I've decided to make another slice of life podcast episode. Now, I thought I was done with these. I thought that the slice of life podcast was an experiment that I had a lot of fun with and that it was going to come to an end. But it turns out that the slice of life podcast actually has a season two. And this is the first episode of season two of the slice of life podcast. So, uh, maybe I should talk about the reasons I'm doing this. You know, I found myself, I'm, I'm kind of, my YouTube channel's in a little bit of a, a weird, I haven't posted anything on YouTube. It feels like in, in quite a while. Uh, let me check how long it's actually been. I've just, I've been recording videos, but none of them have really seemed that interesting to me. Um, yeah, I think it's been a little while. I made that nano video and that was that was about it right so yeah i don't know i'm not i'm not gonna worry about it too much i've sort of become a little self-conscious i suppose about posting random takes like a lot of my videos are very opinionated very strong opinions and frankly uneducated ones um in fact, like, when I go back and look, I don't even know what I'm talking about a lot of the time. In a lot of my old vloggy type videos, like, I'm just sort of rambling. And I don't really understand why anyone would watch this, those ones. Like, with this, it's a gimmick. It's a gimmick of, like, the ultimate background slop that is purposefully meaningless. Like, that makes sense to me. I don't really see why anyone would watch... <laughs> <laughs> like the sacred cow or something kind of just bad and i tried to make up for it in many cases with like fancy editing and and trying to make an aesthetic out of it but uh i don't know i, I think it's just a the denpa vlog the, the going insane it's it was originally the pitch was there's about going insane in your room like do you want to actually know the history because I'm sure most of the people here who are listening to this already know this, but there may be some who don't. So just to go over it, there was this YouTuber who used to go by the name Digibro, but now goes by the name Beatrix, the Golden Witch, I believe. Um, and uh, they used to make these videos on their second channel, which used to be called um, Digi After Dark. Uh, they went through this period of making these vlogs, and so myself and Osaka Syndrome and many people who are in this Denpa vlogging community, we all watched this, those particular vlogs at a particular time in our lives. And they, were, they all were instrumental in some way in us connecting and it just we liked them a lot. Uh, and there were sort of two elements to this, these vlogs. There were some that were purely sort of rant-based uh, stuff. It was like a, a fairly, in modern YouTube terms, uh, short, um, but not like actually short, but in modern YouTube terms, short, uh, unscripted vlog videos, normally like 15 to 20 minutes long, maybe half an hour long, uh, that were just kind of, here's a topic, like for example, objectively good doesn't fucking exist. That was one. That was a very, a very famous one. Right here, I'm just going to rant about why there's no such thing as objectively good or bad media, you know. Uh, and, and I made a lot of videos like that. But then there were other ones, in particular this series called uh, Insomnia Analysis, that were like a series of these rants stitched together in such a way that it produced a particular vibe, a particular emotion, um, a sort of late, we referred to it as going insane in my room. It's sort of a, it's, it's a very hard thing to describe, um, but, but that sort of thing, where it was like not necessarily that the rants themselves were about how you're going insane in your room, but that the juxtaposition and meta-narrative of the video implies an emotion and a particular experience. And that's sort of the dragon I've been chasing this whole time. 
was to sort of extend that discovery and that genre. But even a few years ago, by that point, it had already kind of been exhausted. And with my video, Denpa, and also Dote Smite's Behold the Love God, I feel like we did as much as could have possibly been done with the format. Like, we kind of solved it. We kind of pushed it as far as it could go. Now, in some senses, I tried to push the aesthetic further. So, like, in some of my videos, let me think of an example, or let me scroll down my channel looking for an example. Uh, like, even further still, I think, has some of this. Uh, Untitled Denpa vlog has a lot of this. I was trying to push the aesthetic further, but in terms of the content of the videos, I feel like it it became, maybe even further still, doesn't push the aesthetic particularly far. Uh, they, they exist. I didn't just make this concept up. Um, Night Shift. Night Shift 3. Night Shift 3 is the, the example where I went all in on aesthetics. Um, to the point where I was like, so one thing I've done, for example, is I've gone all in on lo-fi aesthetics. Like, I record my vlogs in 640 by 480 resolution. And even in some cases, I've done stuff like bit crush the audio or render the audio in a, a low bit rate or MP3 compressed, purposefully underexpose the footage, um, these sorts of things in order to, like, just try and squeeze every ounce of interest I could out of it. Because fundamentally, the idea of watching some random mid-twenties guy in his room ranting about how he thinks the world works for way too long, unscripted, with just a camera pointing at his face, is kind of a boring idea. Like, it's not actually very interesting. And so you have to fuck with it. You have to add as much as you can in order to try and squeeze, like, you know, does this make sense? This makes sense. I was about to say, you know what I mean? But of course you know what I mean. That's a very, that's a very obvious thing to say. And I think the reason why I've been so hesitant, I tried to make this thing called interiority to try and revive this format. But I've been, and I, I was like, okay, I'll do something new. I haven't really combined the fact that I make music with these vlogs before. I've done a little bit of it before, but this time I'm going to actually make a whole big segment of the vlog, the big focus climax of the vlog, the process of me making a song. And while I think that might be interesting for some people to watch, you know what I mean? Like, I'm really just beating a dead horse at this point. The whole concept is just beat like, it's hard to, you, anyone who can just do the same thing over and over again, you know, it's, it's not me. I can't do that. Now, there's another option, which is what Osaka's done. And I think in many ways, Osaka's approach to this whole thing has been much smarter than mine. Because Osaka sort of, you remember I said there were these two separate things. There were some that were just sort of ranty vlogs about some particular topic. And there were some that were a bit more high-minded insomnia analysis, the meta hole, the gecko estate, um, a little more artsy and, and a little more uh, meta. You know, I went hard down that street, but Osaka experimented with some of that stuff and worked in some of the better elements of that. But generally speaking, has stuck to just topical rants. And in that way... You know, although I wouldn't say those videos are, like, particularly mind-blowing or uh, artistically revolutionary, they're a lot more sustainable, you know? Like, they're a lot more... It's a lot more reliable. Like, I will actually watch those videos. It's a lot more reliable. It's a, And it, it's, a, it's just, you know, Osaka is an interesting guy, and so it's cool to hear him talk about interesting stuff. Like, that's all you need. And that format, or something similar to it, is actually quite popular on YouTube. Like, take a look at 
for example, Mogul Mail or um, Peng Penguin Zero, critical, most critical. Isn't that basically what they're doing as well? Like that format of just a guy ranting into a camera about some topic that interests them is like quite popular on YouTube. Uh, now, you know, there's obviously a difference between what those guys do and what Osaka does, but it's a similar kind of thing. So, you know, when you're an, a hikini, I think there's just, like, these podcasts and videos have always served a practical purpose for me, which is that I'm a shut-in. I don't talk to my friends that much. I also have a very unreliable sleep cycle. So even my online friends are often just not awake when I'm awake. So I can't, like, right now, I don't know where everyone is, but I can't talk to anyone right now. Like, no, no one I know is awake or replying to me on Discord or anything. So, like, if I have a thought and I want to communicate it to someone, my only option is to pull out Audacity or pull out my phone and start talking. And oftentimes, I'm, I'm a very linguistic thinker. I'm a, I'm a, a word cell if you're chronically online. Uh, and so I, I often need to talk out loud in order to really set my thoughts in order. And so it literally just serves a practical purpose for me, making similar videos to this or, or podcasts to this where I just have something happens and I just want to talk about it with someone but I don't have people because I am sort of isolated as a, as a person um, by, by choice you know I'm, I'm okay with this this is a it, it's a it's a fine situation uh, but but yeah there's there's just there's also something else which can definitely be said about this which is that when you know, we were all into these old After Dark vlogs. We were just all a lot younger and a lot stupider, you know? Like, you actually go back and watch these these things as, an, as a, like, 25-year-old man, and it just kind of comes off as a bit immature. And a, not just that, but, a, like, not very insightful, not particularly interesting. Uh, you know, that... To be more specific, I was interested in this when I was at a point in my life as a sort of late teenager who was searching for an identity, right? Searching for some sort of aesthetic coherence to my life and, and searching for people who I felt could understand me and that sort of thing. The stuff you do when you're a late teenager. But the thing is, I'm no longer that. You know, I'm much older now. Uh... And, and so I don't need, I don't need those sorts of things to give my life purpose anymore. I'm, I'm not questing after purpose in my life in the same way that I was. I, I, I'm not in a situation where I'm thinking, oh, all the people I go to school with every day are fucking normies and idiots. My parents don't understand me, but I can't, you know, I'm trapped with them. Uh, I just want to, like, be in my room all the time and watch anime and, like, get drunk, and then I see a guy on the internet who's in his room all the time watching anime and getting drunk, uh, and I'm like, okay, I have someone I can latch on to. Now, I'm aware, this is, please, I, I hope that no one takes any sort of problem with this. Um, so, Digi is trans, right? They transitioned, uh, she transitioned in, into a woman, uh, hence the name change. But when I'm referring to her in the past, in, from a first-person perspective, from my past self, I'm saying a, 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 a second-person male pronoun because that's what I would have said at the time because they were not, they had not come out as trans yet. So I, I, I hope that's, a, that's a, um, not a cancelable offence. Uh, but anyway, that's a, that's a big digression. Um... Right, so I just don't really need that sort of stuff in my life anymore. And, you know, secondary to that, I've noticed a, a phenomenon where I am, in some sense, that person for a lot of people who watch me. Because, like, now I am a guy who, you know, my I don't live with my parents. I live alone in a house, in my house, where I stay inside all day, and I can get drunk whenever I want. And watch anime as much as I want, you know. I I am living the the the, the hiki neat dream, to the furthest extent that really anyone could could expect to be. 
um, and I think there were a lot of young people, young younger people who who watch my videos and have the same feeling that I had previously, and frankly, they're fucking annoying. <laughs> you guys are fucking children. Oh my god. You know what I mean? Like, not saying all of you. I'm sure some of you are nice people. But I see some of these discussions in my Discord server, which is not going to exist for much longer because I am leaving Discord and moving to Matrix permanently, hopefully. Uh, and they're just, and just annoying. But yeah, I mean, I don't, it doesn't bother me that much. You can, you're supposed to be annoying. You're like fucking 17. You're supposed to be annoying. That's the, the age when you're expected to be annoying. So you shouldn't be worried about it. You'd be worried about it if you're like 30 and annoying. Uh, anyway, that, this seems, so do you know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm no longer in a position where I'm trying to emulate someone because I, there's some like lifestyle that I strictly desire and can't have. But now, I just have the lifestyle I want. And there's another also something very... There's also something that's very important to add on to this. There's something very important to add on to this, which is alcohol. So, one element of the old After Dark vlogs was alcohol consumption. There was always booze being drank. And later on, there was always weed being smoked. And also, at, at a certain period of li my life, I drank a lot of alcohol as well. I drank beer pretty much every single day. Um, you know, I was I was big into alcohol. I wasn't an alcoholic by any stretch of the imagination. It never became some sort of problematic addiction for me, which, frankly, I think I'm fairly fortunate because I did drink a lot. So it's pretty lucky that I never, like... I was just a heavy drinker, but it, honestly, I think I probably flew a little too close to the sun for those years of my life. Um, and I probably escaped through luck rather than, uh, you know, skill. Uh, mostly because I never, although I drank often, I never drank particularly heavily often. I would just, you know, have like, well, whatever. This is not super relevant. Actually, it is kind of relevant because the point is, it's much easier to sort of ramble incoherently when you're drunk. And it's kind of funny. But I don't really drink that much anymore. I mean, I'll have a couple beers from time to time. But, uh, you know, hangovers are more significant to me now than they were when I was younger. And so most of the time, the just cost-benefit analysis of drinking alcohol doesn't really work out. Um, like, there's just no reason for me to drink because it just, it just sucks the next day. And then another aspect to that is, at a certain point... I started suffering from brain fog, periods of intense brain fog. Like, sometimes just for a, for a week, I will just suffer from intense brain fog, and then it just goes away. I don't know if it's long COVID or something. I feel like it started before COVID started, so that seems unlikely to me. But I'm sure COVID didn't help, because I did get COVID at some point. Um, but, you know, having to deal with brain fog, or these periods of brain fog, is extremely depressing i mean it's it's not an enjoyable thing uh and uh so you know i kind of value having a clear mind much more strongly than i did back then you know and then there's a final aspect which is that i fucking live on my own and pay for my own shit now right and alcohol is expensive like ba back then you know i didn't have to pay for anything so i had loads of uh, all of my income could be spent on weed and booze and it didn't matter because because what else am I going to spend it on but now I have to spend the money on like bills and food you know it's just it's just not it just it just doesn't really make sense for me to drink that much and I feel like being a, a drinker was something that it enhanced the aesthetics of the videos in a, in a certain way it loosened me up enhanced the aesthetics of the videos um but yeah, so th this, that's not really a thing I do anymore. So this, these, these factors that I've discussed have all sort of compounded in just that sort of thing doesn't feel right to me anymore. You know, I'm, I don't have so much confidence in my ideas like I used to. Like there were a lot of times when I would be very confident about 
things I was saying at that point. Um, whereas now, I feel like I'm a lot more uh, of the sort of person who says, well, it could go either way, you know? Uh, or, like, I'm not saying it's not true. I'm just saying we don't know for sure it's not not true. Or some, I don't know. Did that, that doesn't, doesn't even make any sense. <laughs> Whatever. So these Slice of Life podcasts, they kind of devolved into just me talking about Team Fortress 2 a lot. Because at the time, I was just doing nothing but playing Team Fortress 2. And I, I took a big break from TF2. And uh, I don't play the game as much as I used to. I still do play the game and I do have opinions. And I'm, I am sure that you will hear some of my opinions about Team, Team Fortress 2 at some point within this podcast. Uh, but this this makes a lot more sense to me as a format than those videos. And uh, the reasons being, number one, I don't have to go through the whole effort, which is really surprisingly annoying, of getting the files off of my phone and onto the computer. Like, that sounds like something that should be simple. And the fucked up thing is, it used to be simple a few Android versions ago. And at some point, they made it, like, really finicky, which is just annoying. Uh, I don't have to deal with big file sizes clogging up my computer, although recording in 240p or whatever, 640 by 480 kind of minimizes that fact. Um, I don't have, you know, this, it just, it just makes a lot of stuff easier. It just makes, um, and then a big thing is that I don't have to worry about like framing and like trying to make shots look good, trying to make sure I'm in frame and, and even a bigger thing, making sure that I am like presentable because I'm not presentable, <laughs> like, I'm a fucking disgusting, fucking hikikomori otaku, you know, I'm gross, I don't shower, I stink, my clothes are dirty, like, you don't want to see me, uh, and f I don't really want to be seen, like, I've thought to myself recently how much I regret putting my face on the internet, like, it's such a dumb thing to do, and the thing is, there are a bunch of people who make similar videos to this. Like, there was a guy, I don't know if this guy still exists or is, like, still alive or whatever, but there was a guy called Mr. Daggers IRL, and, like, he made similar vlogs and never showed his face. There's also Paz, aka Artificial Nice Guy, who makes similar vlogs and never shows his face. Um, like, there are a bunch of, like, it's, it's something that's very doable. I don't know why I decided... It was a dumb fucking idea. I should never have shown my face on the internet. No one should ever do that. If you can avoid it, you should not show your face on the internet. This I this concept of selfies is was a big mistake. Uh, so I don't have to, that's quite nice. All of that stuff is quite nice. Um, and then there's also the nice advantage that I can host all of these on my website. Although technically, at no point am I hosting these. Like, the doorbell just went off, but I haven't, there's no reason for me to answer the doorbell, because I haven't ordered anything from, from any, anywhere, so why would, why would they need to deliver anything to me, um, and no one else would, I don't believe I've ordered anything from anywhere, hold on, well, yeah, I have not ordered anything from anywhere, right, sorry, I just got distracted there, what was I talking about, right, my website, yeah, that's nice. I don't like being reliant on YouTube. YouTube fucking sucks. Uh, we all agree that YouTube sucks. This is a th crazy thing that happened. Everyone agrees that YouTube sucks. Everyone has agreed that YouTube sucked for about 10 years now. And then there was a push for a reasonable amount of time for people to get off YouTube. There was like VidMe and like BitChute and then Odyssey, which by the way, my channel is mirrored on Odyssey. You can only upload videos less than an hour, so you can only find my videos that are less than an hour long on Odyssey. But I do have an Odyssey. Like, if you're, if you're a, someone who's interested in, in th that, for whatever reason, you can watch my stuff on there. Um, but, like, there, was, there were these, like, alternative video platforms. And then there was, like, Peertube, which was the only... Peertube is the only architecturally good one, but that literally no one's ever used it <laughs> um I, that's not true i know at least one person who's used it but you know what i mean basically no one uses peer tube uh right so yeah it's all fucking and then it seems like people just gave up on the idea of like not hosting stuff on youtube 
everyone sort of gave up. Like, the, the, what's weird is, as soon as people gave up on the idea of, like, finding an actual YouTube alternative, suddenly a YouTube alternative sprang up, and that is called Nebula. Like, think about the amount of people who make videos for Nebula as, like, and it's actually viable as a career, you know? But obviously that's that's kind of more like a, a Patreon or Netflix alternative than a YouTube alternative, because it's, it's uh, you know, what's the word I'm looking for here? Paywalled, that's the word. It's paywalled, but it is an alternative hosting site than YouTube, and it's popular. It's the only one that's ever been popular. Because I guess what people really want is money. I guess what people really want is money. Uh, no, it's really because they just all shilled it really hard. It, it got, it got a lot of other things. It got shilled really hard and there was no, like, that, that stuff was only available there. But anyway, I digress. Hosting audio is just much easier than hosting video. Uh, and so, because the file sizes are smaller. So, you know, although in this case, the file sizes aren't that small. <laughs> They're pretty fucking big. Uh, but I do, I can, comp I compress the MP3s to a, a size that I deem, you know, acceptable. It's just nicer dealing with audio when you're not, when you're, when you want to host stuff yourself. It's nice to not have to rely on Google for stuff. Isn't that nice? I think that's nice. Uh, I'm sure it's a bit frustrating because these podcasts are so absurdly long that it's like, oh, I lost my place and you have to find it again. That's pro that probably sucks. Uh, yeah, it's just a better format, really. Other than that, though, like, what am I going to use my YouTube channel for? I have no idea. I actually do have an idea for a video that I, that I might make. I have an idea for a video that is, like, uh, I, I spent a week only using a laptop from 2006. I don't know, I don't know exactly what the title that's not a super snappy title but something al along those lines uh well i just use my thinkpad x60s for a week and see how it does because the video here's the thing that video wouldn't actually be about that it would really be that's the sneaky way that i can tell people about cool soft cool minimal software that runs on my thinkpad you know because the first thing i'll do is like well, I'm going to need to install an operating system on this thing, because right now it doesn't have an operating system installed. And then I'll, like, I don't know, tell people about OpenBSD or something. <laughs> or, like, I don't know. It'll be fun. It'll be fun. I'll talk about, like, Gopher and Gemini. And, <sighs> yeah. Speaking of Gopher and Gemini, actually, let's not speak of that right now. Okay. Insane fucking shit is happening, man. So, I am... I don't want to talk too much about the specifics of what I'm doing, because if it, if it doesn't work out, then it's just nothing, right? So I need to I need to get everything working before I talk about it. But but I'm trying to set up a new website, and um, I needed to install a particular Perl module. And I've listen, I've never set up a website more complicated than a blog. I don't I don't know anything about PHP or anything. I probably should to do this, but I am paying for hosting. I'm paying too much for hosting. I'm getting ripped off on hosting. Uh, I bought a URL, you know, I, I bought a domain, like, for probably too much money. I mean, it wasn't that expensive, but, like, I'm fairly serious about this website. Um, and I'm trying to set up the back end right now, which is not easy. It is very confusing, and I don't understand it. Uh, and then I was like, it's giving me an error that it can't find some particular Perl module. Now, I don't know what the fuck a Perl module is, but I know to read an error message, right? I know it says it's looking for something and it can't find it. So I look, I dig around and I'm like, oh, okay. They have this like thing where you can install Perl modules in the like, I don't even know, the little client they give you to, to manage your website. Okay, you can, ins you can install Perl modules here. So I go to install, I like search for the Perl module that I need and I, inst I go to install it. And then, you know what? I will just read out there. I will just, <laughs> I will just find the error message and read it out to you. Cause it is fucking, ins it, you're not going to believe this. At least I, I couldn't believe this when I, when I read it. Uh, where is it? Where did it go? The hell? 
Give me a second here. Give me a second. Okay, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna do it again. <laughs> I'm just gonna do it again. Uh, one second, please. Uh, fuck. What was it? Sorry, this is bad. This is bad podcasting. I am aware that this is bad podcasting. What the hell? What is that? That's a new error. That's a different error than I was getting before. I don't know what that is. Um, uh, now I'm a bit confused. Oh, I typed the wrong URL, that's why. That's what I was supposed to, yeah, okay. Uh, right, so I need this Perl module, which is, so, uh, this, okay. Right, so I go to install it, I find the one I need, I go to install it, and then it prints me a terminal output. Do you want to hear the error message it gives me? Checking C compiler. Could not load an executable GCC binary. Done. Unrecoverable error. The C compiler is not functional and auto repair failed. Perl module installs require a working C compiler. I'm sorry. What? You don't have GCC? How is it possible <laughs> to have a fucking computer that doesn't have GCC? Like what? I mean, uh, yeah. There is muscle libc. That such a thing exists, but I highly doubt. I mean, I just doubt that that's they're using muscle, right? Surely, I mean, it's like CentOS. Just I'm pretty sure CentOS uses GCC. Does it? I don't know. I don't know what goes on. Okay, I don't know what the fuck is going on. But all I'm saying is this shit don't make no fucking sense to me. How did you even set up a system in which GCC doesn't work? Like, what are you talking about? This this is like insane. Am I like maybe I'm overreacting, but that is an error message I've never seen in my life. Like I don't you have to have fucked up. You do you understand how big time you have to have fucked up to get an error message like that? Like what? So I talked to support and they were like Okay, uh, I'm gonna have to escalate this to, because what the fuck, <laughs> and now I'm wait. I have to wait, twenty four to forty eight hours for a response. Just what the hell? Just just what? Like, what? How is that possible? Am I crazy? Is this like something that does it? Is this something that makes sense to you, or is this is this not like fucking insane? It doesn't. How do you have a computer that doesn't have GCC? like a linux machine that doesn't have G like how does the machine even run <laughs> how did you install anything on it you know what i mean like what the fuck right so it just turns out it's much more boring than i thought it was I, my user account just wasn't added to the group that could access to the compiler um so the error message you can see why the error message says it can't find executable gcc makes me think GCC doesn't exist, but it was just some mistake where I, my user wasn't added to the compiler group, uh, but they fixed it. But that has not actually enabled me to run my website yet. There are many more issues ahead of me. Okay, guys. Well, uh, you will. This will be very old news by the time you you're, you're hearing this. But Dan Pachan is is live. Dan Pachan is a thing, and all it took was one day's work. I basically worked on it all day today, and uh, right now I'm not going to talk about too much the philosophy behind it and stuff, mainly because I have talked about it a bunch to no one today, because I recorded the thing that inspired Denpachan was me recording a big vlog that I'm not going to post because it doesn't really make any sense to post that now that I've solved the problem of solve the internet by making a text for it. <laughs> no, I mean, maybe I'll post it. I don't know. I, I, it's very rambly and unstructured. Uh, and then I recorded the actual announcement video. Like I did like three takes because I, I fucked up. So I've talked about it too much now and I don't want to talk about it again. It's boring to me, uh, but I probably will. Because, because whatever. But I think the real takeaway here, the real lesson of Denpachan is that you can just do shit. Like, no one can stop you. You can just do it. Like, I've never made a website more complicated than uh, a blog, a simple static blog. 
Um, you know, I don't fucking know what I'm doing. I have no idea how this website works. I couldn't even begin to, I don't, I was fucking around with Perl modules. I don't even, I don't know what Perl does. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I have no idea what the fuck Perl is. What is it? I don't know. I have no clue what it does or what it is or why it has modules and what that, like, I do not know. Uh, I, it, I was doing all sorts of shit to, to set this thing up. And some of, some of which I had prior knowledge on, like, yeah, I can, I can do custom CSS for a website. I've done that a bunch of times. And to be honest, that took up a lot of time. I, I, there was a lot of messing around with this site before I got it to look, even though it's very minimal, it's minimal because I was, I was initially ma making it a little too fancy. Um, anyway, that's the real lesson here is you can just do shit. Like if you have an idea, you just make it. It's crazy. This has actually been a theme in my life recently, like kind of recently. Like, hey, what if I made a video game and I just did it? Hey, what if I made a website and I just did it? Even something small, like my ThinkPad. Oh fuck, hold on a second. My X220 has needed the thermal paste repasted for like years. I just haven't done it. And the reason I've not done it is I've opened up ThinkPads before, but not like to replace the thermal paste to get to get to the CPU. You have to do a complete disassembly. The CPU is buried as deep as it could possibly be buried inside of the ThinkPad. And I was just worried I was going to break something. That's that's pretty much it. I was like, I've, I value this object too much to fuck with it. And I know I'm clumsy. And it's like, what if I fuck it up? But you got to get over the fear of what if I fuck it up? Because now the ThinkPad doesn't overheat, <laughs> you know? Like, that, you, you just, I, I just was like, fuck it. I'm just going to do it. And if it breaks, it breaks. It's fine. It's just, a, it's just some silicon and, and stuff. You can buy a new one. It's, it's fine. Same with this website. I went to, it wasn't even supposed to use this software initially. I was going to use a completely different backend at first. And I couldn't get it to work. Uh, man, I've spent all day dealing with the most useless error messages ever. I did all of this. All of this website was made in the hosting, the web hosting provider I'm using has like a shitty built in like terminal access into your, you know, web server. And it was all done within that because I couldn't SSH into it. I don't know. I don't know why. But like it just what like the SSH connection just wasn't accepting my password, uh, so I couldn't SSH into it, and for some reason it didn't occur to me until I was I was sunk costed into doing it this way, that I could have like edited files locally and then just copied and pasted them onto the website, so I did it all with like a hundred milliseconds of input lag in Vim in a shitty, like, they, you can't resize the terminal, so it's, like, tiny, it has a terrible color scheme, there's, like, a fucking it, eyesore, it was, it was pretty painful, <laughs> like, yeah, it was not a, a super pleasant experience, I'm sure that there might have been a better way to do it, but I don't know, I'm just most comfortable in a terminal, uh, for stuff like this, so that's how I did it, and man, some of these error messages, I don't know what the fuck programs this shit relies on, Pearl and, and other things, I'm sure, but they are very unhelpful error messages. And then not to mention, I had multiple prop like I, multiple times I ran into bugs, which turned out to be problems with my hosting provider. Like, I'm not going to say what I'm using. I don't want to call them out. I'm sure I just got super unlucky. And I also want to say their support, like their, their like little chat window that for support, really good. Like, their customer service was fucking excellent. I talked to, like, three different people about various problems I was having, and they were all super helpful, and all of my problems got... Like, when, when there were problems on their end, they got fixed really quick. Uh, so I can't really complain. But it was a little odd running... I mean, I told you about the GCC thing. Like, okay, you just can't <laughs> use GCC now. And that fucking had me baffled. I was like, what am I supposed to do? But it turned out it wasn't even my fault. It was just the, it was just them. I thought I was doing something wrong, or 
I don't know. There were all sorts of weird issues. But I did manage to get to work. That's what matters. The, the fucking website works, which is insane, by the way. It's insane that the website works, given that I have no idea what I'm doing. Please do not inspect Element on some of these pages, because there are some... There were some bad decisions. <laughs> anyway, that's the real point, is it doesn't really matter, because it looks good. It works okay for now. Um, and all of the basic functionality is there that I need. And even though I don't understand all the intricacies of how it works, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I was afraid. I was like, I need to contact someone who's done stuff th like this before, or, or whatever. But no, you just like, my attitude was, you know what, fuck it. I'll shell out the money, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And that's fine, no one ever has to know, you know? <laughs> and I can always try again. If it doesn't work, I can just turn it into something else. I could just just turn it, it'll be fine. But it, it, it turned out to be surprisingly doable. And that's the that's what I want you to take away from this, is, if, is that you could just do shit. Like I've been talking about making some sort of alternative to my Discord server that's like a forum or something for ages, for ages and ages and ages. And uh, yeah, it turns out you could just do it. You don't have to think, you don't even have to, nothing special has to happen other than you making the decision to do it. And if it's scuffed, it's scuffed and that's fine. Things are just scuffed sometimes. Uh, but can I, so this was, a lot of this was inspired by a website called Cohost, cohost.org. And this website is, is pretty fascinating to me. Um, so Cohost is a Tumblr clone. Great logo, by the way. Every time I see the Cohost logo, I'm like, yeah, hell yeah, great logo. Uh, a Cohost is a, a Cohost is a Tumblr clone, and uh, I'm sure that there are some important important like things <laughs> that are somehow important. <laughs> about co-host uh i don't know it I, is there like an about page hold on a second co-host status careers terms of use community guidelines i don't care about any of that oh about no wait there support there's no about page there's just a support page okay well i think maybe this is maybe it's on the anti-software software club's website right so this co-host is this, this it's it's interesting because most of the other like clone of popular website things are like yeah we're non-commercial that's one thing about us maybe this way we don't have ads and trackers that's another thing but also there's some engineering difference like it's federated you can host your own instance it's something like that it's I don't even know if co-host co -host is open source. That's crazy. Is co-host open source? Because I think it might not be. I don't think it is. It's not. It's not even open source. Like, it's fucking just exactly the same as any other big tech website. It just is made by people who aren't big tech. Like, if it wasn't for the... Literally, it's purely spectacular. The only difference is that it's really interesting. This is really fascinating to me. Because like, like Mastodon, I get the selling point of that. You can host your own instance. You know, there are, there are hundreds of instances that around the world to suit. If, if you have some niche interest, it's kind of almost like joining a subreddit or something. You know, it's, and, and it has some technique. There's the three different feeds that you can see. You know, the local feed, the instance feed, and then the, the everything feed or whatever. And, and and then there's like, you know, there's stuff to Mastodon. <laughs> there's stuff to it. And also it's like, it's activity pub, which means it's integrated with like all of these other activity pub Fediverse stuff. And there's a whole thing that's the Fediverse. It's a whole extra thing that's cool. Now, I have problems with it, but I get like, there's a technical, there's something basic about it that is new, you know, and distinct and like positions it as as something very distinct and in opposition to the the corpo web. Right? And Blue Sky is the same way, right? Blue Sky is also federated ostensibly and so on. 
and except there's just a few differences between the app protocol and the activity pub protocol, right? Uh, or there's things like Lemmy and uh, I think that's what it's called. Is it a Reddit alternative? And uh, PeerTube or, or BitChute. BitChute, it's like, oh, we, we fake pretend peer-to-peer, -peer, even though it actually is not peer-to-peer. -peer. They just lied about that, which is fucking hilarious. Uh, but yeah, oh, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, it's BitChute. Or um, it's Odyssey, it's got cryptocurrency built into it for some reason. Stuff like that. You know, like they have some selling point that is like, okay, not only is this a clone of something you already use, but here is like some technical thing where it's like, okay, you can trust us because we're not going to be the same as those guys because fundamentally there's something like technically, architecturally stopping us from being the same as those guys. There's some topological difference. But co host, their selling point is just. You can trust us because we're nice people. We're good people. Isn't that is, that's so fascinating to me? Like they don't they they don't separate themselves or distinguish themselves based on any significant structural difference. It's purely like it's Tumblr, but instead of being written you know run by a corporation for profit, it's run by a few furries, uh, you know, who are leftists. And I think this is so interesting because they make a they make a pretty big deal about their leftist politics. So they have a manifesto, which is always good to see. It's great when everyone has a manifesto. Every, more people should have manifesto. That's just not true. We've had, we've got we've got so too way too many manifestos in the world. Uh, but they have a, a manifesto, and uh, they say we are a software company that hates the software industry. Um, blah 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 there's a lot of stuff in this it's 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 overly long um but they talk about here we're publishing this manifesto to talk about the moral and ethical problems we think are endemic to this industry and how we intend to overcome them and then they talk about a bunch of issues with uber and uh airbnb and facebook right and those issues are the sorts of things you would expect effectively workers rights issues particularly with uber or the way airbnb contributes to the housing crisis those are both like exactly leftist critiques you know like this is a problem of the in one of these is a issue with the dynamic of capitalist and worker right like the the lack of labor laws surrounding the gig economy with uber and so on and the other is an issue of private property ownership and landlord rentierism it's very classical lefty stuff right and they're somehow pivoting from that to sort of imply that that is somehow related to what they're doing but it's not <laughs> like that's a completely different thing yeah the people who uh, work at amazon and uber are like m mistreated and this is an issue of workers' rights. But you know who's not mistreated? Like the Silicon Valley tech bros who run your favorite social media platforms. Those guys are getting paid well. Like, yeah, there were layoffs after COVID because all of those companies overhired on purpose knowing they could lay people off, which was not very nice. However, are we going to sit here and pretend that the like San Francisco tech workers who run these websites are not fucking very well off are we gonna pretend that that's not the, like these guys are doing fine there is not a huge you know workers rights issue in that in that particular industry i'm sure there are some like i'm sure i mean i've heard I, i'm not even just gonna say i'm sure as if i'm guessing i've you know mass layoffs aren't something to wait hand wave and there's also been you know claims about crunch culture claims about covers cover ups of like sexual assault and, and abuses of power, just like you would expect from any corporation of those sizes, right? The stuff does happen, but they're not exactly Amazon warehouse workers level of mistreated, right? Like it's, it's on the scale of cushy jobs. It's a pretty cushy job. And everyone knows that it's not the issue. The issue of the social media is not the people at social media companies are mistreated. Like, it's the dynamic between the site and its users that's the issue. And they just don't acknowledge this 
anywhere. Like, they seem to just completely pretend that such a thing doesn't exist, which is insane. Like, they, they, they push, like, the, the idea that, like, we are leftists so you can trust us. We're going to literally criticize capitalism in our about page on, on why this, uh, you know, website should exist. And there's some interesting stuff there about, like, venture capital funding and how that they're, like, avoiding that. Uh, but, like, okay, if if I was going to do... It's a, this is a very shit... It's, it's not... They haven't tried very hard. Let's just put it that way. Like... How okay, you've you've identified some issues with capitalism. Now go to the next chapter of capital and, and tell me how those issues might be resolved. Perhaps through collectivized, democratically controlled uh workplaces. Perhaps through something like that. Now I don't know if if co host is run as a workers co op. I assume it is. Or something along those lines. Um but of course there's a big difference between uh you know traditional i think these people should probably read techno feudalism by Yanis Varoufakis uh like the the digital serfs on uh platforms are they constitute a class in some sense in in this in the in the relation they have between the the owners of the platforms and the, the users of the platforms constitutes a class dynamic, right? They haven't addressed this at all. They literally do not. They don't even consider it. They don't even mention it offhand or anything. So as a user of your website, that doesn't fill me with a lot of uh, confidence. Like perhaps something insane would be, what if the users had more democratic control over the operations of the website? oh my god it's insane it's insane i don't understand why you wouldn't do that like if you wanted to sell yourself as like people you can trust how about building in accountability to the fucking way you design your site because right now it's just oh trust me bro we don't sell your data can i check the back end no it's closed source what are you talking about we don't take venture capital funding. Good for you, I guess. How does that affect me? There's no ads. I was using an ad blocker anyway, just like everyone else. There's no algorithm. Oh, okay. Good job. Like, what do you want from me? Maybe, like, at least Mastodon and stuff is trying to be like, oh, well, you know, you are empowered because you can create your own instance. In what sense am I empowered using co-host? In fact, like... I'm disempowered in just the same way I would be using any other social media platform. There's no, like, why not just give some hint towards democracy? That's the that's the whole point of all of this, right? A, a real radically leftist social media network would be democratically owned by its users. But obviously, they, uh, they would never do anything like that because that would be you know in to do that they would actually have to like put some thought and effort into it first of all it wouldn't just be we're gonna make a tech startup but trust but leftistly <laughs> but trust me bro it's we're doing it like woke though it's gonna be a woke it's gonna be a woke, we're woke type bro so it's it's better for some reason yeah yeah i know <sighs> Oh yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to evict you. I'm gonna have to evict you from your uh, apartment because you haven't paid rent. But but don't worry, I I am woke. Capitalism is bad. It's look, it's not my fault that I have to evict you. I know, I know, landlords suck, don't we? Ah uh, yeah. Anyway, you have uh two days to leave, or I'm stealing all your stuff. Like it's just that. Like what is that? It's insane. It's fucking batshit insane. It's genuinely bonkers to me but how 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 did they why did they think this was a good idea now look co-host i don't even necessarily think it's like a poorly designed social media platform it doesn't seem to have any like significant issues because it's just tumblr like tom i don't use tumblr but i'm sure if you use tumblr it's very familiar to you it's it's like the same thing it's a proven formula and maybe tumblr but run by better people is enough 
to sell you on on a on a thing, but I dare to dream a little bigger. You know, I I feel like we could do a little more than that, which is why you know I I hope to in the future implement some form of democracy on Dan Pachan. Now I'm not sure how it's gonna work. I have no idea how it's gonna work. I'll probably have to learn JavaScript, which is cringe. Or find someone who knows JavaScript, which is maybe even more cringe. But I do intend to uh, have some experiments with something like that because I've always thought it sounded like an interesting concept. Imagine if moderation. So, like you know, in TF2, right? Where in TF2, if you if you want to vote, you have to you have to vote kick people. It's, this is not just in TF2. This is in lots of different games. Like you can vote kick people off of your team. Imagine if the moderation for a website worked like that. Like you could vote to delete a post. If there was some spam post, people would would vote to remove it. Do you think a system like that could work? I have no idea. But it it sounds like something I want to try. It sounds interesting, you know. Now it would be abusable. Like I don't. You'd have to have like captures. It would it would probably be fairly difficult to implement in a way that people wouldn't just like bot it or just vote a bunch of times especially on a site like this that doesn't have accounts it would be it would be hard to implement in a really robust way but i still want to experiment with maybe not that feature exactly but something along those lines like so far there are many websites where uh, individual users can go out and like create you can create a subreddit right uh stuff like that you can create a page for your thing on Facebook, but like, I wouldn't it be interesting if there were like community, and this is not that unique. Lots of websites have done this, like community votes on a new board. That would be cool. Everyone gets involved, and it becomes a collective decision because it affects the collective, which I think is is cool, and it gets people more invested in in new features that would be added to the site. This sounds good to me. Like, why don't more people implement democratic uh, like votes on how social websites are run. It's baff. It's like actually very strange to me that they don't. It's like all of the the idea, like the core idea behind being any any sort of anyone who is not like a monarchist is groups of people make better decisions than individuals, right? Isn't that the whole point? Isn't that the whole point that like individuals? you know one guy is a single point of failure it's a bad idea to have everything is just one guy because that guy could get dementia or die you know even if that guy's good and chill one day that guy fucking dies and then his son takes over and his son is fucking nuts you know this is the ultimate problem that monarchists never solved is what do you do when the king's son is an idiot uh Mo- monarchists can't answer this sing- this simple question uh you know, like that's the that's the point of democracy is like, yeah, it's not the best. It's not perfect. Right. But uh, there's no single point of failure. Like it's it's it takes if if you're a king and you want to become despotic, you kind of just decide to be a despot and it just kind of happens. If you're in a democratic system and you want to be despotic, if it's like actually democratic, that shit is like much harder. It's not impossible but it's definitely much harder than if you're a god king, you know? Like, that's the basic premise. Uh, uh, groups of people make better decisions about the things they're involved in than some top-down decision from a, a manager who's not directly involved in the thing. Uh, now, I'm not totally against management, you know? Although I have in the past many times considered myself an anarchist, these days I'm quite interested in... Uh, Stafford Beer's viable systems model and according to the viable systems model you know uh, si- what is it system system one is that what it is hold on let me look this up <laughs> I have forgotten I've immediately forgotten the fucking thing yeah sy- system one each each comp- subsystem in system one is self-governing right they only report back to the the higher systems uh, they have a name, by the way. I've forgotten what the name is. I'm gonna I've, hold on. I got to look at a diagram. Uh, what is all of this? This is like the the meta system or the management system, I suppose. 
um, like they only report up the chain if something goes wrong, right? Like that's the basic premise. And I think this is good. Like you, if something's so wrong that you need help and then you have some, some management with the power to help, but in other situations, they're self-managing, self-directing because, you know, if you read, if you read like seeing like a state or something like that, it's just obvious that people who are doing the thing are going to have a better idea of how to do the thing than some external force that isn't involved, right? They're going to, they're, they're external for the technical reason, right? Like the, the external force is going to have to impose legibility and, and in doing so, they're going to fuck it up. <laughs> they're going to make it a little shit for everyone uh, in order to understand it and in order to manage it. Whereas if you're actually involved in the thing, you don't need to do that. You don't need to impose this leg legibility layer. You could just self-direct and make better decisions because you have you have the knowledge already without having to filter it. Uh, that's the premise. That's the theory. Does it work in practice? I think there's. I think they can. I mean, maybe. I don't fucking know. I don't fucking know. But wouldn't it be interesting to try? Yeah, I think so. But first, I need to try and make sure Denpachan doesn't die after the first week and has users, and they have to actually obtain the technical know-how to, to implement these features. Or, alternatively, find someone else who knows how to do that. But I like that idea. And I, I honestly, it's shocking to me how no one has tried to do this. Uh, it, is, it is pretty insane to me, though, that co-host... Like, on their, their main welcome page, they have a thing that just says, no ads, no tracking forever. But literally, they could just be lying about it. Like, you have no idea. Like, <laughs> you have no way to check. Because it's fucking closed source. Like, isn't that so stupid? It's like, anyone who trusts this website is insane. And anyone who trusts these people are insane. Like, I'm sure they're nice people. They seem nice at least for now, but, like, these situations call for a healthy dose of skepticism. Like, okay, you're nice, but what if your website suddenly starts making lots of money? Are you going to be nice then? Or, alternatively, what if your website suddenly starts making no money? Are you going to be nice then? How willing to compromise on your ideals are you going to become when you need to put food on the table? Or vice versa, how willing to compromise on your idea? Like, you know what? This is this is something that freaks me the fuck out. This this event freaks me out. I don't know what the guy's name is, but the guy who made OpenAI, OpenAI, I, isn't it like the most valuable thing in the world right now or something like that? So that guy, it's called OpenAI because it was supposed to be an open source AI and it was open source until Microsoft was like, Okay, what if we paid you three billion dollars to to not make it open source and sell it to us? Like, I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm very passionate about open source software, <laughs> but if someone offered me three billion dollars, like you just, I don't know how I could say no to that. Like that's just, you know what I mean? Like, that's a different level. That's that's how they operate. And I'm not above that, you know, like at a certain point, I'm just like, well, I never had like three, it's three billion dollars. Like, are you kidding me? You, that's just, in, you become a god. Like, I can't even comprehend, like, and that's kind of scary to me because I, he took it and I would take it too. And I don't like the fact that I would take that money, but I, I know I would, I would take that money, but I don't, I don't like the fact that, that I would take that money. And, like, that's the sort of money that's floating around in in the tech sector, you know? Like, okay, co-host people, here's $3 billion. Are you going to compromise? On, you know what I mean? Like, they're going to take the money. I would take the money. You're kind of stupid if you don't take the money. You know? Where it was, like, Mastodon, at the very least... They can't take the money. Like, they could take the money, but they have nothing to sell. What are they going to sell? It's a bunch of distributed, random people running a piece of open source software on their server. 
they can do whatever they want like you you can't buy it it's it's unpurchasable at least that part of the federation is like i re- you can't not respect that that is you know fundamentally based it's inbuilt so yeah i, th- I think that's the end of the of my rant on this co-host as much as i think they have a great logo and they really do have i know i've gone on about it a, a bit but they really do have a great logo and a great aesthetic and their little guy is called an egg bug which is really funny because it's like edge it's like edge bug which is a source engine movement technique which is funny to me um i mean i have a co-host account i do i do have a co-host account and uh no i'm not going to tell you what it is and i don't really use it anyway uh but yeah this will be very outdated by the time you hear this, but there's a meme going around that's something like, okay, if you were st- stuck in a time loop and the only way to escape the time loop was to beat Gary Pat Kasparov in a game of chess, and so you get one try every time loop, uh, could you do it? How long would it take? Something like that. And obviously you could do it because you have infinite time, uh, but people are sort of debating about how easy or difficult this is. And I think there's a really obvious answer which is, it's, you're not going to beat Gary Kasparov in chess in a timely manner, assuming you're an amateur chess player. Even if you were a really good chess player, you wouldn't do it. Um, it would be much easier and more efficient to go the social engineering route. Like, you would, be a, you would honestly be able to try more options and have a higher win percentage chance if you just, like, talk to him before the game every time and try different strategies to get him to throw. Uh, I mean, you're in a time loop. You can do anything. That being said, you know, you obviously have the possibility to, like, practice outside of the game. Uh, but no, it, I mean, it would take an absurdly long time to, to beat Gary Kasparov. Um, I don't know. I don't want to do it. I don't want to be in that time loop. That sounds really annoying. <laughs> it sounds pretty inconvenient, to be honest. I'm not, I'm very bad at chess. I was going to say I'm not very good, but that isn't even, even severe enough. I'm like probably one of the worst chess players ever to have existed uh and i'm not saying that to be humble i mean like i'm kind of comically bad at chess i don't know i don't i don't know it would take a long time it would take thousands and thousands of games before you did it it would be faster to threaten his family or something come up with some i don't know there's a million different things you could suggest to him to get him to throw the game for example, rob a bank and then give him the money. I mean, you know, there's 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 many options. Threaten his family. Threaten him. Th- uh, explain explain your situation with some proof of some kind. I don't know if that's even possible. <sighs> I don't know. There's there's social engineering route. It would be easier to convince him to throw than it would be to win against him. Because he, I mean, you just stand no chance. I I've got a hot. I don't know if this is a hot take. To me, I don't know. This is I just have a take. Let's just call it a take. I I know this is kind of cringe. I know this is this is kind of cringe to say, but I think London might be the best city in the world. I know I'm biased. I've lived here all my life, but I've been to many other places. You know, I've been all around. I've been to Paris. I've been to Berlin. I haven't been to Amsterdam. I would probably like it a lot in Amsterdam. And not just because of the weed, uh, but it looks really pretty and everyone rides bikes, which is nice. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I've been to Tokyo. I've been to Kyoto. Uh, I've never been to, to, to tai, Taipei. That would probably be, I'd probably like Taipei a lot or anywhere in China. Honestly, East Asia or Asia in general. Asia in general, I'm lacking. I've never even stepped foot in the entire continent of Africa or South America. Um... I've been to New York, I've been to LA, I've been to San Francisco. This sounds like a song. <laughs> this feels like I'm reading the lyrics to a song. I've been all around. Um, and look, I like I like all of those places that I just mentioned, mostly. LA sucked. Uh, but, I, you know, I like, I like all of those places. Um, but there's something about London. I don't know how to explain it to you in a way that makes sense. It has a, it has a particular feel to it. It has a particular, I mean... There's some things that are, like, fairly objective, right? Like, great public transport networks, lots of historical landmarks, uh, you know, 
something that I like a lot about London. And I also, I should say, I've been to, like, every major city in the UK as well. All of them suck, except for London, by the way. Leeds, garbage. Birmingham, Birmingham, every, everyone agrees that's, like, fucking trash. Manchester, trash, you know. Fucking Dublin's nice. I gotta give credit to Dublin. I like Dublin. That's a great city. Um, where else have I been? Dub. I. I wanna. I wanna say, <laughs> real quick. I. I did, vaguely just imply that Dublin is part of the UK. Okay, I didn't mean to do that. I was just spitball. I was just connecting in my mind. I was just connecting in my mind, okay? And of, of course, it is not. I didn't mean to say that. I apologize to the Irish. I apologize. <laughs> it is not what I meant. I was just thinking about cities that I've been to and Dublin popped into my head. Belfast is not a particularly nice city, in my opinion. Dublin's a great city. I mean, look, I don't want to make commentary about the Republic of Ireland versus Northern Ireland, but we all know which one's better. And it's not the Northern Ireland. <laughs> um, right. Edinburgh is a nice city. Glasgow's a shithole, but it's kind of interesting in its own way. I, I don't think I've ever even stepped foot in Wales. Uh, so I can't speak on Cardiff or anything like that. But I've been around. I've been around. Uh, I've been around. Been around. And most of that was as a kid. But, you know, one thing I like a lot about London, and this is not unique in... Uh, the the UK is the the Victorian architecture. There's a lot of Victorian infrastructure, like like railways that just cut through the city, like like veins. And that shit is always super cool. It has a great aesthetic to it. It's it's built very well. It's still here. It's still operating. Still in use. You know, everyone agrees. The Victorians knew how to do infrastructure and civil engineering. The Victorians fucking knew how to do civil engineering. And I, I love seeing that shit, man. It's great. Um, now, there are, there are aspects of London that suck. Um, there are areas in London that are bad. Um, I'm trying to think of... I don't even remember what the... I remember going to this place. Fuck, I don't even remember where it was. There, was there, there's a, there are places in London that, are, that's, that fucking suck. Okay, like not just because like oh it's it's like there's a lot of crime or uh, they're like boring suburbs or anything like that. But there are places that's not what I'm talking about because a lot of places like that are are still nice, right? Like uh, there are a lot of suburbs that uh, you know this it's not like America, but like it's not great. Suburbs always kind of suck, but uh, you know they have like good transport links and. They're much more walkable than how you would picture, like, a typical American suburb. I know this is, like, cringe, urbanist, generic talk. Um, but, you know, stuff's important. Uh, so while, you know, something like, like, Rice Lip, it's not maybe my favorite place. It's not terrible. Uh, or some of the, I don't know, somewhere like, uh, fucking, what am I thinking of? Like, Lewisham. Right, Lewisham, I think, is, like, the highest crime rate part of London. I don't particularly enjoy being in Lewisham. <laughs> I try and avoid it if I can. Uh, but, you know, I think there's some good, st- I, I actually do think there's some good stuff in Lewisham. Like, there's, there's a lot of, there's some interesting architecture. There's some nice, like, uh, like, public spaces, I suppose. Uh, anyway, yeah, there's, there's, there, that's not what I'm talking about. It's not just poor people, poor areas and residential areas that I'm complaining about like those those on its own that doesn't make an area unpleasant to be in I'm talking about the places where it's sort of just like a big highway you know it's just it's loud and smelly it stinks of like car exhaust and cigarettes I don't mind the cigarettes so much <laughs> uh there's certain like little parks and green spaces that are just like clearly unmaintained by the council and just like look like shit and feel terrible to be in there are like neglected high streets where the shops are all run down and uh everyone just seems miserable walking around there like yeah these places exist and they're not good they exist like everywhere in the world but there's i don't know man even that kind of adds to it to me i guess i'm just biased i like the imperfections even like my you know there's so much there's a lot of really cool 
crazy areas in London. Like one of my favorite parts of London is uh, the area at the around the, the Barbican and the Barbican itself. Uh, I believe there's this thing called like, is it this or is it this? Is this what I'm thinking of? No, this this can't be it. Uh, oh yeah. So one thing I don't like about London is the fucking skyline. Like they have they have built some really bad skyscrapers in London, uh, recently. Like everyone fucking hates the the so called walkie talkie. That's like a fucking ugly ass building. They really fucked it with some of that stuff. Uh, not a big fan of that of some of the skyscrapers. You know, it's like you look at New York, Chicago, maybe like Madrid. Those cities have great skylines. London, terrible fucking skyline. Some sometimes it's cool. There's some cool stuff. Like they they've really fucked it. There's just like it, it used to be much better. But anyway, this area around the Barbican. So firstly, the Barbican is my favorite place in London. It's maybe my favorite place in the world. It's such a cool fucking thing. If you don't know, you should Google this. Google the Barbican. It was like an experiment with like social housing for the middle class, I suppose. Um, and it's like this giant. It was all made in like a bombed out World War Two area, but they rebuilt everything, and it's all brutalist architecture. But there's like lots of uh, there's like a big water feature in the middle like a huge like loads and loads of water and plants everywhere there's even like a, a like a, a what's it called a, is it called a conservatory i don't know what it's called like a like kind of a greenhouse type area with jungles type plants <laughs> jungles type plants that shit's cool and then there's it's open to the public most of it is open to the public because there's there's also the barbican center in the middle it's sort of oriented around there's a bunch of housing and it's sort of oriented around the Barbican Center. There's like a big arts venue that they do classical music performances. Like they have a, what's the word for a, a classical music place? Am I going crazy? A concert hall. That's They have a big concert hall. Uh, and then they have other like places for, for music. I mean, they generally play like artsy, more artsy stuff. Um, they're really interesting music that you can find performances. And then they also have, like, art galleries. It's just great. Like, and that whole space inside the Barbican Centre, it, it's so it's so fucking sick architecturally. Like, there's, like, holes between the levels where you can look down. I don't even know how to describe it, but they, they, they're really unique little architectural features. And it's all kind of... You know the, the kind of, like, brutalisty 70s-ish, like, late 60s, early 70s-ish architecture that I feel like a lot of people romanticize these days me included so something like you know the video game control although control is a lot more uh I suppose cold in terms of the the architecture like it's it's not as warm and inviting and carpeted and and lots of warm colored lighting and and, and uh colors that the, the barbican center is uh maybe but that sort of thing it's very cool. It's just a really fun, fun space to be in. And then I'm trying to fucking find... Hold on a minute. I'm... Okay, that's what it's called. It's called the Pedway. It's called the Pedway. So, connected to the Guardian... Not the Guard... The Guardian? The Barbican. The Guardian's a fucking newspaper. The <laughs> Connected to the Barbican. So, what's interesting about it, about the Barbican, is that it's completely... It's completely separated from the rest of the city. Like there, are, it's there are no cars. It's all elevated off the ground, and the only way to like get into the whole complex is through like, there's no big obvious like grand entrance or anything like that. Like it's kind of hidden away. All the ways to get in are like kind of hidden away. Uh, little staircases in a little you know so off the side of the street that are very unassuming. Like there, there's a lot of effort was put into the feeling of like separate the it was it's it's genius like architecture where it's like when you enter the barbican it really does feel like you're somehow stepping into a completely different space even though you're like t 10 meters away from the center of london like 
the sound, it blocks the sound, you can't see any cars, there's like, it's uh, just its completely own space. And it was part, in, in a sense, or it was integrated into this thing called the Pedway, which was a failed idea. Uh, so the idea was, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a very, it's sort of a car-centric, like it's not the sort of thing that modern, uh, like urbanist, civil engineer type people like, you know, it's, it's, it's very different from that because the idea was that there would be like the street level would effectively be only for cars or predominantly for cars and that the pedestrian level would be all elevated. Like there's this it, 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 all in sort of hanging off of buildings, uh, separate from, from the road and that there's this sort of two tiered layered system where you have the cars and the the you know on the on the ground and then pedestrians on a series of like walkways and bridges above and the system had a bunch of problems you know it's obviously not particularly cost effective to build like that that's a big one it's not very friendly to people who have impaired mobility lots of staircases and stuff that's obviously another big problem and uh it's also just quite loud because you're over cars. So it's not a super nice place to like hang out in uh, a lot of the time. Uh, so there, you know, there are a number of issues why the Pedway system never took off. Uh, Jago has it, has a, a video about this if you want to watch, if you're more interested in, in the history and, and more details about it. Uh, but it's, it's fucking great. <laughs> like I know I, the, the, the like, the part of me that's like, oh, we need dense, walkable neighborhoods and no cars, thinks this is terrible. But actually being there, I probably wouldn't like it if the whole city was designed like that. But the fact that it's just this little small relic of a failed uh, design ideology that still exists and is like surprisingly large. And what's weird is it doesn't really go like the only things you can access through it are the Barbican and uh, the Museum of London. And then there's sort of nothing else. Like, it just kind of stops. It doesn't really go anywhere. It's it's fascinating. It's fucking... It's really cool. I love hanging out up there. It's... And it's kind of... It, like, ultimately, it feels cyberpunk. Like, it, that's that's what... That's the real... That's the real core of it. Like, it, it really... That whole area of the Barbican and then stepping into the Pedway system feels like you're in a cyberpunk future version of London, like an alternate lost future version of London or of, of a, a major city. And it's just really fucking cool. Like, it's I, w- I, I wouldn't want everywhere to be designed like that. But as a little weird thing... Also, technically, this is in the city of London, not London. And that's another thing I love about London. Why? There's a city called London, but there's actually no city called London. You probably think... You're probably sitting there thinking... Oh, there's that city called London. There's actually no city called London. There's a city called Greater London, which is also kind of weird uh, and complicated. Uh, and then there are multiple cities within London, <laughs> like within Greater London. So there's then the city of London, which is not Greater London. The city of London has their own mayor, their own elections, their own laws, their own police force and... I believe their own like fire service and stuff like that. Uh, it's a completely separate city in the middle of the city. Like the city is like a donut around the city of Lo- like London. Greater London is like a big donut around this tiny hole in the middle, which is the city of London, which is like ancient Roman London, basically. It's like the boundaries of ancient Roman London. By the way, the Barbican, there's just like pieces of the ancient Roman London wall just in the Barbican. It's fucking sick. Uh, Yeah, so then there's the city of London. But then nearby, there's also the city of Westminster. But unlike the city of London, the city of Westminster is counted as a city by law. But it doesn't have its own... But it's under the governance of Greater London. So it's under the governance of the London mayor. And it it is like serviced by the Metropolitan Police Service and, and all of their other utilities. So it's that's extra weird. Most people like people know at this point about the city of London being a different city because that's like an interesting fact. But there's also the city of Westminster, which, by the way, is where Parliament is. 
So it's like technically Parliament isn't even in London City. It's in West, the Westminster City, which is it's fucking weird. Like It doesn't even make any sense, really. They're just historical cities that were nearby and sort of, you know, all got merged into London. Uh, but yeah, the city of London is like fascinating, obvi- uh, obviously. Uh, it's the like root of so many conspiracy theories because it's so fucking weird. Like they still have medieval guilds, uh, like elections in for the for the city of London mayor, the Lord Mayor of the city of London. That's his full title. Um, you don't just it's not just people that. Firstly, I believe there's a vote every year. It changes. Secondly, it's not just people that vote. It's also corporations. And by corporations, I mean, like, in the original sense of the word, like, medieval guilds. Um, and it's, like, also this weird tax haven <laughs> where there's, like, a lot of big businesses are all set up here. It's fucking crazy. And they have all of these ancient medieval rituals to do with their governance. And then there are these things called beadles. There are these guys, they're called beadles. It's, like, something out of a fucking fantasy novel. Like, I don't even know how to... Dis- they just walk around in these costumes and they're like the guards of the it's crazy it's insane that this stuff still exists it's great i love it um what else is an interesting fact about the city of london there's a bunch of roman stuff there uh you can get the keys you can get the key you've probably heard people got the like they get the keys to the city uh i believe that we yeah so there's this weird thing where you can be made a freeman you can be if you if you if the city of London decides they like you, you can be made a freeman, which is kind of like a a yeoman, like it's a hangover from feudalism. Um, you know, as far as I can tell, it's just a ceremonial title nowadays. But it you know was it still exists and people get made freemen of the city of London all the time. Uh, and then this is maybe my favorite fact, is that. Britain doesn't have one written constitution in the same way like America does, right? But we are still considered to be a constitutional monarchy because we have like, uh, it's like the accumulation of unwritten and written documents that form a constitution, like something, something like a constitution. So technically, all power in the UK is derived from the crown. Right. Like the reason Parliament, like the prime minister and and Parliament have power is that the the king gives them power like the the, they were originally advisors to the monarchy. And like the prime minister was the monarch's main advisor. Right. And, you know, still the monarch needs to sign off on every law that gets passed and so on. Uh, But so technically, you know, the. All of the power of the government is given by the monarch, who themselves has power because of God, because of the divine right of kings. Yes, because of the divine right of kings. Uh, that, like, I'm the king, I'm allowed to, to do things and have power because God has given me this right, and therefore I delegate power to parliament. That's how, and then every other aspect of the UK, like, you know, your local council or the police or, you know, anything, anything else that has political power in the UK is, or the the Bank of England, etc., are allowed to do so because of, of the government, which is ultimately because of the monarch, which is ultimately because of God. Other than the city of London, (laughs) every part of the UK all leads back to the monarch and then ultimately to God, uh, gets its authority from God, uh, the Christian God. Except for the city of London, which has specific provisions written out for it, where, like, the, 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 the crown is just not allowed to fuck with it in certain ways. Obviously, these days, it doesn't matter so much, but uh, there are certain provisions that, like, you're not allowed to disturb uh, the city of London or get in the way of how they're operating. And the city of London, their bylaws and, and local laws uh, and, and Lord Mayor and all of their political power doesn't stem from the monarch, uh, you know, legally. It stems from time immemorial. It's just so old <laughs> that they just, it just it is. That's the literal truth. Isn't that shit fucking crazy? 
this shit blows my mind every time I think about it. It's just so fucking old. <laughs> it's cool. It's so cool. Also, like, London is a swamp, but it doesn't feel like a... Sw- I don't know. That's a That's a weird thing. No one thinks about that. What's going on with that? I don't fucking know. And then, you know, I'm also kind of, like, obsessed with the tube. The London Underground. <laughs> it's a fucking fascinating thing to me. Like, what an interesting piece of civil engineering. It's so... It's, like, iconic. It's it's the first of its kind. Like, I'm... You know, I'm not much of a train nerd in general. Like, I can't look at a train and think to myself, Oh, it's a... One of those... It's a, it's a A502 class. Like, I don't, I don't know that shit. I'm not deep enough into it to know any of that stuff. It's not super... I was, I love trains, obviously. Who doesn't like trains? Trains are cool. Trains are awesome. Love them. But I don't know that much about them. But I am quite interested in specifically the tube. There's lots of interesting... I mean, there's an insane amount of, like, interesting history and design that goes into the tube. I don't really get a chance to talk about it, but... There's a, and this is like a, not just a me thing. Like there's a sp- specific subset of train nerds who are specifically into the tube. I mean, I mentioned Jago has it just now because he made a video on the Pedway, but most of his channel is about the tube. There's also um, if you're interested in learning about the tube, there's this series on a channel called Londonist. Um, Oops, I paused. There's a series on the channel called Londonist called uh, Secrets of the London Underground. And I really recommend it because it's fascinating. They go station by station on every line. Like each video is one particular tube line. And then in each video, they go, they, they tell you some interesting stuff about each station. Uh, it's a great series. But yeah, there's all, all sorts of fascinating stuff about that. I can't, I don't know what facts to tell you. I mean, like... There's so much stuff to like about the tube when it comes to, like, the architecture and design of tube stations. Like, there are some... I I don't remember the names of the people who who designed them. But there's, like... <clears throat> in particular, there's, like, famously two uh, designers who are, like, have very particular, iconic um, architectural styles. Uh, one of them... I'm going to just look these up in real time, because I remember the names of the stations. Uh, so, let's see, is there... Uh, this doesn't tell me who made this. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, that's because I'm not in the Wikipedia entry for the actual station. Uh, Charles Holden, that's his name. This guy, architect called Charles Holden. He designed a whole, I mean, he's a very prolific architect in London, but he designed a lot of tube stations, and they're all, they all have this sort of Art Deco design, uh, which everyone, as far as I can tell, everyone loves, and uh, like Arnos Grove, Bounds Green, uh, what else, East Finchley, it's all in that sort of area of the Northern Line, mostly, and the, I mean, everyone fuck it, it looks great. It looks, it's it's just a, I mean, look at Southgate Station. What a great station. Arnos Grove, what a great station. Sudbury Town, yeah. A bunch of really good stuff. And then, so he's not, like, you can, you can sort of find this string, and they're all, like, next to each other on the line. Like, so you can just find this string of stations with, like, a particular design language that's really fascinating. And then there's, oh, fuck, um, this is the, is his name? I'm gonna look him up. There's other guy called Leslie Green much older um i guess it's not that much older but yeah and leslie green's all of the stations he designed are also very iconic they're they're sort of they have this what they have this particular red color of tiles oxblood tiles and the shit looks so cool like you and they're all around um london uh let me see. Is there some sort of list of all of the stations that he made? Uh, I mean, Covent Garden Station. Just a whole bunch of them. I mean, you can recognize them the second you see them. They all have this very iconic uh, red tiling. 
that looks really cool. But they have really small station buildings. Like the majority of them are like underground ticket holes, very small ticket holes, ticket holes. Um, and then another really cool thing about the tube is like the platform design. Can I take a minute here to to complain about something? Can I take a fucking minute here to complain? I've been I was considering like making a full video about this. So recently, I guess it's not even that recently anymore, but it is pretty recent. There's a new underground train line in London called the Elizabeth Line. Now, for some strange reason, this is not technically considered to be a tube line. It's considered a high frequency underground train service, even though in every other way it is a tube line. But it's technically its own thing that is not a tube line. I don't know why, but whatever. Uh, it's called the Elizabeth Line, and it's great, okay? The trains, the rolling stock, are wonderful. They're quiet, they're smooth, they're spacious. <coughs> they have really well-designed interiors. I love you, and it's fast. It's a really fast, efficient service. It, it's super popular. It's great. I uh, Using the Elizabeth Line is pretty much a joy every time. Like, they, it's, it's, a, it's just a really great train service. It's, it's very frequent, it's very fast. Being inside of the trains are very comfortable, quiet, smooth, etc. It's everything you could want out of a, an underground train line. They go to important... <laughs> it gets you exactly where you need to go. It connects a bunch of important areas much more efficiently than they were previously connected. It's great. It's, it's, a, it's massively popular. And after it was completed... It, they spent a shitload of time and uh, particularly a shitload of money on the Elizabeth line. I believe it went massively over budget. But what's crazy is it's like so popular, <laughs> like it's it's much more popular than they initially expected it to be, that it's going to pay for itself within a couple years. Like it is insane. And not just that, but the areas which have seen new Elizabeth line stations or connections have all seen significant economic growth because of this new ch new train line, which is what you would expect, I suppose, when a new train line goes somewhere. But it's still, you know, a nice effect to notice. So generally speaking, I'm a big fan of the Elizabeth line, just like most other people. However, okay, there's, there is one thing I'm not a big fan of. In fact, there's one thing which I consider really bad about the Elizabeth line. And it's not the tube itself. It's not technically a tube. It's not the train trains themselves. It's the stations. Now, there's a lot of good in these stations. In particular, the platforms are fucking huge. Like, they clearly... I mean, everything is massive. <laughs> like, it's huge. It's like, there is so much capacity. It's great. That stuff is great. In a rush hour crush, you know, a lot of stations are really cramped uncomfortable but the elizabeth line clearly has like so much capacity to take millions of, of passengers every day um that stuff i love there's also some really cool stuff you know in terms of certain station designs that have like nice up lighting and they all have these like white tiles um which look pretty futuristic but that's really my problem see on all the other tube lines every station has a very distinct identity. In fact, on certain lines, like the Victoria line, every station purposefully has different tiling that is supposed to sort of, there's sort of mosaics on the walls that are related to the local area. Uh, for example, like Seven Sisters Station has a mosaic of seven trees, which is what those are, the, that's what the area is named after. There's, there's seven, seven trees. And so you can see the seven trees of Seven Sisters on um, the tile. Or Black Horse Road has uh, a, like an interesting minimal minimalist swan in the, the tiles because there's a pub, uh, which I believe is called the Black Swan or, or the White Swan or something. Or maybe it's just called the Swan. I don't know. But there's a pub there right across the road from the station. It's a historic pub. Um, like there's, a, there, there's all sorts of interesting stuff like that. Uh, where where they all have different unique designs and unique tiling. Even the lines that don't have, like, something as obvious as the Victoria Line stations do. Is that the Victoria Line? Or is that, am I thinking of the Piccadilly Line? Hold on a minute. Am I going crazy? 
That's the Victoria line, right? Black Horse Road is on the Victoria line. Yeah, okay. Phew. Thought I was going insane there for a second. Uh, but even every every station has some... They, they all have a unique design. Like, some of them have historic tiling. For example, Arsenal Station um, st uh, still has tiling that says Gillespie Road, which is what it used to be called. Um, or, like uh Leicester Square has like it has it, they all just have a unique look is basically the point. And what that means is if you're a commuter or someone who goes to a station regularly, you can have your headphones in and be barely paying any attention to what station you're at and just because you've been to a station many times, you can instantly recognize it even without seeing any signage because they all have they all unique in term there's all some even though they have consistency in design, there's always some unique tiling or patterns on the wall that you can instantly identify. And that's really useful, you know, because you don't have to catch one of the, the, the signs that says what station you are at or listen to the announcement. You can just, just one glance at the wall pattern is enough to know where you're at. If you take a journey regularly, you're instantly, like, it, it's very easy to memorize. Like, you don't have to try it. You'll just recognize it over time. Um, and this is the problem with the Elizabeth line is that the design of each station is, is like identical. The platform level is, is, is identical on every Elizabeth Line station. The only difference is like the curve of the platform and shape and then the sign that says what station you're at. But they all have the exact same plain white tiling and rounded uh, shape. And so it means you can't do this on the Elizabeth Line. You can't just instantly recognize what station you're at. And that's fucking, that sucks. <laughs> And I hate that. I really dislike it. It honestly, it almost feels a bit surreal because it's like you step into a portal. You get on the train and then you sit there and move and you get out at an identical platform. It's like you've, it's, it's kind of weird. It's like you've moved, but you get out and everything looks exactly the same. It's like you haven't moved. It's weird. It's a, it's a, it's a weird feeling. I don't like it. The Elizabeth lied. I hate that shit. And then here's another thing. This is a famous problem with the Elizabeth line, the, the infamous, uh, the white tiling collects marks in particular on all of the Elizabeth line stations or platforms, you can see these like shadow people on the walls where the benches are. There's like a shadowy silhouette outline of like the, the muck and grime and sweat or whatever from where people have sat on the benches. It's kind of cool, actually. I'm not necessarily complaining about that. It, it looks kind of cool. But it's really unusual to see. Um, I don't think it was intentional. And it wasn't. It, it, it definitely wasn't intentional. Um, but, like, again, the, the weird, like, idea that every single platform has to have the exact same design. And then that design happens to have, like, a, a really apparent floor where the walls behind the benches become discolored and, and create these shadowy forms. I mean, it looks kind of cool. It almost looks like an art project or something, but it's not. Uh, but yeah, that's my main problem with the Elizabeth line, is why would the, they make all the fucking platforms look exactly the same? Shit's, shit's fucking stupid. Look, it's it's very annoying. All right, we've ranted at, at length about London, and I haven't even began to touch on many of the things I love about the city. Uh... Like, did you know there's a place in London called Little Venice? It's like a, ma a huge canal system. Bet you didn't. Bet you didn't know that. It's great. Love Little Venice. Great area of the city. Very pretty. Or, um, I don't know. I could talk about it for ages. But let's cut it short here. Can I talk about VPNs for a second? I think there's, there's a lot of, of weird and strange information that goes around regarding VPNs. On the one hand... You have the giga normie population who think a VPN is like an epic hacksaw tool and if they download Nord v NordVPN, they can look up child pornography and the government will never be able to find them or whatever. So that's that's uh, group number one. But then there is the slightly uh, less giga, but still, I don't understand these people, who then will say, no, VPNs are actually entirely useless. The only reason one might want to use a VPN is to watch region locked content on on Netflix or something like that, uh, but they provide zero security advantage. 
the, this is not true either. I'm begging you, please uh, do some reasonable threat modeling. The chances are your threat model is not the entire US government. Like, come on, please. Okay, what is a VPN? Like, what, what does it do? Okay, it masks the uh, sort of... It, it, it moves, it moves, it moves the burden of who is watching all of my internet traffic from your ISP to your VPN provider. That's all it does. That's all it does. And so one might imagine this means like, oh, well, uh, it's all based on on trust. And so, uh, you know, you can never trust any VPN provider fully. Therefore, it's useless. Uh, but there are many countries where people have strong reasons to distrust their ISP to a higher degree than they would distrust something like Molvad. Um, there are also, you know, I, Molvad is, has problems, in particular the fact that they got rid of port forwarding is stupid. Uh, but, uh, you know, the Molvad gives you the option to pay them in, in cash, like you can just send an envelope of cash to them. Meaning like they, there are situations where you could be using Molvad and they have no, there's, there's no feasible way for them to uh, connect your account to your real identity. Um, which is really all you want to do. Obviously, I'm not recommending that you use a VPN for something that, with a severe threat model. Um, that, that would be a terrible idea. Uh, but this is the simple fact. There are many cases when one might want to hide their IP address, not from a government, but just from other users. There are many services and protocols and, and things which expose your IP address uh, to, to other users or, or webmaster or something like that, uh, which you might just not want for various reasons. In that case, that is a good use case for a VPN. The I, I don't understand why, the, like... The argument against VPNs is, well, if, if, if the government wants to get your information, they can subpoena and whatever. And that's probably true. I mean, it depends on in what country the VPN is hosted or like it. It depends on some things, but let's just assume that it's true. And let's also assume that all VPN providers are lying when they say they don't take logs and all of them, all of them. Uh, like, let's give everyone an assumption of the lowest possible trust. Every VPN provider will share your information with anyone who asks and will also keep logs and so on, even if they claim that they don't. Let's, let's make the worst possible case uh, assumption. That, that which you put, that's fine. <laughs> like, that's, that doesn't, the, yeah, if your threat model is the government, then sure, your a VPN doesn't meet your requirements. But people who claim that the only use case for VPNs is to change your, your region so that you can see something that's region logged are simply wrong. Like, if you're torrenting something, for example, um, you know, using a VPN uh, might be good because your ISP might report, let's say, like, in a, in a typical scenario, it might be good because your ISP might be someone who would tattletale on you or get concerned if they see that you're torrenting some some piece of media but uh, a VPN provider is less likely to care about that sort of thing um, or pretty much very unlikely to care about that sort of thing so they're not going to do it that's one example but an even better example is the BitTorrent protocol exposes your IP to everyone else everyone who is seeding the torrent or uh, leeching off of you or anything can see your IP, and you just might not want that. It's completely reasonable to not want that, and so changing your IP address through mask, like masking your IP address through VPN, in that scenario, just to prevent other users from seeing your IP, is completely fucking reasonable. The idea that that's in, that that's like not a use case is insane. I would like to talk about artificial intelligence. <laughs> Or as I've recently taken to calling it, pseudo-intelligence. I kind of hate talking about this subject. On the one hand, because it's been talked about to death by everyone, especially when the AI hype train was was going crazy, when ChatGPT and, and all of these things. Uh, 
But one strong reason why I dislike talking about AI is because AI is a is meaningless. It's a, literally a meaningless phrase. It doesn't mean anything. There there are numerous technologies which are completely unrelated to each other or almost completely unrelated to each other, which all get grouped in as AI. Like the idea that diffusion models and large language models are like the same thing. <laughs> it's it's they have some similarities. They have they both you know they have a, f- a few similarities, but they produce very different. They're different things. You can't really lump all of this stuff in as just AI. Um, not to mention the other uses for the term AI, like people used to call chessbots AI. We call the systems that govern NPC behavior in video games AI. Uh, you know, there's a, there's there's numerous. <laughs> There are, there are numerous different things which are all called AI and often bear no relation to each other or only tangential relation to each other. Um, and what's interesting about that is that the vast majority of them, like, aren't AI in any, like, in they, they aren't even pseudo-intelligent. They don't claim to be. Like, no one thinks... It makes sense to call the systems which drive NPC behavior in video games AI, in a sense. Right, like, hey, they're they're NPC AI. That's that makes sense because it's sort of a simulation of intelligence. But calling a diffusion model image generator an AI is meaningless because there's no, and no point is that supposed to simulate intelligence. It you you could call it a neural net, you could call it machine learning, but it, it's calling it AI is insane. Which is why I I don't even people who freak out about AI art is very odd because there's no such thing as AI art. There's no, because there's no, like diffusion models aren't artificially intelligent in any, any sense of the word. Um, so I, I don't, I don't know why people like to do that. There's been some very strange nomenclature that I have strong, uh, opposition towards, but the big one is obviously large language models, stuff like chat GPT, Google Bud, Bing, whatever that one's called, Copilot, Microsoft Copilot, that's it. Those are the big ones. Um, and of all of the things that have been called AI, this one, these chatbots are the closest to something which resembles AI, you know? Uh, something which resembles pseudo-intelligence. Now, I've had I've had various opinions about AI uh, in its general conceived you know, just like vagueness, it's a large language model, it's a diffusion network, it's whatever, a diffusion model, it's whatever, right, so let me, uh, and my opinions have changed, my positions have changed, so I'm gonna just sort of put them all here, uh, first of all, in the past, I've come out with very hesitant, critical support for, uh, diffusion generated art, I've, I've never had strong support of this, um, but, this is my this is my reasoning. Um, it's weaker than it used to be. My support is even more critical and weaker than it used to be. But but it is it is effectively this that like uh, I actually did make a video about this. It was called a lukewarm defense of that shitty AI video or something. It was about the corridor digital anime rock paper scissors video, in which I effectively said, I don't think that video is good. And I also don't think that the vast majority of diffusion generated um, images have much artistic merit. Uh, I have seen some which do have artistic merit, in my opinion. Um, so it's not impossible. And I it could be interesting as a tool. Uh, but that doesn't really matter because people are allowed to make bad art if they want to. And it's, it, you, it's okay. It's, it doesn't bother me if people make... I mean, the main the main selling point of the, or the the main people who are particularly interested in using those sorts of image generators are like graphic designers who would have been making dog shit art by hand anyway. It's so it's like you you choose between dog shit graphic designers or dog shit diffusion models. It's gonna suck either way, so I don't really care about it. Obviously, there are some graphic designers who could do good work. And there are some prompts which produce some interesting results on uh, stable diffusion or whatever. But to me, the quality of the art isn't particularly relevant. Um, you know, I've seen some interesting stuff. The majority of it sucks. It's just like all art. 
<laughs> the same can be said of paintings. I've seen some interesting stuff, but the majority of it sucks. Uh, it does, but but that does. It's not a strong argument one way or the other because I think people should be allowed to make bad art that I don't really care for. So that's fine. The real question. There's there's two other uh, large questions when it comes to that, which is number one, is it going to put people out of a job, and is that bad? And number two, um, uh, is is it plagiarism? Is it is it copyright infringement? Is this is this also a problem? Because it's in more brazen terms, is it theft? And this applies to large language models as well. So uh, the the conclusion I've come to is in, in accordance with my views on copyright in general, which is that if you put some art out there, you've put it out there. And the idea that you should be able to charge rent and sort of squat on your uh, your art forever is is a, a, a net negative for humanity. You know, I, I, I think if you put something on the internet, uh, it's impossible to steal a digital file. Well, it's not impossible. You could take the, the physical hard drive that it's on and deprive someone of it. But the real problem with theft is that it, it deprives someone of something, right? Like if, if you have uh, some physical CD and I steal that CD from you, you now can't listen to the album. But if you have some digital files and I copy them, now we both have those files. And this, this also relates to labor. It takes a negligible amount of labor and effort and energy to copy a digital file. So the idea that's, that there's some inherent value to physical objects doesn't apply if i if i want another cd I, someone has to get paid and a bunch of resources have to be spent um time time and energy and resources have to be expended in order to produce that that cd so i can have one but a digital file the amount of of resources that it takes to copy some ones and zeros for an mp3 file is is like negligible it's it's almost zero so um I think arguments about it, arguments from that perspective are a little unusual to me. They rely on the concept of intellectual property, uh, which I think is a pretty spooky idea. I don't think it it's a it's a it's a legal concept, which in my opinion hasn't done anything to actually protect artists. It ha it hasn't really done much. It seems to generate the modern uh, landscape. It seems to be one of the the prime generators behind the modern economic landscape of, of, of the arts, which is to say that 99.9% .9 of artists in any given field are starving, underpaid, like not making any money effectively. Uh, normally they have to have some other job and basically do art as a hobby. Or if they can manage to scrape out a career, they are starving artists who are barely able to, to eke out enough money and are given very little creative freedom on the works that they do take and so on. Right. And then 0.1% of artists are billionaire, super famous celebrities with infinite money and resources. Um, and I think copyright, we, that world has been produced. That world is the, what we live in. And it's been produced in part by copyright law and by the concept of intellectual property. Um, a lot of the hardline, super, super hardline defenders of copyright law are people who have gotten rich on copyright law. So I, I watched a video uh, once of a guy who's, uh, I believe he was like a funk or soul musician in the 70s, and his music has been sampled a lot by uh, hip hop groups. And he was talking about how, uh, you know, how he likes it and, and it's all great. But you look into it a little bit and it's actually the case that he sued a bunch of these people and he's happy with it. And he even talks about this in the video. He's only happy with it because he got money out of it. And not only did he get money, he's incredibly rich. He's a multi-millionaire because of the, the royalties that he's paid on other people's music. You know, he didn't make any decisions. <laughs> it, he wasn't involved. In, I don't know who sampled him, but he was not involved in... It wasn't his idea to sample X piece of the song and turn it into a, a rap a banger. You know, he, he had zero creative input on that... Uh, artistic creation the idea that he should make enough money off of it to get rich and the original creator you know should have to compensate him to me it seems like insane right the example i always give is is this like let's take a taylor swift if i were to uh sample 
some Taylor Swift song and transform it into something new and unique and interesting in my own music and release that on an album. I don't see any reasoning by which Taylor Swift can be can be given ownership over that piece because I, at no point did she have any ideas that contributed to that piece. I simply took something from the artistic canon and transformed it by my own creativity. The meaning of the piece is completely distinct from anything Taylor Swift ever intended. So how if art is is about imbuing meaning onto objects, how can she possibly claim to have have any it's insane to me. But then even to go beyond that, if I were to take a Taylor Swift song and not modify it in any way, if I were to just literally take a Taylor Swift song and then re-release it myself, and then perhaps even claim that I made it. Now this, I you know, I don't support that necessarily. I would like people to give attribution. But if I were to do that, if I were to take a Taylor Swift song, release it unchanged as a no thank you song, that would also have a completely different meaning. <laughs> you know, people would see that and the context of the art would change change it completely. If you, if you had saw that, it would no longer be about... I don't know what Taylor Swift writes about, probably ex-boyfriends or something like this, right? It wouldn't be about Taylor's ex. It would be now some sort of artistic statement about the nature of copyright and, uh, I don't know, something like that, right? Uh, so even in that situation, I think Taylor wouldn't have a good claim to ownership over that. Um, and so once you run this this logic to its conclusion... It's pretty hard to come away from that thinking that language, large language models or, or diffusion models somehow owe uh, something to the artists, to the original artists. Um, now, there's an there's a important other thing to mention here, which is about a sort of pragmatic attitude. Uh, do you want to live in, in the world that you're asking for? Uh, because... These diffusion models, they don't sample. They use some particular statistic algorithm to uh, reproduce a style rather than... Like, that's really what people are mad about. It's not necessarily... Like, if you ask a diffusion model to... You, you could say, right, give me a painting in the style of this artist, and then a diffusion model can produce a painting in that style, possibly, right? If it's been trained on it. Uh, but that painting will be novel. It won't be a direct reproduction of anything that artist has ever done. So in order to actually legislate against this, you would have to give, uh, you'd have to give people the right to copyright style, which is to me a horrific idea. This this is an incredibly terrible idea. Like I don't understand why people can't immediately recognize how bad of an idea this is because. Style is an incredibly vague thing. It's impossibly vague. It's just going to give the giant art corporations like Disney untold power over which art people are allowed to produce anymore. It's going to make loads and loads of art completely illegal to produce because it might be in a style that is too similar to someone else's. That seems fucking terrible. That seems like a terrible idea. I don't want to live in a world where people can go around copywriting artistic styles. Um, so so let's not do that. Uh, now, there is um, something else to consider here, though, which is that if I go along and I sample a Taylor Swift song, or even, to my extreme example, re-release a Taylor Swift song under my own name, I have in some way modified the original work and it doesn't serve as a replacement for the original work which is in the same way that if i copy a digital file you still have access to the original digital file and so it's not theft but in the case of of these um uh diffusion models there's an argument to be made that they are training these models on uh certain corporate art and then they're going to replace the, the artists that they train the models on with the models. So actually, it is going to literally put people out of work and serve as a direct replacement for the original. And that I, is obviously a problem. <laughs> That's obviously not good. Um, but the solution to that, it would obviously be something along the lines of uh, 
you know, this, this, that solution would have to come in the form of, of money from the government, not, uh, you know, I, obviously it's not a bad thing to have certain regulations on tech companies, but, you know, I think most corporate artists and graphic designers, I would hope would rather be doing more interesting stuff with their time anyway. What I would like to see is would be something like an expansion of arts uh, grants programs uh, in order to recompensate artists so they have they don't have to worry about their job security so much uh, and they can just get paid a wage from the government. Now, that also has problems in, you know, uh, the sense that it, it may incentivize that uh, this is the libertarian argument against that would be well in that case they would cut you off if you made art that criticized the government or something like that and to those people i say well you don't have to sit here and theorize in fact most european countries do have uh grant programs for for the arts and if you actually look at the stuff they make it's fucking always critical of the government <laughs> like it's always batshit insane movies about how whatever country is giving the money is like a fascist dystopia uh and how we should all be communists or whatever like they all they all like that and they're all full of sex and drugs and violence and they're all really experimental and fucked up like you you watch some film some european movie that's the most fucked up thing ever and it says at the beginning funded by the arts council of germany or something like that like you always see this if you're if you're, you this is very common i mean an example that I even wrote about is uh, Throb and Gristle. Before Throb and Gristle was Throb and Gristle, they were an, a performance art collective called Coom Transmissions. And they would do batshit insane performance art uh, where they would like all get naked and then like stab each other and stuff like that. Like it was, it was just, you know, exactly what you think of when you think of weird ass performance art. Like everyone was, was doing pain and getting naked and sex and, and all that sort of thing. And they were funded by the British Art Council, like doing th that sort of thing. And to this day, there are similar artists and groups that like, that's how it tends to be. So that idea to me that the, this will become like some government censorship thing. I mean, even to give an, an extreme example, uh, you can look at art in the Soviet Union where, uh, you know, this actually leads back to something to a, a, this is more maybe a, a bigger argument, which is actually under capitalism, we have a much bigger problem, which is that you're only allowed to make art that makes any money if it appeals to consumers, if it's uh, going to make a lot of, you know, you're only allowed to make uh, like that, that sort of art censorship because the idea, okay, so the, here's the dystopia. The dystopia is, uh, oh yeah, the government will give you money to make art. But if you make the wrong kind of art, they'll cut you off from the funds. But in the Soviet Union, uh, you know, there, there's a, a, a some sort of interview with uh, George Lucas where he talks about how the artists in the Soviet Union were much more free. Because in capitalist America, you get cut off from the funds if you make anything interesting and experimental that's niche and, uh, you know, not going to appeal to to a broad consumer base. So, which I think is a... A much more common issue with art and in fact although there were problems with the soviet system later big problems very big problems uh you know in practice we've i think we can see that these sorts of art grants programs don't produce the problems that libertarians would say that they do but let's assume the worst let's assume that this is how you've run your country and then some fascist takes power or some dictator takes power and decides to clamp down on artistic freedom. Firstly, they would do that regardless of whether or not the majority of art was publicly funded or not. But secondly, there is also a, a, a better and broader solution to this problem. And that solution is if you're really afraid that this is going to become a means-tested program, simply do not do that. <laughs> There's a concept uh, called universal basic income where the government just gives everyone money. And at this point, it has been trialed so many times in so many different places and economies on, wild, on, on large enough scales that we can be reasonably confident that this is a good idea. Universal basic income 
is a good idea. And uh, simply providing a universal basic income for citizens uh, or for, for everyone in the country would solve this problem. Because now artists aren't terrified of the idea that their art is going to be stolen from them and they're not going to be able to have a livelihood anymore because they're going to get fired and replaced with a, a robot. Just like everyone is worried that they're going to get fired and replaced with a robot, I just went somewhere and it, I've been there a bunch of times and uh, it was the doctors. I don't know why I'm being vague about this. I went. To the, this doesn't really make sense because this is not a... Uh, this is not a corporation, this is the NHS, but I went to the doctors, they've fucking gotten rid of all of the receptionists, and it's just a robot now, it's just a, a fucking broken touchscreen interface that you use, it sucked, I fucking hated it, I hated using it, it's, it was terrible, <laughs> I, 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 I didn't, it didn't even work, it, it didn't even register my appointment the first time, I had to do it twice, it was, it was terrible, but this is the sort of thing that's happening everywhere, I should also say that a lot of these automation things, they don't really make anything automated. They just outsource the labor to a third world country. It's just some Filipino person doing it instead of uh, someone in your country. Anyway, so if you're worried about that, so effectively, if you're worried about um, uh, diffusion models making, putting visual artists out of a job, firstly, you probably shouldn't be because those models suck and require human oversight anyway uh and secondly uh you should be advocating for at the very minimum an expansion of arts grant programs government grants to the arts if they even exist in your country uh in the first place and to a large degree you should be advocating for ubi uh that's the real solution here um okay that was not really what i wanted to talk about what I wanted to talk about more was large language models. I got distracted talking about copyright because I always do, but large language models are what's in, uh, are, are maybe more interesting because it's it's much less cut and dry in my opinion. Um, so, by the way, I'm not against if you want to make Microsoft or or Google or all of the, or OpenAI or whoever pay people you know have to pay compensation to train off of their work, that's fine by me. I'm not going to complain about that because I, I mean, first of all, I, I, th I think I would probably get some money out of that. I, I reckon that I've been trained on. Uh, it's likely. So, you know, that, that seems fine to me. Um, but I, I, I don't think you have to because AI is already kind of a, a bad product that is just being sold on hype and snake oil. So that's the second thing that I've really changed my opinion. This is the, the, the big thing. So uh, I made a video quite a while ago and the video opened with a commentary on the the particular bing ai that had just recently been released at that point and i said you th oh it's just a large language model with access to the internet my brother in christ you are just a large language model with access to the internet and this is something that i regret saying because it's not true um in fact large language models are not intelligent in any sense of the word they're statistical models that predict what will come next in the text or predict how to respond to a text um and the idea that they're even good at it is nonsense uh i i have actually very little faith in people who think that large language models are intelligent it's quite uh, unusual to me because um it it doesn't seem at the at the time I was interested in this idea that like language is strongly linked to to intelligence in humans. Um, you know, maybe something to do with universal grammar, Chomsky stuff, and maybe something to do with Wittgenstein. You know, I was just interested in that idea. But upon doing more and more research into this area, I've become a bit more skeptical. I do believe that there is some relation between uh human intelligence and language i think it's a strong relation um but i think that i don't know i, ha I have i i i'm less i'm i no longer believe that like language is the single driver of intelligence in humans um and to the extent in which it is it's the social capacities that language enables rather than language itself which which drives these particular features of human intelligence um, so that's interesting, I suppose. But yeah, at the time, I, I guess I was just 
uh, more convinced of the idea that human brains might also be be sort of algorithms that statistically predict what word is going to come next. And, you know, I'm not necessarily in the camp that believes human intelligence is some particularly unique uh, or miraculous thing. Like, to an extent, what we do is just sort of predict what's going to come next. That is kind of how our brains work. Um, but to a larger extent, that has nothing to do with how our brains work. That is a tiny segment of how our, our consciousness works. The major- the vast majority of gray matter in our brain is not is not doing performing tasks related to that um so the idea that large large language models uh, are actually intelligent is or capable of reasoning in particular that that is just not true and that is like provably untrue if you spend any time interacting with one uh so just as an example of this uh, the so-called hallucinations um hallucinations are baked into the way that large language models work they're never going to go away um they're never going to find a way to fix them because uh it's it's simply baked into the way they work they are statistical models they 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 will never not hallucinate they will always just make shit up and this is the fundamental reason why they're basically useless so one common usage for large language models uh that that i've seen is to help in programming and this has been pushed pretty hard. So, because I'd heard about that, when I was programming my video game, Free Fish Game, I tried to uh, use ChatGPT and Copilot as a tool to write some code for me. And what I found was that these programs are exceptionally bad at writing code, and that it was almost always faster for me to just research myself and figure out how to write the code myself, rather than to get uh, Copilot to write code that it doesn't work, then I have to figure out why it doesn't work anyway. Now, that's not to say it was incapable of doing anything. It was actually helpful in some situations, um, mainly because it could, particularly Bing, the Copilot Bing thing, uh, it could read through numerous articles and summarize them all into one uh, blob of text, which was sometimes useful. Um, And it could also it was it was good at writing like very simple stuff like one line of code it could do that and and it would work sometimes but it also did just make stuff up it constantly hallucinated just to the point where it, like it was just inventing commands that didn't exist it was it was just completely hallucinating and it was impossible to get it to stop uh and given that that is writing code is supposedly one of the things that these large language models are better at <laughs> That has that has significantly tempered my expectations for how good these are going to be. Uh, it's simply they they hallucinate too much, and something that is particularly worrying about that is that um, larger models. So so the the trend is okay. These AI models, GPT or whatever, GPT one sucked. GPT two was really bad. But GP like by the time but you keep scaling it up, you keep scaling up the nodes in the network, and they get better and better and better. Like GPT three, much better. GPT four, much much better, and so on. Like as as long as you just make the large language models bigger and bigger and bigger, and you put more and more resources and money, you know, server resources and money into it, they get better and better and better. Um, but the fact is that actually, hallucinations, big bigger. Uh, models hallucinate more. Um, every single uh, large language model hallucinates. It's it's always halluc. It's just made up shit. It's just bad. They don't. They just lie to you. The idea that these things are useful is insane. Like they they the bigger they are, the worse they get. At, like you need them to be as big as possible to have as much information as possible to be broadly applicable and useful. But the bigger they are, the more they hallucinate and make stuff up, which makes them not useful. So it's a, it's a, ter- it just seems like a bad idea to me. Um, it just seems like like not very good technology. Um, and there's there's a if you are sitting here and thinking, well, I've had conversations with uh, ChatGPT or or whatever, and I I feel like it has some sort of intelligence just based on my conversations with it. 
I highly recommend you read this article. It's called um, L M L L Mentalist. L L Mentalist. Uh, the L L Mentalist effect. L L M M Mentalist. L L Mentalist effect. How chat-based large language models replicate the mechanics of a psychic's con by Boulder Bjornsson. Um, this is a, a pretty good article which goes through the mechanisms by which uh, psychic, psychics, con artists, psychics uh, use things like cold reading and the Barnum effect, or sorry, Barnum statements, um, uh, and uh, priming their audience and all of these other things in order to trick people into believing that they have psychic powers to the point where they can sometimes even fool themselves and then it goes on to draw corollaries between the way large language models operate uh, in order to fool people into believing that they have some sort of intelligence and it's very convincing uh, at least it was to me the parallels seem uh, pretty strong and especially what I like about it is that at the end of the article, they go on to say, th uh, this Boulder Bjornsson individual goes on to say, uh, here, I will, I will just read it out for you. Is this intentional? Given that there are billions of dollars at stake in the tech industry, it would be tempting to assume that the statistical illusion of intelligence was intentionally created by people in the tech industry. I personally think that's extraordinarily unlikely. A popular response to various government conspiracies is that government institutions just aren't that good at keeping secrets. Well, the tech industry just isn't that good at software. The illusion is, honestly, too clever to have been created intentionally by those making it. And this definitely goes with everything I know about the tech industry. That, like, yeah, they would have done something like this by accident and then fallen for it themselves. That 100% <laughs> cracks with everything I know about the tech industry. They would have 100% accidentally created a scam that they don't realize is a scam and then fallen for it themselves. Um, so yeah, that's my real opinion on these large language models. At a certain point, especially when they were new and exciting and I hadn't done any real research into how they worked, um, I thought that it was possible that they had some form of intelligence. Um, and there's also a lot of hype being generated where they demonstrate that it can pass certain tests. Uh, but passing certain tests is not the same thing as producing intelligence. Uh, it's all kind of nonsense. It's just all kind of snake oil salesmanship. Uh, they are, they, I mean, yeah, they just to, to just completely crib from this article, uh, which you should read, okay? It's on a website called softwarecrisis.dev. Um, so, you know, it's, I'm just going to crib from this article, but you should read the full thing. Uh, that they, you know, they follow the same pattern as a, a psychic. They they have audience self-selection. They set the scene through through hype and anthropo anthropomorphization. Uh, then they establish content through or context via prompts, uh, and the audience tends to self-select via prompts. Like if you 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 might not even realize you're doing it. When I read this, I was I was like, oh yeah, I've done that without even thinking about it. If you're talking to a chatbot and, it, and, and you're trying to talk to it like you would talk to a person, you give some prompt and it gives a weird response or some sort of hallucination that you didn't expect or, or interprets the prompt in a way you didn't expect or something like that, you're likely to just repeat the same prompt with different phrasing until you get an answer that you want. And it's very easy to do that and then forget that you had to do that in order to get a response that made any sense or was the, the desired response. And then to conclude, ah, oh, the thing is actually much better than I anticipated, even though in reality, you, you were just priming. It was it was all you. Uh, and uh, then the, the fact that those large language models, they it's similar to the Barnum effect where they, they oh, sorry, Barnum statements where they, they give statements that seem specific, but are in fact statistically uh, generic, statistically common. So like, for example, if I said to you uh, th 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 something like, you know, would you say that in your childhood, 
I wouldn't necessarily say your parents were overly strict, but they definitely had a path that they wanted you to go down and they tried to push you towards. That's a statement that I've seen psychics use, and it's a, just something that applies to almost everyone. Because it's, it's, it sounds kind of specific, but it's incredibly generic. It's just your parents had a path that they, everyone's parents are like that. And then there's stuff even like uh, you have a scar on, on one of your knees. That's also just something very specific, very common. People fall down and land on their knees all the time. If they're going to have an injury, it's going to be on their knees. Um, or like, uh, do you have someone in your family who's recent, who's who's passed away or is maybe still with us? or uh, some relative or something with a name. I'm, I'm getting it begins with a, a J, maybe Ja or J. This is the, the J names are very common. They're more common than you think. Uh, that one's less good. It works specifically with like slightly older demographics than my audience. Uh, so like people in their 40s and 50s, that would work better with. Um, but there's a lot of stuff like that. It's like you give sort of vague statements uh, that that sound sound specific but are actually statistically generic but when psychics are doing it they're just saying statistically generic things that they've memorized or researched but when large language models are doing it they have actual mathematically statistically generic statements like they have you know an impossibly large selection of text uh, which they can use to generate mathematically generic responses and so, of course, we, with our stupid human brains, fall for that. Uh, and if you don't, your tent. This is the thing: is if you don't, if you don't, if you don't find that convincing, at any point, if if you are like, this is what happened to me, uh, when I when Google released the new version of Bard, I tried talking with it for a bit, and then it just started hallucinating, and so I just turned it off and was like, oh, that sucks, but. There is, a, and that's going to happen to a lot of people. But there are some people who, the, the people who, the people are going to self select, right? There are going to be certain people for whom it starts hallucinating and they're, they're willing to keep trying and keep engineering different prompts in order to get the answers that they want and so on. And they're going to self select for something that, that can, you know what I mean? They're pushing themselves deeper. Uh, so, like, the, it's just like a psychic, like a, a, a psychic audience. Um, the psychic knows how to, to pin a mark who's going to be particularly um, susceptible to vague statements or cold reading and stuff like this um, out of an audience. And it's the same thing with large language models. It just happens by accident. Uh, anyway, then the next one, uh, the the subjective validation loop. It's, it, it's basically just just the the more the more it happens, it feels. Like if 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 uh, uh, whatever, it does. I'm not gonna read this whole fucking thing article out for you. You can go read it yourself. But anyway, I found this pretty convincing, in in terms of the the fact that AI sucks at doing what it does, and it also just reaffirmed in my own mind my own experiences with AI that like some of the the pro LLM people tend to talk about it as if it's sort of a miraculous technology, but um, you know, even if I would want to believe something like that, as I have in the past, um, it doesn't actually fit with my own experiences talking to any of these chatbots. That when I actually engage with these chatbots, they just give incredibly generic and boring answers to all of my questions. They never seem to have any original thought. Uh, they talk in a really weird way. Like, and you, you've noticed this, I'm sure. Like, there's a particular style. It's almost overly wordy. I'm not entirely sure how to explain it, but uh, they, you know, they they just talk weird. <laughs> they just they don't have another word for it. They just talk weird, and it's kind of awkward language, and they love, like, both sides in every issue. It, it, like, if you... I don't know why they do that. It sucks. They, like... It just... The, the, I, I, the, my previous ideas about AI, or in particular large language models didn't really gel with my personal experience to, uh, with them, but I had just kind of dismissed that, right, because I've seen screenshots and other people talking about it, but after thinking about it more, it's like, yeah, actually, every time I personally have interacted with, with one of these large language models, that, like, they suck, they hallucinate, they're not useful for 
like they just make stuff up <laughs> like they, they the, that's the that's the real meat of the issue they don't understand uh like they don't have any way to to know about facts the way a human would the way something intelligent would understand the concept of like fact and reality or reason like that's just reasoning isn't this a pure purely disprove any idea that these things are intelligent if intelligence is the ability to reason reason is the intelli- is like you know you can make some statement about the world that makes sense uh and these models seem incapable of doing that therefore they can't reason therefore they're not intelligent because they just make stuff up because it doesn't make any sense or doesn't gel with evidence um so you know that's where i'm at these days i wanted to clarify it because i have some older videos where i'm a little more pro ai or pi calling it ai is just been a terrible idea we got we got to start calling it pseudo intelligence because that's really what it is um yeah they just are not even useful they're also one final critique they're bad technology by all of the the means in which i judge technology they're incredibly inefficient use of of they're an incredibly inefficient use of computer resources and energy resources like they are impossibly resource intensive to the point where really the only people who can train larger models are giant tech companies and so of course it's being pushed like crazy because it's a technology that the average consumer is not going to have access to unless they rent it from a massive company with a huge server farm um most of the tasks like okay what's a task that a large language model might do it might write a book okay is it better to have uh you know massive amounts of of electricity uh you know massive amounts of mining and server infrastructure and all the infrastructure required to cool the server farm and all of the people you know all of the resources it's an incredibly large amount of resources and money and stuff that goes into that is it better to have that to write a book or a fucking like typewriter or a pen and paper or a laptop even with with libre office or something like you know it just doesn't it's just a really and then your brain it just seems like a very odd use of it seems like a really inefficient use of resources or to draw a picture is it a better use of resources to do all of that i mean there was actually a good response to corridor digital did a second ai video and uh they 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 this time trained it on uh art that they had had bought the permissions for themselves like they had commissioned some some artist and they had trained the model exclusively on that artist uh, and so there was no ethical concerns in terms of stealing um which the audience had brought up before and then they put out that video and the video sucked because card or digital don't know anything about anime and they don't really have very good story writing skills so uh you know they should go back to making like what if minecraft was in real life <laughs> they should go back to that it was much more fun when they did that um but the thing people concluded was like okay so you had to have loads of really high end computers and a whole bunch of technical know-how and all of these programs and and, and computing resources working for hours and hours and you know days and days training these models and then all sorts of of prompt engineering and then you had to go out and film the base footage which you fed into the model which like transformed it into a, a sort of animated style and you had to like hire an artist who like this just seems like a bad way to do animation because with I can do animation with a pad of paper and a pencil you know like that's all that, that's this it's, it's not a good use of resources like why not just hire an animator at that point you know just commission an animator to do it um it seems like it doesn't really the idea that this democratizes animation or certain things isn't really true it just means it's the opposite it makes it pay to pay to win <laughs> it's like if you can afford a whole bunch of computers and shit uh yeah but it's it's not actually a good use of resources because it just does the stuff that we can already do but worse and with more resources so there you go that's my stupid opinions on ai when there's a process of initiativeification of some software or website or whatever 
um, it is often driven by uh, money, right? It's often <clears throat> it's often the case that uh, let's take like Uber for example as the classic the classic example. At first, they undercut all of the local taxi services in wherever they migrate to uh, by just charging much cheaper fees, and they lose money. And they're running on investor funds. And then, once they have a monopoly on the market, they raise prices so that they can recoup their losses. Uh, And this happens in lots of different uh, cases. Like, since the model, since the startup tech company model is, uh, you know, run on investor funds until you can get as big a market share as possible uh, and then figure out how to make money later, you're always going to be in a situation where suddenly people are going to be panicking and throwing ads and subscription services and raising prices and all of these sorts of things. This is the common narrative around desertification, and it's the most popular form uh, or cause of desertification. But there is another one. There is another cause or form which I think is underappreciated. It's not quite as harmful as the previous form, but it does come into play. And that is simply that once you make something, it's kind of like done, right? Like you hire a bunch of front end developers or something, and they make the front end. And then the front end is just made, and you don't need another one, you know? And so these people stay on payroll, and they kind of, I think it's a bullshit job scenario where you see websites updating their UI all the time for no reason. When the previous UI was perfectly fine to modernize it or whatever, I think it's because these people are like, they, they, they shouldn't be hired anymore. Like, they got hired to do a particular job. They finished doing that job. Like, something like the back end, you know, that thing's going to be need to be maintained all the time. Or, you know, there, there's there's aspects of running a tech company where you're going to need to do continuous treadmill work. You know, things are going to break all the time, etc. And so you need to have, like, devs on staff for every part of your product. But the, the problem is that there are some parts that just won't break. And if they do, it'll be very infrequently. And I think these people get bored. And I think the companies feel like... Uh, <clears throat> you know, middle management. It's really middle management's fault, actually. It's it's not necessarily the devs themselves. Like, it's often front-end devs, right? The people who are making UIs and, and front pages and, and so on. I It's often these people because, because these guys, I mean, this is the only customer-facing, this is the customer-facing part, right? Like, if some company makes a change to the database structure in the back-end, uh, who who gives a shit? <laughs> like we don't we don't we don't know or care that that happened. Um, so it's I think it's a situation where middle management is like, well, you put me in charge of this group of people, but they've already done their job, and I feel like I need to delegate more tasks to them and give them more busy work in order to justify the fact that I'm in charge of this group of people that doesn't really need a manager. They can kind of do their own thing. This is very David Graeber bullshit jobs-esque, right? But I also think that those devs are bored because and they're feeling, feeling strange because they're on payroll for a job that they've already completed, but they're not... I don't understand. I don't understand the, the whole ways that these, these things work. It's very strange to me. Um, and I think this is what... Like, there was nothing wrong with YouTube's design from 2007. There was nothing wrong with it. In fact, in many ways, it was better than what we, it's. It's better, the 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 customization that someone could do to their own channel's page. It was not just better. You could put any image you wanted, and 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 make all sorts of crazy changes to the way your channel page looked. Wasn't that nice? Do you guys remember that? I remember that. It was great. Can't do that shit anymore. Or to give a very recent example, uh, Discord. Discord mobile app used to be fine. It's just like any mobile app. Mobile apps are never good. No one really enjoys using them. At least I would hope not. Especially for something like Discord, a messaging platform 
where most of what you're going to be doing is typing, and everyone, I mean, I would assume everyone hates as much as me typing on a shitty fucking smartphone touchscreen keyboard. It's the worst. I, no, one, <laughs> no one wants to do it. I, and having a chat platform on a, on a fucking phone, you know, it's, it, it's whatever. But the Discord mobile app used to be fine. And then they just changed it for no reason. You know, like, they, they just changed it for no reason. And I think it's because whatever team is in charge of mobile app, uh, you know, UX, is just, like, some fucking middle manager is like, well, we got to redesign the mobile app now so that I can give you work to do, so that I can manage you, you know? This is why, you know, it's, 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 it's showing the principles of Stafford Beer in action that people have the ideas of management completely backwards. Like, in, within a company like that, management shouldn't be delegating, like, that kind of management. Middle, middle manager, uh, like, system two uh, type uh, roles shouldn't, shouldn't be delegating work. They shouldn't be coming into the office every day and telling people, you got to do this, you got to... That's not how it should work. It's the opposite. That team, whatever whatever team it is that, that does mobile app uh, UX or, or whatever, um, they, they should be self-managing and they should only go to the manager when they need some sort of external assistance, you know? That's the point. That's the point of management. That's how you have a viable system. You don't, you don't have system one can't do anything until... or, like, unable to self-direct... And it, I mean, yeah, this is the reason why things suck, by the way. It's because we, we've we known, uh, ever since Stafford Beer wrote, uh, hold on, what's that book called? The Brain of the Firm? Is that what it's called? Uh, hold on. Uh, yeah, Brain of the Firm. Ever since he wrote Brain of the Firm in 1972, we've known how to solve these problems. And yet, no one does it, <laughs> because no one reads that book. It's insane. But, yeah. So, here, let me explain it to you. So, the way it should work is you have some team like that, and they're self-managing and self-directing uh, within the scope of the, the the company, right? Like, you have... But that's not middle management's job, right? That's, that's like... Middle management would be, like, system two. Th- that sort of thing would be... A, a higher systems job basically saying this is what we need on delegating it. and uh hold on let me let me get this image up so i could refer to this myself so yeah system two it's all the problem of the not understanding excuse me people who do, they just don't i don't know man no one fucking understands this shit it's it's like you should only be sending signals up the chain of of management if something's gone wrong. That's the that's the basic principle here. If something has gone wrong, that's when you send a signal up the chain. And the signals should only be going down the chain if something's gone wrong, you know? That's it's not very complicated. It's it's it, it's like a there's actually a funny enough, you know who wrote kind of something similar to this is Nick Land. Uh and like modern Nick Land. There were he wrote a, an article called uh Cold Anarchism or something or Cold Anarchy. Um and that was it's a strange it's a very strange article, but he's in his sort of libertarian critique of of government, he compares a uh, a country to a an organism, to an animal and uh, the the population of that animal, or, or of that sorry, the population of the country is like the the organs and internal, you know, internals, internal organs, physical body, limbs, so on, of the animal, and then the government is like the brain, and he says the brain isn't consciously aware of its internal organs, of its of its internals. Uh, the the brain isn't consciously, you know, I mean, I, I was going to try and rephrase that in a way that made a bit more sense, but I think it already made sense. Uh, the brain isn't consciously aware of, like, its liver unless something has gone wrong. The brain doesn't, you don't have to think about 
the workings of your internal organs unless something has gone wrong an animal doesn't worry about uh you know it's it's stomach unless it's hungry you know like unless there's some or to give a more maybe more extreme example like you don't have to worry about your skin unless it's been cut you don't have to worry about your kidney unless it's failing right like you don't think about you don't generally speaking think about your internal organs unless something's gone wrong otherwise the brain is only um interested in the external environment and i don't know if he's consciously parroting stafford beer but that is also very uh, so you know he's basically saying that's how a government should work right Gov although he phrases it in a bit of a strange way he's like governments should only be engaged with the game of princes <laughs> which is like a strange way of phrasing it but he means international relations um and they should they should basically leave their uh citizens alone to self self-govern uh unless something goes wrong which strangely enough is also kind of how rojava works so i don't know what the, i don't really understand that i mean that article's unusual because um it it i don't know man it's like a lot of stuff it's like he said sa he's saying something let's not talk about that that is beyond the scope let's move on but it's a similar situation where like that that bit about paying attention to the external uh to, to the environment rather that's system four's job um <clears throat> that's not you know uh okay well whatever let's let's move on the point being that if you have a system two like if you if you have some middle management thing they they should not be going around telling system one hey you got to go like do some busy work so that i can feel justified in my position if if they don't have to do if system two doesn't have to do anything if if local management middle management doesn't have to do anything then they're doing their job correctly that that should be a sign i mean this this is one of the reasons why stafford beer is like because that's obviously kind of incompatible with our concept of wage labor as we we think about it right which is why uh you know cybernetic socialism is a thing that like the principles of cybernetics and good systems design often run contrary to the design of capitalism i don't want to get too political here but uh that is the case right if, if you have uh, a, a, a system to local management <clears throat> who's doing their job right they should basically be you know doing uh, doing just a little bit they should just be doing a bare minimum of, of work most of the time unless something has gone critically wrong so like something like uh here we all i'm i'm your your boss and we organize i my job is not to tell you what to do but to organize a setup where you can tell yourself what to do and communicate that well but within your department so like i have I organize some sort of weekly meeting so that uh, everyone's on the same page within this department. I don't go into the meeting and say, like, uh, okay, I'm going to delegate this task to you. This no, no, no. That's like, the, that's backwards. That's, that's the opposite of what you should be doing. Rather, like, you need some person who is not, you know, bogged down in doing the actual work who can, I know this is not very anarchisty of me, but whatever. Uh, you know, who, someone whose job is just to make sure everyone's on the same page, basically. But they are not the page maker. They're not the the author because they don't have any direct direct view of the the work they're doing. It would be really stupid to put them in charge of 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 actually telling people what to do. Uh, like that's the diff. That's what people don't understand about management. Management is not like authorship it's not direct it's not it's not um coercion or or uh, uh i don't know instruction or at least not not mostly uh it's it's not that it's just management it's just like oh, well whatever <laughs> i don't know if this makes any sense but you can see why it goes wrong right am i crazy it you can you can clearly see the sense in which like a good a good manager should be doing very little work a, a good like like middle manager should basically be 
doing no work, <laughs> right? Um, and then <clears throat> those, like, you, you have to have some sort of, you know, reflex um, lines of communication directly from systems one to the three, four, and five. Uh, but if you look at the viable systems model, right, you don't have a situation like we have now where, like, it's, or at least like it looks like we have now, where, let's say you have a situation where, I don't know how Discord works, but let's say there's some manager who's like, I've identified this trend in the market. I was on my retreat in Bali, uh, you know, when I identified, I thought to myself, would, you know, what we really need in order to disrupt this sector is, uh, to make some radical change to our mobile app development pro protocols and, and to synergize the, the whatever, blue sky thinking, uh, you know, <laughs> like we, we need to, and so I've been thinking we need to do this and then comes in like, that, that is not your job, buddy, fuck off. That is the job of system one. The job of system one is to look at the environment and make changes to how they're doing things based on the environment. And then they're the ones that tell system two, the middle management, uh, hey, so this is the environmental, uh, this is, this is the environmental, like, systems or changes that we've noticed, uh, we're gonna need to adapt to this, so you need to communicate that up the chain to system three. That's the, that's the, the you've, they've got it fucking backwards. The job is not for middle management to communicate the orders of the higher-ups down to the actual workers. It's the exact opposite in order to make a functioning system. The job of system two is to communicate the uh, environment and necessary changes and, and all of these sorts of things up the chain to higher management who can then, you know, uh, accommodate for that. That's the fucking, and ideally, specifically to system four who should be planning for this sort of thing. That's 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 that guy's job. Um, but mostly, it's the it's the the case that like, I I don't even know how to explain this in a like app development framework, which I guess is is what we're using. But like, let's say, okay, you have whatever team. I mean, there was there should be no there should like in a in a well designed, uh, viable system like this, the Discord app wouldn't have changed. So I'm trying to think of an example of how that would have happened, but it wouldn't have happened because there's no reason for it to happen. But let's say you have some scenario where like, I don't know, uh, everyone is is constantly saying, hey, we need you to, to, to change something about this, or there's some market feedback, or some law has changed, some regulation has changed somewhere, or um, I don't know, there's infinite different reasons why the environment would cause you to change something about your, your app. Hey, the hosting provider we use, like whatever server f servers we're renting, Amazon, uh, AWS, or whatever, right? Like, uh, they've they've increased their prices, or you know, anything that could have possibly happened in the environment. That is, then those guys who are in System One, aka the the people actually doing stuff, those guys come and 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 go go to their manager and say, okay, well we've we've. And ideally, the manager that organizes this, like they say, right, we're, this has changed. We're going to need to figure out what the fuck to do. And they, they have some sort of discussion about it. And then they come away from that like, OK, well, in order to deal with that, since we're the guys actually interacting with this daily, we know what to do best because we're on the ground here. We can see the situation as it really is. Um, so we're going to have to do this, this and this. Uh, so we're going to start implementing that. Uh, go tell go tell the upper management that that's what we're doing and then the boss two, you know system two should be like okay and then they should go up and tell uh you know system three right this is what we're doing now and then system three should say great that's a that's that's exactly what we need to do uh you know whatever or perhaps they would say uh, you know, that seems like a good idea. Um, here's the resources. That's really what the, what they should be doing, right? Is like, okay, you need to make this change. Here's the resources to make that change. They shouldn't be like, 
and it, it's not that they would always do that it's possible that people would come up with a with a idea that well whatever but that's that's not their job it's not that it's not it's not your job that's that's all i got to communicate to you pe people here is like that that sort of bossing people around type of management is not your job the idea that the management means organizational principles come from the top down and daily adaptations and changes like that come from the top down this is how you end up with an elon musk type situation or even a steve jobs type situation where some ceo is like i want to make a, a car that's like a, a cyberpunk it looks like a, a ps1 game uh go do that and then all the designers are like oh fuck how are we gonna make this work oh my god and then they they have to work overtime and it's insane it sucks to work at the company and then in the end they produce a product that no one really wants and it doesn't really work because they've been for you know this fucking elon musk has no idea you know of the realities of design r d and, and manufacturing and so on although he claims he does he's obviously doesn't um otherwise he wouldn't make the decisions he does uh or even like he doesn't even really have a good idea of uh market uh you know what people actually want to buy because <laughs> tesla is is losing massively uh losing a, a grip over the the electric car ev um market in the us uh and this wouldn't be happening if they they just designed their company better because that's that should never happen you should never have some insane fucking ceo who just gets some pet project in his in his mind and is like go do that and then everyone has to do that that's and it happens all the time you can see this happen constantly with with tech products because what that guy thinks you can do is never going to be in line with reality it just simply is not going to be in line like the exact opposite opposite <laughs> the exact opposite of that should be happening it should be system one who's coming up with these sorts of of things um anyway you know it fucking is what it is let's let me just explain this to you actually in in terms of a a government rather than a corporation or a, a firm a company so in let's say you're chile with your project cybersim the way that that planned economy works is not uh some boardroom full of socialist uh, Soviet bureaucrats uh, does a bunch of mathematical calculations which are, you know, not particularly great and then decides this is how many cars we're going to need to manufacture this year and then sends that order down to the car factories who then follow that order and manufacture that many cars. That is not how the Chilean system worked and that's not how a cybernetic system should work. Rather... It's a direct um, link of communication from the car factory to the, you know, I'm doing air quotes here, market, to the uh, demand side, right? There, that, that line of communication doesn't go through higher systems. It's direct. And it is also like that in capitalism, right? Where firms react to changes in the market not because some state bureaucracy told them to that that would be a ba bad and bureaucratic overly bureaucratic slow and, and ineffective way to manage an economy so we this is one of the better aspects of capitalism it's it's quite smart this is why it was one of the, the reasons why capitalism is much more productive than feudalism right like uh if you have some command economy it's it's just too much it's just it's just going to create a uh it's just going to suck. We we all kind of intuitively know that it's going to suck, right? Uh, so, if this is the case, why can't companies organize themselves like that internally? You know? It, like, in internal to the company, the people actually doing the... If we if we all agree that in, in a, a state context, the, the upper management, the, the systems, uh, you know, three, four, and five, shouldn't be making decisions about how each subsystem uh you know modifies its production then why don't we apply that also to the recursive internal structure of each you know economic entity 
why don't we also say then upper management in a company shouldn't be dictating how the you know departments that actually do the work uh, react to changes in demand or supply or you know whatever like oh we we don't have enough steel to make whatever we're going to make materials you know any anything like that that should not be uh it's the same way your body works when when you're um you know i don't know when <laughs> when when you, you when some something about your homeostasis is out of whack right if you had to think about this consciously all the time it would suck it would be terrible instead your body just does it you know all of the it just sort of happens in the background without you ever noticing it you don't have to when you stand up and you're you, you're you're suddenly you know your heart needs to pump harder in order to push the blood around your circulatory system you don't have to act it would really be terrible if you then had to actively think about that every single time it would be really bad if if the conscious part of your mind your right in the front is that your frontal lobe i don't know about how the brain works but if if that was how it worked it would fucking be terrible and if you had like you would <laughs> you would be massively overloaded with work like that all the time and you'd never be able to do the important stuff in life instead it's backgrounded to the individual subsystems where the heart reacts to some changes in the environment i'm i'm sure whatever lower part of the brain is like directly connected to the heart i don't i don't know how this i probably shouldn't have used this as a metaphor because i actually don't know how any of this works i'm not a biologist um or whatever but is that even the right f whatever fuck off um i'm not one of the, i'm not a, 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 a one of those guys but anyway it doesn't happen in the upper upper management section of the brain it just sort of happens in the you know, it never has to reach that unless there's some problem unless uh you stand up and then your body tries to pump blood faster and then you have a fucking heart attack and then suddenly you get a pain signal directly to the conscious part of your brain and you're like oh fuck i'm having a heart attack and then you know about it then that's when you need that's when you need those like higher systems uh to actually be conscious now that's an extreme example uh but it's because if you have a heart attack you're basically fucked but um, you know what i mean right i think i'm making i'm making sense here like those pop those upper management um i don't know why i'm even calling it upper it's just management like those higher order management systems uh you know systems three four and five should only come in and interject with systems one and two like system two is basically just purely about communication but it should only really come in and fuck with system one if if something's gone gone wrong and system one is like directly communicating back up the chain to be like hey something's gone wrong like we we need we need something that we don't have the power to do we we need some you need to, to give us some resources to fix this problem um or come up with a solution or something like this you know they, they shouldn't be uh meddling management shouldn't be meddling with the day-to-day -day operations of uh system one god i wish i could just show this fucking image to every ceo in the world and fix everything i could just fix if, if everyone just read <laughs> it's one of those books the thing is the 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 stafford beer is just one of those guys if, if everyone read him then we would just be living in a utopia by now but no one does okay well that's my crash course on the viable systems model 101 there's a guy on youtube called dr mike and he's kind of a fascinating figure to me because he seems like kind of a giga normie i mean like when you think of a giga normie it's him like he is the epitome of that i don't know how to elaborate beyond this it's like i don't even know i don't even know what to say but at the same time he if you don't know who this is by the way he's an american doctor who makes youtube videos about medicine and being a doctor and so on and when i first ran into his stuff he was doing stuff like doctor reacts to medical memes and it was like you know the most reddit tier bullshit 
memes you've ever seen. And then he would sort of fake a laugh. Uh, you know, it was pretty bad stuff. But I, I, he also did like Doctor reacts to House MD and stuff like that. And at the time, I found him because I was just watching House, and I think I saw one of his reaction videos to that. So I knew about his existence for a while. And his videos, to be clear, are very normie tier, like ultimate Reddit tier YouTube. But at the same time, they're not ter they're not bad. Like he's he's he he has decent production values, um, but not to the point where it's like overblown and o over um, sterilized. I suppose he he doesn't really, at least as far as I can, you know, it doesn't seem like he sort of exaggerates his reactions for effect. He doesn't seem to be faking anything. The things he's passionate about are all generally decent things to be passionate about. You know. Like, one of the repeating memes on his channel is chest compressions, chest compressions, chest compressions. And it's like, okay, you know what? I actually don't have any problem with this. If this channel is trying to teach a broad audience about basic CPR and, and stuff like this, like, that's fine. And he gives, you know, he, he's a licensed doctor who clearly knows his stuff, at least on most subjects that I've seen. Um, and, you know... If he wants to tell people, like, dispel myths or m medical misinformation and give people advice, that's seems like a decent, you know, it's whatever. It's whatever. It's whatever. And then, at some point, he started a podcast. Now, again, I'm not subscribed to this guy. I just, like, I don't even know. Her. I keep coming across him. Like, once in a while, I keep coming across him. And, uh... I don't know, I haven't watched this podcast, so I can't even really give you any information about it, but it seems like he's he's sort of seen something more... I have actually seen one episode. I have seen one episode of the podcast, uh, but that was a pretty old episode. I think it was one of the first episodes, I it, because it was, it was about the UK healthcare system, and I was interested to see what he would say about it. And there was a British NHS doctor on on the, the podcast talking about it with him and it's actually really interesting i actually kind of recommend watching that podcast because it it shows like a lot of the problems with the nhs because british people we love the nhs right it's it's like a, a big point of national pride for the country and uh yeah people don't realize how how much it sucks <laughs> like the nhs is actually very far from the best healthcare system in the world now it's nice that it's fully socialized that's great that's great but in terms of quality of service it used to be better but it's been sort of slowly bled dry uh, over the course of the past like 50 years to the point where it is now like actually pretty bad and it has some major problems anyway it's it's not going to get any better they're just going to sell it off and privatize it and it's going to become the same level of shitness but now expensive as well instead of free uh Anyway, this is not really. I don't know why I'm talking about this. I've kind of gone completely off the off the the deep end talking about this fucking Doctor Mike guy. This was just supposed to be the segue into what I actually wanted to talk about. Um, I don't even know if I want to talk about this. I don't feel like anyone should should be interested in my uninformed opinions on on medicine. But I I have stumbled across this. So there's this guy. The reason I'm talking about, I'm thinking about this is this guy called Brian Johnson, who you might have seen. He's like a billionaire. He got a big article written about him because he's, like, injecting his son's blood or something. Um, uh, I think he's doing, like, plasma transfusions with his, his son in order to, like, stay young. And he's, like, obsessed with, with living forever. And he's a very, like, if I had to typify him, he's a, he's a left, he's a left, less wrong. He's a less wrong type of guy. He's a less wrong person. He's the sort of guy that would say the phrase, hmm, yes, I've updated my priors. You know, he's that kind of fucking idiot. But it's fascinating. And, it, it, you know, I consider myself somewhat of a... I don't know if I... I don't really use the word transhumanist. I tend to use the, the term posthumanist. But I'm very much of a similar opinion. Okay, the reason he's an idiot is because he thinks AI superintelligence is going to happen, like, next week or something. And he's an idiot for thinking that. But, uh, you know, he the idea that... Uh, and I'm not particularly interested in defeating death or anything like this um but i am interested in morphological freedom that's the main thing that i've taken from transhumanism that i think is very valuable um 
Rather than calling myself a transhumanist, I would say I'm a xenofeminist. Uh, I don't know. It's just interesting to see Dr. Mike and this guy talk about, like, philosophy. Uh, Dr. Mike, clearly an idiot. This other guy, also clearly an idiot. But he's done, at least, this other guy's done some more thinking, but he's done too much thinking and with the wrong people. And so he's just gone down a bit of a a, a crackpot path. Whereas Dr. Mike hasn't really put much thought into the philosophy of medicine or anything like that um but is like you know actually a doctor and so is i don't know it's very strange like for example uh if this is an interesting philosophical question right if the technology arises uh to the to enable human beings to live forever is that uh a good thing would you would you take that and, you know, I think it's a bit silly. It's the sort of thing that, like, quote-unquote real philosophers don't actually spend their time thinking about. Like, this is, like, a the sort of thing you think about when you're, you know, smoking weed with your college dorm mates. Uh, it's not really, you know, a, a, a very serious philo- philosophical question. But, you know, the, 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 the real philosophical question would be to ask about the roots of that question. In other words like a bit a bit more general like what what does it mean to die what is it what is the the role that death plays i don't know there's a bunch of stuff about this the death drive you know um i have opinions on this but i'm not going to share them here because it's kind of boring but like dr mike clearly having never put any thought into this makes one of the most absurd statements i've ever heard which is he's talking about something interesting, right? He says, like, there's this thing where we have to try and, like, we have to try and balance in medicine, not just life extension, but also quality of life as well. And there's no, like, cut and dry answer to this. Like, uh, quality of life is clearly something very important. And they have a sort of vague discussion about this, but they both kind of talk past each other. And then, um, you know, that's that's a cool subject, I guess, to to discuss, whatever. And then Dr. Mike says, like... (laughs) He says some insane shit. He's like, well, if you live much, much longer, doesn't that mean that, like, the value of each of those years of life is less so because because it's less scarce? And this is, this is what capitalism does to you, bro. By Dr. Mike's logic, we should then be killing everyone the instant they're born because those few seconds of life would be much more valuable. <laughs> like, this is... And then the insane thing is that the other guy, he doesn't challenge him on this. He d- he just says, hmm, yes, that, well, I mean, that's an interesting conception to think about. And, like, bro, what do you mean? He, this guy just made the worst argument I've ever heard ever. <laughs> like, you... Th- it's such an obvious rebuttal to just... Okay, well, if life... If the value of, of life is just proportional to how many years lived, like, then in order to maximize the value of people's lives, we should be killing them involuntarily as early as possible. Like, <laughs> isn't that the obvious conclusion to that logic? I don't know how any, how neither of them saw this. I don't know how neither of them picked up on this really obvious, idiotic fucking line of argument. Anyway. I just, I've, I've just been, it just got me thinking, damn, I stuttered a bit there, I just started a bit of a, a bit of a stutter, um, I've developed, like, a little bit of a, a stutter, I feel like, maybe I've always had it, it's not really a stutter, I'm not really sure what to call it, it's kind of like, well, it, you know, let's, this is a digression, let's get back on topic here, uh, all of this stuff gets me thinking about, about the medical, medical institutions, biopower, um, the hospital, and all of, all of these strange things, because I've realized over time that I have kind of strong feelings about this that seem to go against, like, popular conceptions, which is really odd to me, because they seemed really obvious to me. Like, the fact that hospitals, here, let's, let's bust out the Foucault, that they're prisons. Like, you can't be in a hospital and not notice this, you know? Like, I remember, not to, 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 to bring the mood down, but when my mom was dying of cancer and I visited her in hospital, like, it was fucking miserable. You, like, you look at a, you roll up to the hospital building and it looks like a prison. It has giant gates like a prison. It's all set up in such a strange and, like, it's almost, 
I know here we're, we're really bringing out the, all of the meme writers. It's Kafka esque when you walk into a hospital and there are all of these signs that point to like words that don't make any sense, like x-ray photography this way down just down the hall and to the left <laughs> you know like and then you just see diseases that you write like a dysentery on floor three and it's like it's really fucking surreal being in a hospital i don't know most of the times when you're in a hospital you don't really navigate the hospital building itself you're just in your room but being in a hospital just wandering around is fucking ins- it's a really weird experience especially because one time i got lost and i wandered down a hallway that i shouldn't have and i turned back immediately because i was there to see my mum who was dying of cancer so i'm not going to just run around getting you know exploring a hospital i you know that's not the purpose of my visit so i did turn around immediately but i went down a corridor that was i believe like a staff only corridor and it, I don't know, I, it was just very surreal, like, the, it was all dark, and there were all these people bustling around, well, I don't know, man, wearing scrubs, and, and, uh, I, I don't know, it, it felt like a meatpacking plant more than a hospital, it, the atmosphere of that, that little section, um, anyway, to get back on track, there were certain, it's interesting to me the way that people who are in clinical fields don't understand that they are in in a disciplinary environment to again i haven't look i'm not like super read up on foucault i've 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 watched like a couple lectures and i've re- read some snippets but <clears throat> i don't i don't know i haven't i haven't read like discipline and punish or whatever it is whichever book it is that he talks about how hospitals are prisons so i'm i'm not going to lean heavily on that because I just don't know, I just, I just don't know the Foucault, okay, so I hope you can forgive me for that, uh, but, for example, this is, this is, I'm just gonna lean on my own stuff, this may end up with me just making worse arguments than I could be, but whatever, for example, bed rest, bed rest, this is something Dodesmate told me, bed rest is a meme, and I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? Your whole life, you're told, you get sick, you got to rest in bed. You go to the hospital, you rest in bed all the time. Well, it turns out, actually, uh, yeah, this is not true. You, you you can just, as long as you're not, like, obviously, if you're very weak, if you have, like, a serious fever to the point where you're sort of drifting in and out of consciousness or something like this, then you probably want to be in a bed, right? <laughs> so you don't, like, fall over and hit your head or anything like that. Or... If you have an infectious disease, you probably shouldn't be wandering around in the streets giving it to people or wandering around in a hospital giving it to people, even worse. Uh, but, uh, you know, most of the time people in hospital are just confined to quarters. They're just confined to their bed, even though this leads to worse outcomes. Like there have been studies and experiments where they've given patients free roam of the hospital. The patients are, can just wander around and do whatever they want. And uh, it leads to not like massive, but slightly improved patient outcomes. But they don't implement that. And I think this kind of goes back to um, seeing like a state, how this is, this is a policy that's enforced for the purposes of legibility. It could even... Um, you could even do a cybernetic thing you could say like this is a in order to to reduce variety i'm new to cybernetics okay i might fuck this up i'm new to this i'm new to this so i'm just i'm just trying to to apply it to things anyway it makes it harder for you to be to to enforce things upon you and that's what's strange to me is that when you get sick suddenly the the idea is in order to get better it kind of reminds me of alcoholics anonymous you, or you know when you go to alcoholics anonymous i'm sure you're all familiar with this and you you're like well in, in order to get better you have to admit that you have no power and delegate you know all of your power to ev- you have to, to to prostrate yourself in front of a higher power you have to the first job is to accept that you, you have no power and and god is in charge right to hand over control to, to, to a higher power. That's the Alcoholics Anonymous route, which is, by the way, uh, if you don't know, 
like ineffective <laughs> it's been like proven to be clinically ineffective on in, 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 yeah but whatever it helps some people i'm sure and in this, the hospital when you're sick it's the same thing you you're asked to hand over your bodily autonomy to some authority in order to get better and this i don't know it seems like a strange way of doing things like you might think i'm just being a bit schizo here but i think bodily autonomy is is very important no like and and clearly we have some understanding of this in the medical and system because patients are allowed to refuse treatment right like if i go in let's say i'm steve jobs i have pancreatic cancer very very treatable and i go into the hospital and they're like you have pancreatic cancer it's very treatable and then i say no i'm gonna take like herbs and and <laughs> and fucking eat, eat some nuts and i'll get better without without chemotherapy and then you die a doctor can't come in with a gun and stop you and this is a good thing this is a good thing because it killed Steve Jobs, who was a bastard. <laughs> uh, no, this is a good thing, obviously. You wouldn't want the idea that a doctor should be able to afford... I know, it seems like a bad idea to me. Uh, but then there are cases, and here's where we're going to get a little into... We're going to get into some, some, some current political topics. There is uh, cases, one particular big case that is... Uh, very fresh in everyone's minds right now where for some reason the opposite doesn't hold true i can't walk into a doctor's office and say give me this treatment and have them do that i can't just it's not like a a, a plumber you know if i if i if something's wrong with my, my my toilet i call up a plumber and i say hey i need you to come fix my toilet they have expertise that i don't have right this is this is how it's supposed to work um i don't know i feel like i'm going a bit off the rails here i'm talking about the transgenders here where it's like okay if you're if if we've decided that patient autonomy bodily autonomy is important enough that we allow people to to refuse treatment even to the point where it kills them then this hallucinogenic delusion which firstly let me be clear is not true this is a lie i will explain in a second why it's a lie but this delusion that like, oh, we don't know what trans healthcare, it could have some impacts in the future that we haven't studied yet. So we have to exercise extreme caution and not allow, like, so hold on a minute. You're willing to just withhold healthcare from people who are demanding it based on like, oh, we have to be cautious. The, the evidence isn't there, but you're still, you will quite happily, you know, let someone die if they ask you to, uh, you know, not do the treatment that you, it's insane. It's, it's, it's crazy. And then first, let me then go back to say the idea that the trans healthcare is somehow understudied or like, oh, these, these power, powerful, oh, they always say this powerful. They always love to use that word, powerful hormones, pa hormone treatment. I don't know why I pronounced it as hormones. That was a bit strange. Oh, it's so powerful on their weak, weak bodies it's so like what are you talking about all of these drugs all of the drugs are regularly used in cis people that's the only reason they exist you think they invented estradiol to help people transition no it was there to to fucking help uh uh mitigate the effects of um what's it called uh i've forgotten the word for it what's the word for it when you're when you, you when when you get older men is, is it come with an m god damn it what's the word for this menopause that's the word i was thinking of it was there to 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 ease the symptoms of menopause or testosterone it's you know been been prescribed for any number of reasons like there's a whole bunch of reasons why hrt might be prescribed to a cis person and that's why it exists and why it's been prescribed and studied for decades and is considered safe in all of those situations and is regularly used but the second you're you're suddenly there's no there's no reason to believe that there would be any harm these are well studied drugs that are already in use consistently and are, are not even considered particularly dangerous like 
there were some drugs like i don't know let's say you just underwent surgery and they put you on on morphine right like i can understand the idea that you you might not want to give people walk-in access to morphine because it's very easy if you don't know what you're doing to 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 fucking dose too highly and die right i will talk about opiates in a second but um like i can understand this right like if you don't if you don't know the correct dosages for certain drugs you could very easily hurt yourself or you know it makes sense why it's harder to 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 get access to certain drugs but uh like estrogen is not one of these drugs that's very dangerous if like it's so commonplace that it's over the counter like in the UK if you're a menopausal woman you can just buy estrogen over the counter but if you're trans it's almost it's like absurdly difficult to get your hands on it takes years and years of like fucking intrusive interviewing and absurd means testing and psych psychological evaluate like it and like you know i mean there's this stuff has been has been well reported on that there's no reason it's the same fucking medicine it's the same drug the only difference is the social context there's no biological me medical difference here it's it's insane that people are pretending there is it's like um i don't know there's all there's so much stupidity in the like even the concept of puberty blockers is just nonsense like it's like if i went in with a uh i don't know a broken leg i went into hospital with a broken leg and then they said well you know surgery is very powerful <laughs> we're not are you sh oh you but you're 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 too young to know if you really want surgery this could have permanent effects on you so for now we're just gonna like put your leg in a cast well that's not true because that that would heal it i <laughs> <laughs> it's a terrible metaphor just the worst metaphor i've ever come up with uh that is literally how you fix a broken leg is you put it in a i don't know it'd be like well we're just gonna leave your leg broken but we'll like make it so it doesn't heal or become more broken we'll just set it in place broken it's like that's not what that you're not treating the fucking problem i didn't ask for this i came in here for you to fix my broken leg what are you talking about you can't oh it's very powerful though you know, fixing your broken leg is very powerful. What have you... Like, it's insane. It's a fucking batshit insane way to do medicine. So, so far, we've established that it, these medicines aren't harmful. It's known that they aren't harmful. And anyone who claims, like... The reason that this is in, in mind presently is because of something called the CAST report, which was a government... Uh, report into trans healthcare, which is just fucking absurdly bad. They literally discarded the majority of studies. They discarded the majority of studies on uh, trans healthcare by saying, oh, well, we can't apply them because they're not double blind. Now, let me just explain to you, in this situation, for a study to be double blind, you would have to withhold healthcare from someone. It would be deeply unethical. There are, this standard of evidence is absurd and unreachable. And then just if you still think, okay, well, in that case, I guess we will never know. So we have to exercise, exercise caution. No, no, no. Because the CAS report does include non-double blind studies, but only ones that say uh, that don't support positive outcomes from, from HRT and, and gender affirming care. They, they include plenty of studies that aren't double blind, that don't meet their own standard of evidence, as long as it supports the argument. And this person, Cass, I don't remember her first name, is clearly biased. <laughs> like, she's the most obviously biased person ever. She was a fucking advisor to the, like, when DeSantis was like, oh, we're going to ban trans people in, in uh, Florida. You know who he called? He called up this fucking lady. He called up Cass to be his advisor on this. That's what she was doing before this. She was advising Ron DeSantis on, on how to ban trans people most effectively. You know? She, she has a Twitter account and she follows a whole bunch of like transphobic turf accounts. You could just see it. 
Like it's 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 just there in plain plain as day that she is like incredibly biased and should not have ever been put in charge of a report like this. It's terrible. It's disgusting. It's gonna be used to justify all sorts of horrendous things, despite the fact that it's just bad science. Like the the people are gonna point to this as like, well, look, the, this there's this massive report into this. It's it's a terrible like it's so bad. It's cl it's so obviously biased and misleading. And I mean, just to give you an example of some of the ridiculous things in the cast report, there's a section where it implies very heavily that toy selection, whether you choose as a child to play with trucks or dolls, is genetically and biologically informed. That there is some sort of biological reason why boys want to play with trucks and girls want to play with dolls. Which is so insane, because... I don't know if you remember this, but because we don't really have toys anymore, you know, everyone's just on their on phone. It's too much with the phone. <laughs> but uh, back in the day, every boy played with dolls as well. They just called the dolls for boys action figures to make it sound cool because the parents would be too scared to buy their boy a thing that was called a doll. You know what I mean? Like the idea that there's a biological thing that makes girls play with dolls is obviously insane. It's, it's so obviously insane. Like, if you had to pick anything that was obviously socially informed and not biologically informed, toy preference in children would be, like, number one. It's so obvious, like, the idea that there's some biological evo psych thing that makes boys want to play with monster trucks is just, I mean, come on now. What are you talking about? Monster trucks didn't exist until, like, I don't know when they were invented, but it definitely wasn't long enough ago for it to have had some sort of evolutionary um, biological component. Oh my god, it's just fucking terrible. And it's it would be funny if it wasn't for the fact that this is being used to, like, deny healthcare to a whole bunch of people and is only going to get worse. See, what I believe is the, the, the not only should you... The, there's not enough research into into hormones you know i don't like the fact that you basically have to pick it's not even basically you get to pick between boy hormone or girl hormone and nothing else and you can't have no hormones because then like if you just take t blockers for example without taking estrogen you just get bone disease you just get like severe bone disease and die that's fucked up i need them to invent new hormone this is what i need i need them I need the scientists, this is the problem, there are too many transgender um, programmers, okay? They're all programming in Rust, they're all fucking learning Haskell and, and stuff, and making like, you know, indie video games, and, and all of this sort of thing. These people need to put down the programming socks, and need to put on the uh, biochemistry socks, okay? They need to be going into the biochemistry industry and we need more non-binary biochemists in order to manufacture novel hormones, synthetic hormones, which are neither testosterone nor estrogen. We need to be manufacturing new novel molecules which can produce novel effects in the human body which are neither masculinizing nor feminizing in order to create a new race of superhuman mutants who will be vastly superior because they will no longer be trapped by, uh, you know, a biological sex. They'll just be going around with, with neither. They'll just be neithering. And then we can really have non-binary people, right? That's what we need to do. There's not, there's not enough of this. There's not enough. There's not enough research into novel hormonal synthesis we can do it you, you're sitting there thinking that sounds absurd that sounds insane that you would even think such a this is clearly a sci-fi concept this is not a sci-fi concept this is a real thing that i believe in and i that makes me sound insane but i believe it nonetheless that that we could make we could make anything happen okay we went to the moon we went to the moon we could we could do this how hard can it be we've got like all sorts of medicines <laughs> we got all sorts 
someone came up with LSD. You know, we've got all of these. What is a hormone? A hormone is a, a chemical transmitter, right? We've got already all sorts of chemicals that that do similar kinds of things, right? Like all drugs, as psychoactive drugs, what do they do? They go into some system in your brain, and they 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 they, they slot into a, a receptor and act as a, a replacement to something that your body already produces, like your end of your 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 cannabinoid system or. Uh, whatever your your kappa opioid receptors or or something like this, your GABA receptors, right? Like that that's that's fucking brain chemistry. Like that shit is is clearly much more complicated. It has to be more complicated, or you know you know what I'm saying. If we can make if someone can go out there and produce novel you know I I don't know PCP uh, analogs or or um opioid analogs or kind of kind of synthetic cannabinoids or all of these sorts of things right these these crazy drugs because they they understand the structure of the molecules why can't we do the same with hormones why can't we be out there making new hormones that's what i'm saying we need to be making new sex hormones that have nothing to do with with testosterone or estrogen they're just they're just new crazy things can you imagine how cool that would be we're gonna have if if they stopped doing this if they stopped banning you know st- research into these things oh it's unethical <laughs> no it's not you're wrong uh if they stopped then we would have cat girls could be real within your lifetime if the u.s government would put a few billion dollars which they can afford okay they make the money they they can always afford it this is the thing you don't understand about economics okay the u.s government they literally print their own money. <laughs> they can just print more money. And this is not a joke. This is how this is how MMT works. And they need to print a few trillion and put it towards cat girl research. And we could have cat girls within our lifetime. And you think it's absurd because you've never seen anyone do something like this before. But it doesn't even have to be the government. If if like, you know, Pfizer did this or you know, some some big pharma tech company it wouldn't even be difficult if i believe that it could happen within five years it's just an area of research that's never been pursued because because people think that it it it's oh this is not like life-saving medicine oh the ability to to Im- imbibe some sort of n- non-gendered hormone is not life-saving medicine it is not that is correct it is not life-saving medicine this is a new field which I'm calling recreational medicine. This is not recreational medicine. This is, uh, this is morphological freedom, motherfucker. This is not about life saving. This is about life enhancing. This is about liberating. That's that's the word. This is about liberating us from from our our flesh prisons. Okay, by making cat girls real. Now let me talk to you about drugs. Okay, there's a lot of there's a lot of freaking out. There's a lot of people that are freaking out over over the opioid epidemic. They're like, oh no, there's a, there's an opioid epidemic. Everyone's getting addicted to these opiates. Uh, okay, well that's my chicken, so I'm gonna go eat some chicken instead of this. But I went off and did a bunch of other shit. Where was I? I think I was saying about opiates. Oh, we have this opiate epidemic. This is the common narrative, right? This is the narrative. The narrative is this. Um, okay, so doctors were paid by Big Pharma to uh, give people opiates who didn't really need them in America, right? Give people opiates, prescribe opiates to people who didn't really need them, overprescribe, and then uh, these people developed an addiction, which they then turned to the black market to fulfill and got on heroin and fentanyl which caused uh some sort of death or suffering uh but there's a there's a couple of key uh things to note here there's a couple of key things to note here so firstly um there are there are people with severe pain chronic pain uh who just need opiates and the backlash to this opiate epidemic has been to 
make it really hard to get your hands on opiate painkillers for anything long term because they cause addiction. But addiction in itself is not an issue if, if it's not harmful in any other way. And in fact, there are many people who suffer from chronic pain and uh, just can't get their hands on a long term opiate prescription anymore, which would, you know, ease their suffering. Because even though, let me remind you that opiates, they, they are dangerous, right? If you, if you overdose uh, on opiates, they are central nervous system suppressants, so you will stop breathing, which is bad. You don't want to stop doing that. We actually, you want to keep breathing if you can, if you can help it. But uh, that, that happens at close to recreational doses, which for a lot of people are very, very high. Uh, much, much higher than you would typically use for pain relief. So the risk of overdose, if you're using a a regular pain relief dose, is extremely low. Opiates are actually an incredibly safe drug. Uh, They're used constantly, but normally for very short periods of time. But like, I mean, they put me on morphine when I was a kid post-surgery, and I was really young. I mean, I must have been like nine or ten years old, you know? Like, morphine post-surgery is extremely common uh opiates are extru- they, they are a very safe drug they don't really uh cause any long-term side effects in you know pain typical pain relief dosages uh in fact so a, a lot of people are very scared of this idea that that you're going to cause people to get addicted to opiates but you know i don't have that many moral uh principles strong moral principles but i do have this one moral principle which i think is um you know it seems obvious to me but i guess a lot of people uh find it hard to to wrap their head around which is that torture is bad i actually think it's bad if you torture people uh and you know what is torturing people torturing people is when you have someone and you have some sort of power over them and you're you're causing them pain you're you're intentionally causing them to suffer uh and 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 to have to endure a high degree of pain uh, that you could you could easily stop and they don't have any say in the matter you know that's what torturing someone is Uh, so withholding pain medication from someone who needs it that's torture Uh, that there's no uh, let's not pretend or beat around the bush that this is some like decision medical decision or what no no no. this that that is just torturing people and i think that torturing people is probably bad i don't think we should be doing that uh the you know there are solutions that so uh the this this thing the this 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 key step in the process that sort of gets missed out in uh in the discussion around how how uh opiate pain predict prescriptions become uh addiction to street opiates uh is is the transition right like this idea that you're on opiates for for pain pain uh management and then you, for some strange reason, decide, actually, I'm going to start doing heroin instead. Uh, there's a couple of reasons this might happen. Uh, reason number one is your doctor stopped giving you opiates and you are still in pain. And this is the thing that is continuing the opiate epidemic to this day. Because now doctors love to give people opiates. And this is the case, you know, in a lot of places. This, this is not just an America thing. One thing doctors love to do is to give people med- the medication that they need, uh, but then just take it away from them. <laughs> so, like, uh, I've seen this happen with... Pa- I've seen this happen, like, I have personal anecdotes relating to this. I've seen this happen with, with sleep medication. I've seen this happen with pain medication of various kinds. Uh, this idea that, like, oh, no, if I actually help you with your problem, you'll get addicted to the solution to the problem. Motherfucker, that's not a problem. That is the solution to a problem. So you, you know, give someone who's having insomnia sleep medication and you prescribe it to them for a small amount of time, just enough for them to get dependent on it, and then you take it away from them. You should not be surprised when that person goes and, and onto, you know, dodgy websites or, or whatever and try, tries to find black market alternatives, you know, maybe, maybe oh, uh, ben, benzos or something like that. Uh, and it's the same with pain medication. You, 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 sleep deprivation is a form of torture, by the way. So if you're a doctor and you're withholding uh, sleeping pills from someone because you're saying some bullshit about how they need natural sleep, which is, by the way, not a thing. Um, 
yeah you should you're you're basically you know you're just torturing someone for no real reason uh because you're very scared of this concept of addiction without realizing addiction can facilitate harm but it's not a harm in itself uh you know many of us i'm sure listening to this podcast right now are addicted to caffeine you know i i i'm addicted to caffeine i've been addicted to caffeine for uh you know a decade or maybe even longer at this point and so is the vast majority of our society and yet it doesn't actually cause anyone to suffer in their day-to-day life 99% of the time uh right like addiction in itself is not a harm uh, and so when you're giving someone pain medication and then you suddenly withdraw that medication from them they're not just going to the pain hasn't gone away they they are going to find an alternative and that alternative is going to be unregulated uh street drugs which is bad and then they're going to die because uh you know unlike your perks which are regulated and you know what's in them and you know how to correctly dose them uh now they are going to be getting something off of the street which they have no idea what's in it and then one day they're going to get a dose that's been cut with fentanyl and they're going to overdose and die and that's directly your fault <laughs> if you're a doctor who did did this that is like your fault you just killed someone uh so you know i think that's a bad thing i think we should stop doing that i think torturing people is bad and therefore i think we should just give them opiates if they ask for it uh there's there's so okay the other so that yeah this is basically the thing people tended to go to street opiates when they their original opiate prescription was withdrawn they no longer had access to it or alternatively when the prices were too high Now the thing about opiates is they're fucking cheap. You don't need like there's no re- especially in America like the you know drug prices in America are absolutely absurd and there is no reason why the opiates should be uh out of the price range for any you know average person. Uh they they are cheap to manufacture. They are they are inexpensive. They're not they don't have some complex you know there's nothing complicated or the or, or there's the it's not like you know a lot of drugs they're expensive not necessarily even because the drug itself requires some particularly scarce ingredient or has some complex manufacturing process which requires a lot of labor or a lot of um you know highly skilled labor or something like that it's mostly because uh the majority of most drug companies budgets go to R&D right and R&D by itself doesn't generate any profit right like it's it's an expense that's that's most of what they spend their money on and so you need to recoup that money by charging extra for drugs that you could be producing for cheaper because uh you you want to spend more you, you know what i mean right this 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 is the business model of most pharma companies they they charge uh massive markups on their existing drugs because most of what they do is work that doesn't make any money. The thing about opiates though is that they've been known about for like hundreds and hundreds of years. No one had to ever do no one who you know has anything to do with a pharma company ever did anything to research them. Uh you know all of the opiates that prescribed pretty much were not invented through pharma company research and development. So the idea that they should be marked up to recoup the losses on the R&D doesn't you know it's nonsense because they didn't have any R&D so you know regulations on if you actually wanted to solve the opiate epidemic you would legalize heroin <laughs> and then regulate the drug market in the US so that you didn't have to pay out of your you know a lot of people you can hear this story repeatedly like you can you can any any tiny amount of research where you see heroin users or fentanyl users talk about uh how they go on the drug if they if they came via clinical um opiate pain medication it's it's very often that they uh simply couldn't afford it uh and their pain is not going to go away you know i saw a, there's there's actually in in one of the more recent uh what's that guy's name orgasmo breaks your know, channel 5 that guy there was a, there was a heroin user uh in that video and she was talking about how she had some back injury that was causing her chronic pain and the reason she started doing heroin was because she couldn't afford the prescription anymore uh like that's a very common that's a very common story so fundamentally it had it has you know with withholding pain meds from people who need them either through you know coercion where you just you know take their prescription away from them or 
through economic means where they're overly expensive uh, is what leads to people to no no one would voluntarily who like can you imagine how retarded you would have to be to have a steady supply of pain medication that is cheap and reliable and uh you know what's the word like tested you know pure and to decide no i'm gonna instead throw that away uh in order to take uh some thing that i got bought off the street that could could have anything in it no one would do that like that would be insane no, it would be a, a ridiculous decision to make. The I like, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's so obvious. I don't know, man. People should just be able to buy drugs. It shouldn't be some insane thing where you need to go and lie to a doctor. Like, you know, in house, house is like patients lie. Motherfucker, why do you think patients lie? Because it's the only way to get doctors to ever do anything. I hate I hate the medic I hate medicine. I hate all of these motherfuckers. I hate hospitals. I hate all these people. They'll just if you I mean I haven't even talked about psychiatry, which is maybe the worst the worst part of, of medicine. But you know, people anyone with chronic illness, anyone who's listening to this channel with chronic illness knows what I'm talking about. Okay? I don't even have to ask if you've had a bad experience. I know you have. No one with chronic illness ever has a good experience with any medical system anywhere in the world. It always sucks. They're, they're, I don't know what it is, but there's just something about it. There's just something about medical systems that are just incapable of dealing with this. The only re- It's like schooling. The only reason that we don't often think about it is because most of us, you know, we don't have to interact with it. So it's like, okay, you might be in hospital. It's the same way you go to school for 18 years and it's terrible and it's obviously a really bad system. But then the second you get out of it, you never have to think about it again. So you just go on with your life. And no one bothers to, like, really ask for significant education reform. Uh, it's the same thing with, with, with the medical industry. You know, other than drug prices, which there seems, you know, there's, there is a push of, of, like, we need free or cheaper healthcare in the US or whatever or in the UK, like, we need more funding for the NHS because waiting times are absurd, or something like this. Like, those things, those things do exist. There are people who talk about stuff like that. But that's not the same as we need some sort of actual reform in the way that, like, pa- patient-doctor relations exist and the way drugs are prescribed and so on. Because, because most people never have to really interact with those systems until they're old as fuck. It's like a, the classic line of disability activists who say everyone becomes disabled you will eventually become disabled if you live long enough you'll become disabled like the idea that this doesn't affect you it's just it doesn't affect you yet that's the only thing it's there's there are no there are no able-bodied and disabled people it's just people it's there's only disabled people and people who haven't become disabled yet slash died um it's this yeah so i don't know that's my rant about that I, I feel like I kind of went off, off the deep end a little bit there where I started talking about inventing new new sexes through uh, hormone manufacture. I kind of went a little bit off the deep end there, but I think, it, I think it's a fun thing to think about. But it, we might be getting a little bit absurd. There's this video game called Diary of a Spaceport Janitor. You guys should play that game. That's a great game. Uh... I was... I, I started recording this because I wanted to record another thing, but I don't know what it was. Fucking what was it? I don't remember. I'm going back to AI art stuff. I know, I know. Look, I don't want to be talking about it either. It just it just happens around me. Look, I know, okay. But this time it's, I'm bringing something different, okay? Please, maybe? Right, so I missed this probably because I used the blue blocker extension on Twitter, which blocks all blue checks by default. And I would assume that only blue checks would be talking about this. But it seems like my prediction has come true. Uh, which was I maybe not the boldest prediction ever. It was probably always going to come true. But uh, nonetheless, in my AI video, in my video about that code or digital video, uh, I said, like, I might not be a visual artist or an animator, but I am a musician. And I'm pretty sure that it won't be very long until we have AI-generated music threatening my job, right? And it seems to be... Yeah, I've been following it vaguely. Uh, there was one 
I don't even remember what it was called. But there was one not that long ago that was that was kind of okay. But it seems like now we've reached the point where AI generated music is like actually good. When okay, good is not the right word. But of of high quality, of high like fidelity is probably the better word. Yeah, it, the 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 AI generated music is of high fidelity through this company called Udio. Um. And I obviously I dislike their their marketing. I'm not a big fan of their marketing, uh, but anyway, I've just messed around with their their thing for a bit. And when you look at their website, there's a bunch of like, what I'm saying here is that there's actually some good music on here. Like this AI is is capable of making kind of like pretty good music. And I even messed around with it. I put in like modal. Ge- I copied all of the. So I saw. I found out about this because of a YouTube. I uh, sorry, a Twitter post, and the Twitter post copied all of the tags from Blady's Ice Dancer from on Rate Your Music, and just pasted it into the prompt uh, bar, the prompt input, and then it generates a song with what is very obviously Blady's voice that they've scraped, uh, like an AI version of Blady's voice. Um, which is strange, <laughs> it's strange, and they seem to be sort of like slightly panic mode about this, and are like removing features to try and make it so you can't do this, but it's still very obvious, I mean, it's a fucking, how do you think it's made, of course they just scraped everything, that's how these things are made, uh, but anyway, uh, this has me, you know, this has always been a theoretical for me, and it's ne- I've never thought that it would bother me, and I, I don't think it does particularly... I mean, what I'm surprised about is... And I guess I shouldn't... Maybe shouldn't be. But it seems to be able to generate good music. I haven't messed around with it much because you only get four generations. I think you only get like four... Per, it's it's not working very well. Um, like if I... I don't know. Let's let's try... Uh, I don't know. Let's try what's a what's a what's a weird as genre. Then? Let's try trad industrial. I I think if you put the name of a band, it will just hold on. Let's go. Let's just go to the throbbing gristle. Uh, rate your music, and copy some tags from there. Uh, let's see. Maybe uh, what's the best throbbing gristle album? That's a that's a probably the second annual report. Um. Industrial free improvise yeah, let's just copy some of these. Industrial free improvisation sound collage dark ambient avant garde misanthropic. Uh yeah, let's copy some of these and paste them. It's just gonna throw up an error. It's just been throwing up it doesn't even work like most of the like it just throws up an error and I don't even know why. Uh oh, I got it to work. I got it to work. We did it, folks. All right, let's see what it generates for a Throbbing Gristle style song. That's what I'm hoping it will do. Um, Because it generated some jazz. I got it to do some modal jazz. And it was actually pretty good. Like, which is kind of worrying. (laughs) It was actually pretty good. Um, It only generates like 30 second clips. And then it wouldn't... It's supposed to have a thing where you can extend it into a full song. But it wouldn't let me. It just kept throwing up an error message when I would try, so so I don't know what that's about. But I'm gonna I'm gonna wait until these things generate. It takes a takes a while. Uh, I'll just pause the recording and all right, let's play this for you. This one is called Shadows of the Mechanism. Machinery's breath, the symphony's cue. <laughs> through the static, our souls break through. A collage of chaos, the art we find In the shadows of thought, the clock unwinds This is the sound Factory's heart, the rhythm, the roar Interesting, interesting It's not very good at lyrics, it sucks at lyrics They are clashing Teach me how to 
strange very strange but some of those instrumental that instrumental stuff kind of interesting kind of neat the lyrics terrible terrible lyrics and the the shitty like i guess what they've done right is that they they generate an instrumental and they're using something to like try and generate then they have like a voice ai that and then so here's how it's working right they have one model that is however it's doing it generating an instrumental track then they have another model that's writing lyrics they have a large language model doing that and then they feed those lyrics into another model which is a voice ai and somehow because i've i've heard other tracks where the voice the vocals are always like in in key and in a similar genre to like they sound appropriate to the instrumental so they've got some some clever stuff going on there to make that all work uh but yeah, the lyrics suck because fucking AIs have always sucked at writing lyrics. Um, but those instru- I don't know. I feel I thought like if I go for a, I think you can kind of hear this right. If you go for a weirder genre that it's clearly gonna it's gonna have had less training on. You can hear the artifacting of the AI like more clearly. Like if I generated like I don't know folk instrumental about blah 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 it would probably be much less apparently ai but i thought if i go for something weird i wouldn't say that was bad i mean apart from if i can just try and ignore the lyrics just as like a weird dark ambient atmospheric thing honestly i I, not i would listen to that (laughs) i i wonder what else like this is kind of interesting isn't it like it's i'm surprised that this is like way better than the AI generated art. Like most of the art that you you can get it to generate like always sucks, right? Um, like it always looks like garbage. But somehow the uh, the music it seems to be a lot more creative, which is surprising to me. I'm gonna keep experimenting with it, but I I kind of have I feel like this is this is th- maybe this is gonna be a this is gonna be a big controversial statement but i think this is a good thing because if there's an easy alternative to making uh music even in weird genres even if some of it might suck most people don't care i mean most people you have to remember most people listen to top 40 pop music so they don't really care if the music is bad um but this this does prove something which is it will it will have the same effect on music as photography had on painting that like now choosing to paint rather than choosing to take a picture of something you know this is what drove all of that interesting abstraction uh after the invention of the the camera and and proliferation of the camera i i don't know i it's like brian eno he said that um computer music rather than acoustic music turns the problem of of um virtuosity into like rather than it being this is not what he said he didn't stumble over his words a bunch and say some shit that didn't really make sense he said that it was it changes the skill this is a i'm paraphrasing here (laughs) something about how it changes the skill from like technical skill to to a matter of decision making right and that that was a big that was a big change to music right and it happened fairly recently like you know, people were making electronic music. Obviously, you have like craft work and shit, but and even the music concrete, way 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 ago, long time ago. But the like mainstream music production being done, what we in the industry called in the box, right? All being taking place inside of a computer, only really started in the two thousands. It's kind of like digital movie production. Like we don't, I don't think about how these are like fairly recent developments but like yeah pop songs and like typical albums being produced in pro tools only started i believe it's the song la vida loca (laughs) was the first pop song to be entirely produced in box um there's a fact for you which you might want to double check because i might have gotten that wrong but i think it is (laughs) i think it is la vida loca uh but that didn't i don't know i think i think this will push music to push up against the bounds of its its 
trappings. Does this make sense to you? Like, when photography killed the idea that realism could only be obtained through, through painting, right? When photography came along, it pushed painting initially towards abstraction, but then also towards co being conceptual, right? Like, it wasn't just about rendering forms anymore. It was also about the concept behind those thoughts, the, the story and narrative and context surrounding the painting, which, which imbues it with meaning. And so with a new batch of AI-generated music, how does a musician choose to respond to this? Can you just go ahead and make the same old stuff that you've been making? Does it even make sense if you can just click generate? Because this, to me, and maybe it's just because I haven't messed around with it enough and it's new, but to me, there's obviously artifacting here, but in terms of the quality of songs, the musical decisions being made here, they're not bad. I haven't heard anything that's blown me away yet, or that I would actually like listen to. Some of that industrial stuff that I just made, kind of interesting, but I, you know, I haven't heard anything that's like super, you know, good yet. But also, like I was surprised when I put in like modal jazz as a prompt, it didn't spit out like what I imagined would happen. Would it would it would spit out like some Kenny G bullshit? You know, it would spit out like the most generic jazz sounding thing. You know, smooth, cool jazz, whatever. But no, it put something out that sounded like you know Miles Davis or something. It's it sounded, and in terms of the decisions of uh, which notes to play, like there was a a little bass solo in there, and it was a bit insane. Like this guy was was doing tritone substitution, bro was 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 way outside the key. It was kind of sick. It was kind. It was kind. I'm not gonna lie to you. It was kind of, there was a few interesting harmonic choices there. And it's, it, I don't know. It wasn't bad. It wasn't great jazz, you know. It wasn't amazing. And it was also only 30 seconds, so it's hard to even judge. But you know what I mean? Like, this doesn't have the thing that, that Stable Diffusion had and Dali and stuff had, where it's, like, obviously terrible. <laughs> it's not obviously terrible, which is really surprising to me. It seems like we went from... Like, the artifacting is, is still there. You can still kind of hear it. But it just kind of adds a weird texture to the high end. Like, it sounds almost like a, a overly compressed MP3 or, or something like that. Um, I don't know. I need to mess around with this more. Because this is, this is giving me... This is very interesting. This is a very strange development. I, I don't know. Let's see. I've somehow gone in to make, like, no ways. See, that's the fascinating thing. Okay, so if you if you generate a song and it generates lyrics, it uses that thing I talked about where it like has an AI voice and a large language model generating lyrics and it's terrible. But then if you choose if you extend it, which the site is suddenly letting me do, if you if you if you have a song that you've generated that has lyrics and then you press extend, it doesn't go through that process. It's just asking, I'm assuming, you know, so it's asking some model extend this piece and so you get vocals with no meaning you get what sounds exact it's crazy <laughs> you get what sounds like a person singing but they're singing in simlish it's it's fucking wild they're singing in simlish and it sounds like you should be able to understand it like it sounds vaguely like english but you listen to it and it's just nonsense it's insane <laughs> Uh, it kind of makes me feel like I'm going insane because like it's like I, this person singing in what sounds like English, but I can't understand them. And let me keep playing this song because it gets a bit shit. Like clearly, it's been, and you would expect this. It's been trained on a lot more like tonal music, you know, a lot more consonant uh, pop music than it has, uh, you know, or even just metal music in this case than it has on like weird ass avant-garde uh you know dissonant music so while the instrumental here is kind of sick i'm not even gonna lie i i kind of fucks with this on a big level i kind of fucks with the instrumental here uh there's parts where you can hear 
it's like trying to do chords that sound like chords and the vo- vocals are trying to sing a melody and it's like it's it's being dragged back into the realm of music that it's been trained on more heavily which is what I was trying to achieve I was trying to pick like can I go really obscure and weird with it uh to like something that would be outside of its training data let me keep playing you this song That's the part before I turn it on. Then the lyrics are going to make sense. Make sense. See the darkness swell. Life's bitter end. What's there to yearn? Gaze in my heart. It's a hollow hell. Place iron coins. Let my spirit burn. Grasp my wrist. Whisper I'm not awake. The path I tread. The devil grins. No mistake. So that bit you can hear, it's like, it's going a bit more metal. It's going a bit more like, <clears throat> you know, melodic. And that bit, do you hear that? It, it became a chord for a second there. It became a major chord. Get my soul. This is the other one. This is sick. That intro was sick. That shouldn't have. That shouldn't be allowed to exist. keep fucking around with this this is this is crazy this is insane i found it i found an error i have found i have pushed the limits of this goddamn thing uh this udo thing i've completely i've 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 i busted it now this might not sound like i busted it That might not sound like I busted it. That might sound like I put something in like uh, Indian sitar music. But the reason that's busted is that I entered as the prompt Balinese gamelan music, which if you know anything about what that means, it does not sound like a sitar. It is, <laughs> it is not like this at all. So I have, that's unusual that they would, that's very odd. Why would it generate Indian sounding music instead of gamelan music? It's like gamelan music is very particular. It sounds a very particular. I mean, the gamelan, a particular instrument, particular tuning system. I guess they just didn't train it on any gamelan music. So it's like aiming for something vaguely Asian. <laughs> so they fucked up there. Let's talk about Denpachan. Can we talk about Denpachan? I'm going to talk about Denpachan. Denpachan is a text board I made. And, uh,. Today, I wrote an about page, uh, and I would really hope that people decide to read this about page. <laughs> um, but the about page on Denpachan, wait a minute, it's not there. Did I fuck up? Did I forget to put it on this page? Wait, what is going on? What the fuck? Did it get, what is happening? Did it get the, did it, did, wait. Hold on, I'm confused. <laughs> wait a minute. Did it get deleted because someone made a post is that what happened 
Okay, now this is the fucking problem. I have no idea how any of this shit fucking works, man. I have no fucking clue how this shit works. I gotta go figure out. I don't know, like, it It regenerates the page every time someone posts. It regenerates the HTML. And it's just regenerating it without... But I managed to get rid of the the options thing before. How did I do that? What the fuck is going on? Hold on, I gotta fix my website. <laughs> For a while now... I'm going to talk about Team Fortress 2. I know I kind of said I would try and avoid of talking about Team Fortress 2, but I, I haven't even been playing DF2 lately. I just was thinking about it. Uh, there are were, there were many maps in Team Fortress 2, many of which probably shouldn't be in the game, uh, in my opinion. I'm looking at you, CP Junction. I'm looking at you, fucking Steel. I don't understand why anyone likes Steel. It's a garbage map. It's so unfun to play. Why do people like steel? It's not fun. It's just it got a stupid gimmick. But you know what? Now we have a new map which has the same gimmick and is still not a great map, but way better than steel. And it's called Sulphur. But no one fucking plays Sulphur. I don't know why. Steel is ugly, first of all. Sulphur looks great. Sulphur is a great looking map. And steel plays like shit. <laughs> It's not fun to play on. There's no... Everything's super closed off and tiny little tight corridors and little boxy rooms. Like, it's just... I don't understand how anyone can like fucking steal. It's a terrible map. Anyway, it's weirdly popular. I, I really don't understand it. Um, but then again, a lot of people, they hate Dust Bowl. And Dust Bowl is one of my favorite maps in the game. You know, I was thinking of making... You guys, I'm sure, are aware that there's a video called, I believe, talking about PL Badwater for 12 hours, which kind of inspired uh, these podcasts in, in part. Uh, and I feel like I could easily talk about Dust Bowl for 12 hours. I don't think it would be that difficult. Uh, the problem is the footage. I would have to play Dust Bowl for a long ass time to get a lot of footage. But then that's not even a problem because I don't even mind doing that. Uh, although I would rather play Dust Bowl, well, whatever. The The problem is the editing. I don't have the capacity to store that much HD footage, I don't think. You know, anyway, whatever. Uh, Dust Bowl's a great map, but I understand a lot of people don't like it. They think it's, it's choky and, and boxy and all the things that I complained about with Steel. But the difference is uh, that, see, Dust Bowl is not the same kind of map as like a, a, a bad water right bad water is is focused on aspects of the game this is not what this segment is supposed to be about man i don't know what's going on with my my nose but i'm just sneezing i'm just sneezing like crazy anyway sorry about this terribly sorry right no, this was about, this was the intro. This was the intro to this segment. Which is that TF2 has many bad maps. <laughs> and even one of my favorite maps, Dust Bowl, is regarded by many to be a bad map. Because it has a focus on team play and dealing with spam and uh, taking advantage of coordinated uber pushes rather than DM skill and tactics and flanking like most other maps uh, But it also, you know, I can understand why people just like gospel. It's fine. It makes sense to me But there is a map In Team Fortress 2, which is broadly hated. It's often considered to be the worst map in the game and That map is called PL Watville now, if you know Team Fortress 2, that name just made you quake and shiver in your boots. If you don't know TF2, then you have no idea what the fuck I'm talking about. And you should, I don't know, didn't, someone made a video about what though. It was, it was the what, I think, right? The what show. Go on YouTube and look up the what show and just, I don't know, find it. But to give you the summary, there's a Christmas map for TF2 called Whatville. And as I understand it, it was made by someone who was like a a new mapper who just sort of put it on the workshop for fun. 
and uh, had no expectations of Valve. Like, did, Valve just put it in the game for some strange reason, clearly without testing it or, like, even really looking at it because it is... Uh, the first thing most people will notice about Walt Bill is that it's exceptionally ugly. Uh, it's It's got really noisy, like, Christmas wrapping paper textures on all of the buildings. Uh, it just looks terrible. And then the second thing you'll notice about Wattville is as soon as you load in, it, it has terrible performance. It's extremely unoptimized. Uh, and then once you actually start playing it, you will then realize it is one of the worst design. It's it's insane how badly designed this map is. Like, it, 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 some people like to complain about sniper sightlines on certain maps. Wattville is like unmatched for uh, incredibly egregious sniper sightlines. Like, if you want to, if you, it's, it's just insane. You can see, like, all the way from one side of the map to the other, a sniper. It's just ridiculous. And then there were so many problems with the design of Wattville. It's insane. Like, it literally seems like it was designed by someone who's never played the game before. Like, it, it has, I don't even know how, to, it, the whole map is too big. It's, like, weirdly massive, but it's all, like, really boring. Like, there's no flanks. It's just kind of a straight line. And then there are some flanks, but the flanks are really weirdly designed. No fights ever happen on the flanks. It's fucking bizarre. It's like confusing as well. The layout is like really confusing. And then there's like an issue where uh, one of the spawns is like really e like ridiculously easy to camp by the other team. And there's just nothing you can do because all the spawns just have one exit. So like if you just get camped at this particular spawn... The engineer can just build a sentry right outside the door and you can't destroy it. Like, there's so many, there's a bunch of problems like this, right? Where, like, it, there's just really, the whole map is really, really badly designed. I mean, you can look this into this yourself. It's almost certainly the worst map in TF2. But it's only available to play during Christmas time. Because it's a Christmas map. Or a Smithmas map to be more, more. That's a fucking bug. What the hell? What is that? I thought that was just like a the hell was that? I thought, what the fuck? It just jumped. I hope that's not like a bed bug or something. That would be pretty fucked up. Anyway, I thought it was just like a bit of dirt on my 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 hand, but I I like went to wipe it off and it was a fucking living creature. I don't know where it went. What the fuck? That's weird. Anyway, uh, and I I love it. <laughs> I love Whatville. I fucking love it. It's like. It's like a so bad it's good comedy. It's like the room, you know, or or, um, or Gazi's wing or something like that, right? It's like a it's a you like you know those so bad it's good movies that it's like that but in a video game map. No one's ever thought of this. Before. Like this is a completely novel concept. It is fucking hilarious to play Whatville because it is so comically bad. Every time you play the map, something new, some new aspect of how badly designed it is comes out. To, it's it's amazing but then there's another reason why i love playing Wattville, and this is a much more egotistical reason which is that everyone who's like experienced with tf2 knows that it's the worst map in the game it's infamous for being the worst map in the game and so the only people you find on there are like new players who have no fucking idea what's going on and it's just so easy to destroy like they just don't they're so clueless they're so impossibly clueless it's hilarious i learned to play spy by playing Wattville, because there's always, like, 50 snipers who are, like, uber giga noobs, you know, just fucking staring down the sight lines, and you can just, e it's so easy to kill them, they're clueless. Uh, Wattville's great fun. It has so much weirdness and bad design that everyone hates it, but if you take the time to learn how to abuse the bad design of the map, it's so easy to just absolutely destroy because most people can't even figure out the basic layout of the map it's great fun i look forward to next christmas when i'll get to play Wattville again because it's great fun and it runs okay it, it runs bad and some people have more performance issues on the map than others it's to do with your cpu's single threaded performance i believe is that, is that what it's called i don't i don't know if that's what it's called but uh that's how the source engine works uh so it runs okay on my computer. But yeah, that's my that's that's what I'm going. That's this segment. Whatville is is a funny it's it's the only time in in that I it's the only thing I'm aware of 
that is a so bad it's good video game map like i don't think that exists anywhere else i want to talk about delivery apps food delivery now during covid when all the restaurants were closed everything started offering delivery and stuff like uber eats or what we have here in the uk is there's there's one called deliveroo uh, i think it's, it's australian uh but these apps got really popular for obvious reasons um and they obviously have numerous problems in terms of uh labor issues uh that much is clear but i don't want to enough many people have already talked about that that's not what i want to talk about right now i want to talk about when and why does it make sense to order delivery the i suppose common sort of feeling behind it is that it's convenient but in reality ordering delivery is rarely the most convenient option uh you know a much more convenient option would be something like a microwave meal or what i do which is huel uh the the savory what do they call it I've, they've changed the name of it it used to be called hot and savory but now it's called something else uh but the the huel that's real food rather than just powder that you drink uh instant meals yeah huel instant meals so either you know microwave meals or ready meals or huel instant meals for a slightly healthier option that is going to be the most convenient because the main problem with delivery there's there's obviously it's just a bad deal like when you actually think about it it's obviously a bad deal cuz all the food is absurdly expensive once you add on the delivery cost that they charge it's you know you're paying kind of an absurd amount of money and then it always says something like oh well deliver it in 15 minutes but it it's always longer than that it's 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 never food has never arrived early for me you know it i'm i think this is a universal experience like it's always it always takes fucking ages for the food to get there and then when it gets there it's always cold so by the t- basically the situation is you're paying too much to get a meal much slower than you could get it if you just bought like a simple instant meal type of situation because that's the most convenient type of food like the most convenient food that i've ever found is huel instant food right it takes about 5 minutes i'm eating it right now you can go from hungry to having a meal in front of your face in 5 minutes and unlike most of the other options huel is comparatively healthy you know it it it's got all the nutrients you need in it it's a complete nutritionally complete meal and some of them even taste pretty good uh and it's obviously much cheaper i mean it's huel is not the cheapest food you could be eating at least not the the instant meals the huel essential powder the cheapest huel product is 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 much cheaper it's like 1 pound per meal the instant meals work out to about i think 2 pound 30 per per meal which i worked out which is not that cheap compared to like you know a lot of meals if i was making something from scratch would probably come down cheaper than that most of the time even stuff with meat in it for example cuz you know most of what i'm eating is rice meat and vegetable <laughs> that's like 90% of the meals i eat uh and that's not very expensive cuz i buy the cheaper i buy meat as cheap as it can possibly you know like you got a big here's a classic no thank you meal you get you you buy frozen beef mince which is absurdly cheap um and then rice you cook the rice and then you fry up the mince with some onion and you just you just stir fry it with soy sauce and some sugar and you know whatever spices you have on hand whatever chinesey inspired stuff until it gets nice and crispy you well you, you put the spice the flavorings in at the end so they don't burn but you fry the 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 beef mince up until it gets crispy and then you put you know your seasonings in plenty of sugar that's the thing you want to make it sweet and umami lots of msg and that's that meal as far as i'm concerned is basically free like every every ingredient there is so cheap that it you it's basically free food um or you know rice and beans another common no thank you meal it's basically free uh so the real issue with delivery for me 
I think for most people, is the fact that you're paying too much money for for service that isn't even really very good. Because the idea is, oh, it's convenient because you don't have to cook for yourself. But most cooking for yourself is also not really involved. Like, at least the meals I make, most of the meals I make that is cooking for yourself is like one minute to put rice in a rice cooker and then like, you know, no time at all to put food in an oven and then you just wait for the food to be cooked, (laughs) you know? Like there's no, as long as you're not cooking like things on the hob that you have to monitor constantly, which is not most food, then I don't understand why people think cooking is like inconvenient or a hassle. It's it it's annoying because it takes time, not because it takes effort. Some meals take a lot of effort. I don't cook those meals. My meals involve you take some cheap meat, which is normally like chi- chicken thighs or chicken, you know, wings or drumsticks, because those are the cheaper parts of a chicken, and they also hold up better in the oven. Dark meat, uh, and then you put some fucking rice in the rice cooker, and you don't have to think about it. Like, and then you just, you just wait. Like, that's all. You just set a timer and you just eat it when it's done. It doesn't take any time or effort or prep, you know. Throw some frozen vegetables in at the end. And it will heat up and with the rice. It's, it's a fucking, fu- I don't understand this meme about, like, what do you mean you can't cook? How can you not? I don't understand. <laughs> like, the people will say, oh, I can't cook. That's not possible. It's literally impossible. What do you mean you can't cook? You just turn the oven on and put the food in the oven and then take it out when it's ready. What do you mean you can't cook? What are you talking about? It's, it's, it's insane to me. I don't I don't understand how this is like inconvenient for people or, or, or whatever. It takes about the same amount of time to cook most foods or less as it does for the delivery to actually arrive at your house. So in what sense is delivery more convenient than cooking? It's not, is the answer. So, it's like, even even buying relatively expensive food from the store is always a better deal than ordering it for delivery. You know, like, let's say I want a curry. The cheapest option would be for me to buy all of the ingredients, make it from scratch, in a big batch, and then I can freeze or put in the fridge the rest of the portions and then I have curry for like a week and it's it's or for however long if it's if I freeze it you know for forever I have curry for a week I just won't you know cook some rice when I want it or you know whatever and then you have curry but curry is a very involved it has a lot of spices it has it's a, it's a pretty involved uh meal it's not something that I super like making myself because it's, it's uh pretty tricky and you have to like you know it has a lot of ingredients that are only found in curry, at least, you know, it doesn't have ingredients, the ingredients that you would use to make a curry are not things that I typically have laying around the house, so if I make a curry, I have to specifically go out and buy the ingredients for that, and then, you know, whatever I don't use just sort of sits there, uh, so in this situation, for that meal, making a a curry is probably not something I'm going to want to do on the regular, uh, you know, at mine, now, at the end of the day, that curry will be fucking delicious because every time I've made curry, it has turned out amazing. It is, it, it tastes really good, but it's often not worth the effort. So then you have two other options. Option number one is order a curry. Open up your delivery app and, and find an Indian restaurant and order a curry for delivery. Or option number two, go to the store and buy a ready-made curry that you just heat up in the oven. Now, you would think, well, the store-bought curry is obviously going to be significantly inferior to the fresh restaurant-made curry. But, as someone who has tried tried both, it is inferior, but it is not that much inferior. Like, it's perfectly, it will perf- if if I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh, you know what I fancy? I want a curry. It will hit the spot. The, the store-bought ready meal curry will fulfill my desire for curry which is not a frequent one i'm not a massive curry guy i like i like a a curry when i get one you know 
I, I like a, a vindaloo. I like, I, I'm a pretty, you know, I'm not a super experienced with Indian food. So forgive me if these are like normie picks, but all the normie, you know, British Indian food meals. In fact, my, I, I don't even like tikka masala. I, I don't hate it, but it's, I would never willingly buy tikka masala because I, I don't know, it's not my favorite. I'm more of a butter chicken, madras, you know, there's the korma. I love a korma. Chicken korma, that shit's good as fuck. Um, anyway, it's not about... The point is that in terms of convenience, they're equal. In terms of taste, the difference isn't that great. The difference isn't massive. The 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 slightly fancier um, ready-made curries at all of my local shops are pretty good. They're pretty good. And the only thing left is the price, which obviously... You're paying about five times less for for store bought than you are for delivery. So why on earth would you ever buy delivery? Now there are some times when I do order delivery. I get it from time to time. I used to do it when I first started living alone and I had a bunch of money and no one to tell me how to spend it. I was like, fuck it, I'm gonna buy delivery all the time. Fuck cooking for myself. I quickly realized that that was a stupid idea because it costs way too much money, and uh, it's not even really worth it. It's not even really convenient or anything. And, actually, something important. The food on Arthur, the food that you can get through delivery apps, vast majority of it is like fast food. It's not good meals. It's not like good hearty meals that are going to make you feel good after you eat it. It's mostly fast food, which just makes you feel like shit. And it's like, it's not even that it makes me feel, it's just that, like, I wasn't raised eating a bunch of fast food, and and I don't really have, like, I like it, I like a burger, I like a, I like a, a burrito, you know, I like a, all of the, the fast food staples, but I'm not someone who would eat that all the time, I just don't, I just don't want it all the time, it's not, it's not, it's, I don't know, it's, it's kind of like, I would eat a cake, I would eat a slice of cake, but I wouldn't eat a whole cake, you know? That's too much cake. Um, sorry for my, my eating while I'm talking to you. But that's what inspired this segment anyway. Where was I? Yeah, so I don't... The majority of the food offered on these delivery apps is, is fast food, which I don't even want most of the time. And if you only eat fast food, it makes you feel really bad. And then when you go back to eat it, you'll just feel really bad. And the biggest culprit of this is McDonald's. Like, I, I literally cannot eat McDonald's anymore. I don't know what happened to me. But I, I can eat, like, a little bit. Like, if I'm, for some reason, out somewhere and I need a quick, cheap snack, getting a McDonald's cheeseburger for, like, one pound, at least it was one pound last time I got it, inflation has happened since then, so I wonder if they've raised the price. But, you know, it's that's... Like, I can eat that, and that's fine. But getting enough McDonald's to, to equate to a full meal, after I eat it, I will literally take poison damage. <laughs> like, I can feel my body going, ooh, 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 you know? Like, fucking Minecraft. Like, it's it's genuinely really unpleasant. Like, I feel... I And it doesn't happen with other fast food places. This is exclusively McDonald's. Like, Burger King doesn't do this to me. None of the other fast food places do this to me. McDonald's, for some reason, it just makes me feel really like I want to throw up, gives me a headache, and it's not even like any other, <laughs> it's a completely unique form of pain. Anyway, so I'll very rarely get McDonald's. I, I never get McDonald's, in fact. Uh, it's not all McDonald's items that do this to me, it's only the beef stuff. Like, if I if I get a, a McChicken or, or a fillet of fish, I feel not great. But not that bad. Not as bad as, as, like, if I get a McDouble or something. Anyway. There are some times when I will order fast food, though. Or order delivery. And that's because fast food oftentimes doesn't taste as good when you make it yourself. It's designed in a very particular way. To be, to be optimized for, you know, those sorts of restaurants. So, what I mean by that... And this is not true for everything. I used to think it was true for wings, right? But then I discovered 
that oven wings are delicious. Oven cooked wings are fucking amazing. You can just make them yourself for literally a quarter the price of even a cheap, 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 cheap wing, wing place. Wings are like the, the cheapest cut of chicken you can buy because they're all bone. So it's like, I don't know, ever since I discovered oven wings are like delicious, I, I feel like I can't even justify buying wings anymore. Uh, but there are a few things and that's basically burgers. The reason for that is I could make burgers at home that are way better than any burger you can buy, at least that I've ever had. I All of the best burgers I've ever had in my life, aside from one, have been ones I've made myself at home or my mum made back in the day at home. The, the only other time was, was one time at Five Guys when I was extremely hungry and extremely stoned and that Five Guys burger was a fucking spiritual experience to me. But anyway, the reason I don't make burgers at home very often is because to make a really good burger, I'd have to go to a butcher and like specifically get a, 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 a beef mix mints that is like designed for burgers and that's a lot of effort so i don't want to do that now you can go to a local store or do my online delivery groceries or whatever and buy the like preformed burger patties that they sell to you to cook and sometimes those are okay but they're not great and even in terms of value for money they're pretty shockingly bad now i'm not someone who eats burgers all the time by the way, this only applies to beef burgers. If I'm talking chicken burger, it's very easy to make a chicken burger. Like, they, they have these, like, frozen little pucks of chicken chicken burgers, and those taste great. Those, those taste great. I like those. So, yeah, this only applies to beef. But So, a burger place is, is valid because it's just impractical to make at home. And it also, even if you do make it at home, you have to... It takes a lot of effort. Like, you have to be active the whole time over the grill. You have to use really high heat. It stinks up your whole kitchen, smokes it up. It's kind of annoying. Um, also, last time I made burgers, I almost started a grease fire. So that happened. So burgers. Now, when it comes to burgers, I got to say, I'm a Five Guys person. I'm a Five Guys guy. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, Five Guys, that's absurd. When you're just complaining about food being too expensive, isn't Five Guys like a massive ripoff? Well, I have two retorts for that. Firstly, if you've watched some of Hank Green's most recent videos, you'll know that actually for the amount of meat you're actually getting, Five Guys is not a massive ripoff. It's it's relatively expensive, just like you would expect all fast food, because fast food isn't cheap. This idea that fast food is cheap, I don't know where it came from. Fast food is not cheap. It's never been cheap. I, I don't know where pe why people think it is cheap. Americans seem to have this idea that fast food is like cheap and convenient, but it's actually expensive and convenient um, Anyway, but five guys. Yeah, if you actually look into the numbers compared to like McDonald's uh, Like five guys burgers are just much bigger five guys fries and portions are just much bigger and so on like when you actually compare what you're paying for uh, It's it's not that that much more expensive and the more food you get the better the deal is Which is another thing. I always do when I get delivery I always buy enough food to be at least two meals. Always. You will never catch me buying... Because the delivery cost is, is a flat price. So the more food you buy, the better the deal is. Um, anyway, that's reason number one, which is that actually it's not as expensive as you think. And secondly, because... I'm already shelling out for delivery. Like, this is already considered a special occasion when I'm splurging. I may as well get something good instead of a shitty burger. And I've tried every burger chain in the UK. And Five Guys is the best one. So I'm not going to fucking be a pussy about it. I'm going to get a good-ass burger because this is a rare opportunity where I'm going to make a burger. I'm a big Five Guys evangelist. I remember when Five Guys first opened in the UK. It was crazy. We never had good burgers before. And Americans, you guys are so spoiled for choice with burgers that I've heard many Americans say like, Five Guys isn't even that good. You don't know what you don't know you don't know what it was like, man. You don't know what it's like to have no good burger places. Anyway, 
uh, yeah, Five Guys is, is probably my go-to. Alternatively, here's something you don't have, I'm pretty sure. I don't think this exists in America. Wimpy. We have Wimpy. Now, Wimpy, a very different type of establishment, very old school. The appeal of Wimpy is not necessarily that the food is good. It's that they give you a massive quantity of food for a pretty good price. They absolutely do. I've never been able to finish a, an order of just a typical, you know, burger and fries. I've never been able to finish all the fries. They just give you so many. And they're thick cut as well. They give you an insane amount of fries. And then the burgers themselves are, are big. The buns are big. And it tastes pretty good on top of all that. It's got a, it's not, it's, you know, when you, when you, when you bite into like a, a classically good burger, like a Five Guys or a Shake Shack, uh, you know, one of these things, um, it's kind of like an orgy of, of beef juices and fat and, and toasty notes and, and maybe mayo, you know, it's very, um, rich. It's a very rich, very beef forwards type of situation, right? But, but a wimpy burger is more like, uh, I don't know how to explain it. It's, 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 it's much less full of itself. It's much less American. It feels, it feels very, it's very plain, it's very straightforward about what it is. It's not the highest quality beef. They don't even toast the buns. You know, it's just, here's a big slab of meat in between two, two bits of bread and then a bunch of chips. You know, you get what you pay for. And it tastes, you know, pretty, pretty okay. <laughs> It's, it's not the best thing ever, but it's got a certain appeal to it. So that's the other time that I'll order a burger, is I want a million food. I need all the calories, and I need them immediately inside of me. That's when I'll get a wimpy. But if I just want a burger, it'll be a Five Guys. So that's food number one, burgers and fries. Now, food number two that I will occasionally order delivery. This is probably my most common delivery order. Food number two, pizza. The reason... I don't have a pizza oven. I can't make pizza as good at home as any of the pizza places around me can make. You get, when you order a pizza, you're getting something you can't, there is no alternative to. I've tried making pizzas at home. They've never really come out great. But more than that, making a pizza at home is a fuckload of effort. It's, it, you have to spend so long preheating the oven to get it super hot. You got to make a dough from scratch and then let it rise. It's like, if just, no, it's, it's not happening. I'm not making, I'm not making pizza. Okay, fuck you. I'm not making pizza from scratch. So the other option is to buy a frozen pizza or just a, a pre-made pizza from the store. And this is not a bad option. I do this all the time. I eat quite a lot of pizza. <laughs> I eat quite a lot of pizza from the store. Most of the vast majority of the pizzas I eat are those and Even the the way I justify it to myself right is that the only ones that are actually very good Are the more expensive pizzas that you can buy pre-made from the store. Let's say they're about six pounds It's pretty expensive for a meal now because they're big. It's more like two meals It's like a meal one meal and two-thirds about like normally I eat about uh, I don't know, but normally I, I try, I say I'm gonna eat half the pizza now, half the pizza later, and then I finish off half the pizza, and I'm like, let me have one more slice. So that's, and then the next, and then later comes around, and I'm like, god damn it, I wish I had an extra slice of pizza right now. But nonetheless, the big pizzas that are about six pounds from the store, pretty good, pretty tasty. Then it's not the same, it's, it's not the same in any way as a stone-baked, you know, wood-fired pizza but it, it is pretty good and that's the majority of pizzas i'll eat and the way i justify it to myself is well ordering a pizza you're talking like 13 14 pounds which is an absurd amount of money to pay for a pizza and that's one of the ch that's still like comparatively cheap for, for a delivery order uh so i'm like well it's half the price you know if i really have to get a pizza i should just do this but i will occasionally order a pizza just because Making a pizza from scratch is a fucking massive hassle. Pizza is expensive anyway. There's no point in buying the cheap, you know, cheaper store-bought pizzas because they're just garbage. You buy them because you're like, oh, I want a pizza, but I can't really justify splurging out. I can't really justify the six pounds. Let me get the two pound pizza. 
And then you cook it, and it's like, it doesn't cook evenly, and it, it, it tastes like shit. <laughs> the, the bread is like, the, the dough, I don't know what it is. It's like a terrible texture. You're like, yeah, I, I remember why I don't buy these. And it's, it's, it's not good, it's not good. You don't want to do that. Uh, so that's a, that's a, pizza is a, another food that I will get. I don't buy from any chains. Once in a while, once in a, like, once every three months, I'll get a Domino's pizza. Maybe. Very rarely. I'll get a Domino's pizza, but normally there's a bunch of good pizza places, like just random restaurants near me that, uh, you know, all do delivery and they're all cheaper than Domino's and much, much better. So I almost, ne you know, those are normally my go-tos. There's like loads of pizza. I don't know. I, lo I don't know if it's, I must live in some sort of hub for pizza. There's pizza everywhere and it's all good. Uh, and then the next option for delivery is Mexican food and this has been my Achilles heel because recently not that recently but semi recently Taco Bell arrived in the UK and this has destroyed my wallet and my stomach Taco Bell is too fucking good I had developed a serious Taco Bell problem I'm over it now mostly but you have to understand this okay until like two years ago, there was zero good Mexican food in the entire country. There were no Mexicans. There was nothing. Can you imagine? And sure, as, as an American, you can't even conceive of this. There was no Mexican food that was like of, of any quality. It was, it was fucking garbage. And, you know, you'd get a little bit. You'd get little hints of Mexican food throughout your life. And you'd be like, that was pretty good. But then sort of recently, it seems like... People have spotted this gap in the market, and there's been a burst of Mexican restaurants in London. Including Taco Bell, which is obviously more of a fast food place, but, you know, also real Mexican restaurants. And they're pretty expensive, the real ones, and they are impossibly delicious. <laughs> there's one, I'm not going to name it because it would dox me, but there's one semi-close to me that, man, is it expensive. But holy fuck, it's delicious. It is so good. It like the burritos, the taco. Oh my god, just thinking about it. I just ate and it's making my mouth water. It's so good. But Taco Bell is a different story entirely. Because those fucking, those shits that they got there. Oh no, they put crack in them, man. They put fucking crack. They put crack in the quesadillas. Taco Bell quesadilla, so good. Or just any of the burritos. So fucking good. <laughs> and relatively cheap. Kind of. Kind of. Relatively. So I did develop a mild problem with, with eating too much Taco Bell. But I have prohibited myself from from ordering uh, delivery more than once a month. So I don't get it very often. But now that is something... It, I You cannot replicate Taco I can make Mexican food at home. I've done it many times. Uh, you know, and it tastes, tastes pretty good. It's not as good as any of the, the, the um, you know, the, the restaurants that I could order from. Not even close. But it's pretty, pretty alright. Uh, mostly because it's hard to find good quality Mexican ingredients um, in, in regular stores. Uh, so, so that is just something that, yeah, it's, it's just, if you want Mexican food, it's, it's almost certainly better to just uh, get delivery. But I consider it to be a treat. And man... The shit they put in that Taco Bell food, I don't know how it tastes so good, but it, it's amazing, man. Some of it isn't that good. Not everything on the menu is amazing. I've had some stuff from Taco Bell, and I'm just like, this, it's so salty. Like, why would you put so much salt in this? Like, there was one, I think it was called the Volcano Burrito, and it had, like, beef, cheese, rice, I think, and it had, like, Doritos in it, <laughs> like, crushed up bits of Dorito, and it was just so salty. It was good, but it was way too salty. I, I don't know what they were thinking with that one. And honestly, Crunchwrap Supreme, not great. I don't understand the hype around the Crunchwrap Crunch Supreme. It's far from the best menu item at Taco Bell. It's not even close. I'm not going to go into my, my favorites, uh, but there's a bunch of good shit at Taco Bell. Taco Bell was a real problem for me. It was a real problem for me. Shit's too fucking good. But... I'm using my skills of self-control 
to to not purchase Taco Bell because it's just not worth the price. But that is something that even if you can make semi decent Mexican food at home, you can't make Taco Bell at home. I don't know what the fuck they put in that shit, but it just doesn't taste like it doesn't taste like anything else. It doesn't taste like anything I, I've ever been able to make at home. I don't I don't understand what it is. But those are the things. Those are the things that I would I would feel like it's va- valid to order delivery for. Now, of course, I mentioned Indian food before, right? As I said, I'm not I'm not a massive Indian uh, Indian guy. I'm not I'm not I, I like it, but it doesn't make up a huge portion of my diet. But there's something that I should be doing more, which I I I went through a very brief phase of doing this, and then I stopped, and I should get back into it, which is uh dal which i believe i i i know it's uh i think it, it's northern india um whatever it's like lentils and now that if you want a cheap absurdly cheap and tasty food dal is where it's at that shit i mean lentils they basically given them out for free uh protein very healthy fiber protein etc um <clears throat> legumes and rice, I mean, it's, it's basically free. Dal is basically free, and it's pretty tasty. I need to, it's a bit of a pain to make. It's like a little bit, it's not that much effort, but it's a little bit annoying. So I gotta, I gotta get back on my dal cooking, because that, that shit's good. But here's the thing about cooking at home, is once you figure out that MSG exists, you, like, your food's gonna taste great. And now I'm, I will concede that I've been cooking for a long time, and I consider I also watch a lot of like cooking YouTube and stuff, so I'm like a pretty decent cook. I don't really like cooking that much just because it's annoying. But anyway, that's the basic premise here that I wanted to go through. Is uh, I don't understand this meme that ordering delivery is somehow convenient. It's almost never the most convenient option. Even out of the things I I gave, only Mexican and it, only Mexican food was it the most convenient. Because even every other type of food, you can just make it yourself or buy some sort of ready-made version from the supermarket. Uh, so yeah, I don't I don't understand this meme about about it being convenient. That's my basic. That's that's my thesis statement. You're paying too much for food that is okay, um, and it takes like an hour to get to your house. Why are you doing that? Stop doing that. Let this industry die. I've been to a number of art museums in my time. I quite enjoy art museums. Uh, I went to a lot as a kid, and, uh, you know, the classic, the classic smoke some weed, go to an art museum is a classic experience. We've all done it, maybe. Uh, and I have strong opinions on art museums, because uh, I think I've mentioned this many times, that uh, I love the art, I hate the museums. I always think that, like, the whole point of an art museum is kind of, well, it's twofold, you know, let's say threefold. There's three aspects which are, which uh, an art museum, um, or the three purposes, I suppose, three, not necessarily purposes, three actions which it performs. Number one, it's a place where you can go and see art. That's nice. There's, there's, you know, that's nice. We all like that. Number two, galleries are always these big stripped down white spaces with, with, no context and in that sense it strips the art of any context or it unifies the the context of of all of the art there's no longer some it tries to act as a neutral environment you know like and that kind of pisses me off (laughs) i kind of don't like that it kind of tries to draw a boundary where it's like this is this neutral environment that doesn't really exist and you should go and view these arts as art pieces as if they're sort of floating in space, and the little plaque next to them is all you. And I, I don't, I, I don't like it. I don't like that. I, I actually quite dislike it. Especially, it can work sometimes. There are sometimes where it's fine, but there's oftentimes, you know, a lot of art is political. A lot of art is tied to some specific geography or some pol- specific political movement or artistic movement or historical event or you know any of these things and it you know rather than 
You can't experience it like that, though, because instead it's ripped out of any context and all you get is this little fucking plaque. I can't, I hate that shit. Like, um, there was a... I, I also think that a lot of the art in, in museums is just bad. Uh, it's like everything, you know? Mo- most of everything is, is shit. Uh, it's the same with art museums. You're going to go in and most of it's going to be shit. Uh, that's just my opinion, though. Yeah, I'm remembering the last time I went to a museum, just exhibitions full of shit. (laughs) And a lot of that wasn't necessarily just because the art was not to my liking, but it was also because there were specific, like, this was an exhibition called Artists in Society. It was about political art, and yet so much of the art that existed there was like, you know, you'd read the plaque and it would explain exactly how this was a particular piece that was supposed to be in this location, commenting on this very specific event or whatever, and we've ripped it out of all the context and stuck it next to a bunch of other paintings, and uh, I, I don't know, I just felt like it stripped all meaning from the, the pieces. It just became a, a spec, you know, spectacular, simulacral, one of those words, you know? It just, it just became a performance of... Uh, you know, this idea that we're examining the relation between artists and society, it was also extremely literal. It was a pretty disappointing exhibition. But there were some good pieces towards the end of the exhibition, like just topographically walking toward... To, there were some really great sculptures that, I, that were at the end of it. Um, so that kind of made it all worth it. Uh, anyway, so that's something that... that um, art galleries do and you might think that this is like maybe a particularly picky or or strange thing to get mad about but i i think it's very important in the sense that what a gallery serves to do is it serves to separate art from the rest of life that there's this this special separate space and this is the place where art exists and you know that's what's important here is that it's a curated space you know by people you've never met with whatever sort of um you know uh motivations they might have and that's very important which i'll touch back on in reason purpose three or behavior three uh, of art galleries uh and it's like you step out of because most of the art you see especially visual art there's you only generally see two things you either see corporate art you know which is obviously garbage and honestly i kind of hate the fact that that corporate art has been being like rehabilitated as much as i enjoy you know stuff like uh hey here's here's this uh, uh video essay about the guy who composed the disney channel theme tune or whatever it's like okay sure whatever that's a nice video you've got there but can we I don't like this rehabilitation of corporate art I, it, I would I would much rather this wasn't happening I don't like the fact that people people have forgotten the the concept of selling out this is something I feel strongly that like in the, the it started in the 90s before I was born that there was this this selling out was the worst thing when was the last time you ever heard someone accused of being a sellout like, this entire concept has just died off with Gen Z, and it, it's very strange to me. We don't have the concept of, of sellouts anymore. Like, what the fuck? Come on, guys. I don't like, I don't like seeing that shit. It, it's, it's a corrupting force. And these, these uh, corporate artists are, are sellouts. And it's, it's uh, I don't like it. It's all, it's soulless art made for some corporate purpose that is like always devoid of any like real meaning. Uh, you know, I'm not just talking about the Disney Channel theme tune, but like, you know, the statues you see outside of, of big office blocks or murals on, on the walls of an office building and, and these sorts of things. It's pretty bad. Or even the worst, the, the, the illustrators and graphic designers who, who do web design. Oh, man. I hate those people. They're all terrible. Uh, so that's the num- That's the first place and the most common place you see art. And then the second place you see art is inside a museum where it's like, hey, okay, now we have this pure special art that's separate. It's just decontextualized and it's only exists inside this museum. I-, I hate that shit too. 
the only real art is gonna and then you have graffiti that's the the final piece which i didn't i so then you have graffiti and a, a lot of graffiti is shit right the try you know you guys know the try hard garbage banksy uh yoda signing up holding up a sign that says stop wars you know like those garbage things and a lot of that stuff isn't even real graffiti though it's just corporate art it's a commissioned mural um but the actual graffiti um you know i would i think that that just tags and throws like the 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 stuff that most people consider to a lot of people especially from the older generation they have like a much much more hostile attitude towards graffiti where they're like uh when they were growing up they probably just thought it was all all a mess and then they you know the media popped up banksy as this this big big thing and uh etc and then an opinion you hear is like you know i like the graffiti that has like artistic merit but when some guy's just just putting his name on the wall or or whatever no you see i have the opposite opinion i think the if you if you spend like five minutes researching the the like actual artistry behind tags it's actually really fascinating i i i love like the low effort tags i think that shit looks super super cool and what i really like about it is is that it, it's almost a form of architecture and it's almost a form of extreme sport like it's all of these things together you know you see a tag in a place that's like how the fuck did he get there <laughs> and it's great it it literally opens your eyes to the the like physical space of the the buildings that surround you in a in a completely new way it's great i love seeing that shit or yeah, i mean it doesn't have to be like that though I even just seeing like graffiti in a place you would expect to see graffiti, your eyes probably just glaze over and just see like you don't even think about it. But next time you see a random little tag that you probably walked past a million times or whatever, actually take a look at the design of the tag because every every graffiti artist they spend ages working on their their tag and making it look like unique to them and practicing it and so on. Like, it is worth taking a look at that sort of thing. So I think graffiti is very valid art. Um, but, you know, it's very limited. The The point being that uh, graffiti is, is, a, is, is nice but extremely limited. Um, and then you have soulless corporate art. And then you have the real art that gets sucked up into an art gallery and, and sucked out of society and sucked out of life. And I don't like that separation. I think the art should just be be in random ass places you should just randomly turn a corner and suddenly you know there's a Rothko there and you're like what the fuck <laughs> you know that's the sort of thing I want to see uh okay this has been a rant that's gone on for too long the third thing was it's obviously like a speculative asset that that and there's there's like taste makers that work for these art galleries that are so and and the uh the art dealers and they're all in cahoots to set people up like Damien Hirst you you know who sort of only exists to make money for some people and it's very annoying but this was not what I wanted to talk about what I wanted I wanted this was supposed to be a short segment about a very specific complaint that I have there's a bunch of people who think they're really smart and like to think they're super cultured who will go up to you and say you have the wrong you don't know how to look at art all of these oh you don't know how to look you see a painting you don't really there's some skill to looking there's some like oh you don't really know how to look there's like books written about this shit i fuck you <laughs> like <laughs> i hate that you know how i how i've tried this by the way i've tried the approach where you stare deeply into every art art piece find you know walk i i t tend to like walk back and forth in the space to try and find the right the right distance from the piece where it feels appropriate and, and look at it from all sorts of different angles and, and distances and stare deeply into it and try and pay attention to the composition and where my eyes are drawn and so on, so on. Like I do that to pieces that I enjoy, but I've even tried doing that with pieces that don't grab me where I'm just walking around the gallery trying to deeply look at every single art piece. And frankly, it's fucking boring because most of it sucks. The way I have found the optimal art gallery experience is you go to a place and you just walk you just walk and you scan and you just sort of hang out and you don't you don't even think about it. Your mind should be elsewhere. 
you're not even thinking about the fact that you're looking, you know, and you're walking around and then suddenly out of the corner of your eye, you see something and you're like, oh, that's fucking sick. What is that? And then you go up to it and you're like, whoa, that's cool. And then you read the plaque and then you go back to looking at the painting with the information you have from the plaque and you do whatever fuck you feel like doing, whether it's staring at the painting for for one more second where you're like, huh, that's pretty neat. And then we're moving on. Or if it's like, I don't know, something really cool. Like, I'm a big fan. I like, I like big paintings. I know this is, this is kind of a strange thing, but I'm just a big fan of scale. I like big thing. I, I feel like just seeing a painting that's a very standard size or very small, uh, or, or, or like nothing special in terms of, of scale, it, 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 it doesn't really pull me in to such a degree. Maybe this is very naive, but I'm okay with it being naive. I kind of, I kind of like the fact that it's naive. What I, I want something approaching the sublime, you know, I want to see something huge. I want to see a big ass sculpture. I want to see a fucking big ass uh, painting, big ass canvas, you know, something like this. That is like a cheat code into my brain. When you show me something big, something much bigger than me, I'm like, that is bigger than me. And and that's the feeling I'm looking for when I go to an art gallery is a sensation of of perspective and scale and the good paintings even the the small ones can still get you to have a visceral sense of perspective and scale but the fundamental thing i'm talking about here is that just wander through a gallery and don't look at any of the paintings because a painting that that is actually good will just reach out and grab you and you don't have to fucking pay attention to the 99 percent that don't because they're all garbage anyway uh and, and then if and then there's no proper anyone who tells you there's a proper or improper way to to like look at art I know I'm kind of doing that right now I'm just describing the way that I've found works best for me you may have you know your mileage may vary uh, but the the point I'm really trying to make is once you've actually found a painting that you want to stare at don't I don't let anyone fucking tell you that there's a like some sort of correct length of like I know at least for me, sometimes I'm in an art gallery and I'm thinking to myself, how long am I supposed to look at this painting for? Like, am I, you know what I mean? I feel like this has to be some sort of universal experience, at least a little bit. Like, you ever in an art gallery and you're like, how long should I look at this painting for? Is Should I, like, be staring at this longer? Are people going to judge me? If I, No one's going to judge you. I do, I will say, I have one strong opinion about behaviours in an art gallery. And that strong opinion is this. Anyone who fucking tells you to be quiet, th- they should be murdered. The fact, the idea that art galleries, it's like a library. Everyone has to be like hushed tones and, and like prim and proper. Beh- this is fucking retarded. You know what's a, an experience, one of the best things? You know what's one of the best feelings that you can get from an art gallery that almost no one ever does because they're all too high on huffing the fumes of this idea that of like what they think art is supposed to be one of the best experiences you can have in an art gallery is laughter i will tell you 100 percent because the artists a lot of the times are, are the cool ones it's the artists that are chill the people who make the galleries and and, and make the rules for galleries and, and this shit's retarded but i guarantee you that there is some art in in whatever gallery you go to that is supposed to be funny or at the very least the artist thinks is funny at least to some extent. There's nothing wrong. You know, one time I went to an art gallery and there was this, there was this fucking robotic sculpture that would just like move in, in very strange ways. And when it did, it made a really loud noise. And it was something about it. It was dressed up like a cowboy and it was just fucking hilarious to me. And I couldn't stop laughing at it. There's no way the artist who made that didn't realize that they'd made something funny. A hundred percent that guy knew that he was doing something goofy. And if he didn't know, then he's a fucking idiot. And I sh- that doesn't matter. The point is, don't, like, have your loud conversations. Run around, a bit, you know, I'm normally one of these people that's like, I don't, I don't like children in public spaces. I get annoyed when there's, there's loud children in, in buses and stuff like that. This, the art galleries are one of the places where I have the opposite opinion. Bring your kids to art galleries and let them fucking run around and be rowdy and shit. Because our gal- art is a celebration of life, at least to some extent. It's a, it's something, you know, 
it's the it's it's not sterile it's lively right it's art is lively that an art gallery should be a lively space i don't like this dead atmosphere sterile clinical analytical uh you know pretentious fucking bullshit about art galleries i i hate that shit bring your friends chat amongst yourselves at a normal volume fuck the rest of the art gallery goers if they have a problem with it how the fuck does me talking affect your ability to see with your eyes now of course there are some exhibitions that are like you know move you know films or or sound art in those cases you should probably be quiet so you can appreciate the the sound aspect of it and not bother other people but if you're just in a room full of paintings or sculptures who gives a shit don't fucking worry about am i I, am i looking at this correctly because these fucking retards will actually try and convince you that there's an incorrect way to look like what are you talking about bro like the whole point of 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 all of this shit like that you can okay so here's my opinion here's my this is a let's get a bit nuanced here i think there are actually incorrect ways to experience art but only on a subjective level in the sense that some sometimes there are some people like i might get something out of a piece that you might not get out of it and that might be because you're coming into it with a strange or not strange but a mindset that's very different from mine or perhaps you're looking at it in a very different way like at the art gallery where i went recent recently there was a, a sculpture that was just sort of some, a pile of lights on the floor basically it was like it was like a, some lights lighting fixtures on the floor in a dark room and they were like mo- the lights were moving and the, the light was like flickering around the room in an interesting way and my dad who i was with didn't seem to like it very much he didn't seem to care for that piece but i liked it a lot but the specific reason i liked it a lot was i was basically ignoring the actual object itself and just paying attention to the way the light was playing in the features of the room because the architecture of the room we were in was really interesting which is something that I think all ga- art galleries should do more of because having art in a barren space that's trying to pretend it's not architecture is retarded buildings all buildings are architecture don't do don't try and pretend you're not doing architecture when you make a gallery you're doing architecture let it happen and that was something really interesting because I was looking at this piece and I was thinking about how it's like a sort of creating a breakdown between the gallery itself and the piece which obviously spoke to me a lot if you've heard about what i've been ranting about this whole time i that's uh, something that that's a very interesting concept to me um something I, I i i like a lot i was thinking about the the interplay of light in all the different ways i was thinking about the construction of the sculpt. i don't know the construction of the space the construction of the sculpture i was thinking about how like if you moved this piece to a different room or even just moved it by a few inches in the same room it would suddenly be a completely different piece I was thinking about like how shit this would be if the lights were on. I, I don't know, I was thinking about all sorts of stuff. And my dad wasn't thinking of any of this because he was just looking at the the pile of sort of lighting fixtures on the floor and being like, what, what's that about? And when we talked about it after we left, his appreciation for it had changed after I'd explained it to him. So in that sense, there's a ways of different ways of looking at art pieces where you can get more or less out of it in different aspects. But that's, you know, anyone who tries to be prescriptive about that is is fucking stupid. The, actually, that's part of the whole fascination and enjoyment of art is that you get to have a discussion about it afterwards where you talk about your different approaches and interpretations and ways of looking. So let's all have more fun in art galleries. You know what you should do in an art gallery? This is my, um, my recipe. You can follow this if you like. Your mileage may vary. But you should go to an art gallery drunk at least once in your life if you've never done this you should get drunk and go to an art gallery and i'm telling you it would, it changes the movie you know my ultimate problem with food is that i'm experiencing right now is that i don't know if this is an autism thing or what but i don't know that i'm hungry until i'm really fucking hungry and then it just all hits at once and i'm like god damn am i hungry <laughs> that's my ultimate food problem i don't know how to predict i mean I don't know. I just, I don't have any like signal that's like, hey, you should eat until it's like, you have got to eat now. I don't know. Very severe symptoms of hunger. Stomach pain, brain no work, 
low energy, low mood, everything gets fucked up. You know, all the typical things that happen when you're hungry. There's this new paper, <clears throat> it's called The Ant and the Grasshopper, Seasonality and the Invention of Agriculture. And it proposes, and it's pretty convincing with the evidence, that, uh, I'll just quote the abstract here. I propose that the rapid spread of agricultural techniques resulted from... Oh, let me just read the whole fucking thing. Fuck you. The Neolithic revolution saw the independent development of agriculture among at least seven unconnected hunter-gatherer populations. I propose that the rapid spread of agricultural techniques resulted from increased climatic seasonality, causing hunter-gatherers to adopt a sedentary lifestyle and store food for the season of scarcity. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Basically, if you look at climate data... Due to the Earth's axis, I don't really understand the, the dynamics of how this works, but I've I've heard of it before, it's real. Uh, like, sometimes, due to the Earth's axis, you get t periods of time where seasons are more extreme, and sometimes, you know, because it's tilted, right? Sometimes seasons are more extreme, and sometimes they're less extreme. And according to this paper, uh, there you can... You can look at the data on, on, on that and see that around the time when a whole bunch of different unconnected hunter-gatherer cultures developed agriculture, um, it lines up with a period of time when seasonal, the seasons suddenly got more extreme because of this, this Earth's tilt. And so the paper proposes that humans were effectively forced into doing agriculture because uh, it was the only reliable way to to stock up and survive harsh winters, and I think that's probably accurate. This seems it's. I mean, that seems like a pretty big coincidence, right? It was probably a factor. Uh, however, I want to add something on that this paper doesn't mention, which is the fact that there's there's. Um, it's it's not like these people didn't know what the fuck, didn't know that you could grow your own food and then suddenly invented it. They would have already been doing it to some degree via managed uh, food forests and so on. Horticulture, as people call it. Uh, which I think is really the key. Once I found out about this, it was kind of the key thing that made the development of agriculture make way more sense to me. Because when you read about it in school or or whatever... People are just sort of like, yeah, we were farmers. I mean, sorry, yeah, we were hunter-gatherers for, like, the vast majority of time, just hunting and gathering. And then randomly, everyone decided to start farming, uh, which no one had ever done before. And yet, somehow, everyone started doing it all the time, even though it sucked for thousands of years. It was really bad. <laughs> and it's kind of a confusing thing. But once you realize that, actually, it wasn't like there was this very clear delineation between hunting and gathering and then farming, that there's sort of like two very separate things, you know? In reality, it's a lot more of a spectrum. I mean, if you think about it, even to this day, there are a lot of people who forage and there are a lot of people who hunt, you know? And we would definitely consider this to be a, an agricultural society. Uh, and yeah, you, yeah, there are still a lot of people who forage and hunt, even if it's just for fun. Uh, and I mean, if you go out into the countryside anywhere, people are foraging, you know, wild foods for practical reasons all the time. Uh, I mean, even I've done it. I've, you know, I've, I've been eating, eating some wild berries from time to time as a kid. When, when you go on like a hike in the countryside or whatever, pick some blackberries, you do that shit. People do that shit. Um, just because it's, it's, it's good food and it's right there, it's, it's available. So, and this is, we're like way deep into ag culture now. If you think about the way this was kind of like a, um, a, a, a slow transition in the sense that you might have some sort of forest nearby, right? But that forest has been managed by your community for hundreds of years, perhaps. Planted, like... In a, it's it's a lot like agriculture, the way you manage a forest. You plant the shit you want, you cut down the shit you don't want. It's not that complicated. People probably figured it out a long time ago. Um, and then there's also something else to take into account, 
which is Sweden, um, cut and burn agriculture, was probably one of the first kinds of agriculture that was invented. Um, and again, that relies on having a forest that you can burn down to uh, fertilize your fields. Which might have been discovered by accident, or there's a not. I mean, you can imagine a number of different ways how, hey, when you burn something down, when you burn the forest, the plants grow really well. Uh, anyway, what I'm saying here is that uh, it's not like everyone was hunting and gathering and had no idea what a farm was, and then the weather got worse and everyone was like, we got a farm now. It was more like, at least this seems to be my understanding of the literature, people were already, had a, had had for hundreds of years, thousands of years perhaps, a good understanding of the fact that if you plant a seed, it grows into a plant and you can plant the seeds of plants that you want to eat and then eat the, the shit, you know? People seem to have figured that out a long time ago. Maybe not necessarily with grains. I mean, people were probably eating some grains, um, but it, it might, you know, whether it was the majority of their diet, that seems unlikely to me, uh, pre-agriculture. People did eat grains, but yeah. Uh, so it was more like, well, since the, the food sources that we don't control are, you know, more and more scarce due to extreme uh, seasonality, we have no choice but to rely more and more on the food sources that we manage. And that seems to be the case here. Uh, drawing a strict delineation between hunter-gatherer versus early agricultural societies is always seemed a bit strange to me now that I've learned how this shit works. Uh, you know, does that make sense? I think that makes sense. So it was, it's, this seems like a fairly convincing paper. Uh, you should uh, check it out. Something really strange and funny is that, uh, you know the BBC, right? The, the UK public broadcaster? Um, so the BBC is, it's obviously publicly owned, right? People pay TV, TV licenses. I don't pay a TV license because I don't, I don't own a TV. There's this meme, I don't really understand this. There's this meme in the UK that like, uh, this is the case, I mean, this is also the case with the NHK in Japan, where it's like, oh, they'll come knocking on your door, they're like a racket, they're like a, a rack, they'll come, if you don't pay your TV license, they'll show, like, you know, you if you don't watch TV, you can just call it, like, <laughs> I just called them up and was like, yeah, I don't watch TV, I don't need a TV license, and they were like, okay, sure, fine, we'll cancel your license, and that's all it took, like, they've never bothered me, why would they, you don't need to pay if you don't watch TV. I don't understand the, all of the weird ass complaints about this, but anyway, they they supposedly get their money from TV licenses, uh, but they do also have a for profit commercial branch, which is called BBC Studios. Um, you know, because they're they're still a media company. They still sell things and buy things and buy properties and, and whatever. And what's really fucking funny is I just watched this Atrioc video. Uh, and he sort of mentioned this a little bit offhand, and so I went to look into it, and it's very funny, which is that BBC Studios, when Bluey, you guys know Bluey, the the, the kid show about a, a, a dog? It's a pretty good show. I haven't, I'm not caught up on Bluey, but I, I liked it from what I've seen. I've seen, a, uh, like, season one. Uh, it's pretty good. I like Bluey. Shouts out Bluey. Shouts out all the Bluey heads in the, in the, the audience. Shouts out all the Bluey heads. Um, anyway, what's really funny, and kind of fucked up also, is that when Bluey was like a small Australian show, before it had been globally distributed or anything, uh, the people who made Bluey, the little animation studio, you know, to get your show on air, to, to have the budget, you sell off bits of the rights, you need to sell broadcast rights and so on, broadcast rights were sold to ABC, not the American ABC, the Australian ABC, which is like their version of the BBC. Australian broadcast, whatever. Um, and then what's weird is they sold merchandising rights to the BBC, uh, which, why the fuck is the BBC buying merchandising rights to a random Australian show? What are they doing in Australia? I have no idea, but either way, 
this is a huge dub for, for British broadcasting because Bluey is now possibly the biggest TV show in the world. It's the biggest TV show in America. It's fucking massive. And the BBC owns all the merchandising rights, which is fucked up because it's Australian and the it's, you know, a show that was funded by the Australian public broadcaster and yet for some reason the Brits are making all the money from the merchant. It's kind of fucked up like when you think about it a little bit, but uh, it kind of feels like we, st- we stole something there. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how that sits a little weird with me. Um, but what is particularly funny about this is that now <laughs> Bluey merchandise is the BBC's primary revenue stream. It's so big that the BBC is now effectively a Bluey merchandising company. This is so funny to me. Like, I don't even, is that not hilarious? They just like randomly bought the rights to a little Australian kid show that no one knew it would do anything. And then it became the biggest thing ever in children's media. And the BBC is making billions off of it. It's it's crazy. We 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 just got turned into a bl- bluey merchandising operation. That is very funny to me. And look, Bluey is a good show. I saw some people. There's there was a big to catch you up on Bluey news, which will be old news by the time you see this. Um, there was a big Bluey episode, season three finale, which was thirty minutes long. Bluey episodes are normally seven minutes long. There was a huge Bluey season finale, the first one. And uh, I haven't seen this, this episode, uh, but I've gathered what goes on in it. And it's about the family, like, moving out and selling their house. Uh, And then, at the end, they decide, like, like basically on a whim, the dad is like, uh, you know what, we're not selling. We're not selling. We're going back to the house and like pulls the for sale sign out of the ground and everyone celebrates and so on. And I know I shouldn't take, I shouldn't think about this as if these are real people because these are not real people, not the bluey characters, Twitter users. Twitter users are not real people. You shouldn't, you shouldn't act as if they're real people. But I saw some, when that episode came out, I saw a couple people on Twitter and they were like, oh, uh, can you imagine like being a kid and watching this and then your family has to sell your house and how disappointed you'd be when your dad doesn't rip the for sale sign out and like not sell the house it's like motherfucker what are you talking about it's a tv show like people were acting as if it was irresponsible of bluey to do this like what are you talking about it's a cartoon dog okay oh can you imagine being a kid and watching spung uh, watching bob le ponge can you imagine watching Bob LePonge and and uh, then you go out and the squirrels won't talk to you in a Texan accent? How disappointing that would be as a kid. I don't understand. I don't understand the logic of... Well, I thought that was funny anyway. Uh, yeah, that's the bluey segment of this podcast. There's a really good article um, by someone called Hannah Gamble called the average fourth grader is a better poet than you and me too you might have heard of it it's like it went very minorly viral i think uh and i mean the title is pretty self-explanatory it's about this person or by this person who went to go teach poetry at a uh primary school only to (laughs) realize that the students were teaching her how to be a better poet, or them, I don't know, I think it says at the bottom, they, them pronouns, so, them, teaching them how to be a better poet, uh, and you read some of the lines, I mean, honestly, okay, let me read this, writing about a family member's recent death, my brother went down to the river and put dirt on, that is such a good fucking line, it's insane, I genuinely think that is, like, one of the best... I mean, I'm not a massive poetry guy, but the uh, children are very creative. And really, what we all gotta do... I mean, as this article says, you know, 
it goes through very or blog post whatever it goes through very, like uh you know when you, by the time the students get to middle school and then high school their innate ability to make good poetry just disappears because they've like been socialized into using words how they're supposed to be used like the interesting part about poetry is using words in in way novel ways ways where they've never been used before the example that they use is uh i'll just read this segment it's a short article you should just read the the whole article it's it's very short but um last year i spent every saturday tutoring an extremely under socialized kid in vocab when i taught her the word blandishments to flatter coax sweet talk appeal to she wrote this sentence the blandishments of the sugar flowers made the cake so much more inviting the sentence is interesting because the student understood that a blandishment is something that attracts favorable attention without fully realizing that people almost always use the word to refer to a human action. The poet's job is to forget how people do it. And that's what it's all about. You got to forget how people do it. It's not just poetry. It's everything. You need to... Ed Picasso, he figured this shit out. He figured this shit out. He, he, isn't there a Picasso quote? There's a Picasso quote that's like, it took me X number of years to learn how to po- paint like a, a master or whatever. And then it took me a whole lifetime to learn how to paint like a child. That's, he was fucking spitting when he said that. <laughs> he was spitting when he said that. You gotta, it's the, the really challenging thing that I've found in music. And I think the case with, with, all art and perhaps beyond art is that when you first start you have this innocence uh where you don't really know the tools you're using whether it's language whether it's an instrument whatever it may be you don't know how they're supposed to be used and so your brain in is forging all these new connections and you you come up with problem solving creative ideas on how to use your tools, whether it be, you know, coming up with interesting novel use for the word bat blandishments, which is a word I'd never heard before. Or the I, I, I think about the one of my favorite bands, uh, Beat Happening. Beat Happening is a great band because none of them know how to play their instruments. They have this like naivety to their music where it's it's very simple the guy can't sing no one no one can do what they're supposed to be doing and and somehow this produces uh something very powerful to me um and it was the case when i started making i I, actually you know what's the best example of this is grimes grimes uh first album is is pretty good it's not amazing but it's pretty good At, at the time it was amazing uh on reflection it's pretty good um and the thing about that album is it was made entirely in garage band by grimes who had basically no idea what she was doing um and then once grimes got a producer and studio time and had just spent years learning how to make music she start you know she made the next couple of Grimes albums I don't I haven't listened to any of the more recent ones I assume they also suck but uh I don't remember what 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 the I'm not a never been a massive Grimes fan so I don't remember the the album names off of off of uh the top of my head let me let me hit up Wikipedia for that shit and discography um yeah Halifaxia is the one I'm thinking of that I believe was the first one um or was it is vision I don't fucking remember. Either way, Art Angels was a bad album. That's the pr- that's what I'm trying to say here. Art Angels was not was not very good because gr- this was the and what you realize once you listen to Art Angels is that that was the music that Grimes had been wanting to make the whole time, kind of shitty pop music, uh, but was didn't know how to, and so in not knowing how to, she was coming up with creative solutions um to to compensate for her lack of technical skill and that made that's what made the music interesting and once she had figured out how to or hired people who knew how to make music that sounded like what she actually wanted to make the music instantly became way less interesting because she was no longer solving problems in novel ways she was just solving the same problems that everyone else solves in the same way everyone else solves them 
and this is something I noticed with with my music to some extent. Um, it's a pretty it's it's a thing across across everything, across genres, across mediums that um, you lose once you like. There are a lot of people. Okay, there are a lot of people who uh, have this this idea that like I don't want to learn music theory because it will make me sound like everyone else. Um, which is a little unusual. The reason, like, people who like music theory, they don't like people who say this. And they don't like it because uh, they will tell you, well, really, the point of music theory is just communication. It's not supposed to be a guide on how you ought to do something. It's just a way to... It's a collection of tools to describe what a song is doing um, in, like, universal language, at least universal for... West the Western musical tradition, uh, which is not universal at all. But anyway, uh, the thing is that's that's kind of true, and it's also kind of not true. It's kind of it's kind of true. It's kind of not true. Um, you know, I I don't think that you will. But I I think what this means is that there people tend to have this like a sort of intuitive understanding of this process that I'm describing, where they don't they don't want to they there's there's a part of you that doesn't want to learn how to do things because it's hard to maintain the childlike innocence which produces creative problem solving solutions once you've learned the correct way to go about solving a problem. Um, I mean, there have been so many musicians that I've liked over over the years who have become great in my mind due to not having any formal training specifically. Like, um, let me see, like Tina Weymouth was not a bassist. She didn't really know what she was doing uh, when she picked up the bass. And so she had no preconceptions about like what a bass player is supposed to do, which is how you get some of the greatest bass lines of all time, uh, which, you know, I think Tina Weymouth is one of the greatest bass players of all time. And she's creating these insane bass lines that most bass players would never come up with because it doesn't necessarily fit the traditional role of a bass line in a song. Um, Or, you know, even something as simple as not having any pretenses when it comes to, well, I'm the bass player, you know, a lot of bass players have a weird, uh, a, a strange, uh, I don't even know how to describe it. They, they don't like picks. They don't like plectrums. They, 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 I don't know why this is. They feel very proud of the fact that they never use a pick because bass players, we like to imagine ourselves as like very different from guitar players, even though the instrument is pretty much identical. And it's like all we have is fewer strings, an octave down, and we don't use a pick. So if you're using the pick, you're basically a guitar player. You know, you don't really, even though, you know, picked bass just sounds good. The 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 higher uh, um, transients is good. Anyway, Tina Weymouth doesn't have those proclivities. She'll use a pick if she needs to, if it makes the song sound better. She'll use her fingers if she needs to. Or she might drop, you know, put down the bass guitar and play a synth bass on some songs right? She doesn't know how, she never had know how to play a keyboard. No one taught her, but she can pick out a cool bass line and play it. Um, and this like fluidity makes and versatility comes from specifically not having any, um, you know, someone, some external socialized, uh, I don't know what to call them. So socialized ideas about how uh, you know, X thing or to operate. And instead, coming at this from an open, open-minded open perspective and just trying to solve the problems as they come to you with the tools that you have in your own mind uh, or available to you. And it produced some of, some of my favorite music ever. And this is not to say, by the way, that Tina Weymouth was not a technically gifted bass player. She's really good at bass. Like, she, I mean, yeah. It's not about being necessary, like, be happening bad at their instruments. They don't try to get good. Tina Weymouth, very good bass player, like, technically skilled bass player, but retained the free creativity. And that's the thing, is it's, it's, you actually have to constantly fight against this idea 
or the everyone trying to you you this is why being a hikikomori is important you should to to you have to get away from uh people having solved problems in certain ways in the past right that's the that's the key that i'm trying to, to get at here you you wanna it's is not like a computer program you know when you're writing when you're when you have a computer you want to do something you shouldn't re-implement every feature from the ground up if you already have a program that can do that better than you can right <laughs> like uh the unix philosophy or whatever um it's the case for a lot of things uh however you know that that it is trying to i don't know that's about reducing cpu cycles and, and etc that's not what we're trying to do I, I shouldn't have used that metaphor this has thrown me completely off track the point is you gotta you gotta learn to forget how people do it what was it what was the fucking thing i don't remember anyway you gotta stop doing it how people do it you gotta start chilling relaxing and solving problems on your own terms isn't this so funny so you have this company right they're called asus they're called asus and that's a you know that's where you would expect a company to be called that's you know you're like yeah tech company you 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 make like i don't know what the fuck what the fuck do they do what the fuck do they do they make laptops and 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 and, and shit <laughs> you know make computer they make computer that's cool and then they have a sub brand for their high performance computing stuff and it's called it's very serious right high performance computing you know what have they called it they've called it fucking republic of gamers <laughs> i know i'm stealing a, a tweet from myself here that this is very funny that a bunch of people in serious board meetings have to go around talking about the republic of gamers yeah we're starting the gamer country that's right I'm, I'm starting the it's a republic first of all let's get that straight no monarchies here this is the republic of gamers that's right gamers we needed our own republic <laughs> it's very funny and the funny thing about it is that no one ever says it. no one ever says it no one has ever said republic of gamers because it's such a stupid name and it's so long-winded that everyone just says rog everyone just says rog and the reason they do that is because rog is so, so fucking stupid this has got to be some of the worst branding of all time rog republic of gamers it's like uh one time me and my friend back when i used to smoke a lot of weed me and my friend we were really high and we were like we gotta make our own country man and we're gonna call it the crazy republic of jamaican me crazy <laughs> it's like that it's the crazy republic of jamaican me crazy <laughs> it's real and it's in my computer isn't that that's fucking crazy what is going on with these people? Why are they making, why are they calling their shit the Republic of Gamers? I'm considering making a video called Random Crits Are Unironically Fair and Balanced. Where did this idea come from that random crits are neither fair nor balanced? They are both of those things. It's, firstly, they're fair because everyone has access to them and they're random. In no sense are they unfair. You could say that sometimes getting a kill or getting or dying to a random crit feels unearned. That's a thing, I suppose. But that's not unfair, you know. They just got lucky. There's a bunch of other ways to get lucky in this game. In a 12v12 casual server. Do they belong in competitive sixes? Probably not. That's fair. That's understandable that you would say that. But in a 12v12 casual server, there's so much chaos going on. There's a million ways you can get unlucky and die. There's infinite ways that, that luck plays into whether you live or die. It's a chaotic game mode. Random crits are, you know, in the grand scheme of things, you can play around them. They make, they make I don't know, they, it's whatever. And it, 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 it's kind of like um, Mario Kart, you know? In Mario Kart, uh, the further back you are, the better items you get. 
Does anyone say that's unfair? Perhaps. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, it's not really like that at all because of the other thing that, that is important about random quits, which is that the better you're doing, the more of them you get. So in no way is it unfair because it rewards a skilled player. Unironically, this is not a joke. If you have done more damage, uh, then you're more likely to roll a random crit. So do more damage, get more crits, go crazy. And secondly, balanced. The game is literally balanced around... There's In what sense is it unbalanced? There's no class or weapon that is like, oh, well, that's overpowered because of random crits. No one's ever said that. Maybe the Scotsman Skullcutter is the only weapon in the game that could be possibly said, uh, you know, to be unbalanced because of random crits. But that's not even necessarily true because the Skullcutter has a lot of downsides as well. If it really was that unbalanced, then it would be the premier Demonite sword, but it isn't. The Islander is. So, you know, that's obviously not true. No one has ever said that any like mechanic class weapon is unbalanced because of random crits in fact random crits when you remove them make the game unbalanced it makes the game unbalanced to remove random crits because removing random crits is a massive nerf to melee it is a massive nerf to melee because melee has a higher random crit chance right so you know for example if you run out of ammo and you're in a some sort of fight with someone you run out of ammo and then you switch to your melee and you get a lucky crit right that's that's something that you can kind of hope for in in a, a game with random crits enabled you can pray to the gods for a random crit and most of the time you won't get one and it's fine because you're like oh well i fucked up my ammo management i missed all my shots whatever i ran out of course i'm gonna die but when you do get them, you're like, ha ha ha, get critted, buddy, you know? And in particular, there are weapons like the Scotsman Skullcutter, which are balanced around the fact that they do random crits. The Skullcutter is literally the worst Demonite sword if you're on Uncle Topia or any other server that disables random crits. There's no reason to use it because... The whole appeal of the weapon is that it's a demonite sword that does random crits. That is how it's balanced. The game is balanced around crits. The, this, this fucking, you know, removing a, a mechanic of the game is going to fuck up the game balance. No one else seems to care about this, but it makes entire playstyles completely unviable, Spe especially uh, a demonite playstyles like Mimi Demonite playstyles like Demo Pan for example. Demo Pan when I'm playing medieval mode, I play Demo Pan a lot in medieval mode, which is fun. It makes a funny noise when you hit people with a pan. I like it. It has it has a very satisfying animation, satisfying noise. I love playing Demo Pan on Degroot Keep. Uh but you cannot play Demo Pan on Uncle Topia because the only reason that the pan is even able to get any kills is because sometimes you get a random crit and that's funny. With the mini crits from the Tide Turner, is still just not enough to do shit. And I'm not using any other Demonite sword, a uh, uh, shield I mean, because they're all fucking boring. It's like, do you want to use the, the boring shields or do you want to use the fun one that lets you fly around the map? I want to use the fun one. Okay, sorry, you're using the fun shield? That means you only get mini crits now. And also, uh, if, like, one fucking damage, one flame particle hits you, one any anything lightly brushes your skin while you're charging, the charge ends. Oh, but because otherwise it would be overpowered. This is idiotic. Idiotic balancing decisions around Demonite shields. Okay, if you, want, if you want turning control, you have to sacrifice anything else about the shield being good. Pe Demonite is so fucking badly designed. <laughs> like... <laughs> The, the fact that they put the Islander in the game is such a massive mistake. The fact, because it, you know, being the most... I, I haven't explained this, actually. I, I was going to say that, assuming that I'd already talked about this, but I actually never posted that video. The reason is because all the other Demonite swords encourage you to be aggressive, you know? Like, uh, Half the Toichi rewards you with health on kill. Um, the... Uh, Persian Persuader 
people drop health packs when they die so you get extra charge to do chain chain kills um you know and so on they all reward you with some sort of thing for being aggressive other than the islander which does the opposite because when you die you lose all your heads and the islander rewards you for playing super passively and cautiously in other words the most boring way to play demonite and then it rewards you for that by being the strongest demonite sword uh and it's just absurdly like the forehead and more uh islander is just a bit ridiculous what the hell look at it like this okay rocket jumping was an accidental emergent mechanic in quake no one designed rocket jumping in quake it happened by accident because of the way the physics worked when valve was making tf2 they saw this rocket jumping mechanic and they saw the potential in it they thought well let's explore rocket jumping more thoroughly and so they expanded it and made it a core mechanic for soldier uh you know it's even shown in the meet the soldier trailer Clearly, rocket jumping was an intentional mechanic from Valve that started from something unintentional at id. And over the years, over the years, Valve has added all sorts of unlocks for Soldier, which expand upon and encourage rocket jumping. From the gunboats, to the rocket jumper, to the market gardener, to the airstrike, to etc, etc, etc. There are, you know, m most Soldier unlocks, I would even hesitate to say, in some way... Uh, are designed around how they're going to impact rocket jumping. You know, equ equipping anything other than the gunboats is balanced by the fact that it's not the gunboats and it nerfs rocket jumping. Then, in Valve's own game, they accidentally invent something quite similar to rocket jumping, an unintentional physics bug which produces a powerful movement uh, ability, and that's called trimping. Now, instead of doing what they did for rocket jumping, which is to sort of design, you know, acknowledge that this is a powerful tool and that players like to feel empowered and give Soldier something like the Market Gardener, where their skill and precision in rocket jumping is directly rewarded with kills. It seems like they have only left trimping in the game uh, sort of begrudgingly. They originally tried to patch out trimping, then they were like, well, you can trimp, but only with the weakest possible shield. Um, and as far as I know, the only map which has a deliberate trimp spot in it is the group keep. They just don't care. <laughs> they don't care about this. They've done the opposite. Like, imagine how cool it would have been if Valve had seen this really interesting and unique movement technique that only exists in TF2 and taken the time to actually expand upon it and add items which play into trimping, you know, add add a whole bunch of interesting, uh, you know, and diverse unlocks, which all play into trimping being the main uh, sort of feature of Demonite. That would have been really cool and interesting, but instead, they've done the opposite. They have basically said trimping, they've, they've, they've left trimping as this, you know, really fun, but fairly useless or very niche mechanic that can be sometimes used to roll out, sometimes used to, you know, maybe get into position once or maybe escape a bad situation, but has very little practical utility as an offensive tool, as a, a general mobility tool. Uh, you know, you can go equip the Persian Persuader and the um, the tide turner, and have a sort of trimp maxing loadout like that, but uh, still, I feel like trimping is very under has been underexplored in TF2 as as an interesting movement mechanic. In fact, Demo Man's movement has just been like as much as many people talk about how TF2 is amazing for its movement, and I'm one of them. Okay, TF2 has the best. It's a, if you want to talk movement shooters. TF2 is the best. Uh, there's so much interesting movement tech in TF2. Um, outside of Soldier, it's really under... And maybe Scout. It's very underexplored. It's extremely underexplored. Uh, and I, I, I don't... I don't know. I don't like that. <laughs> I think it should be more explored. Uh, it, it seems like Valve didn't learn the lesson from Quake to, uh, you know, expand upon rocket jumping in the way, like... Uh, soldiers unlocks expand uh, upon rocket jumping to expand upon trimping 
they've just left it as this niche mechanic. It's not that, oh, trimping is just useless because it's the way the game is. It's useless or it's kind of a, a flashy, very niche play or, or, or situational uh, maneuver because Valve intentionally left it like that. They ignored it. They didn't do, they didn't add anything like they've added to Soldier to make trimping better, which I think is a damn shame. Demonite is very badly designed. It's, it's just my opinion. They've, they came up with a great idea for Demonite and then they fucked up. <laughs> they didn't go, go as hard on trimping as they should have. They made the Islander, which shouldn't be in the game. Um, and yeah, and they, they've made sticky bombs too powerful. Uh, I don't know about that, but I, I don't know where I'm going with this. To be honest, I might be, I might be just sort of talking out my ass here. I was talking about something before this. Well, what was I talking about before I got stuck on the Islander is bad because it encourages you to play passively? I was talking about random crits. That's right. Um, so Demonite Swords can't random crit other than the skull cutter, which is really annoying because, um, it, you know, this is, it's, it's, it's a weird situation. It's a really weird situation with melee crits because on casual servers, like it's arguably better to not use a demonite specific melee because, uh, you know, you have a possibility with like a stock melee or anything that can random crit to do a full crit whenever you're hitting someone with, with a, with a, a bottle or something. Whereas if you're playing Demonite, sure you get reliable crits, but they're much more skill based and they're not possible in every situation. Uh because of the limited turning radius on, on shields and, and stuff like that and the, the recharge rate and so on. I think can I be honest with you? Can I be honest with you for one second? I think that uh, Demonite this is my opinion on Demonite. The the Islander shouldn't be in the game. It's a bad idea for a sword because this the head taking, having to stay alive thing uh, forces you to play passively and that's boring. Uh, so that was just a bad idea for a weapon. But then my second thing with Demonite is the Persian Persuader should just be how every Demonite sword works by default. That also shouldn't be in the game. Because every every sword or sh shield should recharge re recharge the charge uh, from picking up ammo packs, just like spy recharges from picking up ammo packs. The fact that you have to uh, like hybrid knight would be really fun <laughs> if you could actually you know charge. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm kind of just talking random nonsense at this point. The thing, because the, the thing about me, right, is that my favorite thing, my favorite mechanic in Team Fortress 2 is landing Demonite pipes. It is the most satisfying thing in the game. I've tried everything else. There's a lot of other satisfying things in the game. Backstabs and trick, trick stabs especially, satisfying. Um, soldier air shots, satisfying. Pyro combos, very satisfying. Um... Sniper headshots, a little satisfying. There's a lot of satisfying things in the game. Um, there is. But none of them, in my opinion, compare to the dopamine response that landing pipes gives me. It is just the best feeling you can get in Team Fortress 2. It's my favorite mechanic in any video game. It's my favorite weapon. The Iron Bomber is my favorite weapon in any video game. I'm pretty sure at this point. It just feels so good to use. The Everything about it is perfectly tuned. The, the arc of the projectile hitting the arc of the other player and connecting perfectly. It's it's just amazing. I love it. Um, but, you know, so I like I like that. I like playing Demo, Demo Man a lot because of, because of that. Um, and I used to play Hybrid Knight. And then where I'm going with this is Stickies. Are very effective they do a lot of damage sticky traps are incredibly powerful I'm you know even me who's not very good with sticky traps I am beginning to understand the true power of sticky traps they may be the most powerful mechanic in the game maybe you can completely you know you just basically get a free kill with them at no risk 
uh, if you play, if you make the good decisions, especially on defense. Um, a sticky spam is also very powerful. Stickies are just incredibly powerful, and you have six of them. It's insane. Uh, and that's a fucking problem, because if you're playing demo, like you're supposed to play demo with stickies, not, not as demo knight or hybrid knight, uh, your sticky bomb launcher becomes your primary. Uh, like, the, the iron bomber or grenade launcher is, is a secondary weapon, really, because it's not as reliable as the damage you can get from stickies. It's, you could use it for long-range spam, hoping to hit a long-distance 100 damage on someone, or you use it to sticky-pipe combo someone in a closer range. But the thing is, because it's hard, it's very easy to put a sticky on the ground and wait till someone walks near it, that's very easy. It's very difficult to land a direct hit with one of the hardest projectiles to aim in the game. That's very difficult. And so, high level demos, they don't really use their, they use the, the grenade launcher, but they use it as a, a secondary. They use it as a finishing tool and all sorts of other things. They, they walk around with their grenade launcher out most of the time. Most of what they do is shoot stickies. I mean, with their sticky launcher all the, all the time. And most of what they do is to shoot stickies. You can look at pretty much any high level demo player and see the same thing. Obviously, play styles vary, but that's generally the case. Simply because, uh, you know, with stickies, you can very easily control where a player can go, right? You, even if you're fighting a scout, you can put a sticky down on either side of the scout, and then the scout is kind of stuck in a particular area which makes it much easier to aim your grenades and so on, right? I'm not going to get too deep into this. I'm, I could just ramble about this forever. The point is, stickies are too powerful to the point where it's not fun to play demo for me. It is fun. It's it's fun in the sense that I get a lot. you get a lot of kill. You get a lot of hit sounds. You get a lot of kills. And that, that's, that, that gives you a little, a, some joy. That gives you some joy. But really, what I like about TF2 is flying through the air at high speed and hitting pipes. And so, uh, you know, playing Hybrid Knight is close to that, but the ultimate most fun play style for me is Sticky Jumper Demo. I love the Sticky Jumper. I play with the Sticky Jumper so much. It is a terrible <laughs> play style. You cannot get anything done, because uh, when you're playing Hybrid Knight, you know, the rest of your loadout actually does something. You may be sacrificing stickies, which are arguably the most powerful weapon in the game, but you're sacrificing them at least for something that does damage, for the ability to charge and finish people off with a, sh with a sword, you know? At least you're sacrificing it for another damage-dealing option. When you switch out the stickies for the sticky jumper, you're literally just switching it out for a pure movement tool that does no damage which uh, makes Sticky Jumper Demo pretty non-viable in many situations. Now, that's not to say I haven't fragged out as Sticky Jumper Demo. I have. I have top scored many a time, and I've fragged the fuck out many a time. And the fact that you get to fling yourself around the map at a million miles an hour kind of makes up for the fact that you die all the time, because it's just so fun. I don't know where I was going with this. This is supposed to be about random crits. I like them. I think they're funny. TF2 is a funny game. When I die to a random crit, most of the time, I don't even get mad. I don't even get mad. Because I'm always like, well, I knew that that could happen. I was sitting in the choke with a soldier spamming his rockets down. And I was thinking to myself, I'll just get lucky. He won't get a crocket. And then he got a crocket and I died to it. That was my own fault. I could have been playing further back. There's a number of different ways I could have played that. I knew that it was possible that he got a crit on me, and I chose to stand out in the open anyway, thinking I could tank the damage. It's a good punish to the idea that you can't just sit there and soak up damage all the time. I think that's fine. I don't think that's bad that it's in the game. And moreover, I like the fact that it lets you go on... It's hype. It's hype. It's definitely a rare high moment. It's not that rare. But it's a high moment. When I was playing uh, Medieval Mode yesterday, I was playing Demo Pan, I got three random crit kills in a row, and you best bet, that was funny. That was, like, just swinging, your sh swinging at max speed, just random crit, random crit, random crit, that shit is funny. 
funny things in Team Fortress 2 are good. The game is funny. So, this is my petition to Uncle Dane. Please enable random crits in Uncle Topia. So there's this book called Clean by James Hamlin, and I haven't read it. So, uh, you know, I'm just going to talk about what I think the book's about without having ever read it, because it's relevant to me. And uh, it's by uh, this guy who hasn't taken a shower in in years. He He started writing this book about skin health to try and, like, you know, when it comes to having healthy skin, there are also there's a whole industry around skin care with all of these products you can buy that do contradicting things that no one can really seem to decide what healthy skin even mean. Like, you know, and after diving into the research, he ended up deciding to, to stop showering. And uh, it, as I understand it, the conclusion of the book or the conclusion that the book reaches is... Um, you know, that according to the most up-to-date science, uh, our skin microbiome is something that's very, very important. It's effectively like the first layer of protection that our bodies have against the external world. It's like a whole layer of skin that we didn't even, we don't even think about that we have. And in fact, we're, we're constantly trying to get rid of when in fact it's like extremely important and we're only just starting to discover the protective properties that the skin microbiome uh, performs uh, and uh, you know if that means being a bit stinky then it means being a bit stinky and uh, I I happen to agree with all of this as someone who's a stinky neat uh, you know I don't really care about the skin microbiome but as I understand something that's brought up in the book maybe I don't know if it's brought up in the book uh, I'm not going to talk about the book anymore because I haven't read it I've just heard about it uh, but something I've often felt is uh Obviously, when you hear, this guy hasn't showered. I think we all vaguely know about this 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 thing called the no poo movement, which is a very funny name. Uh, people who don't use shampoo. When I still had hair, I was one of these people. Uh, shampoo is is bad for numerous reasons. I've explained it before on this channel. Uh, but you know, it strips all the natural oils out of. You might if you have greasy hair, try try quitting shampoo. This is, I, I'm actually, this, I, this is, this is advice. Don't, I'm not saying it's going to work because everyone's head is different. Uh, but tr try it and don't just give up immediately, but still wash your hair with water, but don't use shampoo or soap on your hair. If you, if you have greasy hair, tr try and stop that because, uh, the reason is that you strip all the, you know, these are all surfactants, right? And you strip all the oils out of your hair and then your body goes, there's no oil, quick, we have to produce all the oil real quick, and then it produces way too much, and you strip it off again, so you need to, like, wash your hair with water, so it doesn't get, like, dirt and grime in it, but don't wash it with, with any sort of soap or surfactant or, or whatever, just rinse it in the shower, and your hair will be overly greasy for about a week, and then it will get to a, like, natural uh, state, which is probably slightly greasier than most people's hair, uh, but uh, it's it's much it's the healthiest thing you can do for your hair, supposedly. Uh, it didn't help me from going bald, but then again, I actually did the opposite for because I I had really greasy hair as a teenager. I don't I think I just went bald because of genetics. By the way, I don't think I went bald because I like mistreated my hair or anything. Uh, my dad also went bald really young, so it's like definitely genetics. Um, but you know, I did when I was a teenager, especially have really really greasy hair. And so I would, like, do two washes. Like, I would go into the shower, I'd wash it with shampoo, and then I'd wash it again with shampoo, because it was just that greasy. And I think that probably did more to make it more greasy. If I'd known this back then, I wouldn't have done that. Uh, like, I think I was actually making the problem worse by stripping off all of the natural oils of my hair. Um, anyway, uh, so that's a, that's a thing. Uh, and then, you know, wash your hands, obviously, even with soap, that's a different thing. That's about stopping the spread of, of diseases and whatever. But when you, you know, how often you need to shower with soap and, and whatever. Skin microbiome. It seems like, you know, in recent years, people are understanding how important the gut microbiome is. Uh, and trying to focus their diets around having a thriving gut microbiome. 
Uh, and I think we're going to see much more talk about skin microbiome uh, in the coming years. I think this is like, this is going to be a big thing. But here's what I really want to talk about is when you hear about someone who hasn't showered in a long time, the first thing you think is they're stinky. They must be stinky. And the answer is probably, yeah, they probably are a little bit stinky. But here's the thing. Uh, that's actually fine. It's, it's actually not a problem. In fact, this has got nothing to do with the book. This is just my personal opinion. I think people take these cleansing rituals way too fucking seriously. And this idea that you should never smell of anything other than like vague scents of like lavender and whatever else the fuck is in your soap is actually really bad because smell is an important sense. It's an important sense for determining information about another person. Like, I don't know if you've ever... um, like, gotten close to someone, like, either a girlfriend, or a boyfriend, or just friend, or family member, but you start to develop a certain feeling towards their smell. It's particularly prevalent in romantic partners, in my experience, but even towards family members, friends, anyone you spend a lot of time with, you start to recognize their smell, Um, and it becomes an important distinguishing aspect to them. Even if they don't wear perfume or anything, you actually will just recognize their personal smell. And I think that's something important. I think that there's probably... Every other animal communicates through smell pheromones. I'm sure that there's probably some important stuff going on with human smells that we just don't experience anymore. It's a whole realm of, of life that, that has been denied by this obsession with uh, smelling like nothing. Uh... You know, that's, I, I would like to be able to smell people, frankly. And you might think, well, we're not like other animals. You know, dogs, they can smell way, way better than us or whatever. And while that's true to a certain extent, people actually massively underestimate uh, the sensitivity of human smell. Yeah, we're not as good at smelling as some other animals, but we are, you know, okay, dogs, right? You think, well, dogs must be really good at smelling because they can pick up and follow a scent trail on the ground. Well, this has actually been tested, funny enough, and humans are almost as good at, as dogs are at following scent trails. I know, crazy. We just don't do it because our noses are really far off the ground. But if you get on all fours and start sniffing the ground, uh, you, can, you can follow a scent trail as a human. You don't need training. You, this is just an ability that you have, supposedly. So says science. I don't know. I haven't tried it myself. I don't tend to do, to get on all fours and sniff sniff the ground very often. But supposedly, humans are almost as good at following scent trails as dogs are if you just get on your hands and knees and sniff the ground like they do. Uh, you know, the, where we've been told so many times that like, oh, all of these other animals have so much more powerful sense of smell than the, 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 compared to humans, that I think... It's been programmed into it. I think this is all just messaging. But in reality, like, the human sense of smell is still very powerful. I mean, just ask any any chef. Ask any chef. Like, anyone who cooks regularly knows that, like, really, 19% of what you're doing in the kitchen is using your sense of smell. Like, oftentimes when I'm cooking something, I can just leave it unattended because I can smell the second it's ready. Or I can smell if it's getting burnt or whatever. Like you can, and you can detect it really early, way earlier than you could see see it or, or whatever. And I don't know. I'm I'm pro smell. I'm pro stinky. Let let me smell your armpits, officer. I was just trying to smell her armpits, <laughs> officer. <laughs> I just wanted to smell her armpits because of my human instinct. You don't understand, officer. Uh. Anyway. Yeah, I'm I'm pro stinky. I think it's I think it's good for your your skin microbiome, which is probably healthy. And secondly, I think that um, smelling people is 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 interesting. Just like looking at people is kind of interesting, and and hearing people is kind of interesting, and and so on. I think that the having having that sensory information available to us would enable us to. Uh, socialize in more interesting ways as, as a society. Uh, smell is also just a weird ass sense. It's gone. It's nothing like. It's nothing like the other senses. Well, it's a little bit like taste, but it's not really like it. most of 
flavor or smell anyway. It's just little particulates that fit in little molecule little things. It's weird. Smell is a weird is weird. Uh, yeah, get get stinky with it. You know what pisses me off? Do you know what pisses me off so much? This fucking meme. This fucking meme. Have you ever heard this phrase? Oh, my sweet summer child. Have you ever heard of that phrase? Now, in that exact phrasing, that is a Game of Thrones reference. And you will often hear people, you will often hear users of internet websites. They're one of their favorite, oh, the, the midwits, they love a, a counterintuitive fact. They love things like this. So you'll find this everywhere on Reddit and Tumblr and, and all the bullshit where people love to say, I'm um, actually. And look, I'm, I love I'm um, actually, okay? I'm one of these people. I'm a fucking autist who loves to I'm um, actually people, which is why I'm going to I'm um, actually the I'm um, actually right now. So the counterintuitive fact is, did you know that uh, my sweet summer child, it sounds like an old tiny phrase, but it was actually invented by George R.R. R. Martin. It's from Game of Thrones. And, everyone, and then you're like, that seems plausible enough that I believe it. And uh, then this factoid gets shared around. But the thing is, it's not a factoid. It's just a really boring piece of information where a very slight change to the wording has made it into a factoid. The real piece of information is the phrase, Sweet Summer Child, was popularized by Game of Thrones. That's the real fact. And that is a very boring fact, because all that means is that George R. R. Martin is a fucking nerd who reads books from the 1800s and randomly came across this phrase once and incorporated it into his books, and people didn't really know about it until they read Game of Thrones, or it was probably in the T. I don't know, I know nothing about Song of Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones stuff, I haven't watched the show, I haven't read the books. Um, but, the th- yeah, no, a cursory Google search will f- show you that it is not, it was not invented by Game of Thrones. Summer child, as a term for an innocent person, uh, that has, 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 has been around since the 1800s. There's been a, there's been a thing. There's examples of it in books going back to the 1800s. Um, th- it was not made up by George R. R. Martin, but specifically the phrase, Oh, my sweet summer child was from Game of Thrones. But, but summer child, it, there's like, it's, it's subtly wrong. Like the, the factoid is like misleading because it's been like Chinese whispered into something that is like subtly wrong. If you want to say the phrase, oh, my sweet summer child comes from Game of Thrones. That's true. If you want to say Game of Thrones popularized the phrase summer child, you know, or sweet summer. Yeah, sure. That's also true. But like the 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 specific idea that gets thrown around is neither of those. It's that that entire idea, the concept of a summer child to refer to someone as innocent, was invented by Game of Thrones. It's just not true. It's simply untrue. Um, you can look this up yourself if you want. I I uh, you know, I'm not making it up. I'm telling the truths. I speak the true true. Uh, yeah, that shit pisses me off. Because I'm like, no, it wasn't. It fucking wasn't. And this little factoid gets shared. It just pops up. It just pops up from time to time. But it's not even true. There's this thing that competitive TF2 players do. I've been watching a lot of videos by this guy called Wild Rumpus on YouTube. He makes videos about uh, TF2 competitive sixes. Uh, which is a game mode that I don't really play. But I, it's interesting to me. And it's interesting to hear his perspective as a comp player on the game and stuff. Uh, but there's a euphemism that not just him, but a lot of competitive TF2 players use. And they use the, the word reliable. They'll say, talking about a particular weapon unlock normally, they'll say like, so-and-so is just more reliable. Um, and I think it's a funny euphemism because it is just a stand-in for the word easy. It just means easy. And if you said that, it would sound kind of bad. 
it would, you know, you don't want to be going around saying, well, I use this weapon because it's just easier. And so they use this euphemism where they say, oh, no, 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 I use that because it's more reliable. Like, yeah, for example, uh, not that I'm con not that I'm saying that this is actually competitively viable, but let's just give an example here. Like on Demo Man, one of the primary unlocks is called the Loose Cannon. And if you like in theory, you can do 120 damage double donks with the Loose Cannon if you time it perfectly. Uh, which is like an insane amount of damage enough to one shot light classes um, but it's really difficult to use and so no one uses it in, it's pretty much incompetitive at all uh, because it's you know there's some some in some sense it's got a much shorter range than stock or the iron bomber or the lock and load so in that sense it's a direct downgrade uh, and that's not an issue of reliability, that's just an issue of ability, and that's fine. But uh, people will say, you know, it's not as reliable as the Iron Bomber, for example, or the Lock and Load. It's not as reliable, which what they really mean is, yeah, if I got good, if I got good, I would be able to do more damage. It is actually theoretically better for a perfect player. But, but I'm not a perfect player. And they sort of assume, they assume that no one ever will be. And I think that's really interesting. Because there have been situations in competitive TF2, in particular, this one guy called Anthony, who's quite well known, uh, where no one else uses a weapon, except for one guy who's just practiced with, with it. In Anthony's case, it's the beggar's bazooka. Every other competitive soldier uses the stock grenade launcher or the original which is just a reskin of the stock grenade launcher except there's one guy who uses the beggar's bazooka because he's just gotten so good with it um and the beggars is really hard it's really hard to get that good with it's extremely hard you have to put in a lot of time and a lot of practice but after all of that he is one of the best soldier players in the world but that's just it. He's not the best. It's not, you know, it's powerful. It's a good weapon. The Beggars is a good weapon. And I suspect a lot of these people who are talking shit about other various weapon unlocks or unorthodox playstyles in, in sixes would have said Beggars isn't viable until Anthony proved them different or proved, proved them wrong. You know, um,. If we take another game as an example, now I don't play melee, but I follow a bit of melee. It's kind of like AMSA in melee. AMSA, Yoshi main. Yoshi not considered one of the highest tier uh, melee characters, but AMSA just put so lot, much time into practicing and mastering Yoshi that he ended up winning majors back to back, some of the most stacked majors of all time. And I feel like, you know, that was... AMSA winning those majors was one of the most hyped moments in Melee history. It was one of the best moments in Melee history. And I feel like if people like... If Melee, had, Melee does have an attitude, like, of, you know, kind of looking down on people who main low tiers. At the same time, there are some people who think it's cool. It's a, it's a weird situation. But either way, if everyone took the attitude that the majority of the TF2 competitive scene has... Where they're like, why would you bother maining Yoshi when Fox is just better? Like, why would you put so much time and effort into getting, you know, good at Yoshi? Where if you put the same amount of time and effort into mastering Fox, you, you know, it would just be easier and more reliable. Then we would never have gotten that awesome moment. And in particular, there are ways in which Yoshi is good that Fox is not good. There are things Yoshi can do that Fox cannot do, that Puff cannot do. The math cannot do, you know? It's a, a unique trait. And I think the same can be said of a lot of TF2 unlocks. I know comparing TF2 to Melee is a bit of a, a, a meme, uh, for good reason. It's, it's kind of a dumb meme. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think there's a lot to be said about, as, as an outside observer, various more unorthodox unlocks having a place in TF2. Like, you know, the loose cannon 
might not be viable to run full time, but I don't understand why don't people switch to the loose cannon, you know, on a desired last hold in order to stuff an Uber. Like the loose cannon is great. And that way, you know, normally if you want to do that, what you do is you have one of your scouts or soldiers switch to pyro, but that way you get to keep your scouts and soldiers or one of them's fully going to be on on NG anyway. So you're going to have like what one scout, one NG. You keep both your soldiers and you even keep and then you have your demo who still got stickies to do all the trapping that demo needs to do holding last. Um but can also stuff an Uber at the same time. Like to me this seems like a really obvious tactic. <laughs> Why hasn't people thought about doing this? Like, I'm not saying you run the loose cannon full time. That would be stupid. That like it is just a worse weapon. It is a worse weapon. But like it's a, in this particular. I don't know. It's weird. Why don't people do that? I don't know. I have no idea. Um, then you know, here's my my hot take about competitive TF2, which is that pyro, uh, you know, isn't considered very viable because he doesn't have you know competitive tf2 is played on big 5cp um you know maps where being able to move and traverse the map quickly and nimbly is extremely important which is why all of the classes that get run other than i guess medic uh have like high mobility pyro doesn't have high mobility pyro is pretty slow and then secondly pyro needs to get right up in people's faces to do damage uh, which is a problem. So there's a good reason why Pyro doesn't normally get run, other than to stuff Ubers very occasionally in sixes. But, you know, no one has put the time in and tried uh, the Dragon's Fury. Like, there aren't that many players in TF2 in general. Like, if there, if there was any massively underrated weapon, and I will admit I also underrate this weapon, in the whole game it would be the Dragon's Fury. If you've ever come across a good pyro with Dragon Fury, they are just unstoppable. Like that weapon deletes people. It is so <laughs> ridiculous. It does so much damage. It it just deletes heavies. It deletes buildings. It is kind of insane. And then it also makes up for a lot of pyro's weaknesses because it does burst damage rather than sustain damage, and it it just does more damage. And then also it has a longer range than the stock flamethrower. Um, so, like, it basically fills in what well, most people's problems with Pyro, or, like, a lot of the problems with Pyro. Now, yeah, obviously it doesn't account for movement problems, and it, even though it has a longer range than stock, it's still not a long range compared to, like, you know, it's it's we're talking more the range of a scout than a, a soldier or a demo here. Um, and scout has, obviously, much more movement options there. But just the raw damage output... I feel like if a team were to run a full time or at least sometimes Dragon's Fury Pyro, I th I consider it viable. I do I, I I think it's an untapped potential for a meta there. It would never happen because it would require someone to be really good with a weapon that, that is already underutilized in the general community and then also to be a it would just never happen. Because of the at the way the way that competitive TF two is played, no one would no one would scrim with you. It, 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 the entire every everything is set up in order to make sure that that that, that something like this doesn't happen, because they have a meta game that is you know considered to be very fun, and there are some small changes that happen from time to time. Like right now, the lock and load is having a bit of a moment in in competitive TF two. A lot of people are switching to the lock and load. You know why? Some you know, Oh, it's because of the extra range? Yeah, that's part of it, but I'll tell you another reason. It's reliable. What do they mean by that? The fucking... They travel... The, the pipes travel faster, so it's easier to hit your shots. That's it. That's all there is to it. People want it to be easier. They don't want to have to... They, they want to take the easy option. Rather than something where, uh, you know, it might be a really difficult weapon to master but the rewards would be great so yeah i have opinions like this i th i i think uh i think there is a place for dragon's fury pyro not that i would have not that i want to do that because i don't really like using the dragon i mean maybe one day i'll i'll i'll, I'll start using it because it is kind of fun but um 
I don't, I just really think that, like, very few people have unlocked Dragon's Fury. Like, it requires a, it's almost a subclass. Like, it requires a very different mindset from just playing normal pyro. And it requires a very, it's, it's a very unique weapon in the game. There's nothing else like it. It, because it's like, it's a projectile weapon, but it's also a flamethrower. And then it has the, like, damage and speed ramp up. Like, like, firing speed ramp up. There's weird to adjust with. It's a weird weapon. It's like nothing else in, in the game. And so a lot of people don't use it. It's not like any of Pyro's other unlocks. It's not like any anyone's unlocks. Um, and it, it requires a very different play style. I don't know. There's all sorts of stuff that goes on in that game. But really, I just wanted to make fun of competitive players for saying, calling certain things unreliable when what they really mean is just, like, too hard. Uh, because it's fine. It's fine to just say... You know, I'm not a robot. I can't put it off like that. You know, I I can't I can't use this weapon as well as as I would need to in order for it to be worth it. Another one, and this this one's a bit unusual, right? The direct hit. To me, like I don't play that much soldier, and I can understand splash damage being important, but at the same time, it is kind of hard for me to figure out why the direct hit isn't used at least sometimes in competitive you know in a in a game mode that is focused around death matching surely you just want the weapon that's easier to aim and you do more damage with the problem is it's not reliable <laughs> in other words you have to hit direct hits you can't just aim at people's feet and win uh and that's a serious that's a significant concern because you know in the in it, tf2 is a competitive game i mean TF2 is a chaotic game. Sixes is a chaotic game. Uh, you don't, you know, you want something that is that that can reliably do damage instead of having to like make sure you do hitting something really precise, but being rewarded with like with with the ability to delete scouts in one hit. But deleting scouts in one hit is very useful. I don't know. I don't know. It seems like a big deal to me. But what do I know? I'm not a competitive player. I don't even play soldier. There's one thing in my mind that I actually, like, actively have to stop myself from doing because it's something that literally I'm the only person on Earth that, that finds it funny. And to anyone who isn't me, it is, like, the most cringe thing to possibly exist. And that is that I still think saying my name Jeff is funny because... My name, Jeff, had three periods. There was the period where it was in the movie 22 Jump Street, which is a, a, a decade-old movie at this point. It was in that movie, and it was a really funny line in that really funny movie where he says, My name, Jeff. And that was funny, and we all laughed at it. And then it became a, a, a meme there was kind of a reference to the, to the funny part of the movie. It was a, a semi-ironic reference to the movie. But then, stage three, was that meme became pretty popular. And it's such a dumb thing. Like, once you decontextualize it, it's just saying, my name is Jeff in a, in a stupid act. Like, it's, it's something that makes no sense outside of context. And that became a bit of an... Uh, a meta ironic meme and so people started saying it in reference to the meme because like stripped of context it isn't funny so it became like an anti-humor joke and to me that phase three the further we get from the era where saying my name is jeff was unironically funny the more ironically funny it becomes and so to me saying it now is funnier than it's ever been. And this is always going to be the case every every moment until the heat death of the universe. It will always be funnier to say my name Jeff the, f the longer you wait after it was initially funny. Um, but no one else thinks this. <laughs> Everyone else would just look at me like, what are you, what are you on about? Uh, so, so I have to... I ha the, I have to actively stop myself from saying my name Jeff um, in in day to day scenarios. And then another thing that that ruins it for me 
is that I also think it's funny to shorten shorten the phrase even further because the 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 it would, it would originally be you know my name is Jeff and then one of the reasons why it's funny is that in uh, the terrible Mexican accent he cuts out the word is he just says my name Jeff but then I think it's funny to just say without an accent or anything just name Jeff like in text like like to type or or say flatly name jeff because it's so abstracted and 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 beyond i i don't know i think it's funny to just say name jeff but no one else thinks name jeff is funny to me name jeff i'm i'm even like having to hold back a, a giggle right now but to everyone else on planet earth it is absolutely retarded <laughs> no one else finds this funny i've i've made a meme of a meme in my own head that is a meme i share with no one so in that sense it's not even a meme it's more like a if if a meme is is the the ideas version of a gene right and the gene is like dna in a cell and then if there's a cell that just doesn't die that's we call that cancer then this is like the meme version of cancer. <laughs> like just a, a cell that's gone crazy and refuses to die when it should. But it's just like a one one off. And and the, I know that the rest of the immune system will target me if I ever let it be known by casually dropping name Jeff in in a scenario. So I have to actively stop myself from saying it. But to me, the less it's one of those things where the less funny it is, the more funny it is. And because I'm the only one that does this, it's not getting ruined by like, for example, there there are a lot of jokes on the internet that come around and some people think the less funny it is, the more funny it is. But it generally just stops being funny after the first few times. Like, take the, uh, using a picture of Sam Hyde every time there's some sort of shooting or something. Like, yeah, that was funny for a little bit, but it stopped being funny pretty quickly, and people kept doing it. Like, people, st- the, the fact that there are people who still do that is, like, insane to me. And that's how I look <laughs> to other people if I were to whip out the my name Jeff in, a, in, a, in any sort of place. So I'm persecuted for this, you know. <laughs> I'm a fucking on the run, which is why I don't do it. I keep it. I mean, I'm a closeted Jeffer. That's what I'm gonna call myself. I'm a closeted Jeffer. I can never get out of the Jeff closet. I gotta stay in the Jeff closet because otherwise everyone would know that for some reason I don't know what is wrong with my brain. But the less funny my name Jeff is, <laughs> the funnier it is. Then again, it might have actually been long enough now, since it's been 10 years, it might have been long enough now to bring it back as a nostalgia meme. Because, for example, Pengas has come back as a nostalgia meme, which I would never have guessed would have come back. But but Pengas has come back. That's not a very good impression, I know. But I would never have, I would never have guessed that Pengas would have come back. Um, I'm waiting for the post-ironic... Uh, MLG montage parodies to come back. That'll be good when that if that happens. Cause I feel like dubstep is making an ironic comeback linked to like 2010s nostalgia. And if there's 2010s nostalgia in some cases where some people are listening to shitty bro step again, maybe maybe bringing back my name Jeff, it's on the cusp. I would be an early adopter. If I were to do this, I would have to be an early adopter. And the thing is, when you're a nostalgia wave early adopter, you always run the risk of being too early and being cringe. But you don't want to be too late because then you miss the wave. So I think it's funny. But also, I can live without Jeff. I've been trying not to put this in the podcast because I'm trying not to just talk about TF2 because otherwise I would like if I allow myself to talk about TF2 in these podcasts, then it just becomes a 12-hour TF2 podcast, and look, I don't know, you guys probably don't want that, (laughs) maybe, I don't know, um, but here's the premise, so, 
uh, there's this YouTuber called Zest. I also, when I say I've been trying not to put this in the podcast, what I mean is I've made two other videos about this, neither of which came out well, and so I'm just doing it here instead. Uh, so there's a YouTuber called Zesty Jesus. He's controversial in the TF2 scene. I'm not going to get into it. I don't really care. His videos are generally speaking meh. But he made a, a video where he did some quantitative analysis on TF2 player numbers uh, using various different statistical techniques, or th- that may be overstating it, but using Steam's API uh, and, and other websites that scrape Steam's API and some, you know, insider knowledge into the botting scene to try and figure out just how many TF2 players are actually real and how many are bots. And as it turns out, the majority of TF2 players are not real people. Uh, that you'll see, you go to TF2's page on Steam and it shows the player charts. That that does not reflect the actual player base at all. It's like 70% bots or something. And uh, look, I think he made some good points in that video where he's sort of like, you know, this is not acceptable, something, something, Valve bad. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm in agreement that Valve is bad. <clears throat> I, I'm in full agreement that Valve is bad. Uh, now that we're in my podcast, I can go on this little rant. I think it's pretty fucking abhorrent that there's this guy called Yanis Varoufakis. He's, a, he's an economist. He's a lefty communist economist, which <laughs> might already be ringing alarm bells for some people. He was briefly Greek finance minister. Uh, which also might ring some alarm bells. Uh, he's written some books. He wrote a book called Techno Feudalism. Uh, he's like a semi popular lefty intellectual, is what I'm, I'm going to say here. Uh, and you know, I've generally liked him uh, as a <coughs> cringe lefty myself. I I think he's got so I don't think he's you know perfect, <laughs> but he has some good. He's he's big into. He's been criticized rightly for being a bit too into neologisms he's big into neologisms uh but i think he uh has made some good points and some good analysis of the global finance system uh he actually does know his shit when it comes to to like economics and the way that the global monetary system works uh i mean he was literally finance minister like he he was in he was in the shit uh I think he has some good analysis of the ways that capital is mutated. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm kind of like fucking sick and, and weird because I slept like 10 hours, 11 hours. Anyway, um, but one weird little fact about Yanis Varoufakis is he, so he also is big into like calling for reform, which is basically communism, but without saying the word communism. So like he'll say the way we need to fix this is we need to have, we need to reform uh, the laws around the way shares, um, shares work, shareholding works, uh, in order to give every, <clears throat> every worker in a company should have one share and they shouldn't be tradable. It should be like a, a library card and one share equals one vote. And, you know, he's basically saying collective ownership of, of all of these companies is how, how the world should be run. He also is a proponent for UBI by introducing some sort of new tax, which is a bit strange, but he doesn't really go into as much detail in that as I feel like he should. But anyway, he's he's big into that sort of thing. And one of the reasons he's big into that sort of thing is he's he then will bring up, he will say, like, I, I worked at a billion dollar tech company that operated like this. And so we have proof. I was was a economics advisor for a company that moved billions of dollars around uh, in the U.S., that operated like this. Um, and so, you know, we, we have proof that this is a good way to run a company and it, it will not destroy businesses and so on. And do you want to know what that company is? You can probably guess from context because I was fucking shocked to find this out because this is like two worlds colliding, right? This is Yanis Varoufakis, a guy I follow, I've, I follow for his like lefty economics takes. Um, and I go and look into it. It turns out he worked at Valve. What the fuck? He used to work at Valve as like an economics advisor for Valve, which is which is insane. Like the player run economy, he was hired to like manage sort of the player run economy and uh, and Valve's internal structure. 
uh, obviously they're very secretive about stuff. They don't really talk about exactly what he did, but like TF2's economy was partly and, and CS:GO's economy, all of this stuff, like partly created by the Greek finance minister. Very strange. Um, but I think it's pretty fucked. You know, I think this is pretty egregious. Because, you know, Vatofakis is going around talking about this, like, clearly he's not a gamer, right? Clearly he's not a gamer, because, uh, or he's just huffing, like, massive amounts of copium. I don't know, because Valve is, like, obviously a fucked up company, right? Like, they, they're, they're just rent seekers, no? Like, they make their money by charging rent on Steam. That's, that's, that's what they do. They don't, like, yeah, they make hardware. They, they used to make some games sometimes, right? But, but, like, they make their money, really, from charging rent to be on Steam. Like, let's be a little bit... Cr cr and, and the economy that they run is based on gambling. Whether it be literally gambling on loot boxes or speculative gambling on whether a, a, a CSGO knife is going to go up in price, right? Like... The, the Valve's economics is, is, I mean, Gabe Newell is like famously a libertarian, right? Like it's very much, I, I don't know, it seems very open to lefty critique. And I mean, he did leave Valve, so I guess maybe he, but he's never mentioned any problems he had. He just sort of brings them up in a positive context. And I've also, he doesn't, it's interesting that he doesn't mention Valve by name. Uh... But yeah, I think that's pretty egregious that that Yanis Valfakis, this this famously I mean, here's the thing. When he's talking so so what I want to tell you about about Valfakis is when he's talking to like he, he, he goes on a lot of podcasts, does a lot of media tours, he goes on the news, you know, he's a public intellectual. And when he's talking in the in like lib contexts, he's very he's very lib about it. But then I found this this talk he gave at a like in like Cuba at some sort of uh, communist conference and the mask fucking drops like he is a hardcore commie he's he's calling people comrades and shit like like he's he's he, he's the guy that he's one of those guys that unironically uses the word comrade like he is he is not like his power level is high okay he's a he's a he is a commie um which is pretty, yeah, it's pretty shocking that he, he, like, kind of defends Valve's business practices, uh, implicitly, when, you know, they're very obviously, the worker ownership of, of Valve, which is kind of, you know, questionable in the first place, Valve's organizational structure, but it, like, regardless of how their company is internally organized, they are very clearly an example of, like, problems within capitalism, and they're a great example to show to people like Vosh or or people who think communism is just worker ownership of the means of production. Like, it's a great example to show that's not what it is. That is absolutely not what it is. Is that if you if you just want that, then that's how that this is what we get. We get rent seeking, uh, you know, tech companies that have no reason to like actually provide a usable product to their consumers because they they can just charge rent forever. Right, so that's that rant off. <clears throat> so, just to be clear here, that rant exists because I'm saying that I am absolutely not a Valve defender. If you've seen my videos I've made about Valve in the past, you will know that I am not a fan of, of Valve. I, 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 I like some of the games they used to make, but I am absolutely not a fan of Valve as it exists today. I could go more into cr criticizing Valve. A lot of people, they want to criticize their organizational structure. Um... And you, they they sort of want to say the reason that they're bad is because they have this like flat or non hierarchical organizational structure, and then some people say well actually they don't really have that they sort of have that in name only and in reality like people who are more senior at the company are like de facto bosses or managers, um, which is probably true, uh, and like Gaben even though he basically has nothing to do with the company's day to day runnings and just plays Dota all day uh will still come in and just like fuck up your project for no reason uh that's like probably a thing i can believe that but the yeah clearly they have some structural issue where they are just incapable of hiring new talent like the thing about valve is that they used to be well known for being like if you you know they did the the, the silicon valley tech company thing they did the thing where it's like if you are 
a super smart, just graduated college student who's, you know, got a big dream and a big idea and you really know your shit, that will hire you. That's how they made all the good games back in the day, right? They hired a bunch of, you made this mod, you you made this mod for Half-Life called Counter-Strike, you're hired. Like, oh, you made this random, like, university project for a game, you're hired, come make Portal. You know, they used to be well-known for, for being the guys who would, they had the money to spend on, on talent like that, and, uh, now they are the opposite. It's like you can't go to Valve unless you are the most senior developer. Like it's where it's it's like a, a semi retirement for very senior game devs. Uh where it's just like, yeah, you get a massive salary for doing basically nothing all day. Uh which sucks. And it's it's especially evident in their inability to hire an anti cheat developer, which clearly well, I'll talk more about that in a second, because that doesn't really matter that much. So the point that I wanted to actually make here is, uh, uh, it seems like there's a lot of doomerism in the TF2 fandom now because of this Death to Jesus video, which is cringe. It's cringe to be a doomer about this game, because we all are sitting here like, the game's dead, there's no players, blah blah blah, and then loading into TF2 every day and playing it with loads of players. Like, what are you talking about? Even in the video, Zesty Jesus says, like, this is a still, like, a perfectly healthy game. This is not, he even brings up, like, Rat's Instagib as an example of an actually dead game. Like, you you have to be actually hallucinating to believe that TF2 is a legitimately dead game. Because we all play the game every day. If you're in the community, you play the game every day. You know, like, what do you mean it's a dead game? You, you're playing it right now against other people. So, my counterpoint is this. I have the world's biggest TF2 hot take. The hottest TF2 take on the planet, people. The hottest take, and that take is the bot crisis. The bot crisis isn't a really big deal. It's not, it's just not that much of a big deal. I, I, I think it's overstated how, how bad it is. Um, not because the bots themselves aren't that bad. Like, they are really bad, and people who make these bots deserve to be, like, publicly doxxed and, uh, you know, I, I am personally, you know, when it comes to video game cheaters, I have a zero tolerance policy. Like, I, I actually think uh, South Korea is, like, correct. I think you should be arrested if you cheat in a video game. Uh, <clears throat> I know I'm, like, supposed to be a prison abolitionist, but, yeah, no, I think you should be arrested if you cheat in a video game. Fuck you. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> so, yeah, you know, I'm not exactly sympathetic to these bot creators. I, I think they should be hanged. Uh, but... The the fact of the matter is, the bots are in casual. They're in Valve casual. If you just don't play Valve casual. There's no bots. It's not a, like it, it's not a, it, like it's is it crazy? Is this is this is like it's not complicated. No one no one plays Valve casual anymore. Who who's like big into the game, because because of the the bots. So you just play on community servers, and it's fine because there are loads of community servers. Uh, like people act as if. Being forced to play on community servers is, like, this terrible thing. These are, like, these second-class... second, second class, so, Like, what are you talking about? Team Fortress Classic did never had official servers, you know? Games didn't have official servers until fairly recently. Arguably, TF2 was one of the early ones. This was, like, a cringe console thing, right? Like, Counter-Strike. One of the biggest games of all time. Been around since the 90s. The OG Counter-Strike games didn't have... Official servers. You want to play 1.6? You're loading into some random Russian guy's server. You want to play Source? You're loading into some random server. You know, the idea that multiplayer games have to have uh, official servers run by the company <clears throat> is, is a new modern idea. And the idea that this is like the, the, the games are unplayable without this is crazy. Because people played games for decades without this. And it was fine. In fact, there's a strong argument to be made that it was better. There's this old image, which I've never been... I saw it once on 4chan, and I've never been able to find it again. But it's an image about Counter-Strike. And it was comparing CSGO to CS Source and, and 1.6. In the sense that there are multiple different player archetypes, you know? Like, the stoner, who is just, just like, smoking weed and, and wants to hang out in a game and, and take it really casually. Versus, like, the newbie, who just installed the game yesterday and doesn't really know what they want to do yet versus like the, the the sweat who's like been playing the game for 
for for years and and wants to try hard and 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 win all his games or whatever and 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 so on there was like various different archetypes like this and uh the, i think one of them might have been the socialite who's like yeah I, but he mostly plays these games to hang out with his friends or meet new people right there's there's all these different archetypes of people who want to play an online game and before people used to find their server and their community or if they couldn't find one that they liked or had some other reason they might have made a server or community right and then all of these people you know you had the the scrims for the the tryhards in in counter strike you had the casual deathmatch servers you know you had you had all of these different communities where these players wouldn't get in each other's way right the the people who wanted to try hard were were tryharding and they, there was never any like you know casuals in their tryhard lobbies who was who was going to annoy them because why would you be there you know they had their own servers the casuals had their own servers the stoner had his own servers there were servers that were good for socializing and you could make friend groups uh, everyone on the server was a friend group and so on like this is just how it was and it was fine everyone had their own little community and their own little space and it was much more pro social but with official matchmaking servers everyone is shoved into the same place and uh that that fucking ruined the game for a lot of people right because if you are just a stoner who wants to hang out and and chill and you know smoke weed and and click some heads in counter strike and then you're you're playing on matchmaking now you have to queue with the the sweat who's like trying to really hard to rank up and he's going to be yelling at you in the mic and it's just fucking like i shouldn't be here you 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 two shouldn't have to be having this interaction because you shouldn't be in the same place uh uh, the noob who's, who's just started, you know, he's going to join some matchmaking server and then a bunch of people who have been playing the game for 10 years are going to come in and be like, bro, you don't even know what the fuck you're doing, but go back to Valorant or whatever, right? It's like he should have a chill community space to learn the ropes of the game and decide if he wants to take it seriously and try hard or uh, keep it as a sort of casual experience. You have to remember that we think of Counter-Strike as this esportsy video game that is like super sweaty but even for a lot of CS:GO's lifetime that wasn't the, that wasn't the case you know the the esports scene in Counter-Strike was kind of similar to the esports scene in TF2 where it's like yeah it exists there are people who play this game competitively but it's a small niche of the entire community like the idea that that is the and now it's the only thing because they're obviously the people who are tryharding are obviously going to beat out every other person who's not tryharding in a in a you put them in an arena together the try hard sweats are going to win and also normies you know normies they love sports they're big into sports so you turn anything into a sport and suddenly all the normies are going to be able to re- you know really get into it <clears throat> versus like you know a, a TF2 casual trade silly server uh you know unless you're giga autistic you, there's no reason to be there um like in many ways community servers from a community perspective from a from a social perspective are better than centralized matchmaking servers or centralized you know official servers uh, for that very reason that they 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 cultivate different communities and then you get to choose you get to choose as a player i get to decide today i feel like playing well i feel like i want to i want to you know get down and dirty and i want to sweat so i'm going to join an uncle topia lobby in the nighttime when all the sweats get on, you know, it's like 2 a.m., I'm going to join Uncle Topia, they're, they're playing fucking CP Sunshine, and I'm going to I'm gonna get on, I'm going to play Demo Man, and I'm going to do my sticky traps and stick by my medic and so on. Uh, or, you know, maybe I'm like, today I just feel like fucking around and goofing off, I'm going to join a 24-7 high tower server and play some Trolger. Or I'm like, you know what, today I feel like really fucking around and goofing off, I'm just going to go join 24-7 two-fold server and be a hoovy, uh, or I'm just gonna join Lazy Purple's silly server and just hang out with these people doing literally nothing, just sort of staring at each other, um, you know. Or uh, maybe I just want sort of a, a middle ground. It's like okay, well, there's I could still join, like you know, one of these twenty four seven servers, high tower, two four, whatever, and then just pick my main and start killing people. You know, there's 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 so many options of what you can do. I, maybe I want to I want to play some jump maps. Maybe I want to maybe I want to play uh, some MGE. Maybe I want to get really good. Maybe I'll 
hit up my friend on Discord and say, yo, you want to MGE for a couple hours? And then we'll do that, which is what I do all the time. You know? Um, and, and, and it's great. You have all these options to play how you want to play, rather than there just being one default option that is like, you want to play the game, you click the button that says, uh, you know, match, find the Valve matchmaking server, and then and then you get put in with everyone else, and everyone's playing. It's fucking, you know, all these people put into the lobby at the same time, they probably shouldn't be in the lobby at the same time. So in a lot of ways, from a community aspect, the death of official servers is a good thing. And obviously, you know, it does this even bear mentioning, community servers are better from a moderation standpoint, right? Like, rather than having one company who has limited time and resources and stuff, uh, moderating everyone in the world, you dele- delegate, you know, that moderation to much smaller communities who can dedicate a, uh, you know, comparatively or, or relatively higher uh, proportion of manpower and, and, and time to moderation. Like, yeah, I'm sure on Uncle Topia there are probably some closet cheaters who have never been caught. And I'm sure on Uncle Topia there are probably some people who have been banned from cheating or banned for cheating who actually were innocent. I'm sure it happens, but it's 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 very rare. Like, the the truth is, like, you go on somewhere like Uncle Topia, you're not going to find cheaters. And you're definitely not going to find bots. That's another thing that kind of annoys me, is there are a lot of people who seem to sort of conflate the the cheating bots you know the instant headshotting sniper bots with cheaters like there are people who sort of consider them to be the same thing but they are not the same thing like it would be much much easier for valve to ban the cheating headshot bots than it would be to ban like individual cheaters like people are talking about it like this is just like an an elevation of the cheating problem that like having a a a, you know (coughs) aimbot scout is the same class of thing as having, you know, a cheating headshot bot, but it's not the same class of thing, because getting rid of bots is 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 as easy as putting a capture in the game, like, just make players, like, you know how easy it would be? Yeah, it would be like, do uh, you think it would be really annoying? Okay, yeah, you have to solve, once every hour, you have to solve a capture. I think, I think it'd be fine. I don't think anyone would complain about that. And it would just eliminate the bots. What would they do? You know? Like, it would, it would massively neuter the bots. There's only, like, a thousand bots, according to Lazy Purple, any, uh, not Lazy Purple, according to Zesty Jesus, anyway. It's, like, a thousand bots in the entire game. You know, make them do a capture. That's what you need. It's not really the same class of thing. Uh, but anyway. So, obviously, community servers are better for moderation. And also, because you can, you know, you can pick a server network that you you like the moderation policies of. Right? Like, there are some servers which allow sprays. There are some servers which disallow pornographic sprays. There are some servers which allow porn sprays, but not lolly. There are some servers that allow or any any sort of spray. There are, there are some Valve servers do not allow sprays, right? There are some servers which will let you say the N-word in, in all chat, and there are some servers that will not let you say the N-word in chat, you know? Like, hey, you can pick whatever sort of community that you want to hang around Uh Rather than Valve servers, which are just, like, completely unmoderated, but no sprays, it's like, you know, you get one moderation strategy that applies to everyone. Maybe I don't want that. Like, this is what uh, the Fediverse was was supposed to be. And, and there are, to some extent, right? So, to some extent, this problem always shows up when you have, like, this sort of federated thing, where it's like... People are never just okay with letting different servers have different moderation policies. They always want to have, like, the 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 more high ground people, they always want to have some, uh, some way to, like, prohibit uh, anyone who's on the less moderated servers from coming to the more moderated servers. On, like, Mastodon, it's going to be through server block lists. Like, okay, it's fine if, if you, you know... There's X server which has less moderation versus Y server which has stronger moderation. Um, you know, we actually have to ban the, the less moderated one. We have to block that so that entire instance. Um, and then in TF2, there's even people who try to do this. Like Uncle Topia, if you're in certain Steam groups, you know, there's Steam groups for cheaters. And I can understand if you're in a, CS, if you're in a TF2 cheating Steam group 
uh, I can definitely understand the desire to to ban anyone who's in that same group from joining Uncletopia. Yeah, like that makes perfect sense to me. But the I like there are also Steam groups for like servers that are just servers that are slightly less moderated than Uncletopia is. And it's like, yeah, you're banned from joining Uncle like if you join Uncletopia and you're in one of those Steam groups, you just get banned. I don't know, man. Seems a bit fucking stupid to me, but hey, Uncletopia is pretty stupid. The only reason I play there is because it's populated. It's very popular and you need that for an online game. You need to you need other players and that's that's what's important here. The servers are consistent and they're populated. Uh and the play it's kind of you know there's this meme in the TF2 community that like Uncle Topia players know what they're doing but they really don't like Uncle Topia players have better deathmatching skill that's the only difference that's literally the only difference between Uncle Topia and casual is they have better deathmatching skill that is not the entire game like the um, and it really goes to show when you end up on a map that does not reward that like Uncle Topia players have no idea how to play dust bowl they have no idea how to play Dust Bowl. It's actually insane how bad Uncle Topians are at Dust Bowl. Compared to, like, the Skyle 24-7 Dust Bowl server, that's the, that's the Uncle Topia of, Uncle, of, of, of Dust Bowl. Like, the players there, they know how to play Dust Bowl. Because it's not just about, it's not just about deathmatching ability. It's about coordinating pushes. It's about dealing with spam. It's about, um, you know, tracking Ubers. It's, it's about, um, you know... Sentry and dispenser placement and teleporter placement. It's it's a uh, it's about spies. It's a it's it's about team coordination. It's about it's it's so much more. It's about territory. Dust Bowl is like trench warfare, right? right? It's about digging it. Yeah, the idea of Dust Bowl, especially the fast respawn, high ser- high play account, uh, Dust Bowl servers, is it's it's a uh, it's about it's trench warfare. You you take a corner. And then you set up a cent like if you're blue, right? You take you 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 push forward slowly, and then you should have a, an engineer with with his level three in order to entrench. That's your that's your trench now. Once you've got your you take some territory, and it's like meaningless. And then once you get your engine nest set up in that territory, now you are now you're entrenched, and now it's going to take a a big push from red to push you back. And that's how you take territory on Dust Bowl, is you push forward a little bit, and then your NG moves the buildings up. And you push forward a little bit, and then you're, to make space for your NG to move the buildings up. Like, that's, and then, you know, on, then you get to Dust Bowl stage three last, and then it's like, okay, you push forward as much as you possibly can, and then you uh, just need a, you need a big uber push. That's how, that's how you do it. You need a big ass uber push uh, to, to finish it off, which is always, you know, fun. Uncle Tobia players, they have no understanding of this because it's not about 1v1ing the, the MGE soldier on the other team in order to kill him or, you know, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's about teamwork. The amount of times that I've been playing Medic on Uncle Tobia and I, I'm like, okay, we're going to Uber in and then we Uber in and then we take down the sentry and then the whole team just stands there doing nothing and then when they just rebuild the sentry, it's like, it's fucking ridiculous. <sighs> yeah. So let's not pretend that Uncle Topia players are like actually better than the general TF2 player base. Also, there's an idea on Uncle Topia that there's like they're all sweaty tryhards and there's no friendlies. And it depends on the in my experience, it actually depends on the time of day that you join. If you join late at night, uh it's people warming up for their 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 sixes scrims and they're all the sweaty tryhards. But if you play any other time, uh no like i've played hoovy on uncle topia i've i've been friendly on uncle topia most i mean i've come across lots of friendlies on uncle topia like it, it's not it's not that unusual it happens all the time um yeah so the point being really i kind of rambled here this is why i don't like talking about tf2 on these podcasts because i will just talk forever but the point being uh you know the the botting issue is nowhere near as big of a problem as like as an actual player of the game as the fact that, for example, the Wrangler is overpowered. Like, that's something that actually annoys me. Like, the, that actually affects my gameplay. Hey, there's this broken item that's just been left in the game untouched for, for years and years. But maybe you could nerf this broken item a little bit. It would make the game a lot more fun to play. Uh, you know? And yeah, we there's a bit of self-moderation because the community sort of hates those items, right? There's, there's a strong... There's a strong um, social pressure to say, like, if you abuse 
if you abuse certain unlocks, you know, like, you're kind of a bad person, right? Like, if you're, if you're sitting there abusing the Wrangler, like, to a high degree, like, that's kind of, that's just an asshole move. Like, we all know that's in the game. Any of us could be doing that. We choose not to because it ruins the fun for everyone. If you abuse the vaccinator, you know, we, everyone knows that's in the game. We choose, we choose to not do, do that because it's, 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 it's mean and it ruins the game for everyone. It's like when you see someone doing it, you know, you're like, oh, okay, you're like edgy. That's, that's what's going on here is you're, you're trying to be edgy. Like, that's the reason that you would do something like that. It's not about just using the Wrangler or using the vaccinator. Those are two different things. Using an unlock versus abusing an unlock is different. You know, I use the Wrangler as my default secondary on Engie. I always use the Wrangler because it's useful for mainly extending the range of your sentry. It's the shield that you can abuse. Like, if you're sitting there just tanking an uber push with the shield and then, you know, picking up the sentry and, and running back to spawn in order to make all of the uber pushes completely useless, then you're just an asshole, <laughs> you know? You're just doing that. You know that you're, you know this weapon is overpowered and broken because no one shut... Everyone will not shut up about this fact, right? You, you know this to be the case. Um, you know there's a way to use it where you don't abuse that fact. Um, you're choosing to abuse that fact, which takes effort from you and is not even a fun way to play, I should point out. Like, it's a pretty boring way to play as well. Anyway, sorry, that's just my rant about the Wrangler. But that's the sort of thing where it's like, yeah, I am pretty pissed that Valve just left that in the game. But you got to get into your head, right? That, that TF2 was one of the first live service games. Another terrible invention that Valve made. Uh, and live service games are bad. And TF2 is no longer a live service game because Valve is no longer offering it as a live service. It is an old school game like Counter-Strike Source. It is a game with only community servers that is not really supported by the developer or updated very often except for some bug fixes and stuff. It is Counter-Strike Source. It is not Counter-Strike 2. You know, it's its its own... It's an old school thing. It's like you going into a, a Quake lobby and being like, it really needs to nerf this. Like, what are you talking about? They're not going to do that. It's The game's finished. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's my TF... That's my biggest TF2 hot take. That was, those, are, those are my Discord pinks. My biggest TF2 hot take is that the bots... I don't I don't see them in my day-to-day -day life. I do not interact with, with, with any TF2 bots, and they don't bother me. Fuck it, let's not pretend this isn't a TF2 podcast anymore. And what is with engineers broken unlocks and NG mains pretending that it takes skill? Like, I know I just complained about the Wrangler. Like, okay, this is how you abuse the Wrangler. What you do is, who gives a shit about, like, uh, the Wrangler without the shield or with a much weaker shield? It should be a well-designed weapon. The idea being, you exchange, you know, the auto-aiming abilities, instant reactions of a sentry in order to extend your range and focus fire down one particular target in exchange for having your sentry be inactive for a few seconds uh, and easy to take down once you've switched off the Wrangler. So it's like you burst down a, a particular high priority target and you have a risk reward thing. It should be, a, it w if it was just that, it would be a really well-designed weapon and really situationally useful. As well as for the fact that it can, you know, bullet, with the bullets you can shoot yourself to push yourself to reach areas of the map that you wouldn't normally be able to reach, and rocket jump, which is kind of a niche meme mechanic, but it's funny. Um, you know, that stuff would all be fine. It's obviously the shield that's the problem. The fact that the Wrangler has a, a bigger shield that negates like 90% of the damage you throw at it means that what you can do as engineer is just when there's an uber push, just literally press two on your keyboard to pull out the Wrangler, and now your sentry takes, instead of like uh, three you know, pipes to take out or whatever, it now takes like double that uh, or more. It crosses a bunch of really important damage thresholds where people are going to have to reload and they're not going to have enough time to spam down your gun. And then you can basically waste people's time with that. So you force them to put a whole bunch of spam into your gun and then just before they take it out, you rescue Ranger uh, and just pull the gun away or you uh, just pick it up and just run back to spawn. And then, you know, their Uber's going to run out, they die or get pushed back, and then you just have the jag and put the gun back up in three seconds. And Well, you don't even need the jag. You 
you you just put the gun back down and then, then you still just have a, a a sentry gun and you just heal it and it's it's back to normal and it just makes sentries impossible to take out especially when you have multiple sentries if there's multiple sentries and engineers are using the um wrangler it just becomes a bit a bit ridiculous now i'm not totally against a weapon that makes sentries tankier um because there are weapons that make sentries less tanky the direct hit and lock and load being the primary examples there are weapons that are specifically and explicitly designed to make it absurdly easy to take out a level three sentry it almost feels cheap whenever i equip the lock and load and i just turn a corner and just jiggle peek a sentry twice and it's gone like this engineer just spent a fucking minute building a level three and i'm just like boom boom and it's gone with the lock and load like it almost feels cheap to be able to do that the thing is if you don't have it as part of a coordinated team push uh like just taking down a sentry isn't actually that important it's something i'm noticing especially if you don't take down the dispenser as well like if an engineer has a, a full dispenser and you take down the level three with the jag that that level three can be back up and running in you know a matter of seconds it's not even really a big deal if the team doesn't build it up with the push but it is it it is kind of a yeah i don't know i i'm i'm not 100 percent sure what to do about that uh but but obviously the the goddamn wrangler shield is like ridiculously overpowered and, and everyone agrees on that even engineer mains will agree on that uh but the, but the one that, that is crazy to me is the short circuit People are like, oh, the short circuit shouldn't be able, you shouldn't be able to spam the short circuit on the cart. And yeah, I agree with that. You know what else you shouldn't be able to do is use the short circuit because it's it's just a stupid, badly designed weapon. Like, why should you be able to just delete projectiles? You know how fucking stupid that is. Like, any weapon in TF2 that just counters a class for very little downside is is broken. Like, and the short circuit counters two classes for for nothing. For some metal, you're an engineer. You're standing next to a dispenser. You always have metal. Like, <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, especially like, oh, it, it makes. It, I don't know. Oh, it, it it makes battle energy viable. Look, I I I will accept that the short circuit has has a a place in the meta. It has a place. It it maybe is not like completely terrible, because it's it's really good at dealing with specifically spawn camping. And spawn camping is a bad mechanic. Like you shouldn't be able to spawn camp. So any weapon that, that reduces the effectiveness of spawn camping is good, right? It, it helps you get out of Dust Bowl first. That's good. You know, you need an engineer spamming the short circuit on the resupply cabinet on Dust Bowl first to leave. Otherwise, it's just, like, incredibly painful. And yeah, you know what? I, that's, like, pretty okay, but that's really bad map design. Like, that... And then there are some places where it's like, yeah, if you're getting spawn camped, you switch to the short circuit to to delete the stickies and push out. Yeah, I guess I guess that works, um, and that's fine. But but it's kind of annoying. Uh, you know, I don't I don't necessarily. I I think the real problem with with the the short circuit is just that it's like too easy. It's not like air blast, right? Because air blast also counters projectiles, but air blast timing is is fairly strict. Uh, whereas the short circuit has has zero timing skill required like it just it moves so slowly and the area effect is so big that you just sort of shoot an orb in the general direction at any point and it just lingers in the air absorbing anything you fire into and there's nothing you can do meanwhile the engineer can still shoot his shotgun from the other side now on soldier most soldiers are going to be running the gunboats so they don't have anything other than uh rockets to shoot anyway which just makes it fucking stupid because you just you just counter, like, you shouldn't be able to do that. You shouldn't be able to just sit there, count, like, completely disabling an entire class. Like, you, it, it is literally, if, if, it, it, I mean, it just makes engineer impossible to kill, which is stupid, because engineer is supposed to be a weak class. Like, the, the idea that you're a soldier with the gunboats, you have four rockets, engineer can tank at least one rocket, assuming that the rocket's, like, uh, aimed very well, you can still tank one rocket. So, you tank, you know, you can, like, shoot a short circuit, it's going to absorb one rocket, and it does damage, by the way, which it shouldn't fucking do. It does quite a lot of damage as well. It should, like, it's so stupid. And then the worst one is, is if you're playing Demo Man, you have nothing, you don't even have the option to equip a shotgun. Like, you, at least on Soldier, you could theoretically equip a shotgun and, 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 and deal with it. It wouldn't be good, but you would still have the advantage, because you have the same weapon as an engineer but you just have more health so like even theoretically in a shotgun 1v1 
with the short circuit in play, you can't even use your primary. You should still be able to beat out an engineer because engineer is supposed to be weak because he's supposed to be, you know, play around his sentry. But the, uh, oh man, f playing fucking demo against a, a, uh, a short circuit engineer, it's, it, it's just retarded. It just deletes your class like there's nothing you can do. And it, it just feels stupid because you're probably not even going to kill the engineer and the engineer is probably not going to kill you. So you just sort of stand there firing at each other and you just walk away. It's stupid. It, sh it shouldn't be in the fucking game. Like the way this works is so bad. Like at the very least, the hitbox should be way, way, way smaller. Like you should actually have to aim. You should actually have to intercept the rocket or pipe or sticky in midair. You shouldn't just be able to shoot an orb that just sort of lingers in a massive area of effect that just deletes any projectile that comes into it. That shit is so fucking broken. It's not just, like, spamming it on the card that's bad. It's like any... If you're if there's, like, a battle engineer, it's just stupid. Like, it's... It, it, takes, no, it takes no effort. It takes no effort. It takes no aim. It takes no skill. You know, you're just, just free. The only thing you're sacrificing is metal. But you don't, like... You know, normally, if there's, like, a risk-reward thing in a fight, you're sacrificing something important for the fight. Like, uh, you know, rocket jumping, sacrificing health for, for mobility, for example. Like, that's the normal one. You sacrifice health for mobility. You, you do some sort of explosive jump. Or, uh, you know, some, something like sacrificing speed or m mobility in, in some way for, for more firepower. Or, you know, something important that would actually help you win the fight. Uh, but, but in this case, uh, the thing you're sacrificing, metal, is something that doesn't matter in a fight. Like, it, if you're shooting someone with a shotgun, it doesn't fucking matter if you have metal or not. Like, it, it, it's, it's free. It's literally free. Like, the metal is just ammo. It's, it's not, uh, you don't sacrifice anything other than a secondary. Like, you, you it's not really a sacrifice right because the short circuit is good so you, you're not there's, there's no risk it's all reward <laughs> it's all reward to just just counter engineers counter which is demo it's it's like the razorback you know the razorback is just free counter to spice for 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 nothing like what else are you going to put up or or the you know that the, everyone agrees i i would hope that the the shields are, are fucking stupid especially the Darwin's Danger. Like, Darwin's Danger is just a, a really bad thing that shouldn't be in the game. And yet, even Engineer Mains, I don't under, I don't see how you could possibly make any argument that the short circuit requires skill. It doesn't. It doesn't require any aim. It doesn't require... Like, people will complain about Air Blast being too easy. And even as someone who plays a lot of Pyro, yeah, if a, a good soldier can counter me. Easy. Easy. If you're good at soldier... You know, you know how to time your rockets, like, so it's, you bait out air blasts and stuff, and you know how to shoot around the, the air blast region. Like, you, yeah, it's, it's, it's a fucking easy win for a, a soldier. Like, Pyro counters bad soldiers. Pyro doesn't counter soldier. And even if you do want to hit your air blasts, you, you, in close range, you're still going to have to predict, which is, like, hard and requires game sense. And even at longer range, you're still going to have to, you know, hit a... a a tight timing window even if the aim window is pretty broad but again even if you like reflect a rocket that doesn't do any damage to them unless you also aim the rocket back at them which is as hard as aiming a rocket as soldier it's the same difficulty um and you know then you also have to account for stuff like all the different you know knowing that the being able to instantly spot what weapon the soldier is using and account for it like oh that's the direct hit okay i'm gonna have to time my air blast way better then because the projectile travels much faster. Or, oh, that's the black box. It has one fewer rocket, so I know he's going to be reloading after the third one instead of the fourth one, so the timing is going to be bigger. Like, having to know and memorize all those timings and then execute that in a fairly tight window is is a, a difficult thing. It's a difficult mechanical skill that, that that is then, you know, deserving of a big reward, which is a, a mini crit reflect rocket if you manage to hit the timing window and hit the aim back on the soldier like yeah that and even a mini crit rocket is like not even that crazy like soldiers get that for free with a, a banner anyway so uh you know it's 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 a a powerful mechanic and it's also on pyro who is otherwise like a really fucking weak class who can't do any damage so um you know it's not it's not the same thing it's not free and even then air blast only really works on soldier 
like you can air blast stickies away from you but you can't really do damage to a demo with stickies you can you can and reflecting pipes is much harder because pipes shoot faster than you can air blast so even if you manage to to, to reflect one uh the next one's going to come at you before your your air blast is recharged um so demo even has something like built into the way that the grenade launcher works that makes air blast like less strong and also pipes are just much smaller and harder to see and they travel in an arc so it's just generally difficult it's not that difficult like i mean we've all done it we've all died to reflected pipes and hit pipe reflex like it happens uh but pipes aren't really the you know what i'm saying is and this should this should just be obvious is that air blast is 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 a contentious mechanic already in the game and it is way harder way riskier and way more skill based than the short circuit is and yet for some reason people only complain about the short circuit on the cart why the short circuit is bad everywhere it shouldn't fucking be in the game it's just busted like that, that shit is just it's just way too high a reward for nothing for it takes no skill to use it takes nothing it's literally nothing you're sacrificing a, a, a secondary on engineer like if it wasn't for the fact that the wrangler is is even more busted then it would be insane to use anything else because what are you going to use a pistol like <laughs> you're an engineer your sentry is doing the fighting for you 90 percent of the time anyway it's like what you, you know you're not even like ostensibly going gunboats on soldier is a sacrifice like you you could be pumping out more damage with the shotgun but you're choosing to go for a higher mobility play style and pretty much everyone agrees that the gunboats is like a perfect side grade because it, re it rewards someone who is a skilled uh you know rocket jumper if you're not good at rocket jumping if you've never rocket jumped before you're going to get more use out of the the shotgun every every day of the week obviously but on on ng on, on engineer you know there's no better unlock <laughs> that you could be switching to other than the wrangler which is just also broken like the excuse is well there's this even more broken unlock i could be using so you should be thankful that i'm using the already broken like bro this shit shouldn't be in a fucking game like it's it's just busted i i hate engineers i i dislike them so i don't even feel bad i hate i hate um engineer secondary weapon that are like that for some reason Valve was just like, yeah, we gotta fucking give Engineer just, like, free buffs because we made him too weak. But he's not too weak. And you know how I know he's not too weak? Because even in sixes, they play Engineer to hold last. Like, they don't play fucking Pyro to hold last. They play, they, they, the, if you're on sixes, this, you know, on and holding a last, the first thing you do is, is, is build a sentry. And then when your sentry goes down, you switch to heavy. Like, you don't fucking switch to Pyro. You don't, you don't you know switch to any of the other classes you you play an engineer because having an aimbot is extreme like news news flash bucko who <laughs> could have possibly predicted that having a, a, an aimbot that can can you know hit people perfectly is extremely powerful and counters scout you know completely uh which is important because scout isn't counted by anything else if it wasn't for engineer scout would be like you know unquestioningly the most powerful class in the game second to medic the most powerful attacking class in the game if it wasn't for the fact that engineer exists scout would just be ridiculously unstoppable because scout is also poorly designed in tf2 right in tf classic scout was really fast and really mobile but didn't output very much damage yeah i know i'm fucking salty scout is too powerful uh but even that, you know, I I can't be that mad about it because the the scout's superpowers, scout being the best attacking class in the game, only unlocks once you're cracked at scout. It's like sniper, you know, like sniper is overpowered and and unfun to fight against, but a a a bad sniper is not, right? Like it's only a good sniper, a a a, a sniper main with ten thousand hours in the game that it, that makes the class busted and completely broken and it's the same with scout um although not enough people talk about this they like uh, most scouts that you will face are like you know tough to fight as most classes which but but doable but a really really good scout with really good movement and really good good aim is just impossible to fight like it, they're just invincible 
Um, so if it wasn't for sentries, it would just be it, it would the game would fucking suck. It would just be scout heaven. <laughs> it, would, it would be terrible. So you know that's your role, engineer. Your role is to make sure that scouts don't fuck everything up for everyone else. To keep the game fun by balancing scout. That's your role. Um, your role should should not fucking be you know countering the classes that are supposed to take your sentries down by just you know pressing two on your keyboard and and selecting the two broken unlocks that you have you're not supposed to be tanky you know you're not supposed to be i don't fucking know it's stupid it's very bad game design i don't know what they were thinking i don't and what's more is like i feel like the tf2 community is just insane because no one no one else talks about how busted scout is and no one else talks about how busted the short circuit is people talk about the short circuit being bad on the cart which is extremely egregious like that is you know a massive amount of unlock abuse like spamming short circuit on the cart is people will call you out for it in chat you'll get flamed like it's everyone agrees that this is bad behavior and you shouldn't do it um but really it's just emblematic of the fact that the short circuit is fundamentally bad game design like why is it why can we all agree that it's not fun to fight short circuit engineer on the cart but as soon as that short circuit engineer is anywhere else, suddenly it's like, oh, it's it's fine, it's fine, because he doesn't have many shots. Yeah, but it doesn't matter if he has a lot of shots or not, because you can't just choose not to shoot him. He's got a gun as well. He's just going to shoot you. <laughs> like, what do you mean? The only option is to run away. And that's the problem. Like, no one likes fighting a... No one likes taking a fight where there's no counterplay. Like, that's the whole... The whole point is that there should be counterplay. That's, that's what balance is. It's like you should there there should be soft counters in the game like there should be it's part of the fun of the class based combat of TF2 is that some classes are going to be harder no matter what you play you're going to have a, an easy time taking out some people and it's going to be really hard to fight other people and that means you get sort of a an ebb and flow of difficulty and skill requirements during a game you know like heavy is supposed to be a difficult matchup for almost everybody um, that's why he's in the game, and that's why it's fun, because you're like, when, whenever you decide to fight heavy, you're like, yeah, you know what, I am this confident in my skill that I'm going to take on this class that is comparatively much more difficult to kill. Or like, you know, it's the same for, on different classes, it, it's different, but whichever class is going to be easier or harder to fight. Um... <clears throat> And that's part of that's part of the fun of it. That's part of the 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 fun of TF two is that it it's not just Counter Strike where every player is the has the same abilities. You have to decide based on the exact situation that you're in and your confidence in your own skill who you're going to be able to face. But theoretically, you should be able to win most scenarios, except for the very very few like really hard counters in the game. There are very, very few really hard counters in the game. It's not a hero shooter, it's a class-based shooter, right? It's the, the scout-engineer uh, matchup is a really hard counter. The pyro-heavy matchup, not counting the Dragon's Fury, is a really hard counter. Uh, but that's kind of, like, there's really not that many other than that. Um, I'm trying to think, but uh, really hard counters where it's just impossible to win a fight. A sniper versus anyone else, <laughs> kind of uh that's but that's i don't know if you'd call that a really hard counter uh yeah i think those are the only ones i can think of is pyro versus heavy and uh sniper uh, sorry scout versus engineer every other class versus every other class has like a, a you know it might be like a 90 percent in one class's favor but you still have a 10 percent chance you're never like no there was yeah okay the point being engineer didn't need buffs because because we already have evidence that engineer is is optimal for holding points and we know this because we have a situation where we can look at optimal play it's called competitive tf2 where they've had you know more more than a decade to figure out the optimal play style for the game and it involves engineer in a niche role but that's fine you know there's nothing wrong with having a niche in the game uh so the idea that engineer like wasn't strong enough already and needed needed secondaries that would buff him is just absurd 
Like, there's, no, it's not it's not true. People played Engineer before the Wrangler and the Short Circuit were in the game. They played Engineer all the time because he's a good class. Sentries are extremely powerful. You're already strong. You don't need you don't need extra buffs. And I, I think most people don't play with the short circuit or abuse the short circuit to a high degree because it's so easy. It takes no skill and it's not even really fun to use. Like the the reason that you don't often run into short circuit spamming engineers um is in part because it's found upon in the community and you'll be flamed in chat if you do it but it's also because it's boring it's really boring to do because it takes no skill and it's really easy in which case like why can't engineer mains admit that it shouldn't <laughs> it shouldn't be in the game or it should be like much harder to it should require some actual skill like you should uh, you should at least have to aim that's all i'm asking like instead of just vague direction giant orb it should be like you have to actually click on the projectile as it's coming towards you what if it was that what if you just had to like point and click at it and you had to, you know, actually look away from the fight for a second. Uh, so you couldn't be aiming your shotgun and shooting the short circuit at the same time and just pressing Q, you know, like easy, easy mode. But but that is not how the game works. They made the game badly instead, which is just stupid. And yeah, Scout, no one talks about how bad Scout is. Scout can, can two shot almost every class in the game except heavy. And is also just like impossible to hit if they're good. That's overpowered. That's that's stupid. I think it's important to keep the great otaku tradition alive of throwing in random Japanese words into your sentences, even when you don't really speak Japanese very well. Um, and because because it's the same fucking shit that the Japanese motherfuckers be doing to English no one it's like considered cringe it's considered cringe if you go around throwing in random japanese words uh throwing in random nihongo into your uh you know your speech i still do it all the fucking time because they do it on the, i mean that uh Dogen on youtube he, he jokes about how this all the time right how modern japanese is just like what what's it called gaidaku loan words it's just nothing but loan words uh and yeah i think uh i think it's just funny to pull the same shit <laughs> but in reverse just speaking english but but with lots of random japanese loan words that don't need to be loan words as a very uh, i i find this extremely amusing uh no one else has ever commented on it uh but i don't care like i'm always for it's normally i'm saying it with anime related stuff obviously cuz cuz that's that's yeah, I'm an, I'm an otaku, but uh, notice, for example, how I almost always say otaku rather than, like, weeb, which would be the general Norman slang. Most people would say weeb, but I always I always make a point to say otaku because uh, there's an implicit self de de self-deprecation when you go, you got to go around calling yourself a weeb because you're not allowed to think, you're not allowed to just be actually genuinely a part of a subculture or whatever. You have to be self-deprecating, like, oh, I'm a, I'm a disgusting weeb, anime is trash, you guys watch the new Sea Dog VA video, you gotta be going around like that. You can't be like, no, no, I'm a hontoni otaku this, <laughs> you know? You, like, I, I will, for example, I will always say, like, Neko Mimi or uh, Kimono Mimi rather than like cat ears or anime ears uh, or, I mean animal ears <laughs> anime ears uh, or like uh, I like refer to characters as like the, the Megane girl instead of the glasses girl you know stuff like that um, but yeah I just think it's funny and and kind of kind of epic that's my that's my general opinion on random Japanese loan words we should all use them more often, and then the two language, the two languages will slowly morph into like a patois, to, but like opposite sides. <laughs> that I this is very funny to me. So this is the TF podcast now. Let me talk about uh, something fucking weird. Uncle Dane, the Sentry Main, uh, he was uh, he he did like some sort of podcast. Hold on a minute. Let me find this. Uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. Yeah, Uncle Dane and John Tohill to talk about Engineer and Spy for two hours. And I watched this whole thing. 
And it was an interesting, you know, little discussion. They're just sort of talking about the dynamic of engineer versus spy as an ng main and a spy main, respectively. And, uh, you know, it's pretty interesting. They don't have great chemistry, the two of them, but it's just fun listening to high-level players talk about whatever they do. But what was really weird to me is that they sort of seemed in agreement on this one particular statement, which is engineer and spy are the most complex classes in the game. I'm sorry, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, spy I can kind of understand, but but in what universe is engineer the most complex class in the game? I mean, like, by my reckoning, there is no most complex class in the game. Like, you can deep dive any mechanic in this game, and and, and it, it goes as deep as you want it to go. I mean, like, any... Really, Medic? Medic isn't the most complex class in the game? Like, I would say Medic is the hardest class to master in TF2. Uh, because you can always be making better. Like, as Casual says in his his Medic video, uh, you know, you, you can always be optimizing slightly better. You're making the most decisions per second of, of a, in, in, like, anything ever. <laughs> you, you are... You are making, like, an insane amount of decisions per second when you're playing Medic. Uh, and you could always be playing slightly more optimally. Or you could always, like, you know... In a class where your mission is no longer don't die, your mission... Oh, sorry, your mission is no longer kill the enemy. Your mission is now, what, don't die, plus heal your teammates, plus uh, Ubers. Like what? Like yeah. I mean, if you want to talk about the most complex class in the game, it's it. If if it's anything, it's medic, right? You you gotta. Firstly, you gotta have excellent game sense in order to avoid dying at all times, and you gotta have great judgment in terms of like how aggressive you're gonna position yourself. You gotta keep in mind so many different things at once. You gotta keep so many things in mind. You gotta keep in mind where the enemy team is. You gotta be uber tracking your enemy, the enemy medic. You gotta be spy checking. You gotta be being spy aware all the time. You gotta be deciding what uh, heal priority. Who who are you gonna heal at any one time, uh, based on all different classes. You gotta decide if you're gonna hold on to someone with a medi beam for an extra time to buff them into battle, or just heal them up to full, or if you're even gonna heal them at all. You gotta decide. Uh, you know, you gotta keep in mind crit heals. You gotta decide which medigun to use at any given time. You gotta, importantly, very important, you gotta decide whether you want burst healing with the crossbow or whether you want sustained healing and uber building with the, the medigun. You know, there's so much stuff to keep in mind at any given time when you're playing medic. Like, Uncle Dane calls Engineer the ultimate multitasker. Medic is the ultimate multitasker, and there's no question about it. Uh, yeah. So I don't I don't really understand that, but even you know beyond that, pretty much any class is gonna be complex once you dive deep into it. I really don't understand this idea that the spy and especially not en- like engineer is one of the most simple classes in the game in my opinion. Maybe not the most simple, but but I th- I f- I feel like engineer's got to be one of the most easy to understand classes in the game. You know, like, at any given time, you're always going to want to be building. <laughs> like, that's kind of it. There's there's not really much decision-making that goes on in playing Engineer. All the maps, they already have designated sentry spots. You don't have to sit there and think about where you're going to put your sentry, because that's already been figured out for you. There's meta has evolved already. So you don't have to decide where you're putting your sentry, unless you're playing Battle NG. But 90% of the time, you already have your predetermined sentry spot. You already, I don't know, what's complex about playing Engineer? Like, yeah, obviously it's difficult to play a good Engineer. Like, I'm not saying it, it, it doesn't require skill or it isn't complex. But how is it, like, more complex than, I mean, not even Medic? How is it more complex than, like, Demo or something? Like, if you really want to talk about a complex class, uh, okay, you might just think Demo is all about sticky spamming and trapping, which is already fairly complex, and then not to mention pipes being really difficult to aim but you also have to remember the demo has the like broadest variety of unlocks for any class in the game like mastering demo would mean mastering demo knight as well uh and hybrid knight and the sticky jumps like 
People spend thousands of hours just doing sticky jump maps. There are people that's all they ever do in, in TF2 is just play play jump maps on demo man. Uh, you know, that's just that mechanic alone is infinitely complex. Obviously the same applies to soldier. The soldier isn't just shoot rockets at people's feet and win. Obviously. Anyone who knows the game knows this, right? But soldier is definitely one of the more simple classes. But of course there is lots of depth when it comes to rocket jumping. Uh, you know, if I had to say the least complex class, it would probably be heavy. I think that's pretty, pretty easy to agree upon. Um, but most complex, I mean, spy isn't that complex. I don't understand. I don't know. This is just, this is just a really weird take to me. The fact that they just say this and they, they, they just both accept it without any thought is so weird. <laughs> like there's so much depth to this game. How are you going to just be like, oh yeah, these two weird-ass classes, definitely the most complex in TF2. I guess the argument is that like they have two classes that don't rely on just shoot the enemy gamers. You know, they have two classes other than Medic, where it's like you have to you have to do some sort of other thing. But, but yeah, Medic exists, first of all. And secondly, you're still just shooting enemy gamers or stabbing enemy. Like, yeah, I mean, come on. Weird take. Weird fucking take. I don't know how they're getting away with it. Here's the scenario. Someone puts me in charge of a of a game studio, a, a major game studio or something. So someone puts me in charge of Riot or or something like this. And they're like, make make your make your make it make whatever game you want. Make whatever game you want. You have you have lay budgets and lay time. Here's what I would do. I would make a arena FPS game. Uh, now, you might be saying to yourself, no, thank you. You've already made a video game. You know how to make video games. Why don't you just make a video game? It's important that it's a major studio because there are a bunch of arena FPS games that still get made. Everyone's been trying to sort of, you know, quote unquote, revive the genre for like ever. But it's not going to work because they don't have a million dollars to spend on marketing. Any of those games, Rats Instagib, uh, Warfork, Z Zonatic, uh, there's more. Like, there's stuff that's come out recently. I, I saw one on Twitter. Like, the game devs on Twitter posting about it. I don't know what, I don't remember what it was called. It kind of looked really bad to me, to be honest. Uh, I mean, it, yeah, it didn't have... It, the movement looked, looked uninteresting. But... Uh, you know, there's 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 quite a few of these little, like arena FPS games going around, but none of them have a million dollars to spend on marketing, so it doesn't matter. So what I would do is take my major gaming studio and whip up an arena FPS game. Um, you know, they're not that hard to make. They were doing them back in the nineties, so you could definitely do one now that would be pretty easy, with a focus on movement, speed, and precision aiming, and all of the different you know. You know how how arena FPS games go. They you got the projectile aim. You got your tracking quake lightning gun, and you got your um, sniper. Right, that's how that's the flick shots, tracking, and projectiles. The 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 sniper, the lightning gun, and the uh, the rocket launcher. Like that's that's all you really need. Honestly, it might be good to even cut down on the amount of weapons and just just stick with like those three weapons or something maybe not though i don't know anyway the specifics don't really matter that much because good arena fps design has already been perfected like you just have to copy what other games already did like you just do a mix and match of like the unreal tournament weapons the half-life deathmatch weapons and the quake weapons like you just do a, a mishmash of those uh and you'll have a good you'll have a good weapon selection um in terms of movement Obviously, it would have air strafing similar to the Source engine. Um, you know, that's that's non-negotiable. Uh, but the here's the important thing. The important thing is, so it would be it would be m quite movement heavy, as as these arena FPS games tend to be. But f frankly, most like as long as it was it was pretty decent, it would be it would be a better game than anything released in the past ten years. <laughs> <laughs> right, as long as it was pretty decent, 
it would be as long as any arena shooter that was like half decent with a decent movement system and and decent the you know weapon selection is 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 good enough like it doesn't really matter the important thing is this it would have you know a casual mode where you can join servers filled with however many players you want but the important thing is it would have ranked 1v1 competitive uh ladder ladder and you might think that that's a bit strange for me to say given how i have regularly talked about how much i dislike ranked competitive matchmaking in first person shooters and i think they've kind of ruined the genre in a lot of ways but uh i think it's different because the really important thing here is that the competitive 1v1 ranking whatever like the competitive ranking matchmaking that's just to get normans to understand how to play the game the important thing is that it's a 1v1 like this is actually what the shooter genre needs is a return like you look at the the classic you know quake tournaments the unreal tournament tournaments you look at the the actual matches between high level players and it is just some of the best gaming you can find like the it's gaming on a fucking another level man these people are gaming on an, on a, on another plane of existence and they play in 1v1 and look i've put a couple hundred hours into half life and when i get onto a server with a player who is like around the same skill level of me and it's just me and them and we're 1v1ing it's about it's about game set it's not you know in a in a, in a full server you can't possibly keep track of all the the pickups and where all the enemies are and and all the spawns and so on like you, you there's just too much it's just too chaotic you just you know it's and that's fun like that can be fun in its own way but the real specialness of the arena fps genre is the is the 1v1 experience and that's something that you know i feel like the emphasis on on team shooters has just gone the complete wrong way right like the the team shooter genre works best in my opinion in something like tf2 in other words a casual game right where where you know there's maybe an, there's an objective that you sort of congregate around and everything's kind of chaotic and wacky and it's tf2 and they've already perfected it but if you want to comp- like something competitive you know everyone it's it's even in tf2 right of course i'm going to make everything about tf2 in tf2 the competitive format they have to reduce the player count by half right they take it from a 12v12 casual to a 6v6 um you know and every competitive shooter has like five or six player teams uh just just take it down because because no one everyone's mad all the time in these fucking competitive games whether it be an fps or moba or whatever they're always mad because they always you always have to rely on a team and teams are bullshit you're gonna get cured with with idiots because that's because the the internet is made of idiots and even if you don't you can blame your poor performance on them i i think a shooter based around like a fighting game ladder where it's just a pure 1v1 performance would pop the fuck off like it would be it would be amazing can like can you imagine internet arguments being settled in this shooter it would happen and it would be sick it would be pure execution it would be amazing and it would you know it might bring back the joy of of projectile aim into video games you know most out of the three core shooting styles flick aim tracking and projectile aim you know pro- tracking still exists in games like apex in the call of duty games and in the and yeah stuff like that flick aim still exists in counter-strike and valorant and tag shooters uh like that but projectile aim the only like semi-popular game that still puts any emphasis on projectile aim is literally tf2 like no one else does any projectile aim even though in my opinion it's the most satisfying form of aim in video games like hit, there's nothing like hitting an air shot like that's just the best feeling in the world um so you know any game that has projectiles in it and people people are going to figure out how satisfying it is again it'd be great and you know how much the zoomers they want this they want a movement focused competitive 1v1 fps with with lots of tech the zoomers would love this shit 
loads of movement. I don't know, man. This is the, it's like the perfect game. It would sell a billion copies. It would be the biggest game of all time as long as you put a lot of marketing behind it. Like, it, you could have esports tournaments. They would be crazy. It, it would be fucking sick. It would be the sickest shit ever, man. I just need one game. Like, one game studio just needs to take a risk on this, this genre. And, and actually put the time into making it, like, a, a fucking 1v1 game mode with a, with a ranked ladder. The rank doesn't even matter. Like, who gives a shit about, about actual ranks? But 1v1s are fun. Like, it, it's insane. Everyone knows that 1v1s in, in FPS games are fun, right? The, like, there are one, the 1v1... I don't know if it still exists in CS2, but in, in CSGO, you could always find 1v1 servers online. And, and it was super fun to play 1v1s on on those like community servers it was it was incredibly fun uh th- like people do 1v1s all the time in video games it's it's just a fun thing like it, it, this concept of 1v1s being fun has just like what what do you mean why isn't no one taking advantage of this yet it's such an obvious thing to do it's like we have a genre which is like the perfect pure distilled form of fps gaming which is like 1v1 arena fps's it's the perfect pure distill. Like, if anything was the most pure competitive format of FPS gaming, it would be that. And yet, instead, it's gone into this fucking insane thing. Like, that's where competitive FPS gaming should be. It should be in these, like, 1v1. It shouldn't be, like, fucking Counter Strike, <laughs> in my opinion. Maybe, maybe it could be, but I don't know. I just really want to see that game. If I, if I could have any game be released it has to be by a big studio who can like put up the server resources and marketing budget behind it like an indie is just not going to be able to do this it's it's unfortunate but it's just not going to happen i mean at least without like a big publisher to to make a big marketing budget because it's an it it wouldn't have to be like that popular to work because it's all 1v1s that's like another advantage of the genre it wouldn't have to have a million players online it just has to have a few players because you don't need a team every time but nonetheless um you know it'd be better to have more players obviously it's a multiplayer game it, it would be so sick like do you guys not on but like why hasn't this happened it makes me actually kind of mad it's like why i would do nothing but play that game if that existed that would be my entire life i would literally do nothing other than play that game i wouldn't even I would, I, I don't fucking know, they need to do that shit, man, someone needs to get on that, if you, if any of you have connects in, in the games industry, someone needs to get on that shit, here's how you make that game, you go, you go all in on the Y2K aesthetic, you have a jungle soundtrack, because Unreal Tournament had some jungle songs on it, right, you, you hire, like, Machine Girl, you know, they made the fucking Neon White soundtrack, they'll make a game soundtrack, Right, or something, you know, you it's, it's not hard. You, you could hire Fotec. Fotec still works in the industry. Like, Fotec makes music for, like, law and order and shit. Did you guys know this? That's, that's fucking wild. But, you, you know, you, you hire someone who knows how to make jungle. It's easy. I can do it. You can hire me to do it. I'll do it. Yeah, you fucking have a jungle soundtrack. Yeah, yeah, go hard on the, like, Y2K aesthetics, you make the walls, like, very, you make it look like Mirror's Edge, that's what you do, right, you make, you kind of, like, vaguely make it look like Mirror's Edge, with character design to stand out, and then you just, that's all you need to do, it's so easy, you just put some marketing behind it, and you just mark it as, like, the ultimate 1v1 experience, and with a, with a ladder you can climb up of ranks, and that's it, like, it, people will fucking flock to this game, I'm telling you. Like, the Zoomers will love this game. You pay a few streamers to play it, you pay XQC to play it, and then you just, like, dominate him. Like, can you imagine? You just get some, like, old fag, you know, Unreal Tournament veteran to, like, own XQC on stream. Is XQC even relevant anymore? I know Jinxy or some other streamer, right? You just, you, you pay someone to just fucking destroy them on stream with some sickness, and then people are going to instantly see how sick the game is. Like, here's what you do, okay? So you make the game. When the game launches, you have two modes. You have casual mode, which is just like, you know, I don't know, however many players per server free for all, right? And that's fun. That's pretty fun. And then you have ranked competitive mode, which is 1v1s. And then, like, a year out, 
you add cap to the flag team deathmatch with like you know i don't know three three to five players per team somewhere somewhere around that that level with a bunch of new maps like it, it's the perfect thing for like a the modern live service model you can add new maps probably shouldn't add new weapons or anything probably fuck people you know that would fuck up the balance or whatever but but new maps is always fun i don't know it's such an e- this just seems like such an easy thing it just se- <laughs> like am i crazy it just seems like the easiest and most obvious thing to do in the games industry right now everyone would love this game like it, i i it makes me actually very frustrated that i can't do anything about this because all i can do is like at most and this wouldn't happen is that I could make a shitty arena FPS game by myself as a solo dev, and then no one would play it, right? That's not what I want. There's nothing I can do. Like, I, it requires, <laughs> this requires, uh, you know, a fucking marketing budget. I'm, I also don't really like game dev that much. I'm not going to become a game dev. So I, I don't fucking, there's nothing I can do about this. But, like, I wish I could just get in fucking, go to the, go to the games industry and just yell at them please make this game you will make a bajillion dollars if you make this game everyone will play it please make this game as the resident nick land um reader i do want to inform you people that uh land's writings earlier writings i have no fucking idea what he talks about today he's probably just like smoking crack and jerking off sam altman or something or actually no they all hate him because he wants AI to be regulated. I forgot. Anyway. I don't know what fucking Nick Land believes nowadays. I don't think he does either. But, uh, uh, you know, the real Nick Land. <laughs> um, when he talks about AI, it, it, he's not talking about anything resembling large language models. Like, this is... The, let me just make this very clear. That when, when he talks about... I mean, in some sense he is. When he talks about intelligence production... You could argue that large language models are a form of intelligence production. Like, that's, I think, if you want to be a bit of a stretch, yeah, you could you could kind of make that point. But uh, when he actually talks about AI, he's not talking about anything that resembles a large language model. Like, let me read out a quote. This is from a, an old blog post of his called Implosion. When the first AI speaks, it might be in the name of the city that it identifies as its body, although even that would be a little more than a radio fossil, a signal announcing the brink of silence as the path of implosion deepens and disappears into the alien interior. In other words, Land's conception of an AI is that it might, you know, that it, as he's very clear on this, the AI is techno-capital itself. Like, it's it's not um, going to be some little sub part that is manufactured it's like it could be a city right like in the sense that a city is a self-organizing intelligence in a in a particular way uh or and and that might be what it identifies as its body if you can even hear it but anything that you can hear anything that you can can comprehend from from an ai is going to be just a just an echo just a, a, a radio fossil nothing to do with the true a, right, okay, does that make sense? Um, um, can we get that sorted out, please? Can we can we not pretend that, that Nick Land is, is fucking talking about ChatGPT here? He's clearly not talking about ChatGPT. He's talking about something on a much greater scale that, you know, think about it in almost like historical materialist terms. It's not that, you know... AI is going to be some product of capitalism, it's that AI is going to subsume capitalism, right? It, it's very, he's not like, he. although he's often talking in obfuscated terms, he's pretty fucking clear about this, like in many different places, that, that this is kind of like pretty central to his thesis, that, uh, it, yeah, it's, think about it, it would, it would kind of be like, I don't know what it would be like. I don't know what it would be like. Uh, let's not do likes. It just is. And it's not that. It's not, it's not fucking language models. That's not to say that, 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 that language models are so... There's no steps in, in right or wrong directions. There's, there's just the process that accelerates. That's all there is. 
And it's not to say that large language models have nothing to do with anything Land was talking about. They do. You know, of course they do. Uh, they are also just as much a part of the acceleration of techno as anything else. But uh, the point being, you know, this... Uh, when, when Land really talks about artificial intelligence production, even if large language models, you, you could put put them into that box, they would they would be, you know, a, 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 how do I even put it? it? It's not quite that, right? It's it's not those those are just just a computer program. That's not what Land is talking about. He's not saying and then we're going to invent this computer program. Human beings are going to do that. That's that's not what he's saying. I must be one of the only people like this. When I was reading the visual novel Rewrite, um, I read the first route, and then I read the second route, and then, like, a, a little bit through the second route, I think I was probably more than halfway through it. Um, I took a little break from reading for a few days, and... Uh, it just so happened that I had stopped reading, you know, in the middle of what was sort of the build-up to the climax of the the route. So I took a break for a few days, and then when I came back, I started reading it again, and I was, like, thrust into the middle of this car chase where, you know, people are fucking shooting laser bolts at each other, and, and, and I must be the only person who, upon reading that, was like, I, I, can't, I can't get myself to care. You know, whereas I feel like if I had been thrust back into reading it and instead it had been like slice of life, you know, boring, no plot happening stuff. Like I must be the only person where it's like, oh, an an action scene. Okay. Life or death stakes. Okay. You know, I fucking can't bring myself to care about this no matter how hard I try. Versus like a bunch of, you know, Bishojo characters hanging out doing nothing fuck yeah <laughs> give me more of this a light-hearted comedy you know hell yeah i i don't know it's weird how m- i don't know i need to go and read more of the like i keep looking for generic visual novels what's weird about visual novels right is uh I, one thing i hate is is western visual novels parodies it's the worst thing ever I will never fucking read Doki Doki Literature Club, even though that's one of the better ones. I will never read it. I will never, and I will never fucking read Class of 2000, what's that one? Class of 2000 something? Fucking, oh my god, what is that? I don't remember what it's called. This this Western visual novel, I'm going to look it up right now. Is it called Class of 2000? Something like that? Class of 09, that's it. I will, I fucking hate this shit. I will never touch class of 09 in my life. Fucking garbage. Oh, it's like a parody. Like, oh, what if the visual novel dating sim, but the girls were mean and they were bitches and they were edgy and they, they did drugs and smoked weed and, 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 and it was in an American high school in 2009. But, but what if it was what if oh, what if they called the nerds in the school losers for liking anime but it's already an anime visual novel oh i'm so smart for doing this isn't this so funny isn't this there's a school shooting isn't this so funny and epic it's not a dating sim it's a rejection sim i'm so clever for subverting the visual novel genre me and my western brain Giga Braid has never read a visual novel ready to subvert the genre. You want to know what the most popular visual novels are? Do you want to know? Let's see. Most popular visual novels on VNDB. Number one, Saya no Uta. Okay, there's no such thing as a fucking... Like, if is that not a subversive visual novel? In the top visual novels, Steins Gate, Saya no Uta, fucking Umi Neko, you know? Uh... What else is it? What else? You know, Subahibi is right up there in the top visual novels of all time. Uh, Yume Mirukusuri, Chaos Head. Um, Totono is probably in here. Kimito Kanajoto Kanajoto Ski or whatever the fuck that anime is called. I forgot 
what Kimi to Kanajo to Kanajo no Koi. That's what it is, right? That's a very popular visual novel. And like all of these are fucking not, you know, too hot, <laughs> right? They're not those. They're not. They're not the. Oh, it's a dating series. It's a generic, you know, harem school whatever like you have to fucking dig to find those trust me because i'm the one that wants to read them and they're not the popular ones no one's read them <laughs> and most of them don't get translated it's fucking sad you've got to even like go back to the like 2000s to even find them no one makes them anymore like the really straightforward ones they they mix them to the extent that they do get made there you know, there's something added to them. They're, they're either like comedies or actions or, uh, you know, hardcore melodramas or something like that. No one's just making pure love, uh, you know, be shoujo games anymore, really. They get translated, at least. They exist. Okay, that's that's an overstatement. They do exist. And I've, I'm, I've read uh, quite a few of them, but... Um, do you understand what I'm saying here? Like, this fucking meme where it's, like, fucking white people. <laughs> it's not white people, okay? It's just because Katawa Shoujo exists, and that's not this, right? Katawa Shoujo is just a really good visual novel by people who were into visual novels as a medium and made a good one. It's not like, I'm going to be subversive. I'm going to be subversive of a genre I have no experience in. That pisses me off. That shit pisses me off. Don't you can't subvert something if you don't even understand the tropes you're subverting. You're just making up tropes. You're just making shit up and pretending that you're being clever. You're not being clever. You're not subverting anything because this medium has been around for a long time and has already subverted itself. Like Totono, right? Like it's like at least read. You know what I'm saying? Do you do you understand? Do you understand? Like the popular visual novels are not. Those ones, they're not the, 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 what you think of as a generic bisojo gay. Like, the, the, the shit that you've, you've never fucking heard of because no one's ever played it. Like, they exist, and some of them are, are somewhat popular. Um, you know, like the Nekopara series, that's weirdly popular in the West. Um, and th those are that, to some extent, right? They're, they're maybe a little, they've got a gimmick, which is that they do the, like, you know, animations, they, they have, like, animation technology, but they are closer to something like that, but, yeah, even, like, Grisaya, one of the more popular visual novel franchises in the West, um, you know, it's also got, like, big action twists in it, it's very action-centric, sure, the common route is, is good, <laughs> it's really good, it's slice of lifey, but the actual, you know, character roots are are very action centric. Um, Umineko is obviously nothing like the generic uh, bishojo gay archetype. Danganronpa is nothing like that. Clanad now, Clanad is something that's closer to the thing that these people are thinking about, except that it's a fucking key visual arts game. So it's a naki gay. It's like, you know, going to be a, a soft fantasy or like ma magical realism, whatever you want to call it. Is it even magic? It's just going to be magic. It's just going to have, it's going to have supernatural elements and it's going to try and make you cry really hard and it's going to be boring as fuck. Uh, Move Love, you know, Move Love Alternative is a fucking mecha war story. Tsukihime is Tsukihime. Uh, same can be said for, for Fate Stay Night, right? Uh, I'm just reading them off from the, the most popular visual novels. Magikoi. Magikoi is something maybe a little close, but Magikoi is very unique. There's nothing else like Magikoi. Little Busters is another key visual novel. Higurashi is a horror. Ever 17 is a mystery story. Uh, um, you know, it's nothing like the generic, what you think of when you're thinking generic. It's not too hard. It's not, you know, uh, DC de Capo. Uh, Phoenix Wright is a fucking Phoenix Wright. Superhebe is like literature. <laughs> it's nothing like anything you're thinking of. Uh, nine, 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 you know this one? It's like a mystery detective thing, right? 
um, rewrite. It's a, a key. Planetarian is a key. Nekopata is now we're getting closer to something that's a bit more generic, but it's the only one, and it became famous in the West for being like an example of this generic thing. It's kind of one of these ironic, It's it became popular ironically to like in the West, because frankly, as someone who's played every Nekopara game, they're not very good. Uh, they are nothing close to the best the genre has to offer. They do have neat animation software in them, which is kind of cool and makes them stand out a bit, but there are nothing, you know, they're fine. I've also watched all of the Nekopara anime there's like three different Nekopara anime, and I've watched all of them, and again, they're also just not very good. And then you get like Sharin no, Kumi Himo, Sharin no Kuni Himawari no Shoujo, right? Again, that's kind of like a... I don't even know how to describe this. It's like... What even is it? It's it's like a... It's it's not too hot. It's not the capo. It's not the generic thing you're thinking of. It's a, like a... It's closer to literature, you know? It's 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 a story in, in a, like an alternate future with with drugs and uh you know a, a a fascist government it's it's fuck i didn't finish it but it's it's insane it's it's nothing like you know it's nothing like that uh steins gate i already said kata no shoujo i haven't read it so i don't know anything about it uh yume miru kusuri or, or chaos head chaos head again is more like a deconstruction of the visual novel genre where the main character is an otaku and meets a bunch of girls etc uh it, and is it's all about like being delusional and going insane and being you know spoilers but you may Kusuri is a game where everyone is fucking depressed all the time and wants to kill themselves it is absolutely and it's about being sort of delusional as well it is absolutely not a generic you know Anything like the generic visual novel that anyone would picture. Uh, maybe Hoshizoro no Memoria is clo- like, we're getting close, we're getting close. You have to go all the way down. You gotta keep going, but you're finally starting to get there. Konosora, there you go. Konosora, you're finally starting to get there. Um, which I really need to read uh, that. But you know, you finally start to get there. You get down to the you know, it takes a while of digging through the top before you start even getting to, like, the Ubisoft games, uh, like, you know, stuff like that, and it's, then you finally, like, school days, and then you get to it, and, like, the, the difference in, in amount of people, like, compared to the top, you know, most reviewed, or most rated, um, most played games on VNDB, you know, we're talking in the, 15,000 different ratings, right? Thousands and thousands of ratings. Uh, number of votes, state added vote average, rating. yeah, that's all you can sort by number of votes. Like, Sayana Uta, 16,000 votes, almost 17,000 votes. And then you scroll down to like, you know, by the time you're at school days, at the bottom of page one of VNDB, you're just in th- 3,000, right? So like there's there's more than a 10,000 people difference here. Clearly the market for the like, you know, visual novels that are like your stereotype of what visual novels are like is tiny in the west. It's a few thousand people. It's it's you know, there doesn't exist this phantasm of a a genre that you can parody if you don't know anything about it. Am I making any sense? What I'm trying to say here is, like, I don't know, fuck off. <laughs> the, the, this idea of, like, a generic visual novel, that there's this, like, huge crowd of people who read generic visual novels is not real. Like, it's just not. I need to read Connoisseur. This is probably really good. And also, um, oh, fuck, what's that other one? Irosekai, yeah. Iro, Irosekai, what, what, what is it called? Iro... Iro Tori Dori no Seka, yeah, weird name, but that's that's something that I I might read that next once I finish um whatever I'm reading, what am I reading again? What's it called? <laughs> Riddle Joker. Once I finish Riddle Joker, I'm gonna probably read Iro Seka. So yeah, this is just my call to, and like I I know I know someone who's developed a visual novel who's not Japanese, and, like, his visual novel is like a, a Yuri romance, you know? 
like there's nothing there's nothing wrong with making a even non otaku inspired visual novel i've read a few of those you know i read a visual novel called purgatory which is like a gay furry visual novel and that was really good it was kind of like a mix between a visual novel and a, a point and click adventure game um but yeah that was really good it had it wasn't trying to be something and it wasn't it was just a, a fun story about furry characters you know sort of in purgatory trying to get out of purgatory and it was fun it was it was cool i recommend it it's it's good even if you're not a furry i'm not much of a furry but i enjoyed the story um you know i've read that they do these like vn cups on uh on uh, game jams on itch.io i've read a few of them like hello girl that was a good one uh I, uh good morning is a social construct that one wasn't that good it was very short it didn't have time to tell a proper story really uh you know i've read a few little short vn cup game jam western visual novels that aren't trying to like rip off or they're not trying to be doki doki literature club like you i don't understand why doki doki literature club is even it's fucking retarded isn't it isn't it just like the higurashi did this a million years earlier and better like haven't we already done it looks like it's gonna be a moe gay and then it's horror instead multiple times like why did you i don't know man shit's fucking stupid the point being that the the subversive or twist twisted somehow visual novel narratives are the popular visual novels the unpopular visual novels are the ones that you are classing as like generic or whatever at least in the west like no one no one reads them no one cares about them there's a very small fan base for real visual novels or they're not real because a lot of those are great right Superhebe is like my favorite visual novel. Chaos Head was pretty good, or if it was overly long, it was about twice as long as it should have been. But uh, you know, it had a lot of good moments in it. Uh, you made me do is good. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of a lot of stuff out there, but it's not you know the same thing. It's it's a it's a. Do, do, am I making sense here? I feel like I'm like making a point, and maybe I'm just making up a guy and getting mad at him. It's been many years since I watched this video, which I think is like maybe one of the most famous videos on YouTube. The History of the Entire World, I guess, by Bill Watts. We've all seen it, but I ha I watched it, you know, when I just, I haven't rewatched it in ages. I was like, you know what? That video is fun. I'm going to watch that again. And I've spotted an, I've spotted an, an error. I spotted a factual error, which I will now point out to the five listeners of my podcast. He says that social hierarchy was invented at the dawn of agriculture because whoever owned the fields owned the food and that's how so but that's just not true that's that's uh that's uh, that's inaccurate that's that doesn't there was already social hierarchy in pre-agricultural societies and there were also um early agricultural societies that didn't have uh <clears throat> social hierarchy so you know the i yeah i mean this is this is not really his fault this was in textbooks until fairly recently uh but it was just kind of a guess like archaeological and anthropological evidence has disproven this now uh yeah the 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 general idea is not necessarily social hierarchy but at the very least they say like land ownership which eventually led to social hierarchy but yeah that's just not true there there have been plenty of documented um societies which practice agriculture without land ownership and without social hierarchy especially given the fact because the the obvious idea behind it is if you're just hunter gatherers there and you're just you know running or chasing after your food as as bill Watts says then you don't really need need to invent any conception of land ownership right but if you're now growing your food, suddenly who has permission to work what land becomes really important because that land becomes, you know, necessary to eat. Uh, the problem with that idea is it's, 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 it fails to take into account a few things. Firstly, that the transition to agriculture wasn't sudden. It was a gradual transition from 
managed food forests and horticulture into agriculture, which was in part, you know, spurred on by uh, changes in the climate. Uh, but nonetheless, the idea of certain part pieces of land being valuable because of th- they had the capacity to grow food uh, already existed, even if people weren't the ones planting that food, even if it was just like, this is the area of forest where there's more berries or whatever the fuck, you know, that value already exists there. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that when you think of agriculture, you're probably thinking of sedentary agriculture, right? But that was not possibly uh, some of the earliest agriculture. Like, it's like, uh, uh, what I'm getting at here is that it seems like a lot of the earliest agricultural societies were built on Sweden agriculture, also known as slash and burn agriculture, which requires you to burn down a new piece of the forest every few years and move move where you're farming. So owning a piece of land to farm is kind of useless because you're gonna that piece of land isn't gonna be useful for farming for very long. So that yeah, the kind of the fact that Sweden was probably one of the earliest forms of agriculture again makes this concept that land ownership and consequently social hierarchy yeah it just kind of makes it make no sense once you're once you're thinking like these are you know calling it nomadic is a little weird but they're not quite the same thing as sedentary they're sort of doing a big circle right that's the way sweden works it's kind of like really long-term agroforestry uh <clears throat> whatever you want to call it uh <clears throat> or or really long term fallow agro I don't know the point being if you're doing sweden agriculture you, the 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 concept of owning a particular parcel of land and then have using that to leverage power doesn't make sense so yeah and since that was probably one of the earliest forms of agriculture you know the 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 idea that the the development of agriculture went hand in hand with the development of social hierarchy and okay i mean look you read the you read the the read the book read the 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 the, the david graber book you know about this um fucking yeah and then you know there were there of course that book goes back to what i was saying earlier which is yeah there there were actually agricultural societies and i say were there continues to be to this very day agricultural societies without land ownership based social hierarchy uh like also looking at the the zomia book right like there's the zomian style of sweden agriculture a lot of the tribes do have social hierarchy like they tend to be um maternalistic matriarchal societies in the the uplands of of southeast asia uh where like matriarchal lineages have the social power but the land is farmed in common like they don't they don't derive that power from land ownership and i mean this was the case this is just the case of, this is very common common commons are very common there 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 were commons in the in the middle ages there were commons in the roman times there've been commons forever commons are a good way to do agriculture so everyone did it it's a very efficient use of land so so lots of people did it uh and yeah again by definition you can't really have land ownership based social hierarchy if most of the land is held in common anyway so yeah that's uh <clears throat> yeah fuck you bill words you got you got that wrong i got to fucking decompress man today today has been a uh, for me for me, for for stuff that happens in my life where I don't go outside and do anything, has been a wild day. A very eventful and wild day. So I wake up, I don't even remember what I did for the first like three hours of the day. This is normal. I'm not really there for the first three hours of the day. You know, I'm just kind of a non a non person. I I probably like scrolled Twitter and and watched YouTube and <laughs> checked my email. You know. Stuff like that, boring stuff. No, it doesn't really count as the day having started yet. <clears throat> uh, but yesterday, I had been watching. Um, 
I've been watching this anime called Taitama, which is, I, I haven't actually finished it yet. I want to say 10, uh, so I'm like almost finished with it. But I, I, I watched 10 episodes yesterday and I was going to finish it today. Uh, but yesterday I kind of ended up getting this thing that, that happens to me fairly often. Because I'm watching one thing and then I start like just going down the fucking otaku database rabbit hole. And next thing I know, I'm I'm in the depths of VNDB or whatever, you know, and I'm just, I, I'm oftentimes watching something or reading something and I end up just obsessing about what, what's the next thing I'm going to watch? What's the next thing I'm going to read? Which is probably not a healthy mindset to have, uh, but, but that's what it was, that's what was going on. Um, so, so I ended up sort of watching Taitama and remembering uh, Artificial Night Sky made a video where he watched every single uh, Bishoujo gay adaptation, which is interesting because I would think that Taigitama is a Bishoujo gay adaptation, but he hasn't seen it, so um, I don't know what that means. But anyway, it got me thinking about Bishoujo games, obviously, and uh, thinking about how I sort of stopped reading Riddle Joker at some point, I, ne I never finished it. I didn't consider it to be dropped. I just hadn't read it in a while. Um, so I was, you know, yesterday I was just like, well, t tomorrow what I'll do is I will, you know, keep reading Riddle Joker because cause I was enjoying it. You know, it's a good, it's a, it's a good uh, visual novel. <clears throat> uh, I just hadn't been reading it for, for a little while. So... I was like, you know what I do, what I'll do is there was this thing that I was enjoying doing, which is having the visual novel open on my second monitor and play TF2. And then when I'm dead in TF2, tab over to the visual novel and, you know, read until I respawn. And that way I get to play TF2 and read a visual novel at the same time. And it's like, you know, peak performance. And that's how I've read quite a few visual novels or back in the day. Like, I read most of my Tetsu in between rounds of Counter-Strike. Uh, <clears throat> it's a good setup. It's a pretty good setup for me. Uh, so I was like, I'm excited to wake up tomorrow and play some TF2 and read this visual novel at the same time. It's going to be great. This is, the, this is the peak of excitement that my life gets. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do some gaming and some reading at the same time. So... Because I was thinking, kind of, and this continued into today, it's like, what should I read next? <laughs> like, I gotta finish Riddle Joker so I can read the next visual novel that I want to read. And especially thinking about Taitama and uh, that, that Artificial Night Sky video, I was thinking, like, I gotta read a classic. I gotta go read DC DiCaprio or something. But then I was like, actually, I think I want to read Ido Seka, which, you know, is just a slightly more modern visual novel but that is very um well regarded very uh, critically acclaimed uh anyway that's not super important uh what the the point being i was i was excited to do this so i come today and then i i go onto the computer i get onto the computer and uh oh by the way that rant about um subversive visual novels happened in the middle of all this while i was on vndb sort of autisming around and I, it just like struck me i just sort of anyway yeah <clears throat> so i wake up i get on the computer and then what do you know osaka syndrome is online and it's like you want to you want to vc real quick so i'm like sure so i help on vc with osaka syndrome and something else i've been kind of planning to do for a while is osaka got really into counter-strike recently and uh, I used to be big into Counter-Strike. I haven't played the game in a long time now. But I used to, I have like 3,000 hours in the game. You know, I, I used to be big into it. So I've been meaning to play some CS with Osaka for a while now that he actually like is good at the game or like knows how to play the game properly. Uh, so I go into Counter-Strike and I, I'm like, yeah, I'll warm up with a quick wingman match. So I load into wingman and oh my God. I'm so bad at Counter-Strike now. I'm like so comically bad. It's insane. <laughs> I've lost all of my skills. Last time I did this, like I played Counter- I played, uh, you know, CS2 at some point 
what you know after stopping playing it and picking up tf2 and i was like not as good as i had been but i was still like you know had the muscle memory but now it's just gone like i my movement's still there i can still do the the fast silo boot on nuke like you know like it's nothing like it's the back of my hand but my aim is just completely gone like whatever semblance of aim i once had has just fucking disappeared uh, and it was embarrassing, to be honest. I was like, what happened to me? This used to be my shit. Like, yeah, I was never that good, but I wasn't this bad. Like, I've regressed so much. Um, <clears throat> and especially because a lot of, like, because the only game I play is TF2, I have TF2 muscle memory. Like, someone threw an AG grenade at me, and I, just without thinking about it, like, tried to time a jump with the explosion so that I'd get knocked back, so I could surf the damage like you would in TF2. <laughs> like, I didn't even think about the fact that there's not a thing in this game. Uh, like, my muscle memory is fucked from TF2, um, and, uh, yeah, I suck at Counter-Strike now. So I played a round of, of CS with Osaka. It went okay. We lost, um, but, you know, it is what it is. Uh, and then I was like not really having fun playing Counter-Strike because uh, I'm much, you know, my brain has become ADHD zoomed by uh, by TF2. Like, Counter-Strike is way too slow for me now. Like, I play Counter-Strike, it's fucking boring. You spend half the time just holding angles, not doing anything. Um, you know, playing with random, like, Russian teammates who are just screaming the whole time. You can't even communicate, really. Um, and then even if I did manage to give myself some sort of advo like tactical advantage, it wouldn't matter because my aim is so dog shit now that it's just, you know, not, not, it's not happening. And on top of all that, Osaka can't really have fun in the game because he's on EU servers with 120 ping. Uh, and he's just getting frustrated because of that, very understandably. So, you know, it's just kind of a bit of a disaster. And I was like, I, do I want to play TF2 now? Uh, so I'm like, hey... Osaka, you want to jump on TF2? Uh, Osaka's not the biggest fan of TF2, but we we jump on Sky or 2 for 24-7. And, uh, you know, I'm, like, getting a couple frags and whatever, playing TF2, playing 2 for you know, just sort of typical thing. Nothing special is really happening. And then, you know, Osaka uh, gets off uh, for the day. So I'm like, oh, cool. Uh, let me download that uh, visual novel I was going to play. So I, I go and download uh, Irosaka and I turn my VPN on to download it because of reasons. So I turn my VPN on to download uh, this, this visual novel that I want to play. Um, <clears throat> also, just so you know that I'm not a complete bastard, I also bought a visual novel today on Steam. Uh, a visual novel that I already have the files for, but I want to support the small visual novel studio. So uh, I did actually buy a visual novel today as well as, uh, well, you can't prove that I didn't buy it or Seco. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, I, I do like supporting developers. I just, uh, I'm more of a try before you buy kind of guy. Anyway, that, that was a bit of a tangent. Point being, the key, the key aspect here is that I turned my VPN on to download this thing. And uh, then I went back into TF2 and went to go play on Uncletopia because I was like, okay, right, well, I want to play a real game now. So I go to load into Uncletopia and I get a message that's like, uh, VPN detected. Uh, don't turn your VPN on off before connecting to Uncletopia. And I'm like, oh yeah, duh, right? Uncletopia blocks VPNs. Most popular, most popular uh, TF2 community servers block VPNs because, uh, you know, ban, ban evasion. That's, that makes sense. So I go to turn off my VPN. I close out of TF2 because if you if you change IPs, well, like if you turn your VPN on and off while TF2 is still open, it gives you a Steam error. Uh, so you have to close the game, turn it off, and then reopen it. At least that's how it works for me. I, 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 whatever. Uh, so I go to do that. I, I turn TF2 off. I exit the game, turn my VPN off. Then I go to load the game again. And when I try and join a server, the game just closes. The game just closes the second it tries to load a server. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's weird. Let me try again. Again, the game just closes. I'm like, huh, that's a weird bug. Maybe this is, I don't know what this is. So I'm like, I uh, restart Steam. So I restart Steam. Same bug still happens. Huh. Restart my computer. Same bug still happens. I'm like, is this, is this only when I try and join uh, a 
public server or if like what? So I, I make my own server, yeah, a local, you know, I make a local server and uh, it still crashes. The game opens fine, everything's fine until it tries to load a map. Once it tries to load a map, the game just fucking crashes. It's not giving me an error message or anything, it just shuts down. So it's impossible for me to, to have, like diagnose the issue. And I don't, I'm, I know there is a way to see like a console output on Steam, but I can't figure out how to do that. Like I'm Googling, I'm duck duck going. I can't find anyone who's like explaining how to do that. I've seen people do it. I've done it, I think at one point, but I don't remember how I'm looking around and I can't find out how to do like any sort of verbose output. So actually now that I think about it, maybe you do that by running Steam from the console when it just, yeah, I think that's actually how you do it now that I think about it. Anyway, I didn't remember that at the time. Point being, commence like hours of me going fucking insane trying to fix TF2. I uninstall the game, reinstall it, doesn't work. I delete all the files and then reinstall it. Because when you just press uninstall on Steam, it doesn't actually delete all the files. So at this time I delete all the files and reinstall it, uh, doesn't work. You know, I clear the Steam cache, it doesn't work. I've tried like everything like i try all sorts of things and then i try deleting all the files clearing the steam cache and reinstalling it and this time deleting all of my custom config stuff as well and this time i load into the game and it works and i'm like oh great now i will just put my master config back in and uh play the game again so i was like two hours in or whatever i was fucking took me forever and then no it just stopped working again it worked once randomly and then it never worked again. So I'm like starting to, I'm like getting a bit mad. I give up for a bit. I just read the visual novel for a little bit. You know, I'm like, fuck it. I can't be bothered to troubleshoot this anymore. I have like, I don't even have any indication on what would be working or what wouldn't be working. Because the first thing, one, the reason, like the thing I did was to do a fresh install of TF2 without any custom like master config stuff. And it worked. So then I was like, okay, let me try putting master config on. And then it didn't work. So I was like, okay, this must be some bug or problem with master config. No idea why it's suddenly happening now and it wasn't a problem this morning, but whatever. Uh, but then when I try it again without master config, it doesn't work. It just worked random. So I have no, like, even any, I, the, the, it wouldn't be as frustrating if I just had any way to understand what was going wrong. Like, I can't even narrow down the problem and troubleshoot properly. Like I can't, uh, it just seems to be crashing for no controllable reason. And I, you know, I do pretty much, I'm Googling, I'm, I'm on Steam forums and old Reddit threads and stuff and people have had similar problems but their solutions don't work for me. You know, I'm trying all sorts of sort of like launch properties that they're, they're asking about uh, saying that might work and none of it's working for me. It's a fucking mess and I'm kind of starting to, yeah, so I, I sort of take a break, I play this, uh, I read Riddle Joker for a bit and then I come back and I'm like, okay, I kind of want to play TF2 now, uh, this isn't funny anymore <laughs> and I just can't get it to work. Like, I think this took me like three hours of just troubleshooting this fucking thing and I think I deleted and reinstalled TF2 like five times, uh, which I don't know why I kept doing it when it didn't work the first time, but uh, whatever. So, well, it did work the first time, and it didn't work any other time. So then I'm like, I don't know how I got it to work randomly. I don't know what's going on. I'm messaging people. They don't know how to help me. And then just like randomly, I'm like, let me just try this. Let me just fucking, there's like, there's, there's no reason this should work. But let me just go into the settings and just lower everything. Like every setting that I can lower Let's just put it to the lowest possible one. Just in case there's like some RAM issue or something. And it's like, this this shouldn't work because my settings were fine. Like, I don't know what, it, of course this is what fixes it, right? For some reason, the game is just like running out of RAM or something, that's my guess. Uh, or I have no idea. And lowering all my settings fixes it. So now I have to play TF2 on low settings. Why? All of a sudden, I have no idea. This has never happened. It's never broken before. But all of a sudden, okay, memory leak. I don't. I don't know. I don't know how how programming works. But for whatever reason, that fixes it. It's like okay, great. Now in the process of doing this, 
uh, I backed up all my custom stuff and then accidentally deleted the backup I had. Yeah, I'm stupid, right? <laughs> I was backing stuff up and then one time when I was trying to re-add the custom, you know, the, my custom config and my HUD, uh, I, instead of copying and pasting, I clicked and dragged, which moved the file to the TF folder, right? Because I made, I, yeah, and then when I tried to undo that, it just deleted it. So annoying, very stupid. So then I'm like, okay, I got to go through reinstalling a HUD. I'm not going to install master config because that fucks it up for some reason. So I guess I'm just playing on low settings for now. That's fine. I played on low settings for, for a while before. It's whatever. And then I get distracted because I'm like, what if I made my own custom HUD? And then I go looking into like how to make your own custom HUD. And it is way more complicated than I expected it to be. And it's like, no, that's that's not happening. So I'm like, well, this is a good time to try a different HUD. Uh, so I, I try out some different HUDs. None of them really work for me, so I just go back to the old one. And TF2 is now fixed, and I can now fucking play the game. After hours of trying to get this shit to work, I finally managed to fucking pl play the game. So, uh, that, that was fucking... I was going a bit insane. I was like... What do I do? Like, what if I can just... What if I'm, I just never am able to play TF2 again? Like, what if it's some weird hardware issue? And it's like, okay, now, like, I, I'm going to have to buy a new GPU or something. Or, like, like what could possibly be... I, I had no... I was, like, starting to panic. I was like, what if I have to buy a new GPU? Like, what if I just can't play TF2? What, like, what am I going to do? I started to, to get really mad at Valve. <laughs> I was like, fucking, fucking Valve, Gabe Newell is trying to personally drive me to suicide by taking away the one thing that gives me joy in this life. Uh, it was a, it was a massive fucking pain. But I finally got into TF2, and so I go on Uncletopia. Uh, and there I am, on Uncletopia, uh, and what do I see but people in the chat, uh are talking about how there are pros in the lobby. And yeah, there were three pro TF2 players in this random Uncletopia lobby. And one of them was a pro medic main. I mean, I'm assuming. Whatever he was, he was a really good medic. <laughs> and man, I played a really fucking good game of Badwater. Like, we load into Badwater, and this guy, like... I've obviously never played with a with a, a high tier, you know, ETF, ETF2L medic before, especially having two medics on the team as well. And uh man, it's a it's a it's it's a different experience. It's like TF2 it's like playing TF2 in heaven. There were no spies, there were no snipers. We had two medics, consistent heals, and the medics were always alive, so we always had Uber pushes. But it wasn't a role, because the other team was also really good. Like, the pros were evenly distributed across both teams. Um, like, we, we did end up winning that game, but it was a pretty difficult last push. Like, it was a fucking great game of Badwater. And, it, and uh, you know, I've been watching this guy on YouTube, Wild Rumpus, who's a comp demo main, and trying to pay attention to how he plays demo man to try and improve my own demo man gameplay. And one thing I noticed of him playing is like how important spacing is uh and how like demo man's ideal range is actually like quite a bit further back from the front line than i've been playing and that i'm probably dying way too much uh but normally when i try and do that you know it doesn't really matter because i i hang back and then someone just pushes into me and i die but this time you know with consistent heals if i do end up in a bad situation i can sticky jump out of it and have a medic heal me immediately. Like, stick, like ha having consistent heals actually makes like sticky jumping to escape a bad situation very viable. Uh, and I just started doing it without even really thinking and then realized what was happening. And I was like, this is fucking great. Like, I feel like I'm actually playing the class well and getting my role done. I was setting traps. You know, I was fucking doing demo man stuff. I was spamming long, long range pipe spam and getting some kills. Now, was I at the top of the scoreboard? Fuck no, I wasn't at the top of the scoreboard. But like my my kill death ratio was something like uh, uh, 28 to 
uh, fucking I don't remember exactly what it was. It was I think it was more than that, but it was it was great, is what I'm saying. I was it was it was way it was significantly above. Uh, it was like a somewhere around. I don't remember. I don't remember, but it was good, is what I'm saying. It was it was like almost two to one, if not maybe I don't even remember. But I wasn't dying. Is the point here? I was I was staying alive and I was doing consistent damage. I bet even though I didn't have a high score, if there were like logs and I could see how much damage I'd output through the game, I bet you would see that I had done a lot of damage. Uh, <clears throat> I, I dropped medics, I was, you know, stuffing uber pushes by launching players into the air, I was trapping the car, I was trapping everywhere else, I was doing pipe spam, I hit a naughty air shot uh, at one point. You know, I was hitting, I was hitting sticky pipe combos. It was just a great fucking game, and it was weird because I hadn't. You know, it was just like my, I finally managed to get into TF two, and I fucking play out of my mind. But I didn't even score that high. Like that's the thing. Like I played out of my mind, but I, like fundamentally, played, the objective right. Like I wasn't fragging like crazy. I wasn't going on a godlike kill streak. I was just getting my team the win. And that felt really good. It did. I like I make me understand like why people want to play competitive. And what the role of a demo is on the team anyway. Like it might not be to completely roll the other team and get a godlike kill streak, but it's like, you know, almost a support class. It's it's sort of like yeah, it, it it's that. It's it's you're very good at playing with your team, setting stuff up for your team. And man, I gotta say, playing with two good medics is like living in TF2 heaven. Playing with two good medics, and I don't have to worry about snipers randomly quickscoping me from across the map, and then I can't play the game. It's like, I don't have to worry about spies every 10 seconds and have to be schizophrenically turning around constantly. I can just actually play the game and fight people. And, you know, I didn't play perfectly, I made a couple mistakes, but generally speaking, you know, having consistent buffs from, from overheal means, like, I can play demo in a way that's just much more fun, particularly because I can sticky jump a lot more. And sticky jumping is really fun, but I don't have to sacrifice stickies and, and play with the sticky uh, jumper in order to have fun. Like, I can just have medic overheal and actually have some, like, decent mobility, which is, you know why why demo is good in the first place is because he's a great damage dealer and he has decent mobility as well but a lot of the times in casual you don't have the medic buffs in order to to actually use that mobility effectively you just don't have the spare health but with good medics like you have that spare health and that added mobility lets you play from like super unexpected angle like i i like at one point uh there's this um like when you're pushing last on bad water there's there's sort of a, a choke and then there's like a, a little sticky out sort of box <laughs> that you can you can jump on top of and uh, get like the high ground up there to sort of look around the corner and normally it's not maybe a very good place to go as a demo because you're gonna have to sticky jump to get up there so you're losing a lot of help and it, it you you might get it kind of puts you in a sniper sight line and it doesn't give you like a super great vantage point, but it can, like, especially because it's a bit of an off angle, like people don't generally expect a demo to be up there. Uh, but normally, you know, if I'd go up there, it'd probably be pretty pointless because I would have to expend so much health to get up there that all it takes is, you know, one soldier to bomb me while I'm up there and I'm just dead. But in this situation, the medic just overheals me and then I can jump up there and actually start spamming down damage and then fall back effectively when I see that I'm getting bombed and trap the, you know, place stickies at my feet so that the soldier lands on them and then he jumps. I, I know it's, it wasn't a crazy play or anything. It's, it's just a way to be effective that you normally don't get. Like you can just be in spots like that. Or uh, I saw an engineer running behind us like that it didn't seem like anyone else had spotted. So I just like sticky jumped over there to catch him. Right, because I could I could actually keep up with him by stick like that that the medic buffs are so powerful. Playing with a good medic is it's a life changing experience. <laughs> Having consistent heals is insane. It really made me feel like I was actually starting to reach the potential of of demo man as a club, even though I wasn't you know fragging out that crazy. My sustain was way better. I just wasn't dying. 
I mean, I died. I died a few times, but I, I was killing much more than I was dying. And it was great. It's just a great fucking feeling. Um, anyway, then we played a few more games and the teams were a little less balanced and it, or quite a lot less balanced and they were kind of roles and it wasn't that fun. But that one Bad Water game was great. It was the best Demo Man gameplay I've done in a, in a long time. Uh, that's not even true. I've been improving recently to just at the, at, at the game, especially stickies. Like sticky aim, tra- like knowing when, where, when and where to place traps and all that stuff. Like I've definitely been improving at Demo recently, which is a really good feeling because... There was a good while there where I kind of felt like I wasn't getting much better, but I've been improving significantly. Well, at least it feels significant to me. Um, yeah, so playing with pro players, and it's also a bit fucked, right, when they're on the other team, because one of the pros was playing scout on the other team at some point, not on the Bad Water game, but on a different game. I just like, yeah, you can't kill that guy. <laughs> like, he's going to rush you down, and if you get caught off, like, away from your team in a, in a weird position... That scout is going to fucking spot you and he's going to rush you down and there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, you know, maybe I need to play more demo v scout MGE uh, to practice that matchup, but I really haven't. I just, I, I managed to hit a pipe on him, but hitting one pipe is not enough. Uh, and that, yeah, but most of the time he just runs you down and there's nothing you can fucking do. It, you're, you're not going to out predict a, a, a pro, you know, Highland or player or whatever. Um, so yeah, that was uh, that was TF two. That was the that was my day. It's been very eventful. And that whole time, that whole time I was playing TF two, I wasn't even reading Riddle Joker. <laughs> I was just like no music, no videos in the background, pure focus TF two. It was crazy. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Does it is that an interesting is that an interesting anecdote for today? It was a pain to get TF two working, but but once it did get working, it was great. So there I was. It was 6 a.m. I had just woken up and I hopped on Uncle Topia. And there we were having a good fun time playing the video game. But for some reason, people kept voting for really bad maps. <laughs> like, we played, uh, I don't know what was going on. We played like Thunder Mountain and it, it lasted like 10 years. But everyone was having fun and talking to each other in voice. And everyone was was, was making jokes and 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 having fun in in voice in TF2 and it wasn't like giga cringe it was actually fun uh and then the other team started tryharding for no reason it's fucking 7 a.m it's like 7 in the morning try hard on uncle topia time what are you doing running two vax medics what are you doing <laughs> fucking spamming the short circuit on the cart it's, it's fucking set, but can you imagine waking up at seven in the morning and being like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to grab a couple friends. We, we all pick medic and pocket this heavy. Like there was a heavy, there was three medics at one point. Oh man. It was a, it was just a, it was a lot. And so people were like, what's going on here? Why are they doing that? And that just sort of spurred the beginning of the game complainers. Then for some reason... People just kept voting for unpopular maps. Now, I don't, I'm not the biggest fan of Thunder Mountain. I don't think it's like a terrible map, but I wouldn't personally, you know, queue for it. It's not my favorite uh, map in the game. Uh, and then they voted for Enclosure, which is, I actually think, a decent map. Like, I, don't, I don't hate Enclosure, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's a lot. It's not... Not, you know, super popular. It's not great. It has problems. Uh, and then they vote Dust Bowl. Now, I love Dust Bowl. But after running fucking three, three stage maps in a row, after running three weird ass three stage maps in a row, after, after running Thunder Mountain, Enclosure, and Dust Bowl with tryharders, like, the vibes were just, just rancid. The vibes were, were rancid. The vibes were terrible on that server. There were just game complainers in the chat. And they were saying, like, they weren't just saying, like, fucking retards voted for this map or whatever. They were doing that. But they weren't just doing that. Like, that's fine. If you want to complain about the map you're on, that's fine. But they weren't just doing that. 
they were then going like, oh, the, the, the game's dead. Casual is unplayable. There's only one Uncle Topia server that's active at 7 in the fucking morning. Oh, the game is dying. I think TF2 is going to die in two weeks because everyone stopped playing it. Just insane, unhinged shit like that. And they just kept going on. And then they were like, Pyro is too overpowered. Pyro is the strongest class in the game and he's too broken. And sticky spamming is too overpowered. Everything's too overpowered in the game. It was fucking driving me nuts. I hated these people. I couldn't stand it. So, and I was like, fuck it. You know what I'm going to do right now? I'm going to be the change that I want to see. I'm going to save TF2. Because why is this happening? It's happening because all of these idiots are forced to be on the same server as each other. Because there's only one Uncle Topia server that's uh, that's active right now. But, you know, it's like 7.30. People are going to start getting onto the game by now. People are going to start playing. So someone just has to go and, and op you know, be the one who joins a new server and, and revives it. And creates another un active Uncle Topia London server. So I said, fuck it. And I started streaming. I, I loaded up a server, Uncle Topia London 2. And I started streaming with the IP in the description. And I just said, we gotta revive the server, guys. I put on motivational music and, and LARPed as a motivational speaker and just encouraged everyone to join the stream and then join the game. Get on the game and save TF2. And what's crazy is it fucking worked. I mean, I guess I shouldn't be that surprised. The timing was very good, but it worked. Like I joined this empty server and then I encouraged, like, you know, we got, like, six people to join. And then off of that, more and more people started joining until we all left, including me. And the server is now revived. And all it took was, was playing Upward and Badwater. And it was a great time. It was great. It was really fun. There weren't fucking raging tryhards, you know. It was just having a good time playing TF2. You can go watch that stream. It's on my channel. Uh... And it was, yeah, it was just great fun. And that's all I wanted to say, is that I did that, and we did that. And it was great, it was great, it was, it, was, it was very fun. Maybe I'm just like uneducated or not aware that there's there's some game out there that does this. But it's actually insane how Zoomers just don't have access to games with projectile aim. Like if you're not gonna play TF2, there's no other game where projectile aim is important. It, it's insane, like, there's three core types of aim, right? Flick, tracking, and projectile, right? It's from Quake. You got the lightning gun, the, the sniper rifle, or the rocket launcher, right? Like those are the three types of three core types of FPS aim, and like there's just no games other than TF2 that are popular that have projectile aim in them. It's insane. Like, look, the hit scan aim is is fine, right? Like I suck at it. I I, I suck at it. But, like, I like it. You know, I've played a lot of Counter-Strike. Uh, I play Sniper in TF2 sometimes. You know, I'm, I'm not, like, against... Ag I'm just talking about, like, why is projectile aim so underrepresented? When, at least in my opinion, it's the most satisfying. Like, yeah, a nice flick shoot, flick headshot in Counter-Strike or whatever game is, is satisfying. And, yeah, it's satisfying to... to have really good tracking in a, a game like Apex or something. Like when I I've never played that game, but when I watch people play Apex, like it looks very satisfying to to have great tracking aim, and I I respect that. Like there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not an air pipe, <laughs> you know. Like nothing in gaming is. There's nothing else like it, which is fucked up because it's such an old classic mechanic. It's been around since the early days of of multiplayer FPSs. It's crazy that. Every game is just pure hit scan now. Like, guys, what happened to projectile aiming? It's so fun. Like, I, 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 I don't know. It's like my perf. You know, my perfect one v one esport AFPS. Like, people would play it as soon as they realized how fun it was to shoot people with a rocket launcher because it is crazy fun. And it's crazy to me. But and like, I I like playing Demo Man because my. <laughs> I like satisfying thing, and I like movement in video games. Like my favorite two things, are, are movement and hitting hitting projectiles. I like the swag. I like the satisfying things. What I'm saying is, it's nice to have an option that's based around the different type of aim. Because like my my hit scan aim is is dog shit and garbage. 
and my projectile aim is not amazing, but it's, I think if you were to rank me against the average person, I probably have like just about either average or barely above average uh, pipe aim on Devil Man. Um, you probably have a little bit above average. I don't know. I, I'm trying to think, because isn't it the thing that everyone rates themselves as, as slightly above average in anything? <laughs> like whenever you ask people to rate themselves, they're like, yeah, I'm slightly above average. So maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe I'm just about average. But I, I don't know. It, I have good and bad days. But I would just assume that I'm above average given the fact that I have like 500 hours on Demo Man. Like I would assume that most people haven't put that much time into the class and... That's what makes that's that that would make me better. Um, like it's not that often. I guess kind of by the nature of Demo Man, it's not that option that you end up in a a, a clean bum one v one with just a grenade launcher. But when I do, I rarely die to the other guy. Most of the time, we both whiff all of our shots and then uh, run away. <laughs> that's most of the time when that happens. Point being, I I think I wouldn't have average skill projectile aim if there were more games you know like even on soldier in tf2 like i barely play soldier i don't have that many hours on soldier but when i mge with do less on soldier obviously he beats me because he's a soldier main but i think i do like okay like i kind of do some i win some games like i don't i don't win most of the games but i can beat him from time to time as the soldier 1v1 um like my my aim is to, my projectile aim my ability to hit air shots it's not great it's not particularly good it's definitely not as good as someone who plays a lot of soldier um and neither is my rocket jumping but it's it's okay like i just think i'm generally more of that kind of of player i think that that type of aim just suits me better i've just never you know i think i've talked about this to death but in you know three thousand hours of counter-strike my aim was always the thing that held me back. I've just never been good at hit scan aim, and to the point where it just kind of makes me miserable. <laughs> like especially playing scout in TF two, is just fucking suffering. Like I I I hate playing scout. I cannot hit my shots, and it feels like I'm going crazy. Like sniper, at least I understand why I'm missing. Scout, I don't know what. I don't know, man. I fucking hate playing scout. <laughs> I hate fighting scouts. I hate playing scout. I, ca I just cannot hit my shots. I'm incapable of doing it. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's time for me to like buy Kovacs and just start aim training 12 hours a day. <laughs> but I don't think it's going to help because I did that. I played Counter-Strike for 3,000 hours, which is basically that. And it didn't improve my aim. I'm still garbage. <sighs> and I play on like low sense comparatively. Compared to a lot of people, I have like pretty low sense. I have a big desk. I have a big mouse pad, so I play on like pretty low sense. Yeah, I could it could be lower, but then it would fuck up like rocket jumps where you need to do like quick, you know, 180 flicks behind you to rocket jump and stuff. It would make that really annoying. Uh, I don't know. I guess I'm just a complaining Andy. I'm a complaining Andy about about uh, the focus on hit scanning. What I mean is like I'm definitely below average skill level for a gamer at hit scan aim. Because there are so many games that prioritize hit scan aim that the skill is highly transferable, and it's like there's so many people with ten thousand hours on t on on uh, Counter Strike, ten thousand hours on Apex, ten thousand hours on Valorant, ten thousand hours on PUBG, ten thousand hours on Rust. You know, like there's so many people who have grinded those games that the average skill level for hit scan aim is just crazy high these days. Which is one of the reasons why I don't like playing Counter Strike anymore. Because the skill, the average skill level in Counter Strike is just kind of absurdly high, from my perspective. I remember back in the day when I would just go for ninja diffuses and play the game for fun in CS:GO, and the amount of people who would just like make such basic mistakes, like not even checking the site when you when you take the site, so that you could just hide in a corner and no one would even notice you. You'd just be behind them, no one would even care, or you'd smoke the bomb to defuse it. And they would just completely forget where they planted the bomb and just spray wildly, completely missing you. Like, there were so many situations like this that just wouldn't happen today. Like, people just don't make basic mistakes like that anymore. Or when I first started playing Nuke with, with a B-hopping play, focused playstyle, like, if there was an AWP holding a silo outside, 
I could just run past him. Like, I could bet on the fact that he would miss the shot because I was just moving slightly unpredictably from B-hopping. But now, like, that's impossible. <laughs> like, you, if there's an off outside, you cannot go slightly. Like, you're dead. You, like, and it almost seems silly to suggest otherwise. Like, you, and what's fucked up is we can't go back. We can't go back to a time when people were bad at aiming. We can't go back to a time when people had no game sense. Like, it, it's just, it's just, everyone's too damn good at everything now. And it, it, it means you have to also have the pressure to get better and get better. And I like, you know, it, I, hit the, I hit the ceiling on how good I can get a, a hit scan aim while playing Counter-Strike. Like, I'm just, I, I can't get better. I can get worse. I have gone worse. I've gone much worse. <laughs> but I can't, I, like, I don't know. I seem to have hit some sort of wall at, like, uh, 2,000 hours in, maybe a little less than that. And, like, no matter what I do, no matter if I spend time practicing... On, on maps, you know, practice maps, playing games, there's nothing I can do to improve my budget. I've hit my genetic limit, which is just really low. And it, it seems like there's nothing I can do about it. Whereas projectile aim is a lot more about thinky brain. It's, it's like if hit scan aim is in the matter of like 0.01 seconds, projectile aim is about time scales of about, you know, 0.1 seconds, right? The, like there's a there's a significant difference in terms of the like pure instinct where it's like you just flick to where the pixel is on the screen and click and the better you are at doing that that you win versus having to make the split second decision in order to read your opponent where are they going to go can i trace out the trajectory of this player who's flying through the air at a million miles an hour like not just in terms of gravity and and game mechanics but also in terms of their brain like how are they going to strafe how would i strafe in that situation and then you just have a, a tiny bit of a longer time scale to think about it and then easing that up with like how long is it going to take for my grenade to travel and what's the art going to be like and so on it's just it's a different skill because it's not just about where you place your mouse cursor it, you know can you click on the pixel it's about can you click on can you imagine? It's about almost creativity. Can you invent the correct scenario in your mind? And that's just something I'm much better at. Like, yeah, it's easier. You, ha you, you don't have to, it's not, it's not sniper. You don't have to click a headshot to, to do, to kill someone. You have to land two pipes. It's different. It should be easier. You just have to hit them anywhere. But the punishment for, I don't know, whatever. You know how projectiles work. My point being, we need to, we need, I, 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 it's crazy to me that that style has just gone like vanished because it's so fun. It's like the most fun you can have in a video game. It's insane to me that like no games do that anymore. Today in TF2, I learned that if you're even mildly effective as a flank pyro, people will fucking hate you. People will absolutely hate you if you know how to play flank pyro properly. This is a completely new experience to me. I don't play any class that's like infuriating to play against, right? I main demo man. I'm playing in the most generic way possible. I sit on the front lines and I spam stickies and pipes and stuff. Like, I've heard people say like stop sticky spamming to me before. But no one's like actually flamed me for playing demo man very often. And also, you know, or when I'm playing pyro, I tended to play like combo pyro. I did have some stint with, with flank pyro before. Um, when I was in Estonia, I picked it up last time because uh, Goldsmite has a very small desk. So it's not really possible to aim pipes very well. So I picked up backburner pyro because you don't have to aim. Um, and that's when I started playing with that loadout, but I haven't really played with it since because I found combo pyro much more fun. Uh, but today I was like, you know, I, I feel like doing some backburning. So I did a bit of backburning today and man, <laughs> if you are effective on the flanks, people will get so mad. I just had a game where like half the enemy team was flaming me. And I wasn't even played, like doing that well. Like I was like in the middle of the scoreboard. I was doing fucking nothing. <laughs> All I was doing was killing spies and destroying like 10 teleporters and stuff, you know? And the fucking engineers like getting mad at me for destroying his teleporters. Motherfucker, this is the game. Teleporters are important buildings. 
if I want to, if you want your team to win, you destroy the teleporters. It's not like a bad or fucked up thing to do. It's not a cheap strategy. It's a complete. You know what I mean? Like, oh, you can't. Everyone agrees who's seen an Uncle Dane video that teleporters are the pa most powerful buildings, especially on offense. Actually, both to be honest. But uh, I mean, they're not really important on a last hold, but. Uh, <clears throat> in every other scenario, teleports are the most important building. What is it that Uncle Dane says? Sentries get kills, dispensers save people, and teleporters win games, or something like that. Uh, yeah, sentries get kills, dispensers save lives, and teleporters win games. That's what he says, I think. And it's like, well, I don't want to lose the games, so I'm going to destroy the teleporters. Ever since I heard him say that, I've made it my life's mission to destroy teleporters. Is it annoying? I guess... But, like, what else are you doing as engineer other than, like, keeping your buildings up? Like, maybe keep your buildings up instead, you know? <clears throat> but, you know, I'm not going out of my way. The only time I do that is on Bad Water when I just sticky jump a demo to the teleporters. But everyone, that's, this is accepted. Everyone, everyone accepts that someone's going to do that on Bad Water. This is very normal. But, Jim, you know, that game that I was just playing, I wasn't going out of my way to destroy his tellies, I was just flanking, and I just kept running into the tellies, so I'm destroying them, and the same with this spy who told me to kill myself, I, he was like, why are you hunting me down, I was genuinely not hunting him down, like, I was just flanking, and he just kept having to, happening to be there, and he's very obvious, he's one of these trick stabbing spies, you know, I, I, look, I like playing spy, I'm terrible at playing spy, I'm terrible at Spy, but I do, I enjoy, I used to enjoy playing Spy. I haven't played much Spy recently, mainly because I, I, you know, casual is just unplayable these days. Um, and Uncle Topia players are too good to farm easy kills off. And I don't know how to play Spy against actually good players, so I just don't, uh, at least not off. I mean, you know, I, I'll, if there's like a really annoying sniper or, the, or something, or an NG nest that needs to be sapped, I'll switch to Spy situationally just to deal with it but you know what i mean i'm not loading into a server and picking spy right off the bat pretty much ever uh but i respect you know i would spy is the weakest class in the game and i respect it because it takes a lot of skill to get good at spy um it takes a lot of skill however spy mains have a reputation and that reputation is well deserved the reputation is that they're very egotistical and kind of toxic and I think I know the reason for this, which is that Spy is well known for being the weakest class in the game, but it was also, you know, very swag, very cool. Backstabs are very satisfying, trick stabs are very epic, etc. Uh, even Spy as a character is is a cool spy, right? Like all pretty much all the other characters are kind of goofy in some way. Spy is like the straight man, you know. <laughs> Like, there are many reasons, but I think all of this compounds with a very simple fact, which is that, for some reason, the devs decided that every other kill in the game is worth one point on the scoreboard, except backstabs, which are worth two points on the scoreboard. And so, if you have a good spy, like a decent spy, they will just rock it to the top of the scoreboard because they're getting double the number of points per kill that everyone else gets. And so, I think most spy mains like, tune out this fact in their head, and so they think they're a lot better than they actually are. Like, they think that, you know what I mean? Like, a lot of the times, I will, this happens to me constantly, is I will open up the scoreboard at the end of a game that we just lost, and I'll see that a spy, you know, was our top scorer, and I'm just like, we had a spy? You know, it didn't, like, I didn't even notice. He didn't do anything useful for the team. Uh, like, this happens all the fucking time. I think spies... They feel like they're, they feel oblig, they feel uh, like, like the rest of the world owes them an obligation to just turn your back to them, because spy is one of those classes that I mean necess necessarily it relies on other people fucking up, right? Like, yeah, you can get caught off guard by any anyone can get caught off guard by a spy once, you know, or maybe or maybe a few times, but if you're consistently getting caught off guard by a spy, you're fucking up. Like, you're doing something wrong. You're not spy checking enough. Your situational awareness is terrible. If you're getting consistently trick stabbed, you're an idiot. Like, trick stabs don't work. They're not very effective. Are you, are you chasing spies upstairs again? Stop doing that. 
when when you see a spy doing trick stabby movement you just you just stand still and then if he br brings out his gun you know you run away or something uh, i don't know and this guy was good look don't get me wrong i could see him going crazy with the ambassador and that's not easy but just because i happened to kill him a few times I mean, bro was going, bro was literally dead ring a kunai ambassador spy. Like, it doesn't get more corny than that. I have much more respect for stock Invis watch, stock knife spies. If you're full stock spy, full stock is incredibly effective. Every spy player will tell you this. Full stock, stock revolver is super reliable. It actually does way more damage than, than you think if you can aim. The stock revolver is actually a pretty good gun. I die to that shit all the time. The stock knife is great. And the stock invis watch is great. Like, all, all of them are really reliable options. And if you see someone who's good at... Like, I would never get... I don't know. That's... I have respect for that. Dead on a kunai ambassador. It's like, you, you watch too much, Mr. Paladin. You watch too much, Mr. Swipes. Whatever. Uh, like, you need to chill. <laughs> Now, I will say, when I play Spy, I used to play, I, I, I saw all the Spies, they're like, oh, well, every Spy uses Deadringer and Kunai, so I guess that's just the, the meta, like, I should just pick that, and it didn't work very well, so nowadays when I play Spy, I play Stock, except I use the Electron J instead of the Stock Pistol, um, anyway, yeah, I think the Spies, they have this ego, as if, like, I'm not supposed to kill them. As if I'm doing something wrong by just killing... But, bro, you're an easy target. <laughs> you're weak. You suck. <laughs> like, play it. If you don't want to die to a random fire particle, play a better class. <laughs> you know? There's there's a class in the game that is a better spy. It's called Sniper. Like, you will do the same job that Spy is doing for your team, but more effectively. Uh, or don't play Sniper, because that's annoying. But, uh, you know, the... You can just choose not to play Spy. You can very easily just choose to pick a, a, a regular-ass class. You could you could go rage-heavy right now, and there's fucking nothing I can do about it. But instead, you... I don't know. Both, both like, getting mad. Everyone's getting mad at me. Everyone's getting mad at me just because I'm on the flanks. They don't expect it. No one expects it to be dealt big crits in their back by a pyro. Now, if I was a Spy doing it, everyone would think it was okay. No one would be complaining that I was going behind them and getting them from behind. That pause, pause. I was hitting the back, hitting them, hitting them, them hitting them from the back. <laughs> no one would complain that I was dealing out back shots like that if I was a spy. Everyone would be like, "That's just the game." But as soon as a pyro does it, suddenly WM1 brainless, zero brain, zero IQ WM1. What do you mean? What do you mean? It's the I don't even have, you know what the difference is? Is that a spy can at least cloak and disguise to get behind you. I don't have any of that. All I have is a big jetpack that lets me jump directly into groups of enemies and die. So, you know, next time, have a little bit more respect for the backbone of pyros. We lock down the chokes. I mean, you lock down the chokes, we lock down the flanks. Someone's got to do it. No one expects a pyro to flank all the way behind and be in a weird-ass fucking place. But there I am, in weird-ass places. I'm like, today, I want to be in weird-ass fucking places. Just pestering, just being annoying. Why? To distract the team. To destroy, you know, random players on their way to the front line. You don't expect me to be there. It's an easy kill. Just like every kill that spies get. That's the thing spies don't want to admit. And look, again, there's no disrespect to play. There's no disrespect to spy mains. I've experimented with playing a lot of spy. I didn't enjoy it that much. Mainly because the problem with playing spy is that it's twofold. Firstly, at the beginning of each game, you do really well. And then the team cottons on that they have a spy and they start spy checking. And then by the end of the game, you can't do shit. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is that it just varies so much server to server. You load into one server, everyone is fucking clueless. You're just getting chain stabs and tricks that, like, people are just chasing after you and getting matadored and it's easy. You load into another server, they've got three pyros, you can't fucking get anywhere near anyone. You know, it's just ridiculous. Every, like, that's just the life of a spy, is you rely on the other team being bad. 
a kind of to like some extent obviously you can compensate for it with skill and and people do but i can't i'm not good enough i feel like i was going somewhere with that yeah i guess what i'm saying is like a normal person me when i played spy and i was like it's not very fun the fact that like if the other team has one pyro who spy checks even a little bit you know i'm just kind of fucked i would rather play a general like a more generalist class and i just did that if you're gonna put you know loads of fucking hours into spy and still get mad about the existence of of a a counter to your class like something's got to be mentally wrong with you why did you pick why did you press number nine why did you press nine on your keyboard when you loaded into the server if you weren't prepared to die to pyros no one expects it the back burner, it's crazy powerful. That shit can melt heavies. You don't expect it, but that shit can... I've said often, the pyro heavy matchup is, like, ridiculously unfair. It's, I mean, it's not unfair, it's just a counter. Like, heavy is a massive counter to pyro. Um, but the back burner, I hadn't really thought about how much the back burner even the, the playing field. Like, with combo pyro, you don't stand a single chance against the heavy, no matter how good your combos are. You're just, you just can't put output damage fast enough. Um, <clears throat> and with the... Yeah, but with the, the back burner, if you catch that heavy from, by surprise, you know, even when he turns around, you've melted half his health away. And by the time he turns around, you know, he's going to be disoriented. He's not going to instantly lock onto you. And so you can do a little bit of wiggling and jiggling and keep out of his crosshair and get right up in his face, make it hard to aim. And you can, you can fucking melt those heavies. It happens. It happens quite a lot. It's one of the only class, you know, I feel like semi, when I'm, when I'm playing demo, right, obviously demo is one of the best equipped classes to counter a heavy, but I'm still like pretty cautious, you know, count, killing a heavy is, is a moment in the game, right? You've got a, why is this computer on? Why is my ThinkPad X60 still turned on? And it's really hot. What the fuck? I thought I turned it off. That's weird. Anyway, you're playing demo. You still got a corner peek. You got to use high ground or low ground in creative ways. Because if you just stand out in the open shooting a heavy, he's going to kill you first. The only thing, like, you know what I'm trying to say here? With Backburner, as long as he's not, lo- as long as his back's facing you initially, you just sort of stand there and, and uh, get right up in his face. Backburner. Also great for dealing with, with snipers. I mean, it's just good for doing the same thing that Spy does, right? But, but better and more, more mobile. And on top of that, dealing with Spies. Like, yeah. To, I, I rat, it's great. The thing about the, the, the flank pyro loadout that I'm using, right? Which is, it's going to be uh, back burner, thermal thruster, and then some melee. Probably. In this case, I'm using the power jack. In the past, I've used the the rake. I forgot what it's called. Uh, but, you know, some sort of melee doesn't really matter. Uh, <clears throat> is, so far, I've just been talking about the back burner, right? But the thermal thruster, <coughs> although I think it's a badly designed item, in the idea that, or in the sense that, it's a good idea of executed poorly. Particularly, like, there's no reason for... Uh, the the like switch speed to be so low it just it just makes it feel really bad to use the fact that it just takes forever to take out or put away and there's other weapons that have switch speed penalties but those you can bypass using by just like switching between weapons rapidly you can't do that with a thermal thruster it always takes like extra time to put away um or to pull out which is just very annoying like i don't understand did they think Pyro was going to be too mobile? It, it, he's really not. <laughs> like, you only have two charges and they take forever to refill. Uh, yeah, I, I know. I, I don't. I think the weapon would get way more use and be way better if it just didn't take so long to, to pull out and put away every single time you wanted to use it. It means you, like, super have to commit hard to doing a jump whenever you want to do a jump. You can't, like pull it out when you go around a corner and then see someone and put it like you you know what i mean 
But the thermal thruster has one stat, which is pretty crazy. And that is that you take massively increased knockback from all sources of damage. Which is just crazy to play with. Like, you are just flying around. The, like, you don't even have to use the, the thruster. You're just, like, every time you fight anyone, you're just, you're just flying around. You're just getting knocked into the air and flying. It's crazy. It actually makes you kind of harder to kill in a lot of ways. Like, especially heavies. Like, you could just jump and crouch, and then the heavy will shoot you back to your spawn. And not because you died, but because you got flung there by his bullets. Um, stickies will just fucking launch you in the air. You know, these kinds of things. I literally hit the top of the skybox because I, I bounced off some stickies on uh, on Mount, on on Thunder Mountain. Uh, <clears throat> and then the other thing is, sometimes it can be annoying because, like, I think it's supposed to be a downside. And it works as a downside a lot of the time. Like, when if you're bombing in and someone sees you and just, like, shoots you with a shotgun a couple times, it can completely fuck your trajectory up. <laughs> Uh, but one thing that it just interacts very strangely with is sentries. Because sentries will just send you fucking flying. They will just blast you off in a strange direction. And sometimes you can use this to a massive advantage to extend your jumps like crazy and just end up in a really weird place. Um, and sometimes it'll just pin you in a corner and there's nothing you can do. For example, actually very funny, today I got ubered by a medic, and I don't know why he ubered me, but he ubered me and wanted me to go destroy the sentry, assumedly, but I literally could not walk forwards towards the sentry, because the knockback was too high, like, I couldn't walk forwards, because it was shooting me, um, that was very silly, anyway, I just think it's very, I don't really understand what people are so mad about, what are you mad about, I just killed a couple, sp I just spy checked, all I did was spy check a little bit, and destroy a couple of teleports and kill a couple of heavies and, and 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 kill a couple of medics. I wasn't even doing that well. Yeah, I top fucked the previous game, but they weren't even. No one there was complaining when I was doing that. I don't know. Weird ass game. There's a little bit of of hype or interest or vi virality going around it. It's sort of niche virality of this thing. I don't remember what it's called, but but it's being marketed as, or it's being viral marketed as the FemCell dating app. Uh, it's just a, uh, like, 4chan sock dating app or something like that. I don't know. I'm not paying attention to it. Because what's really important here to point out, this is fake, right? Like, there are lots of screenshots being shared of very quirky FemCells. They're not on, on this app. They don't exist, okay? <laughs> like... The, there's a lot of people going like, oh, you know, the, the, a, a lot of young men are going to get on this app and they've ruined their lives by dating some, uh, you know, Sanrio posting e BPD e-girl or whatever. It's not going to happen because none of these women are real. <laughs> like, let's just get that out of the way straight off the bat. This isn't real. These are catfishes. Can we be clear? I just want to get, because this is definitely going to be revealed, like, at some point soon enough. There's going to be something where it's going to pop up and be like, turns out that dating app was full of catfishing. Uh, so I'm just getting ahead of that. It's all fake. Like, can we can we just accept this fact just real quick? There are probably some, some women on there. I'd buy it. I'd buy that there are some women on there. But uh, it's probably not very many. <laughs> Let's be honest. It's probably not very many real women on that, that dating app. It also shocked me how... Subahibi seems to have become the the next lane. It's the it which I suppose it makes a lot of sense. But Sub Subahibi has become a bit of an e girl signifier, which is very funny to me. <laughs> you know when when the Normans discovered lane, uh, it was kind of depressing to me. It kind of ruined. It was like this is my special thing, and as it became spread around the internet and. Lane herself became a bit of a floating signifier. That that kind of ruined it for me. It became hard to look at the show the same way ever again, you know. Um, but with Subahibi, what's interesting is I don't really have that same feeling. And the reason is because 
I don't know why, but for some reason, when I think about all of the people who post about Lane without having seen the show, or who have seen the show, or whatever, I don't know, that annoys me. But when I'm seeing people posting about Subahibi, and I'm like, I know you definitely have not read Subahibi, because it's like 40 hours long, and you probably just aren't a degenerate like me. Um, you know, it, for some reason, I'm just like, okay, that's funny. It's not funny, but it just doesn't really bother me as much. I mean, it, I guess it a little bit bothers me, you know. I would rather if people would would, would actually read the, the, the visual novel, just because it's really good. <laughs> it's really, really, it's really good. Uh, but, um, yeah, I don't know. It doesn't bother me as much as it did with Lane, seeing a lot of people who clearly haven't actually read the source material, posting Subahibi stuff for aesthetic. Um, yeah, I'm surprised they latched onto Subahibi and not like Sayano Uta. That's, that's a bit surprising to me. Sayano Uta seems, I mean, I guess there is some Sayano Uta posting, but uh, that seems, because mu- it's much shorter, it's much, now it's written, you know, it's Urobuchi again, he's, he's a fucking, you know, he writes normie shows. <laughs> uh, Zion Oint is a much more normie friendly work than Subahibi is. Uh, so I'm surprised that they latched onto Subahibi instead. But it doesn't really bother me that much because, you know, there's. The, the Normans, they're not gonna latch onto. Like, they're not gonna latch onto, like, you know. I've seen people aesthetic posting from, you know, some of the old key vi- visual arts stuff like i've seen people aesthetic post about canon and i've seen people aesthetic post about you know that sort of thing like they take an image in it as an aesthetic and that that you know but there aren't a bunch of people basing their personality i wish there were can you imagine a bunch of e-girls suddenly going starting to say ugu bro we need to make that happen we fucking need guys is this not the best idea i've ever had we need to make that happen we need to we need to introduce because because they would love the aesthetic of canon right Canon, I don't know. They would love the the aesthetic of Canon, um, obviously, and the vibe because they all love like Planet After Story, right? All the Normans they love that that anime. It's like their favorite anime of all time. Uh, so we we just need to show them Canon, the visual novel. We just need to get, and then we can get them all to say Ugu, and that'll be really funny. We can, we can laugh at them, because they're saying Ugu in fucking 2024, and that's hilarious. Uh, guys, start this, we need to begin this PSYOP. Begin PSYOP, I don't know, as if any of us have access to egos to PSYOP. I don't know. <laughs> but, look, we need to be, we need to be using our psychic, uh, powers we need to be creating hyper sigils in order to convince e-girls to um replace uwu uwu is really annoying to me do you know why because because firstly uwu is like kind of a furry thing as much as it was like a, a weeb thing but more importantly uwu was never something you were supposed to say out loud it's a fucking emote it's like an emoticon it's it's it would be like saying colon set, uh, colon close parenthesis, you know? It, it does, it's, it's, it's not supposed to be a little vocal tick. Replace uwu with a ugu, and then you're doing a, a canon reference, and then that's fine. Anyway, these people, they're not going to be reading wanko tokukuraso, you know? You know what I'm saying? So it doesn't bother me. They're in the class of visual novels that are an ordinary you know, non-completely broken person could read. They're not in, they're not, they're not me. They're not, it's not the same thing. Does, am I making sense? For some reason, I find it much easier to separate myself from these people. Like with anime, I, I don't know. Maybe it's because the majority, like, maybe it's just a matter of uh, quantity. Like with anime, the, the hardcore otaku stuff, is actually a, like a niche, right? Like most anime is targeted at teenage boys, and it's like you know, short sets, short sets. What? Holy shit! Brain fart. It's like not okay, you know, isekai stuff, or harem action battle harem stuff, or shonen adaptation stuff, shonen manga adaptation stuff. 
you know, the amount of, like, Manga Time Kirara adaptations or whatever is pretty low. And while they do carve out a niche, they don't make up the, anywhere near the majority of shows per season. They're a small minority of shows. They don't even have one every season. And that's fine. You know, that's okay. Uh, but it does mean that just through pure quantity, if I were to go and say, I like anime, no one is going to assume, oh, you're into moi. They're going to assume, oh, you love Jujutsu Kaisen and JoJo's, uh, which annoys me. That annoys me. And if I say, oh, no, I'm not really that into shonen, they don't really know, like, they don't even have any concept that anything else really exists. Like, they might have a vague awareness of maybe Lucky Star. I guess a lot of people know Lucky Star and, and Azadayo nowadays and i do love both of those shows so yeah i don't know it's not like i can say oh i'm a well i'm actually a moe otaku so um that sort of shonen slop doesn't really uh, do it <laughs> you know what i mean like i feel like that's i mean i do say that <laughs> not in real life but i say that online all the time uh because it's okay to be cringe on the internet that's what the internet was made for with visual novels it's the opposite with visual novels the stuff that is like literature like Subahibi or um, popular games like um, Danganronpa or um, the, the 999, you know the one I'm talking about, that those popular mystery series are a small minority of the majority of visual novels which are, you know, slop in the best possible way, which are, maybe slop is the wrong word, they, they are uh, cult, pulp, pulp media. Um, yeah, like once you get past the first page of VNDB, you know, the, the majority of these are, I mean, they're about like the, the very format of the visual novels is like the typical format is dating a bunch of high schoolers. <laughs> like it's just not going to attract people who aren't already degenerates, if you know what I mean. So it's like. I don't know. It's a little annoying. I'm not sure what's annoying. Something's annoying. There's always something annoying going on. But I find it much easier to ignore with visual novels. The other side of the coin, though... In fact, building onto this, you know, I kind of feel like... If you... At this point, I kind of feel a little bit like... If you if you have no interest in, in Eroge, like, are you even... Can you call yourself an otaku? Like... <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's the real shit. It's like the, you know, if if uh, anime is like is like the kratom, <laughs> then then eroge is like fucking shooting fent directly into your veins, right? Uh, or I, I don't know. <laughs> it's the real shit, is what I'm saying. It's as hardcore as it gets. It's where the real shit hangs out. It's where the real shit lives. It's like yeah, you might be able to handle you know, a moe side character in whatever shonen anime you're watching. Where's your goddamn, you know, 60 hour... <laughs> like, and I don't mean, oh, I don't mean Phoenix Wright. I don't mean the, the ones I was just talking about. Like, if you haven't read a little... And I'm not the most experienced visual novel reader. I'm far from it. You know, I'm very inexperienced when it comes to visual novels. Uh, you know, I've only read, like, what, I can actually check, I have VNDB up right now, uh, like, 30 or so visual novels, um, which is really not that many, right, uh, man, I fucking regret writing this review of Food and so bad, I, it was so badly written, um, anyway, yeah, well, what the fuck am I talking about, I'm very distracted right now, I'm having trouble focusing on what I'm talking about. Right, I've only read like 30 or so visual novels, which is, which is fucking nothing, right? And a lot of those are completely meaningless to me. Like, if you asked me one thing that happens in Wagamama High Spec, I couldn't tell you. I have no memory of that game. <laughs> I have no memory of Wagamama High Spec. I have no memory of, let's see, uh, fucking... I mean, I, I remember the basic premise of Island Diary. I have, I remember the basic premise of Lilium X Triangle. I, I remember the basic premise of, um, 
Actually, I don't. I don't know what the fuck happens in Princess Evangel. I didn't even finish the common route in that one. I have, I have no idea what the fuck happens in that game. Trouble Days. I remember this one. Why didn't I finish this? This was short as fuck. It was good. Oh, I remember. I just lost my save. That's why. It was, it was in the Great Saves Purge. Yeah, point being... I don't know what the point is. I don't know what the point's being. The point's being something. I don't remember most of what happened in fucking Kinio or Loverreach, to be honest with you. Did I even read this? I don't remember reading- Oh, it was this one! The, the kidnapped by a vampire lady who wants to have sex with you one. That was good. Bishoujo manga kyo. Man manga kyo. Norowashi densets no shoujo. Yeah. That was- the, I remember that. I mean, it was very- it's kind of a naki- uh, I mean, a nukige. Uh, it was okay, I guess. Anyway. If you ain't reading some real shit, then then you ain't you ain't on no real shit, <laughs> and that's why. What I've really been struggling with is, I'm reading Riddle Joker right now, right? I'm like halfway through the Nanami route in Riddle Joker. This is a terrible segment. I'm just like getting distracted and barely even keeping my thoughts together. But anyway, I'm like halfway through the Nanami route in Riddle Joker, and I'm enjoying it quite a lot actually. Uh, it's Usersoft, you know, Usersoft, very, very reliable. Um, and I was kind, and, and I was, I don't know. Here's the thing, is it's it's very difficult for me to choose which game to read next. Uh, and that's what I've been keeping, spending a lot of time in my, in my brain, spending a lot of focusing power, trying to make some sort of decision as to which game to read next. Um, one option is... Uh, there's two, like, longer, more Nakige-esque, I suppose. I think, I don't know much about Clover Days. Honestly, I haven't looked into it very much. I just kind of saw it was highly rated, and I thought the character designs looked nice. But Clover Days is one option. Uh, Irosaka is another option. That one is extremely high rated, so I think I'm probably going to read that one next. But it's also quite long. And so I was thinking I might read a short, shorter visual novel in between before I pick up Iroseka. I might read either Koinikami Osorite 2 or Hokejo, which also looked pretty good. Um, and I keep just downloading all these games. Without, and I, really, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. It's not like an anime. In an anime, you just are like, eh, I don't care what I watch next. Uh, I just pick it up four hours later, and eh, that was okay, and then I'm done. With this, it's like even a short one. It's like ten hours. You know? It's it's quite a commitment. Uh, which maybe should be an indication that I should read something a little shorter next, I suppose. But I suppose we'll see. I guess I should focus on finishing Riddle Joker first. And then there's something else which is of concern to me. Which is that most of the visual novels I read are the more modern ones. Um, but I also really want to go back and read, uh, read the Capo 1. I really want to read the Capo 1. I read quite a, a good chunk of the Capo 1, you know, a good few hours of it, before just sort of being like, I don't want to read this right now. There wasn't any, I wasn't like, I don't want to read this full stop. I was just a, I don't want to read this right now. In fact, it was a time when I, I just kind of didn't want to read any eroge at all. Um, but I, you know, those, the, the old school, the classics, I gotta know the classics, you know? Like, I can't just not know the classics. And an advantage of the older games is that I can play them on my ThinkPad X60, which pogs. That is very that is very aesthetically satisfying. Um, in fact, weirdly enough, Da Capo. I guess I probably it should probably isn't weird because I suppose Da Capo is probably thirty two bit anyway. But it runs better, even though I run Wine in thirty two bit compatibility mode. But there's there's there was a oh oh yeah okay. So the reason I stopped reading Da Capo. One of the reasons is that one of the scenes, like one of the backgrounds that the game uses. Uh, has like falling cherry blossoms and for some reason whenever I played it before if it was it was on that background with the the falling sakura blossoms 
uh, the game would just fucking slow down to a crawl. It would get like 3 FPS garbage frame rates and just be unplayable. Which is not that bad for a visual novel, but it was kind of annoying because they use their background pretty frequently. But on my X60, it runs perfectly fine. Uh, so I don't know. Yeah, there's, there's a concern where I'm going to be going to Estonia pretty soon. And um, yeah, I need to, pr it, I should probably start, you know, as much as I like OpenBSD as an operating system, just for practicality's sake, I'm probably going to have to, I'm probably going to end up going back to Linux of some kind, probably just Artix again, um, just to play, just to play Edelge, really. Um, unless I want to bring my X60 and be limited to games from before 2008. <laughs> Which is maybe a good thing. I don't know. I have quite a few of those that I want to play. The like, the, the Canon I think came out before two thousand eight. I think Canon. I don't remember when Canon came out. Uh, I mean, um, not Canon. I meant Clanad. Yeah, Clanad was two thousand four. That's what I thought. Canon nineteen ninety nine. Uh, yeah, I could read the the key the 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 early key trilogy, Canon Air and Clanad. Um, even Little Busters would probably run fine on, on my uh, X60. And that's actually the one that I'm most interested in. Little Busters, from what I've heard, is really good. Uh, so that's an option. And there is also one, I forgot the full title, but that's from like the 90s, um, like 1998. Um, so that would definitely run. It seems kind of interesting. I think it looks great. I think that game looks amazing. Um, pretty early visual novel. A lot of stuff that went on to work for Key work on, on that game. Although, I hear it's not very good. Uh, there's also Shuffle, which is a game I've been wanting to play for a while. Uh, has a fairly popular anime adaptation. Um, yeah, it's also not that highly rated, but... It is considered a bit of a classic, I suppose. Uh, let's see, what else is there? Before, let's, let's add a little thing. Uh, date. I'm on. I'm just going on on VNDB. Before, um, two thousand. Oops, not nineteen ninety eight. What the fuck? I meant to click two thousand eight. Why is this not working? Here we go. Before two thousand eight, by rating. Love, love, maybe, probably not though. Oh yeah, Shadow no Kuni. Um, I don't know what's going on with the translation for that. So yeah, I don't know. Ever seventeen, that could be interesting. And remember eleven, both could be interesting. Uh, Symphonic Rain, probably not. Uh, F, that could be funny. I don't think it would be that funny, but. Famous, famously is an anime. F, A Tale of Memories is famously an anime from 2007. The best year for anime. But the original game came out in 2006. Damn, that's a quick fucking turnaround. Holy shit. <laughs> they got that anime out like nothing. They got that anime out super quick. What the hell? Wait, it came out in December 2006. When did the anime came out? come out? The first season? What is this? I don't know. I don't know how this website works. Autumn 2007. Less than a year. That's fucking crazy. Um, well, I didn't know that about, about F. There are all sorts of things out, out there here. There are so many things out here. The Capo 2, that also exists. That's another thing that exists. Okay, well, this is what I do, man. I just end up on VNDB just, just for, for hours, just looking at stuff. Galaxy Angel. Galaxy Angel doesn't work very well. The English patch sucks. The The translation is really bad. I tried reading it. Um, Himawari? Himawari? Could be good. Maybe. I don't know. Um, I wonder if I could play... Do you think Counter-Strike 1.6 would run on my ThinkPad X60? Surely it would, right? I could test that today. That would be a very easy thing to test. Nanatsuiro drops, that could be interesting. I've wanted to play that for a long time. Could be fun. Well, this was stupid. I don't fucked up and got addicted to Zins. 
I don't fucked up and got it. The Yard podcast, Ludwig's podcast. They kept talking about Zins. And I was in the shop and I saw some Zins. And I was like, fuck it, I'm going to buy some Zins. But the only ones they had were extra strong. So I tried packing a Zin and it was way too much. And I'm a pretty heavy nicotine user, right? And I have been for years. I vape 18 milligrams. So for nicotine to be way too much for me, it has to be a lot. So I was like, damn. But I kind of liked the the vibe of it, even though it was way too painful. I was I was I had the feeling this would be good if it wasn't like burning my lip and making me feel sick. So I went uh, to the shops again to buy weaker ones to a different shop. They didn't have Zins, but they had different snus. Uh, this one is uh, what does it say? It said this. It said somewhere how strong this was. Six six mg, uh, and uh, instantly what started off as a as a meme because I liked saying Jesus died for our sins, you know that's just funny, uh, and the yard was doing it. Ludwig was was packing sins and I thought that was funny. And it's funny to say upper decking and lower decking. That's funny. Packing Zins is just a funny thing to say. Um, it took one day to become a problem. <laughs> it took one day for me to realize, oh, this is just the best nicotine delivery method. Like, you don't have to vape. It's cheap as fuck. First of all, it's incredibly cheap. Secondly, it's discreet. It's not a bother. It's just better. It's just the the best nicotine develop delivery method that exists, and it's somehow like stronger almost. It feels, it feels more. I don't know how to explain it. It's uh, it's quite stimulating. It's almost like a high, which is not something you normally get from nicotine, but it does give you a, a real buzz, which is quite nice. Uh, I fucking love Zins, man. Immediately got addicted to Zins. Definitely recommend it. <laughs> Definitely recommend Zins. These shits are great. Too good. And I'm going to be in Estonia relatively soon. And they they love Zins and over there. They love Snus. Uh, supposedly. I don't know. But I just want to point out that I got addicted to Zins. And that's really funny. <laughs> I mean, I was already addicted to nicotine. So nothing's really changed. But, yeah. i got to be careful not to go up the ladder of strength on these things because that would be a, a disaster that would be an actual disaster it's pretty fascinating how you can like read the psyches of of other people in tf2 and so there's this uh i play mostly on uncle topia Right, which if you don't know, if you're not, if you're somehow listening to this twelve-hour podcast, most of which is about TF2, and you've gone eleven hours in or however long, because I'm gonna, I'm gonna truncate my silences. Uh, right, mostly talk about TF2, and you haven't, you have you don't play the game, then then, I don't know, that's fucking sick for you. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's pretty famous for being very tryhardy. Pretty well known for, for having a lot of tryhards. Tryharding in casual is terrible because, uh, you know, once you're actually in that environment, you will quickly change your opinion about competitive weapon bans, as I have. Uh, when I'm like, okay, yeah, you know what? It, I can see why competitive players ban so many items because a lot of these are just really unfun to play against. Anyway, uh, a lot of people get upset at tryharders in video games, and then tryharders are like, what do you mean? I'm just playing the game as it was intended to be played. But I think there's a, a social skill, which is what tryharders are lacking, and that is the ability to match the energy that you're feeling off the match, right? Like, not just, you know, try to win, but try and, you know, match the vibe. It's a it beca- because it's a bit of a social space. A video game is a social space, and you know maybe I'm autistic, but I try and match the vibe, and whatever. The point being, today, I randomly loaded into a server with like three other people on it, and on one side there was just one demo night, and on the other side there was a scout medic combo, 
and the scout medic can we load in i also go demo i'm like yeah i'll just go sticky jumper demo because there's only two people on the other team surely they're just, we're just gonna fuck around and congo around the map or something until more people join right so i go to sticky jumper demo and uh as soon as the spawn doors open medic pops crits on the scout who then proceeds to roll us and taunt obviously neither of us were expecting this and what are you supposed to do in that situation um so then i'm like okay well maybe that was just a one-off but no the medic is still just gonna pocket the scout who is just gonna i don't know wh why this would be fun for you but obviously neither of us have the ability to fight back um then i kill him a couple times with some stickies i kill the med a couple times and i kill the the scout i switch to regular stickies guy switches to soldier now he's again now he's basically playing ulti duo right he's got his medic soldier combo and meanwhile it's my mate on my side with the scotsman skull cutter and me just sort of not really knowing what's going on uh and at this point i'm like okay this guy's not gonna stop try harding uh i don't know what else to do other than also switch to soldier so that's what i do i switch i switch to soldier now if you don't know i don't really play soldier I, I, I almost never play soldier in casual, but I have MGE'd with do less uh, quite a bit uh, as soldier. So I've played soldier almost exclusively in MGE servers, which uh, I guess I got a shout out for that because it turns out, firstly, soldier is very easy, right? Like, unlike demo, you don't have to aim like, you don't have to actually hit, hit anything. <laughs> you don't have to hit anything. You just aim at the feet, right? Secondly, you're extremely mobile. So even if shit starts going wrong, you can just rocket jump away and there's very little anyone can do to stop you. So you can get to a pack when you're low very easily. So there I am playing soldier. First thing I do, bomb the medic. Medic surfs my rocket. So I jump up and I get the market garden. Boom. Easy. Then I turn back to the soldier. I, I, I reload, I bomb in, owned, soldiers fucking nuked, boom, bam, pow, get on the cart, push the cart forward, we're on bad water by the way, uh, we're actually on pro water, not bad water, but yeah, uh, anyway, it turns out that, that even with my middling skill as soldier and my teammate playing demo night, uh, yeah, this guy, I, I just felt, I, I, I feel like he's an idiot. <laughs> this other guy because Bo started the match was like aha a server with two people on it who are both playing like meme classes or like semi meme loadouts this is the perfect time to fucking go try hard soldier so he plays scout at some points he keeps switching classes he can't decide and but he's try harding against me and i'm just fucking owning this guy i died like once to him after i switched to soldier like it's just too easy the class is too damn easy uh you know especially like especially with when it comes to dm like when it comes to just dealing with like one other guy it's so easy it's so fucking easy to to just to just roll roll this fella because i can just get out if i if shit starts going bad for me i just run away to a pack it doesn't even matter um and then well, what's funny is that then he's like oh i'm getting rolled okay it was just a joke guys i'm gonna go battle medic now i'm gonna go back <laughs> like it's very funny that you could i could see his perspective when he saw me load into the server he was like i'm gonna go try hard against some noobs and he pops up these two idiots and then he starts getting rolled and suddenly he's like i didn't even want to try hard anyway i'm just gonna go battle medic and play it for a meme so you know i switched to battle medic also and then we're having you know funny blood saga fights which is which is pretty funny and then along comes more people join and now we have two full team like three three v three all, all playing battle medic which is very funny uh tf2 moment then someone joins on the other team, uh, Pyro, and we're just playing Bowman. They're, they're brrr, fucking us up. So I'm like, well, okay, you you have sacrificed your team's uh, ability to have fun. <laughs> so I switched to Heavy and, you know, roll back out. It's obviously not going to work very well. Three Battle Medics versus one Heavy, or three Battle Medics and a Pyro versus one Heavy. It's not going to, you know, Heavy wins that interaction. Um, and then Killbind, 
uh, and then they're like, dude, you switched to heavy, and then I switch. I don't know. But the point being, it's it's I I I I like the fact that I kind of have the ability. You have the ability in this game to decide how serious you want to take it, and it's gonna bend and flow with the map, with the match, right? Like, if you see the other team starts like abusing the wrangler, going stacking two vax medics, uh, you know, if you see some. 10,000 hour sniper main if you see uh oh that doesn't necessarily because that's just one guy it's if the team starts try harding if they're stacking sentries in different places if they're setting up lots of traps you know it's kind of shocking how little i just realized this i never get killed by sticky traps like no one places sticky traps in casual i do all the time and i get loads of kills with, with traps because they're extremely powerful um it's like literally free kills like you put a trap down you're not in any danger and it's a one one hit right it's the it's the freest kill in the game a sticky trap is the freest kill in the game uh i don't know it feels like i almost never die to traps like i die to to, to demos who i'm you know dming in in the context of team fortress 2 dming doesn't stand for direct messaging it stands for death matching in other words a, a fight you know uh I don't remember, no, remember where I was going with this. I just was having a fun time existing in this man's psyche, where, oh, I'm getting, I'm getting rolled. Okay, time to start playing as a joke instead. Because I do that, I do that sometimes. Um, yeah, I just play more soldier. Is the conclusion? Conclu 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 <laughs> the conclusion is I should play more soldier. I don't understand why anyone would use Source Filmmaker in. 2024 surely you can just import some like tf2 models into blender and animate there like why are you still using sfm it's just a terrible program everyone who uses sfm does nothing but complain about how terrible it is you, you don't need to do it <laughs> like you, you, it's terrible yeah you can import models into another animation software you can just do that It'll be better in every way. Why not just do that? I don't understand. What's the appeal of using SFM in modern day? Why do it? There's nothing you can do. I don't think there is. Is I mean, I don't... Yeah. <laughs> like, I was thinking, is it because you can, like, directly import demos of recorded gameplay? But you can do that in other animation engines. Because I know, like, there's a whole sub-community... Uh, of people who import Counter-Strike gameplay into Unreal Engine um, and, like, you know, add fancy effects to it and stuff. Uh, and if you can do that with Unreal, I'm sure you can do it with Blender as well. And it works for all the... Count I, I don't know if it works for CS2, but it works for... I've seen people do it with 1.6 Source and Go, so I don't know. I would assume it also works with TF2 since they're basically the same game, uh, or at least... Counter-Strike Source is basically the same game as uh, TF2. They're both just Half-Life 2 mods. Um, CSGO is a Portal 2 mod. If you didn't know this, that's how it is. CSGO is a Portal 2 mod. Uh, CSS and TF2 are both Half-Life 2 mods. And anything older than that is a Half-Life 1 mod. Oh, that's my rice being ready to eat. I'm going to go have breakfast now, which is going to consist of a bowl of rice with an egg on top of it. Welcome back to the TF2 podcast. I'm thinking so much recently about weapon balance, but in particular, I'm thinking of ever since I watched that Zesty Jesus video about how um, removing random bullet spread on shotguns is a is a buff. It literally, it's not just. It doesn't just make it easier to use and less random and less bullshit. Like, it actively buffs the weapon, i.e. Um, it doesn't just reduce the randomness of the spread. It actually reduces the spread in other terms. Like, the pellets are, are shot in a tighter radius, which extends the range of the weapon and means more pellets are hitting your target, meaning more effective damage. Um... And how that's annoying to deal with as a class that is countered by Scout. Just like every other class in the game. <laughs> Except Engineer. Uh, and 
Yeah, I don't know. I I was I've just been thinking about how t- so many TF2 YouTubers talk in a particular way about randomness and how I don't know. It's they it's like they 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 see randomness as as something that doesn't belong in TF2 even though like none of these people would advocate for for example removing the random spread from heavy's minigun that would suck everyone would hate that <laughs> you know like if you removed the random bullet spread from the from heavy's gun it would be terrible it would obsolete the tommy slab first of all but yeah i mean it would be it would be bad no one wants sasha to have no spread and randomness is a perfectly reasonable way to balance a weapon case in point the beggar's bazooka you know and lots of other weapons in the game pistols smg they would suck if they were just laser beams that were super fucking accurate and then look at counter strike right counter strike is an entire game built around managing weapon bullet randomness right it's a it's an entire game where the movement system is built around making decisions based on how how random you want your 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 gun to fire that people who say oh we need to remove random crits and random bullet spread they they are actively changing the balance of TF2 in a way that isn't necessarily just a common sense good you know random crits they seem it seems like removing random crits is just a common sense good thing to do um like there's there's no argument against it like it's it's just random crits you know but random crits removing random crits is a massive nerf to melee it's a huge nerf to melee now you might think that's reasonable because in a lot of situations so if you don't know melee crits more often than it, it has like it has a higher crit percentage chance than other weapons. So, you know, it it means if you run out of bullets, you in a server with random crits enabled, you have the chance to get a lucky melee swing and get out of that engagement alive. Is that actually fair? I think there's an argument that it's not fair and that shouldn't be in the game. If you are in a position where you've been cornered and you're out of ammo, you fucked up. And you shouldn't be able to just get lucky with a random melee swing and kill the guy. That guy outplayed you. Like, yeah, you know, if you want to make that argument, that's fine. But then there are, you know, some things in the game that melee is actually balanced around randomness. The prime example being the Scotsman Skullcutter. On Uncle Topia, without random crits, there was never any reason to use the Scotsman Skullcutter, which is a demonite sword although it's an axe, but it's a sword, uh, that the main advantage of it is that it's the only demonite sword that can deal random crits. Um, and so if you can't deal random crits with it, there's literally no reason to use it. Another example being uh, the classic meme playstyle, Demo Pan. Playing Demo Pan in casual or on servers with random crits enabled is just w- way more fun. <laughs> Because it's it's a goofy meme play style that is unreasonably effective because of melee crits. Without melee crits, it stops being so much of a goofy meme play style and just becomes like, okay, so I just have to rely on charge crits anyway. It's no, I'm no longer playing this any different than I would just be playing normal demo night. Like, it, you know what I mean? Which is fine. Uh... But random crits, they they encourage you to play, like, differently. I normally, they, they encourage you to play a little more ca- carefully in situations where you're going to be tanking damage. Like, they, they encourage you to not go around tanking damage, standing in the middle of chokes and being like, well, this soldier can fire two rockets at me and I'll survive or whatever, uh, so I can just tank that and then win the interaction. Because you don't know if one of those rockets is going to be a random crit, like, and, and, you know, take you out. There's a lot of situations like that, right? Where it's like, there's risks that I would take if I know 100% that this person can't kill me in the time it'll take and I can tank the damage. Versus if I'm thinking, well, I might get unlucky and get hit with a random crit. And is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. 
I'm okay with random quits being turned off. It doesn't bother me that much. But it's worth noting that it's not just as, a, as it seems to be presented, the random quits of this bullshit mechanic that only exists to be bullshit and annoying and uh, what, whatever, um, who was it, Lister or, or Shonik? I don't remember who made that video. Uh, it was Lister. Yeah, Lister made this video about like the design decision behind random quits and how it was meant to help people push an advantage. But even that doesn't really go deep enough. That it's because he's right in that video. He says like the crit chance is too low to rely on, so no one's gonna be actually taking that into account when they push an advantage because uh, you know it's just too low of a percentage to 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 risk, um, which is completely true. But that doesn't mean the random crits don't have art. So it might be the case that they failed in their initial uh, reasoning for implementation doesn't mean they don't have other gameplay implications. It doesn't mean that when you remove this mechanic from the game, you are not making a weapon balance decision. Because you are. You are making a weapon balance decision. And that's something that's important to keep in mind. Like, there are some classes, like heavy. Heavy laser beams are, you know, extremely powerful. When heavy gets crits, because crits ignore damage fall off, so suddenly you're getting peppered with laser beams from across the map doing shitloads of damage uh, when normally, you know, heavy is pretty useless from a long distance. Whereas someone like, uh, I don't know, Spy, Spy doesn't benefit almost at all from random crits. Uh, Pyro can get lucky with random crits if you're already in an interaction, but the aspect of range doesn't matter really except with flare guns and but with your primary you know you already have to be in close range to do any damage so it doesn't really the, that you know what i'm saying like right like like you are making a balance decision is it a good balance decision in this case i think weighing the pros and cons it's to me i don't really mind it's it's a little annoying to die from a random crit but it's also pretty fun to kill people with random crits um so you know i don't have super strong opinions one way or the other on random crits uh they do change the balance of the game um and i think that's something to keep in keep in mind uh yeah but random bullet spread which is turned off on uncletopia is a different story see i i i now there are some things that this thing used to be in the game called random damage spread which meant that every time you did damage it could be like plus or minus 10% randomly. Now that was stupid. That should never have been in the game. There's no excuse for that ever having been in the game. That is that's, that's a, that is just such a stupid design decision. I don't even know where to start. It's incredibly stupid and it should never have been in the game. I uh, yes, <laughs> that was bad. That should have been, that, I'm glad that was removed from the game. It was terrible. Random bullet spread, however, removing that is very objectively a buff to shotguns. Like, do shotguns need to be more powerful than they already are? They're already very powerful. Shotguns are already very powerful. Scout is already arguably the strongest offensive class in the game. With random bullet spread on, like, do you really need to buff Scout? I don't think so, personally. I'll take anything that nerfs Scout. And if you're going to remove that element of ran randomness, when are you going to stop, you know? You're going to say, well, I should be able to, rely, you know, there shouldn't be anything. When I click my mouse, I should know exactly where the bullets are going to go. That just seems reasonable to me. Okay, then why why don't we do the same thing for every gun? Why don't we remove the randomness from from non-shotgun hitscan weapons, like, like heavy and SMGs and pistols? Why don't we do that? I wonder if it has anything to do with the fact that Uncle Dane is an engineer main. And uh, if you removed random spread from pistols... It would be real easy for a scout to pistol down a sentry from, from just outside of the range of a sentry. It would be super, super easy for them to do that. So maybe that has something to do with why Uncle Dane isn't interested in removing that stuff. Or maybe he just knows that it would it would make the game worse. You wouldn't want SMGs to be crazy accurate from long distances and have snipers just, you know, demolishing people from across the map with a 50 damage body shot followed by... SMG tracking, that would suck, you know, you probably wouldn't want scouts to just be sitting far away destroying buildings instead of 
buildings requiring some sort of team coordination or explosive class like they do, like the game is balanced around, you know, like, yeah, it is bad to, it would be, it would be stupid to remove random spread from, from those things. And in my opinion, the same goes for, um, the shotguns, that the shotguns are, are too accurate on Uncle Topia. They're too overpowered. Like, yeah, they're supposed to be kind of there for reliable damage as a finishing tool or t- to fall back on or whatever. But they're not that, they're not supposed to be that reliable. On every class other than Engineer, not counting the Scattergun, the, the, the shotgun is a secondary weapon. It's supposed to be weak, weaker than your primary at least. And on Scout, you know, Scout, in order to do maximum damage ramp up meat shots, needs to be right in people's faces anyway to the point where uh, random spread wouldn't really matter and he's already you know absurdly powerful does he really need another buff does scout really need a buff i don't think so i think scout needs enough if anything uh if you look at, at the sixes ban list most of the banned weapons are scout weapons scout unlocks because scouts unlocks are, are fucking broken <laughs> and scout is just generally speaking the the secret most out overpowered class in tf2 this is my big take on tf2 is that scout is scout is the the most broken class everyone says it's sniper lots of people get mad about sniper because there's no counterplay it's, it's really scout that that's absurdly powerful anyway i don't know where i was going with this <coughs> damn it's been a while since i recorded one of these it's been a good while since i recorded a segment fuck okay i gotta get some Man, I gotta go fucking do shit. I gotta get my caffeine in my body. I gotta get myself caffeinated because goddamn, I did not sleep enough. Okay, caffeine. Caffeine pill. This will help me to explain Wagwan. Fuck. Okay. Uh. I'm doing this with one hand while holding the laptop in the other. Caffeine pill. Observed. Okay. <sighs> right. So. Valve. I think what's happening right now with the leaks of uh, Deadlock, aka what used to be called Neon Prime, aka what used to used to be called Citadel, is really interesting it's so interesting to me because it's valve right valve has been one of the most beloved games companies for my entire lifetime everyone's always kind of loved valve they've always had been like the weird black sheep of the games industry right they made half-life and portal and tf2 and then they kind of disappeared and then everyone uses Steam all the time. Like, they're weird. They only have, they don't have many employees. They pay ridiculously well. Uh, like, they operate on Valve time. Right? There's a lot of weird shit going on with Valve. But, what, but they've always been kind of like... You know, there was a whole meme about Lord Gaben. Like, praising Gaben as a Jesus-like figure. For a long-ass time, that was a meme back in the day. Right, like everyone fucking loved Valve. Valve had the most goodwill of any game studio, no question about it. And they've had that for a long time because they, generally speaking, don't fuck up. Even in a situation like Artifact, which wasn't very popular, they still don't really fuck up. Right, this uh, Half Life Alex, although it was a VR title, so not many people got to play it, was generally well liked by everyone. Except Donkey, because he, he couldn't figure out the puzzles that you had to use both hands, which is a bit silly. But anyway, uh, their VR hardware has been well received. Steam, you know, I don't know. People still use it. People still think it's the best game games store platform thing. Uh, and then the Steam Deck, which was massively fucking popular. Everyone loves the Steam Deck. Steam Deck's like, like a massive dub for Valve. And so... Valve is releasing a new multiplayer online game. A new third person hero shooter with MOBA elements from Valve. Everyone should be hyped. Everyone should be really excited. You know, 
It's Valve. They only make good things. Everyone knows. Oh, there. Every Valve game has been a hit so far. Every single Valve. Every every Valve game has been great. And if you're really deep in this shit, you know the Valve has been wanting to make a combination of a MOBA and some sort of shooter game for like a decade at this point. So this game's been in development for a long time. And you also know it's been developed by the same guy who made Dota, etc, etc, etc. But with the leaks come out, the leaks come out, and what's the reaction? The reaction is, this looks like slop. And honestly, I agree. It looks like fucking slop. It doesn't it doesn't have the charm of a Valve game. It doesn't have any... It, it feels like every previous Valve game has been unique in some way, right? Maybe, you know, CSGO didn't have a particularly unique visual style at the start of his lifetime. It was kind of... Well, firstly, it wasn't really even developed by Valve for most of the time because it was off, you know, handed off to a third party publisher to make a port of Counter-Strike Source to the Xbox. Um, but it kind of looked like a generic military sh- shooter like, you know, they all did back then. Uh, it developed its own art style over time, but it kind of looked like slop for a while. But it had interesting mechanics, so that's g- kind of what I have to hope for for Citadel or whatever the fuck this game's called. Deadlock. Stupid name for a game, to be honest. Neon Prime, much better name for a game. Deadlock, terrible name. Uh, yeah, no, it looks like slot. It lo- it doesn't have it doesn't have any any of the the Valve charm in the art style, which is like it's really just strange. Because okay, so actually let me talk about let me just say what I wanted to get out. Let me just say what I wanted to get out in this segment first, which is this is this is what's fascinating to me is the Valve. Of any company, every games company in the world, and probably the most goodwill of any of the like major publishers, whatever. <laughs> Valve had so much goodwill, a fan base like no other, you know, a whole ecosystem, and I think the reaction to this proves that Valve's goodwill has run out. It's, it's starting to run out at the very least. <laughs> Because of the shit they're doing. And they're not going to... This is the thing. They're fucking stupid. And they're not going to understand this. The people who work at Valve are so, like, cut off from the rest of, of, of the world. They're so little in their little bubble. They don't really see what's going on outside. Like, they have no fucking idea. So they're just going to... They're just, they're just sitting there panicking right now. Absolutely confused as to why people aren't appreciating the leaks. They they are they are panicked. They're like, why don't people understand? It's gonna be a good game. They don't understand. They're like, it looks so great. The Source Two engine. They don't know. They really don't understand. They're like, you like Valorant? Why don't you like this? They they literally have no idea that it's because you are now known as the company that can't make an anti cheat, <laughs> right? Like the people are saying, okay, so Cow Strike is full of fucking cheaters at high elo. TF Two is unplayably full of bots. You know, every single game you make is just full of cheaters. And now you expect us to play another shooter game from you that looks like slop. It doesn't even have anything, like, to indicate that it was made by, like, experienced developers of Valve. And it's, it's, I don't know, you just, you've lost it. You've lost, you've lost your, uh, your goodwill. Like, you fucked us up by not caring about your old games. You fucked this up. And it's not just Counter-Strike that's full of cheaters, right? It's also worth noting that Counter-Strike launched missing half the content and just they never bothered to put them back in. The launch of Counter-Strike 2 is one of the most abysmal fucking things I've ever seen in the games industry, okay? If you were playing Counter-Strike before, like, they put no effort into it. They just didn't even try. (laughs) It's, like, comically bad. They they stripped out half the fucking game modes from the game. They just launched it with half the game modes missing. It's been like ages now and none of that shit's back in. They removed a bunch of good maps. Like they there's no cash. Cash is like one of the best maps in Counter Strike. They removed cash. And then importantly, right? Like, where's the fucking operation? How could you launch CS2 without an operation? It's insane that they would do this. It's actually mind-bogglingly insane 
that they would launch CS2 without an operation to go with it. Like, w- literally, why? I mean, because they know people are going to play it anyway, I guess. Like, yeah, people are going to play it anyway, but that's not what it's about. It doesn't really matter if people play the game. What matters is if Valve has credence as a company, right? <laughs> like, if you are going to market Counter-Strike as the premier shooter, right? Which is what they do. It's It doesn't hurt. Oh, no bullshit. No heroes. No agents. No laser beams shooting through the walls. No bazookas. You know, it's not Valorant. The premier tactical shooter is an eSport. It's precise, you know? We got fucking grenade lineups. That's a good shit that they added, okay? We got grenade lineup things that come up when you hold down the mouse button. Like, this is the fucking premiere. You'd be doing graphs. You'd be doing linear algebra to throw these fucking smoke grenades, right? This is this is the fucking peak of 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 high level esport first person shooter gaming. Also, it's full of cheaters. Also, it's a front for a casino. And then most most importantly. We're going to launch the game half fucking finished. <laughs> Broken. Feels like shit. The one th- This is such a typical Valve thing to do. The Counter-Strike community wanted 128 tick servers for years and years and years. And wouldn't it have really mattered? No. It probably wouldn't have mattered that much. 128 tick versus 64 tick. 99% of people can't tell the difference. Unless you're a pro player, you probably can't even tell the difference between the two tick rates. Like I, I fully acknowledge this. It's a, it's a stupid thing to ask for. But instead of just doing that, Valve was like, "No, we're gonna solve tick rate. We're gonna make sub tick." This is typical like tech bro bullshit, where they're like, "No, we can't just do the thing that people want. The easy answer. We're gonna go reinvent the wheel for no fucking reason with this sub tick system that doesn't even fucking work. <laughs> it doesn't even do anything." Makes the whole game feel like shit. And then obviously, don't even get me started on Team Fortress 2. There's going to be another save TF2. There's going to be hashtag fix TF2. That's going to come soon. That's not going to achieve anything. You know why? <laughs> All the devs of Valve are busy working on fucking Deadlock. Which, as multiple people have pointed out, should have been in the TF2 universe. Maybe. Maybe it should have been in the TF2 universe. It was originally going to be in the Half-Life universe. That would have been more interesting, in my opinion. I don't know why they didn't do that. This is the reason everyone says it looks like slot, by the way. is because because Valve didn't just set it in the Half-Life universe. If it was set in the Half-Life universe, it would have looked like a Valve game. And everyone would have been like, Pog! Oh, it's Valve! It's the, it's the Gordon Freeman! I like that guy! You know? They would have fucking loved it. Instead... They made it a brand new IP. I have no idea why. They could have set it in the TF2 universe. It would have made sense. It's a hero shooter. It would have sucked, but it would have made some sense, right? But instead, they... I don't know why they fucking did that. Stupid decision from Valve. They don't know what they're doing. They've lost all their goodwill for a reason. Because it's literally... They don't know what they're doing. But, I mean, as other people have pointed out, if they, you know what they should have done? And I know this is this is just me talking because I like TF2, right? But it's not just me talking. I've seen other people who don't even actively play TF2 have this sentiment. Instead of releasing a brand new game, if they just released a remaster of TF2, it would have been the best selling game of all time on Steam. <laughs> you know? Like, a fucking TF2 remaster would outsell... A TF2 remaster and re-release with a content update with weapon balance changes and stuff like that would have outsold Deadlock. I guarantee it. Deadlock's not even out yet. I guarantee a TF2 remaster would have outsold it. But they can't just do that. Because they hate TF2. They actively dislike it. They worked in it for too long. And they don't want to be stuck doing the same thing forever. And so they, they're just trying to put it behind them. And I kind of understand that. Like, I understand that from a human perspective. From a human perspective... It's like, fuck, this game's been out for 17 fucking years. I don't want to keep doing the same shit for 17 years. I get it. Like, no, that's... I can I can understand that. Now, would 99% of developers fucking cream their pants for the opportunity to have a game that is alive for 17 years? Yes. There's no other game like that. There's very, very few, at least. Right? Like, that is, that is a fucking incredibly unique opportunity that Valve has. Right? Like... 99% of that's that's the goal that's the dream is to have a multiplayer game that just doesn't die you know 
but I understand from a human from a human level why why Valve, you know, they're probably fucking sick of 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 looking at TF2 spaghetti code and, and doing that shit. Uh which is strange because you know they, there's a bunch of, there's a whole bunch of people in the TF2 community who are developers who are familiar with TF2's code who Valve could easily hire I don't know if they needed to do stuff like that but that doesn't matter the point being they would probably have I don't know man I don't know why they don't know why remaster TF2 don't make any gameplay changes fuck it you don't need to do that you don't need to make it add any new weapons you don't need to make any gameplay changes there's enough weapons, there's enough maps, there's enough everything. Actually, there's, there's, there's some things that are very stupid, right? Like, there are, there are a few maps. I mean, there are a lot of maps that are in the game that shouldn't be in the game, right? And there are a lot of maps that aren't in the game, classic community maps. Like, Cough Bagel, for example. Which aren't in the game, that should be in the game. Uh, What's another one? I don't remember. There's a few, Slaughter, Cost Slaughter is a pretty good map. I'm surprised that shit isn't in the game. Actually, I don't even like that map that much. <laughs> it's fun to play Sniper on, but yeah. Anyway, I've somehow turned this into talking about TF2. The point being, Valve somehow thought they could like half ass a bunch of game releases and neglect their, their legacy games and like still have goodwill from the community. It's like, no, but brother, brother, you don't get to do that. You don't get to do that. No one, no one is gonna be like, oh well, it's fine that they fucking, you know, ruined the games I like, so that they can <laughs> make this new bullshit that no one fucking wants. Who was asking for this? I've said like, who, who was sitting there like, you know what we need? I love mobas, and I love third person shooters. I don't want this. Is just, isn't this just Smite? Isn't this just Battleborn? Like, why is Valve so obsessed with the idea? This, this the concept that this is a good idea. Like, both of those games fucking failed. I mean, Smite was probably good for some time, but, like, man, I don't fucking know. I don't know what these guys are are doing. They're smoking crack. They've lost all their goodwill because they were too busy smoking crack. That's what really happened. So, yeah. And you know what's one of the weirdest things I've seen from the deadlock leaks? Is, Is there's people who are going around saying, oh, don't judge, this is an early alpha. Motherfucker. Have you ever seen an early alpha build of a game? This is not an early alpha. These leaks are like beta. This is a, it's literally a closed beta. Like, this is not what early alpha builds of games look like. (laughs) If you've ever seen a video game, they don't look like this. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you, man. I would not be playing it. I mean, I might check it out if it's free. Uh... I might check it out, but I highly doubt that it will be doing much for me because the only reason why I play Valve games in the first place as my main games is because of the movement engine, which only really works in first person. And well, this doesn't seem to have the glorious source engine movement that we've all come to love and appreciate and adore. So what the fuck's the point of it existing? I've seen this fucking guy Gabe Follower, this is this Twitter account Gabe Follower, who's kind of like um, Valve News Network. He's he's one of these Valve leaker data miner people, and uh, I'm I've, he's kind of an idiot. I feel like um, he he's he, I made a tweet about it, and I'm just gonna respond to it here. I'm just gonna repost it in in this voice. So Gabe Follower said. So firstly, just for context, Gabe Follower is is one of the many valve data leakers or data miners who who trawls through changes to however the fuck it works i don't know i don't know how the steam back end stuff i don't i don't fucking know how any of that stuff stuff works okay but but for some reason whenever valve updates one game it often includes some data from other games when they make changes to the engine i don't fucking know why as far as i can tell they might do it on purpose even like, it seems like they initially did it on accident, and now they do it on purpose. At least that's what Tyler McVicker says. Who knows, though? He's been wrong about a million things a million times. Oh, I don't fucking know. Gabe Follower is one of these people. It doesn't matter. The point being, everyone who follows any of these pe- Valve leakers, 
data miners, no, has known about Citadel, aka Neon Prime, aka Deadlock, for years at this point. We've all known about it. And this guy, Gabe Follower, is obviously one of the people who was leaking it. Um, he's been leaking for a long time, and then obviously recently there were some more intense leaks, which keep coming out from Deadlock. Maybe the most leaked Valve game ever. You know, we've got fucking frag movies of Deadlock before the game's even been announced. It's kind of insane. We got fully edited frag movies from a game that hasn't even been announced yet. Uh, it's very funny. And it's so funny that Uncle Dane was the initial leaker. It's so funny. It's like impossibly funny. But anyway, Gabe Follower, he tweets out, just before all these leaks, Deadlock devs said they had no plans to stop the test or kick anyone because they want to develop the game together with the community and do everything right. However, Valve community, as usual, chose a different path. Now, this is an insane take, right? The insane It's an insane take because, bro, do you know why Valve, this stuff leaks? Do you know why this stuff leaks? Because Valve famously doesn't use NDAs for playtests. They just, they they are famous for being the company that playtests early and often, right? And they also never get anyone to sign an NDA. So shit just leaks constantly because they just refuse to use NDAs. It's it's pretty, pretty strange. And so, so my response to this, I'll just read out my tweets. This is fucking insane. If Valve used NDAs like every other company who does things like this, they wouldn't have this issue. In not doing that, they were explicitly permissive, and now you're acting like that's the community's fault. Which is true. I agree with myself. Valve are the ones with chronically poor communication skills, leaving their fan base begging for scraps of data mined info. Valve are the ones handing out closed beta access to randos with no NDA. And Valve are the ones leaving their other games to rot, turning those fans cynical. Now, I didn't have enough space in a tweet to expand upon that last point, but... The fact that Valve seemingly, you know, leaves their other games to rot, Counter-Strike and TF2 to be more specific, um, you know, be because of that fact, it turns the players of those games, including myself, cynical against Valve. And so we don't have the goodwill towards Valve to, like, ignore the leaks or, you know, it's, it's a kind of situation where people are gleefully sharing something that they think is their only way to have any power to, to get back at Valve. It's like, haha, the big gaming monopoly, Valve, that doesn't care about us. We've got something on you now, which I think is a big reason why these leaks have been so widely shared. Like, if it was random leaks from a random fucking third-person shooter from any other company, it, this would have been over and no one would have really given a shit. It would have hit some gaming news sites and no one would care like think about it if it was any company other than valve no one would fucking give a shit like it's because valve is is fucked up <laughs> it's because they don't communicate if valve communicated like every other games company they wouldn't have you know what i'm saying like like yeah of course people are gonna fucking latch onto leaks and leak more like there's a there's an there's a motivation for people to leak there's 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 much more riding on valve leaks than leaks from other gaming companies because of the way valve treats their games and the way valve treats their community i.e with radio silence uh you know this is the inevitable endpoint and then finally my my final tweet was quoting gabe followers original post they want to develop the game and with the community my brother they're called playtests. Every game on the planet goes through a closed playtest. I made a fucking game in a week in Godot, and even I did closed playtests. Why make this out to be some unique Valve goodwill? And yes, I agree with this. Of course I do. I said it. But, motherfucker, yeah, they're not doing anything special or uniquely kind by doing playtests for a video game. Every video game has playtests. This will be ancient news by the time you guys hear this. Man, this 12-hour podcast has taken me much longer to make than any other previous 12-hour podcast. I feel like I just have less to say lately. I've also been quite depressed and just not really in the mood to talk. Uh, <clears throat> but that's neither here nor there. What the fuck have I talked about for 
11 hours. I'm going to truncate the silences so it will be shorter than that for you, but... What the, what the fuck have I talked about? I don't even know. Probably Team Fortress 2 at some point. Who knows? Anyway, a- ancient news, but this may remind... So, so there's a guy called Ludwig. You know Ludwig. He's a streamer. He's a YouTuber. I like him. In particular, I like his podcast, The Yard. Um, and he's running a speedrunning event called Fast 50, which is a... He announced it. It's like a 50-hour speedrun marathon. Sounds pretty cool for charity, you know? Sure, whatever. Who gives a shit? That's kind of cool, I guess. I like speedrunning. That sounds neat. Uh, <clears throat> so there I go. So anyway, there's a bunch of drama around it because of bullshit, okay? Don't, I mean, there's a whole bunch of drama surrounding this. There's a whole bunch of drama surrounding the speedrunning event. And to sum it up real quick, these are the sources of drama. Most of this is very bad marketing on Ludwig's part that, for some reason, he just doesn't... I don't know why, but he's sort of acting as if this isn't the fault of his bad marketing. Like, bro, you did bad marketing. Nothing about the event is necessarily bad, but you communicated it poorly. Uh, Not actually poorly, but what happened is you forgot that this is the internet, where any little sliver of thing that people can infer... They're going to take to the maximum and, and act as if you're the devil incarnate. So, like, hey, the, the original roster that Ludwig releases has, has no women on it. And is entirely white dudes, except for one Asian guy. Like, mm, yeah, you know what? You probably should have thought about that, maybe. Like, the speedrunning community, very progressive type of people. You know, like, you could have probably seen that one coming. Uh, I mean, look, I understand it. It's a very progressive group of people who were also mostly white guys. <laughs> but, uh, I don't know. I feel like I would have seen that coming, maybe. Uh, you know, I don't really care. I don't. Think, I think people are probably just pretending to care about that, but whatever. Uh, but then the other, the other thing, the other thing people are getting mad about is... That, like, he, he announced this thing, he put out calls for speedrunners to, like, hear him up for an event, and when he announces the event, the roster that he, he puts up is, like, a bunch of fucking YouTubers, like, who are adjacent to speedrunning. Like, Most Critical is on there, you know? Doug Doug. Like, it's not speedrunner speedrunners, it's YouTubers who make speedrunning content. Uh, sometimes. Like, I mean, Doug Doug doesn't even do that very often. That kind of thing, right? And, see, to me, I can understand why people are mad about that. Is this just because Ludwig did a poor job of communicating? Yes, because his poster is fucking a bunch of YouTubers and then an and more. And it's like, well, don't release the, don't release the lineup if you don't have the lineup. My brother, release the lineup when you've, when you've got confirmed, like, he's trying to play it off without actually saying, well, these are just the ones I've got confirmed right now. I don't know if, if other speedrunners are going to... Ju-. Like, he, he hasn't actually explicitly said that, but it's very clear that that's the case. That, like, these are his YouTuber buddies who I'm sure are easier to work with because they're in the industry, right? If you're a YouTuber streamer guy, you have contacts with the other YouTuber streamer guys. Everyone knows how events work. Everyone, you know, is already going to be streaming. They're going to have a good setup. They don't have to do any preparation, etc. Like, it makes perfect sense why, as Ludwig, your first go-to guys would be the YouTuber streamer guys who are adjacent to speedrunning. And then it also makes sense in Ludwig's mind why, okay, well, if I want to advertise the event, I should put up a poster with all the biggest names in the event. Like, that makes sense in Ludwig's mind. But that is not how speedrunning works. When it comes to speedrunning, people don't re- people generally they follow particular games and they know who's the best in those games, right? Like I follow Mario 64 speedrunning and like I know, you know, Kano, Green Suigi, uh Cheese, uh you know, etc. Kano, his name's Kano, not Kano. I don't know why. Kano is a, a British rapper from like the 2000s. <laughs> Kano is a Japanese Super Mario 64 speedrunner. Two different people. Right, like, I know... I know in the same way that, like, Ludwig is into Smash, and he would know a bunch of people that, like, 
those are the best Smash players. If you're going to do a Smash Invitational, you would invite those guys. You wouldn't, you know, if you were going to make a Smash Invitational, you wouldn't invite Ludwig because, yeah, he's a big YouTuber who's adjacent to the Smash community, but he's not a fucking good Smash player. It's the same thing, right? Like, you, you invite a bunch of YouTubers who are adjacent to the speedrun community is not the same thing as inviting a bunch of good speedrunners. I don't know why this didn't immediately occur to Ludwig, but it I guess it didn't. He thought that the best... But look, that's fine. He just did a poor job of communicating all of this. Like, none of this stuff is actually bad. It's just weird that he made these decisions. But I don't care. Like, I'm saying all of this because I really want to make one particular point. I, there's only one thing I actually care about. And that is, you know who's who's who responded to Ludwig's initial tweet... And, and got hyped up by other people, has a sizable fan base who definitely want him to be included in the goddamn Ludwig speedrunning event. And you know who it is? It's fucking Simple Flips. It's only Simple Flips, one of my favorite YouTubers. And nope, he's nowhere to be found. He's nowhere to be found in any of the goddamn advertising materials. Why not? Why not? Give him, a, give him, his, give him his break, man. Shouts, shouts out to Simple Flips, first of all. Shouts out to Simple Flips. And secondly, where is he? Ludwig. Hey, Ludwig. You used to be bros. You, everyone else has forgotten. No one ever than me remembers this. But back in the day, back in the day, when you were a fucking tiny streamer, Simple Flips played Smash with you a bunch of times. You guys, there's like four videos on YouTube that are Ludwig versus Simple Flips melee matches. You can go look this up, Ludwig Simple Flips Melee. You'll find a whole bunch of videos on both of their channels from ages ago where they played Melee against each other because Simple Flips is a Melee player and he's pretty good at it and he's involved in the community. So it's fucking... If anyone was going to... If you were going to invite anyone to a speedrunning event, Ludwig, I was sure it would be the speedrunner who's very famous in the speedrunning scene and also very technically good at speedrunning and a god gamer in general who you've also interacted with and played Mario with, uh, sorry, and played uh, Melee with before, like, who's got a bunch of people vote, shouting him out, in the, who, was, who wants to be invited, where's the fucking simple flips, man? I'm just, I'm, look, and I'm sure that this is exactly the experience that everyone else is having. That's my guy, that's my streamer, I want, I want him to be on the big stage. I want him to be on the big stage. I feel like Ludwig just abandoned him. I've, I've often felt this way. That, that Simple Flips and Ludwig had a relationship going where they streamed Melee together on multiple occasions. They had a thing. And then Ludwig blew up and he forgot about his day ones, man. He forgot about his day ones. He put Simple Flips in the fucking dirt. Now, maybe there's some controversy behind the scenes why Ludwig doesn't want to put Simple Flips in the event. Maybe he doesn't think Simple Flips has a good enough... Uh, uh, audience to be front and center on a poster perhaps 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 he thinks that simple flips is too small to draw a crowd to to a uh, an event i doubt that i mean it's possible it's very possible but i don't think as in hold on what i mean is i think it's possible that ludwig thinks that but i don't think it's actually true like even though there's a lot of people who might not watch every simple flips video like i do He's a very, very well-known meme in the speedrunning community. Everyone, I feel like everyone knows Simple Flips, even if they don't watch him. Um, so that's the first thing. Secondly, uh, Simple Flips was in some cancelable hot water like two years ago, or, or it might have been longer than that, I don't even remember, uh, for like cheating on his girlfriend, which was fucking cringe that he did that and he shouldn't have done that. And I feel like he's been widely forgiven from from the I mean he took a bunch of time off off I don't know cheating on your girlfriend is not a good thing to do it's not chill but it's not necessarily a, a cancelable offense that would prevent you from being involved in events right I don't know but then there's a final thing which is that Simple Flips recently came out in support of a guy called Hacks and if you don't know this is a melee player um. And what happened was, there's a guy, there's a melee player who's really good called Leffen, who everyone fucking hates. Everyone hates Leffen, uh, like, as in his personality. Everyone thinks Leffen is a whiny bitch, but he's also really good at the game. But he's constantly whining and bringing other people down, he has a huge ego. Kind of everyone hates Leffen. And Leffen and Hacks got in a massive fight and argument, I don't even remember the origin of this, 
but it resulted in hacks just just spurging out and making like a three hour long call out video on Leffen where he like compares him to Adolf Hitler and stuff. It's fucking badger insane. It's also very clear that this is not being made by someone who's in like a good mental state, you know? Like it's nuts. To do something like that is pretty insane, right? Uh and then what happened was Pax got fucking perma banned from all melee co- all melee events ever. He's perma he's permed from everything forever, which is insane. Like he got in a fucking argument with someone and made a YouTube video, and ever since then he's been desperately trying to apologize. He's been you know he's still a good player. He plays on Slippy. He 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 plays you know whenever he can, and he still has a lot of respect as a player. But I don't know. I'm definitely on Hax's side here. Should he have caught a ban for some crazy behavior? Perhaps, but a temporary ban, ban for life. That's fucking insane. It's absolutely insane. Uh, especially when Leffen has done a bunch of fucking degenerate shit too, which I'm not going to get into, but he's done a bunch of degenerate shit too, and he's, I don't know, man, he pissed me off. Uh, so Simple has recently came out in support of Hacks. Maybe Ludwig doesn't like Hacks, and this is my theory, right? Maybe there's some, some shit where Ludwig is a big Leffen fan or something, or Ludwig has, has, believes that, that, that Hacks should remain permabanned, or doesn't want to support. Maybe, maybe it's a controversial thing in the Melee community to speak out on it. And so Ludwig thinks if I invite this guy to my event, that's kind of like saying that I'm speaking out in the, I'm, I'm endorsing his, like, I don't know. I'm schizoposting, okay? <laughs> I'm schizoposting at this point because I am, this is, and I'm sure this is what other people are mad at Ludwig for as well. It's just that there's one guy who I really like and he's not in the event or he hasn't been announced to the event and I'm mad. I'm like, come on. I know. It also makes me think, like, did you not see this coming, Ludwig? You know? Like, speedrunning, there's a million billion speedrunners. And they're all good at the game. That's what's fucked up. Like, they're, whatever game, like, I fucking, I was, like, watching GDQ one year. And I saw people speedrunning a bug's life for the PS2? PS, PS2. I saw someone speedrunning a bug's life. The, the, the game adaptation, the shitty movie tie-in game for a bug's life i saw them speed running it and um so so i have an in joke with with my irl friend i have an in joke with my irl friend where you you know that phrase is a is a dog eat dog world you know you know it's a dog eat dog world right people say like it's a dog eat dog world right we have a little twist on that when we say, well, it's a bug's life. It doesn't make sense. It's just an in- it's a stupid in-joke I have with my friend. So when I saw that this game had, like, speedrunners, I was like, that's funny as fuck. That's, like, that little dumb in-joke I have with my friend. It's a, it's a bug's life. Uh, you know. Uh, that's, that's funny to me, okay? <laughs> uh, so I was like, fuck it, I'm gonna pick this game up. Uh, just for, for shits and giggles. So I started playing it. And I quickly realized that, like... This game is actually optimized as fuck. <laughs> like, this game has, like, ten runs. And the top runners are, like, kind of insane. Like, they're kind of really fucking good at a bug's life. This is the... Like, every speed game is like this. Like, you'll find some niche fucking thing. Like, I mean, I've done this with a bunch of games. I speed ran, uh, you know, Counter-Strike Condition Zero deleted scenes. And that game... Also insanely optimized at the top level. Like, in- insanely optimized. And it's like these people, this guy, the, 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 the best Counter-Strike Condition Zero deleted scenes player when I was playing, I don't know, I haven't kept up with it, uh, was a guy called Fruit. And, uh, like, that guy was top of every leaderboard. He had no competition, and he was still lowering his times. Just He was just grinding for, for himself. Like, it was insane. He had no pressure to lower his times. He wasn't discover. Pardon me. He wasn't discovering like new tricks or anything. He was just optimizing his movement and shit, just because. And he was fucking crazy. Like I was minutes away from his times. It was insane. And I put like a reasonable amount of time into that game. You know, not hundreds of hours, but tens of hours for sure. And I wasn't even close to any of his records. Uh, and you know, I'm very familiar with Source Engine movement and stuff. Whatever. The point being, like. Every speedrunning community is like this, where there's, like, top runners who are incredibly dedicated to their game, and they have, like, some sort of tight-knit community around them, 
and they put in a lot of work. And so when you see a new speedrunning event, when you see something GDQ, it's like an example of you suddenly are immersed in some game you've never fucking heard of, and it's sick. Like, A Bug's Life actually has a really cool speedrun with some really interesting tech and tricks in it. Like, some really tight, frame-perfect inputs and interesting movement stuff and interesting glitches. You know, like, that's... that's I didn't just pick it up because it was a... Well, I, I may have just picked it up because it was an in-joke, but once I actually started playing it, I was kept playing because of the interesting stuff to the run. And every game is like this. Every speed game is like this. And every GDQ is like this, where you find some game or community that you didn't know existed, and suddenly you're seeing crazy shit. And, and you know, you're learning about people that you may not have ever known existed before, and they have a whole tight-knit community around them. So it's like, it kind of feels like, you know, it was inevitable that these communities would feel kind of scammed if Ludwig advertises an opportunity for their guy to, to be on a big stage and then just doesn't follow through. Or at the very least is like, I'm not going to advertise that, even if I'm doing it like, oh, I don't have faith that these guys will bring in the crowd. So here's my YouTuber buddies. It's like, oh, okay. It's way less interesting for me to see a, a speedrunning competition with a bunch of fucking YouTubers than it would be to see a speedrunning community with a bunch of speedrunners, <laughs> you know? And it's not, this is not like a cancelable offence. This is not some moral failing on Ludwig's part because I also don't really care that much. I, I probably wasn't going to care that much either way. I don't really watch GDQ anymore. I just like you know, watch fucking Summoning Assault and, and like the 10 million other Summoning Assault channels that make the same video as he does. And that's how I find interesting speed games. And then I, if I find a runner interesting enough, I just follow them. But I don't know. The point being, I'm upset because Simple Flips hasn't been featured in this, okay? And I have, I have a big personal connection with Simple Flips. I really like his videos. I've been watching them for a long time, uh, I, you know etc. And, you know, in that situation, what I'm imagining is there's a whole bunch of other people who feel the same way about their niche speedrunning creator. And, you know, Simple Flips is relatively not niche. He's relatively popular compared to a lot of these people, which is even more shocking, again, given the fact that he's literally been playing Melee with Ludwig for, like, multiple times. They know each other. And Simple Flips, look, I gotta root for him. I gotta fucking root for Simple, I gotta root for my guy. I know it's parasocial, it's definitely very parasocial. That's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but, you know, I feel it's like a sports team. Like, I feel, I, I want Simple Flips to do numbers. I want him to be able to get lots of views so that he can make more money, so that he can make better videos. It's, it's you know, that benefits me. I get to see better videos, I like that. I, I, want, I want to see him succeed. Because I like him as a person. I, you know, he makes stuff that I like watching. And if he, and you know, his channel has been a little bit simple flips. Like, <clears throat> some of his more recent stuff hasn't been necessarily doing that well. I mean, it's not like it's, it's, it's massively dropped off or anything. But, you know, he doesn't, he's not the type of YouTuber that gets a million views per video. He never has been. He's you know, used to hover around 100k per video, uh, and now he's hovering around, like, 70k per video, uh, which, you know, is, doesn't make me feel good, it doesn't make me feel good, uh, because I like this guy, and I like these videos, so, you know, when I see that pirate software blows up randomly off of fucking YouTube shorts of all things, and, Pirate Software is friends with Simple Flips and is shouting out Simple Flips and giving him, you know, a little bit of, of his clout, letting him suckle off the teat of, of his new, newly found clout. clout. God damn. I'm like, fuck yeah. Brother, spread the wealth. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So when I see Ludwig, who's got this clout <clears throat> and likes the Smash community, um, I don't know, man. Because when these streamers find someone they like, They'll fucking show him. Case in point, Squeaks. Okay? No one gave a shit about Squeaks. There's this guy called Squeaks. No one fucking cared about Squeaks for years. 
For like a decade, this guy streamed CSGO to no viewers. Then this guy streamed Mario 64 for no viewers. And then one day, some of his clips end up on LSF. And I guess some streamers react to those clips and like him. Next thing you know, this guy, who at the time, like, I've, I've, I knew Squeaks before because I'm, you know, I, I watched some Mario 64 uh, streams. So I've seen his, his stream before. Um, you know, fucking this guy is randomly invited to a whole bunch of events with Ludwig. You know, he's suddenly best friends with, I don't know, man. It's like Ludwig suddenly picked him up and is like, you're my boy now. You're my boy. I'm going a, I'm to a big you up. I'm going to fucking put you on, you know. He could decide to do that to anyone. He has that power. He picks this, and I like Squeaks. Listen, I think Squeaks. He has he has some good gimmicks. He has some strong gimmicks, and he's a funny guy. I I like him. But you know, it's just pointing. It's just to point out that, like, I don't know what I'm pointing out. <laughs> he can he can raise people up. He can raise people up. If he decide if. If one of these big streamers decides they like you, if a big streamer decides they like you and they have a strong community, they could basically pick any rando. As long as that rando is entertaining, which Squeaks is, then, you know, they're going to give you a, a career and make you rich, basically. And look, I like Squeaks, but Squeaks is primarily a live streamer. His YouTube content isn't as good, in my opinion. It's not, it's, it's not terrible, but... It's often not amazing, in my in my opinion. In my opinion, I know. I'm not the, I, I actually ended up unsubscribing because they just didn't feel like they, they, they weren't that good. Uh, but Simple Flips makes great YouTube videos. Where's his motherfucking clout, man? Someone needs to put him on. Someone needs to... This guy, I, whole time I've been watching him, he's been stuck at 280k subs on YouTube. It makes me mad. Motherfucker, he should be on a million. He should have a million subs by now. He's just perma stuck in like YouTube not suggesting his channel to new people. He's not getting, you know, any sort of outside clout. I, I don't know, man. He, this guy's given up. He's, he's like, fuck it, I'm going to go become a lawyer now. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> I'm going to go to university and study psychology and law. Like, what the hell? You shouldn't be doing that. You should be playing Mario 64, man. <laughs> that's, what, that's what you're here for. I don't know. That's a joke. I'm glad that Civil Flips is doing that, but... Uh, it seems like he's just actually interested in the subjects. I don't know, man. I just, I want someone to pick him up and put him on the big stage. I wanted to pick him, pick up my boy Simple Flips and put him on the big stage because he's my boy. And I'm just mad that Ludwig didn't do that. And that's basically the premise. It's just that I don't have any legitimate reason to dislike Ludwig. I don't think anyone does for this competition thing, right? Like... It seems like a bunch of people are just recently desperate to throw Ludwig under the bus for something. Like, it seems like he's had it too good for too long and the community has just turned against him because he just generally stays out of controversy and stuff. As like, first he had some stupid fucking drama with Destiny, which was just completely forced. And now there's another drama that is just completely forced. And I like Ludwig, he's pretty funny. It, it just seems like people are, are just like, oh, he's had it too good for too long. We ought to bring him down somehow. <laughs> We all do something to him. Uh, and I think it's combined with the fact that Twitter has, like, in the past year or so, it was already bad, but it's gone, like, significantly worse. Like, tw Twitter is now, like, I'm considering delaying my account just because it's so fucking unbearably bad now. I don't know if they changed the algorithm or it's just the culture or Tumblr refugees or, I don't know, blue check, something. It, it, for a time, you know, after Musk bought it, you, there's this there's this browser add-on called Block the Blue, or Blue Blocker. <clears throat> it automatically blocks any blue checks, and for a while that was enough to make the site actually pretty good again. But uh, yeah, I don't know, man. It that something about that site has just gone, it's gone ten million times worse recently. So I think that is part of why people are suddenly I don't know, man. It's fucked. It seems like the like over the past like. I think it, it might it might have something to do with AI, you know, it might have something to do with, with, with chat GPT, made up AI content, I don't know. But this all, it all kind of leads into something else, which me and Dots might have been talking about lately, which is the like, it's almost getting to the point where being a hiki is kind of unsustainable just because the internet sucks. Like, if you're a hiki, 
you want to be a hiki because the internet is better than real life. And it's getting to the point where there's no way you can go. Even on the niche places that, like I've always said, oh, the internet isn't bad, it's just the surface net that's bad. If you know all of these niche little text boards and, you know, Gemini and Gopher and stuff, it's, it's, and yeah, a lot of that stuff still exists, but it's getting to the point where, no, the internet is actually just kind of bad now. Like, it's actually becoming a problem <laughs> for me. Like, I spend all day on the internet and it sucks. It's like video games, kind of bad now. Everyone's just turned into, I don't know what it is. It's, it seems like everyone's changed. Everyone's switched up. I can't really explain it. The vibes, there's been a, there's been a, a, a vibe switch in the last, like, year. And I think it's partly to do with, like, the AI garbage. I, I don't know. It also seems like it's a lot of, like, culture war nonsense stuff. I can't really pick out one thing. But it just feels like the quality of, of, of posts everywhere has just massively declined. I think it's... There's no one factor. I think it's a number of things that have just reached, like, a peak of intensity. I think it's all of the initiatification processes, you know, all of the ways in which every platform is trying to milk as much money out of their users as possible. I think it's, you know, the culture war reaching a, a, a new crescendo for whatever reason. Uh, oh, well, probably because of Israel-Palestine. Um, <clears throat> I think... I, I don't know, I think it's, uh, to give a very, very controversial take, actually that's maybe too controversial to say in public, so I'm going to keep that to myself, uh, yep, that one's staying inside my brain, uh, I don't know, I think it's a lot of things, I think it's a lot of things coming together, some of you probably already know what I was going to say, but I think it's a lot of things coming together to make the internet worse, and, uh, I'm not a fan of it, and it makes being a hiki pretty fucked up it makes it pretty pretty unpleasant there's a lot of stuff where it's just like okay there's just nowhere left to run there's just nowhere left to go but it's not that bad i still have my niche little spaces that are still fine but even those it's like the people are getting older they got jobs now there's they're, they're slowing down the posts are slowing down you know there's a, there's a website i've been going on this community i've been in for a decade at this point you know like a long ass fucking time and, uh, yeah, it's just slower and slower every day, less and less posts, more and more dead time, people leaving, smaller and smaller communities. It's just sad to watch it slowly decline. And I don't even know how to help it, right? It's like Demper Chan. Like, I knew that Demper Chan would end up being about as fast as it is. Like, that was the goal. I didn't expect the posting speed to be as fast as it was in the beginning. I kind of thought it would be slow in general forever. Um, but... No, it was very fast, and it slowed down to what I consider to be a nice, comfy speed, and it's consistent. That's what I'm glad about, that it still, it gets a consistent level of slow posts, and I like that. I like that shit. Um, the, Denver Chan has turned out okay. People, oh, I'm going to address something, actually, speaking of Denver Chan. Now that we're here, now that we're having a conversation about no longer stupid... Ludwig drama that I just made up in my head. This Ludwig simple flips drama that doesn't exist outside of my own mind. I'm purely schizo posting. I'm purely parasocially schizo posting about that. But uh, okay, there's a there's a thread on on Denpachan which says new thank you is cringe. I haven't been keeping up with no thank you's vlog videos, but I regret that I did. Motherfucker's making normal fag videos. I don't approve of it. I feel like TF2 is really affecting him, and he needs serious help before he becomes my old friends from middle school. Now, I'm 90% sure this person is trolling, but uh, <clears throat> I think it, I, it's a good... I'm going to... Hold on. There's a couple new posts, which I should agree. Uh, da, da, da. No should work on his fish game. I have zero interest in working on my fish game anymore. That was a, a, a week of manic activity. There's hell. Game development as a solo dev is fucking hellish. It is... It is just perma torture. It sucks. It is inc and level design and it's so it's so tedious. It's so much work. Like making a video game is just so much fucking work. It's insane. I don't want to do that anymore, man. <laughs> like free fish game ain't that good. Uh, uh, yeah, bro. One time made eight hours of virtually nothing. Pretty sure he made a sandwich in between and filmed literally darkness. Doesn't even matter what he puts out. At this point, did it ever matter? People watch no because he talks funny, that's it. I'm glad that that's how you feel because that's how I feel as well. Um, so, I did make a series of TF2 videos. 
and I will address that here. I made a series of TF2 videos in very quick, rapid succession. I had an idea that I was going to make daily TF2 videos, and that would be fun and funny. That would be a funny thing to do. Um, that's the first thing. I thought it would be, I, I like TF2. If the idea that this is some deviation from my old stuff is insane. Like, what is more, like, hiki neat pilled than putting in thousands of hours into a random dead and dying video game from 2007? I think it's highly hiki neat pilled. I think the idea that it isn't is kind of insane. No one complains when I make anime videos. Why do you complain when I make... No one watches the anime videos, but people don't complain when I make anime videos. Why is it different when it's TF2 videos? I don't understand. Um, but, you know, those TF2 videos might have been targeted a little more of a wide audience than some of my other videos. They might have been. Particularly one of them. The, like, top, top 10 Dust Bowl tips and tricks. And that one, I mean, I just wanted to... I'm going to be honest with you. I'm just kind of autistic. And I spent an entire... Like, in the video, I say in the intro, like, I spent a whole day wandering around Dust Bowl. When I say that in the intro... I'm not exaggerating. I sat down on my computer and I spent literally 10 hours straight in a private server, in a like a local server, just wandering around that map, finding stuff. I didn't, at no point did I like look stuff up on the internet. Like I'm sure I'm not the first person to find any of those spots. I'm sure that people have found that stuff before. But I literally just spent an entire day alone just doing nothing but that all day with no break. I mean, I, I stopped to have food at one point. That was it. Uh, I just got gripped by the autism, and I was like, I want to know every weird little spot on this map that you can go to. So I, that's all I did all day. Like, and then when I, and I, that was a lot of time and effort to put into something. And so I was like, I want to make this a relatively polished video, right? I want to make this, I want to make this relatively polished because I put a lot of work into this, and I'd like to share it with people. I'd like people to see it. Is that a fucking crime? It got a thousand views. I'm not turned into Mr. Beast. So that was one of the TF2 videos I made. Another TF2 video I made was the, the how to push last on X. I made a couple of how to push last on X map, right? And this how to push bombless last, I was literally fucking mad. I was playing Uncle Topia. And I fucking was at bombless and I was like, we could have won. Like, there's no reason why my team couldn't push this fucking point. Other than, like, it wasn't a, a skill issue. It wasn't a matter of, like, my team couldn't aim. It wasn't really a team comp issue. It was literally just because people don't know that you're supposed to push from locker room. That was it. All of our Ubers were being ineffective because our medic didn't know that locker room is where you Uber out of, not the main chuck, right? And it's like, I'm so fucking mad that people haven't figured out this basic fact. <laughs> like, do they not pay attention to the game? Like, when I'm playing the game, I'm looking around and I'm saying, okay, we won that round. Why? Because this tactic was effective. I don't even have to, like, consciously think. That's just how I am whenever I'm playing a game. I'm analyzing and shit. The fact that people don't realize basic shit like that about how maps work is insane to me. And I was so mad that we lost that I was like, fuck it. I'm going to go record a video and I'm going to make sure that people have no excuse not to know. I'm going to put this video out just because I'm mad. Someone needs to know how to push this map other than me. And so I made that video. And then it got a bunch of views, which was, you know, good and nice. And I'm glad it got a bunch of views. Mainly because it means that maybe more people will know how to push. And I won't fucking be mad all the time. Same thing with Upward. Uh, part of it was because the previous video had done well. And there were multiple people in the comments on that Bomb Blitz video saying, you should do a whole series of these. And I was like, that would be fun. That's all there was to it. I literally saw those comments and I thought to myself, I love this game. I could talk about it endlessly. Hell yeah, I'll make a whole series of these. Actually, you know, there's a lot of TF2 YouTubers. There's a lot of them. And most of them, this is all of their content is either weapon reviews, uh, challenge videos, or like some sort of meta talking about the state of the game. That's all there is on TF2 YouTube. There's no one talking about, or, or there was like some niche where people talk about like how to play competitive. Like that's part of the inspiration is because I've been watching this guy on YouTube called Wild Wampus 
who makes kind of rambly videos about competitive TF2 and certain parts of strategy and weapon metas and, and so on. And I don't even play sixes, but I find those videos really interesting and relaxing and comforting to listen to. And I was like, there's no reason why someone couldn't talk about strategy and casual as well. Though I would watch this. I'll make it. That's all my videos have ever been. I would watch it, so I'll make it. Then, so that's why. There were people asking for it, and I was like, well, if I can make someone happy by making something that I would also be interested in seeing, I'm quite happy to do that. And it might even make my games better because people know how to, strat how to do a strategy on this map. Okay, then I made a video with Do Less called We Ranked Every TF2 Map by Temperature. Now, this is an idea that I've had in my head for like a year at this point, which I just think is funny. Like, I just think that the concept of that video existing is really funny. And at that point, I had made three TF2 videos con on consecutive days. And I was like, I guess I'm doing daily TF2 videos. What's the next one I can make? Oh yeah, I have had this idea in my head for a funny video. Like, the premise of the video is funny because it's such a stupid thing for a video to be about. It is so pointless that it is, it is funny to me. Making a tier list of all the TF2 maps by temperature is such a stupid video idea that that is comedic to me. Uh, as people pointed out in the comments, like if you look in the comments of that video, you see this is the type of content that happens when a game is 17 years old and doesn't receive any more updates. That is the exact vibe I wanted, right? I wanted to make a video that would capture that vibe. Like this is the sort of dumb shit that we're doing now because there's nothing else. We've talked about everything in this game. Like that was the joke, that was the joke. So I made that video and as you can see, if you watch the video, it's not very good. It's just me and do less, it's unedited. You know, it's, it's whatever. It's just kind of a meme video. And then the next day, it wasn't even the next day, I, I stopped because I ran out of ideas. And then I was doing more autism where I was like playing uh, Bad Water and I was like, fuck man, we can't destroy these sentries. I, I've heard people say that there were sticky lineups to destroy the sentries, but I've never been able to, I've looked, I've looked all over YouTube, I've never found anyone who's who's made a tutorial on how to do them so i'm gonna just load up the map by myself and fuck around until i figure them out because i've played a lot of counter-strike and i've pl i've done this before i've figured out my own smoke grenade lineups and flashbangs in counter-strike like oh you i will apply these skills to a game i'm playing now and then when i found them i was like well I was annoyed from not being able to find out this information in the past. So I should publish this information so other people don't have to do the whole effort of, you know, having autism and, go, you know, spending fucking three hours shooting stickies into the air until they find a lineup that works because most people aren't going to want to do that. Right? I'm the only one that wants to do that because I'm just retarded like that. Uh, so I was like, fuck it. I'll make a quick video about that. And that video didn't get any views because no one fucking cares, right? And that's it. That's the end. That's it. Like, what else is there to it? There's nothing else to it. Th th there's, this isn't some crazy shit. And then I didn't make any more. I didn't make any more. So what are you getting mad for? What are you getting mad for? And when I saw that those videos, those first few videos, got a few thousand views. Yeah, I'm not immune to propaganda. I saw the big number. And I was like, that's nice. I like big number. I'll keep doing what works, you know? Like, that's, that's not, I'm not, you know, I'm not immune to propaganda. I like that. But I'm not going to keep doing it if it stops being fun. Hence why I haven't made a video about TF2 since that last one. Because I was like, I don't, I don't want to keep doing this. It's kind of boring now. I just made a bunch, you know, that's fine. I don't want to fuck around making a, a, a thumbnail and whatever. Like, you know, whatever. Uh, also, like... Hey, Barn Blitz, there's an obvious strategy that other people aren't using that I know and other people don't know. Upward, there's an obvious strategy that other people aren't using that I know and other people don't know. When it comes to other maps, like, I don't have tricks like that. You know, I don't have, I don't have shit like that. I don't have obvious things to say. So I'm just not doing it, right? It's, it's very simple. There's nothing, to, there's nothing crazy. And then you add on top of that. Just on top of all of that. That's the primary stuff. Then you add on top of that that I got hit really hard by taxes and bills last month. Uh, actually, not taxes, ins insurance payment and, and bills last month. And so I am like, last month I spent more money than I made by a, a, a decent amount. 
And so any extra money that I can make from AdSense right now is extremely helpful. Like I actually kind of need the money. And I was like, well, these videos are doing slightly better than my normal videos. That means I get slightly more AdSense. That's gonna, you know, like I, at the end of the day, I need to chase the bag a little bit, just a tiny bit, because I got hit hard. This is not a typical thing. I had abnormal payments that I don't normally have to pay that I hadn't prepared for because I'm an idiot. I don't have a big spreadsheet with all my finances on it like I should. Um, and don't worry, I'm not in any financial trouble. It's just, hey, like, I got hit a little harder last month than I thought I would, so any extra income I can make to make up for that would be really helpful right now. That's all it is. Like, hey, I had to dip into my savings a tiny bit last month just to cover some stuff. Be nice if I could make some of that money back. That's all it was. Like, I mentioned that in Denpachan, people going crazy. <sighs> Look, I don't know. Is that, is that such an insane thing? Is that such an insane thing, I ask you? Well, whatever. Just to be real with you, just to be completely honest with you, speaking of this channel, as time goes on and I get older and I get further away from... Shut the fuck up, notifications. Holy fuck. As I get further away from the time period where my inspirations for this channel existed and my own tastes change. Like, would I have started watching videos like the video I watched? What the fuck? I just had a stroke. Would I have started watching myself right now? If I found myself on YouTube, would I watch my... You know what I'm saying? And it's like, honestly... For a lot of the Denver vlogs, I'm not sure I would. I might. I still think there's some good shit in them. I think that sometimes I do them well. But also I think that sometimes the whole project seems contrived. Does this make sense? The whole project seems like I'm just doing the same shit over and over again. And sometimes that's fine. Sometimes it's okay, and in fact I've talked explicitly in many situations about how I like people who do stuff like that, you know. But there's also the counter drive to keep innovating, whatever, okay. Irrelevant. Irrelevant. Cut it. The important point is, I'm not... How do I put this? It seems like as time goes on, the less I feel like people should care what I think in, the, in this kind of sense, right? Like I watch back some of my older videos where I'm sort of rambling philosophically about stuff. And I'm just like, this, this guy has no idea what he's talking about. No one should listen to this. This is stupid. Or when I'm having like super strong opinions about things, and I'm just thinking to myself, like, the internet has enough guys with super strong opinions about things. You know what I mean? There's enough stupid rant content on the internet. In fact, in some sense, drivel like this is kind of what I hate. But it's also kind of I like some of it. There's a, there's a sweet spot. I don't know. It seems almost... There's some, sometimes when I, if I'm recording a vlog, it seems sometimes like I am egotistically presuming, it seems presumptuous to assume that what I say is worth listening to. Like, I used to believe strongly that I had had all the answers, but these days I believe that less strongly. I believe less strongly that I have all the answers. In fact, I, I really don't think I have many answers at all. Um, you know, I, I used to be much more... Hmm, how do I put it? Fervent in my opinions. I used to be... I used to be think, think of myself as much more important than I think of myself as now. I used to think that, like, Den Denpa is some sort of movement 
and blah 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 i don't i don't really think about that i don't really think like that anymore i i i feel like i'm a lot more cynical but but directed inwards i'm a lot more cynical about my own projects i spend a lot of time trying to figure being a hikini into some sort of try to give it a sense of importance that it doesn't really have you know uh i used to put a lot more on the idea of being deep internet which kind of that whole concept is a little strange to me now and yeah most importantly like i don't really feel like you know honestly i regret showing my face ever on this channel as a first thing <clears throat> and secondly you know i i don't know i just i often feel like who needs more who needs more of this you know but then at the same time i kind of like having more of this like i know i'm pretty sure i would listen to these podcasts and i'd know that because i have actually listened back to these podcasts and they're 12 hours long so that's no small feat just because i like really long in-depth slightly rambly stuff i have i'm a fan of that kind of stuff and there's not enough of it there's like it, that kind of thing has been taken over by the scripted written media focused video essay and it's like me maybe those are that's fine but like I like it a little more off the cuff. I like it a little more um uh rambly, a little more autobiographical, perhaps even a little gonzo, one might say. You know, I like I like that kind of thing. I like that kind of thing. I like those super long like when I see something like that video like like uh the the casualty of 212 hour long video. It's like, "Oh fuck yeah. A 12 hour long video." it almost is like a challenge to me and i like that i would so you know what i'm saying but the point being when it came to the denpa phenomenon there was kind of two angles to it and i i think i mentioned this i might have even mentioned this earlier in this podcast i don't know but there's like the angle that osaka went down which you know we were all coming from the the after dark channel there's the angle that osaka went down which is to make specified shorter vlogs which was the majority of the after dark channel and then there was the angle that i went down which was to make insomnia analysis rip offs but to continue it make it more skits or more heady more like a movie more aesthetically strange more avant garde more person etc and it's like actually in the long run <laughs> osaka i think took the right opinion or the sorry the right direction because if you look at like popular channels like uh what's that one guy moist critical and there's there's the guy what's his name I, I, the, the some ordinary gamers like they're basically doing the same kind of improvised off the cuff rant type content C- calling anything content just makes me i don't know man I'm a bit brain warmed but who is in these days you know what i'm saying here like that kind of thing has an audience and seeing someone actually interesting like osaka do that instead of someone who's incredibly boring and un- unentertaining like critical you know that's good i like that osaka has going to have more interesting topics to talk about etc after a while of doing autobiographical stuff you just run out of stories especially when you are a neat in his room all day you don't really gain any new ones right like i don't want to go out there on an adventure and take some crazy risk with, with myself like i did when i was younger you know i did all that shit when i was a teenager and it doesn't really have much appeal to me anymore like i don't want to go get on a train halfway across the country and take acid with some friends you know like I could I have that opportunity right now but why would I do that like I don't really want to do that that just seems that just seems like way too much effort 
and it seems like it's something that could go very badly. You know what I'm saying? Like there would be there was a time in my life where I would have I would have immediately leapt at that opportunity. But now I'm like I don't I don't really want I don't know about that, you know? Uh and I talk about TF2 so much in these videos because 90% of what I do with my life is just fucking play Team Fortress 2. Because I just don't have a very interesting life, you know? Like, and, and plus, there's less novelty to it now. I feel like what used to be a very niche thing of being like a hiki on the internet, deep internet hiki, has sort of been recuperated, particularly by, did you know there's like TikTok hikis who are like lying about it? Like there's TikTok hikis who go outside all the time. There's people on TikTok who call themselves meets, who like go to school and have a job. There's YouTube ones as well. There's a YouTube neat. I don't remember her name, but there's this YouTube neat, but she has a job. <laughs> she calls herself a neat, but she literally is self-employed. She's just self-employed. That's not the same thing as being a neat. Uh, which is which is very strange to me. Uh, but 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 uh, but I digress. I don't know. I've just become a lot more skeptical about this whole this whole setup. You know, there's a Deleuze quote. There's actually a Deleuze quote. I'm gonna spit a Deleuze quote at you, if I can fucking find the screenshot somewhere on my computer. Uh, Give me a minute to dig through some images. Du, du, du. It's going to be somewhere in this folder. Here it is. Repressive forces don't stop people expressing themselves, but rather force them to express themselves. What a relief to have nothing to say. The right to say nothing. Because only then is there a chance of framing the rare, and even rarer, thing that might be worth saying. What we're plagued by these days isn't any blocking of communication, but pointless statements. And I think anyone who's been on the internet for more than five minutes can see that Deleuze was being pretty fucking uh, prescient when he said that back in 1995, you know. It seems like that is all we, we have nothing but pointless statements and arguments and yet nothing real is ever being said. And I don't really like the fact that I feel like I'm kind of contrib contributing to that. Um, it's kind of embarrassing, to be honest. <laughs> like, it's, it's kind of... Like, when you see my place in these videos, when you see my house, and you see how much of a fucking mess it is. Like, that's why I like doing these podcasts. You don't have to look at me, you don't have to look at my house. Well, and you see that shit in these videos, like, it, and, and you see how much of a fucking mess my place is. Like, it's embarrassing. I don't want to show people that. I don't, I'm, you know, it ain't a joke. I'm mentally fucked, <laughs> right? Like, I, I got, I got mental problems. <laughs> like, I got, I live like a fucking crazy person. Because I kind of am that, you know? Like, you don't really see it so much in the videos, because a lot of the time I'm just, like, depressed. You know, I'm I'm bipolar. I fucking go in, like, recently, I've just been deeply fucking depressed. Like, I'm sorry. I don't really have anything interesting to say. I've just been, like, playing Team Fortress 2 and, like, fucking crying myself to sleep. <laughs> like, what you, you know, like, I just, there's no interesting, there's no interesting spin on that. It's just boring. It just kind of sucks. Uh, so, you know, that's in the sense why I'm not against making these podcasts. I, I will probably continue season two. I like it. I like getting my thoughts out there. As much as I'm also kind of embarrassed about the fact that I like being heard, I also do. I have a a need to be to be understood a need to, the human need to be understood and listened to like you know who's based is there's this person called horror love and horror love makes 
interesting vlogs and and shit like that but doesn't ever post them publicly like she just d she'll make them and she'll just dm the file to like people who she's friends with and that's it now that's fucking based like i kind of wish i was that based but i am uh unfortunately not immune to propaganda so you know i'm going i'm going to estonia to hang out with those might in a few days and that'll be good that'll be good for my mental health get out of this house stop being so lonely you know that'll definitely be good for me um but one thing about being there is that uh, I'm probably not going to be playing as much Team Fortress 2, right? Because there's, there's only one, there's only one computer, and Dotsmite's probably going to be using it fairly, fairly often. Uh, and that's probably a good thing too. <laughs> that's probably also a good thing, because you know I don't know what I this. I'm. I'll tell you one thing. I have frankly, you know, begun to make progress away from tryharding in this video game. And I have seen the Im improvements that it has made to my brain. Uh, and just to my experience. They're like, you know, putting pressure on myself to get better. Although it's nice when it works, I'm very inconsistent. Like, I kind of thought that this had changed coming from Counter-Strike to TF2 that like my consistency had improved. But it turns out I just hadn't hit the skill limit where I was able to actually notice the differences in my consistency day to day. And it might just it might not just be me, it could be that some days I'm playing against better players than other days. I don't know. Let's not talk too much about TF2 because this whole fucking podcast is about TF2. Um, anyway. I made a, 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 a album. I made an album. I made a wacky... I made a very wacky Yes Thank You album. If you guys want to listen to that, it's on my Bandcamp. I haven't really showed it anywhere because uh, it's extremely wacky and extremely long. It's one of my wackiest albums. Um, I think it's pretty funny, though. There's a lot of very funny moments, at least to me. I'm, I'm quite happy with how funny some parts of that album is, but I don't know if it's only me and my friends that will find it funny. Like, I'm pretty sure that a lot of people will just be like, what? What are you doing? <laughs> this, this sucks. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm just kind of... Oftentimes, I'm like... There's no reason to put myself out there as much. I got, like, I gotta get off Twitter. I like... It's one of the reasons why I like anonymous places on the internet, or pseudonymous places where I'm, you know, all of these many places on the internet where I, I'm, no one knows who the fuck I am, I have a different name, I have a different persona, and none of them are linked to each other, that shit's great, no one knows who's speaking to them at any one, it's great, I feel like there's no pressure on me, I don't know why I feel like there's pressure on me here, but... Yeah. Eh. I don't really have solid thoughts on this. I don't know if you can tell. This is all rambly because I don't really have. I'm just kind of. Blub, 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 blub. <laughs> I'm, I'm just kind of. Uh, I got a vibe going on. It's kind of difficult to communicate a vibe. Uh, where my, my mindset has like been slowly changing. Where it's like, if I want to make a Denpa vlog. It's like that's gone from being a genuine expression to being like something I do because it's something I'm, I feel like I should do. Does that make sense? I don't think it really makes much sense. Like, the people I watch these days on YouTube are quite different from the people I used to watch. Well... But I also do... I like similar 
It's similar but different in a way that's hard to describe. I don't know. Let's stop this. I'm, I'm like, rambling because I'm like, do I want this to be the last segment of the podcast? This would probably be a good closer, but also I'm, like, too far away from 12 hours to really end it here. So, yeah, fuck it. Okay, Denpachan people. People who don't like my TF2 videos. I'm now kind of upset about it. I'm kind of upset about it. Because, hold on, now people are fucking, now people are fucking talk. hold on, I gotta read this, there's new parts to this fucking thread. I don't know man, virtually nothing is the entire point for me, a vlog of a psychopath doing random shit. Since when am I a fucking psychopath? I'm a, I'm, I'm autistic, I'm not a psychopath. <laughs> what the fuck? Sometimes music and FX will come in kind of like a whole... That is not how you spell buffet. <laughs> when he does talk about something, it's interesting. When I do my thing, the ideas inspires me. Now it's all bullcrap. At least with the Mario, he did something with it. I need a no AI voice generator and like an hour long Bataille discussion to proof my point, but I stand by it. What you call bullcrap are just micro ideas that inspire just as much in contrast with macro ideas of a philosophy lecture. This tends to happen when you do something you like 24 seven. The passion is equally there. It's what I believe Lacan calls talking without using words. If it's equal, then why doesn't he put effort into it than the older ones? What the fuck are these people talking about? These ES ESL spotted. ESL users spotted. Makes no fucking sense. I don't I can't even pass what these people are trying to say because they could barely speak English. Okay, I'm not taking the criticism a little less seriously. But I'm annoyed that the fuckers have got me to doubt myself. Because I just made, I just edited a TF2 clip dump, which, for those of you who, for some reason, listen to this 12-hour long podcast, where a lot of what I do is just talk about this one video game, who don't play that video game, I respect it, I respect it a lot, um, I respect you, but, anyway, uh, TF2 is an incredibly clippable game. It's maybe the most clippable game of all time. Because it's designed to just be funny. Like, funny things happen constantly. And then, like, pog things happen constantly. Right? Like, every day I play TF2, I get at least a couple of clippable moments. Like, just stuff that I want to send to a friend or something. You know? Like, either something funny happens, or I do something cool, or I, do so, or I fail really hard and it's funny, or, like... You know, something, so there's, a, there's a weird glitch, you know, like, something happens every day when you play this game that is, that is, like, worth clipping. And I've accumulated a lot of clips, and so I'm going to compile them into a clip dump. This is a thing. You go on YouTube, search for TF2 clip dump, you'll find a million videos that, that are all the same kind of thing. So, I've accumulated a shitload of clips at this point, so I was like, well, I gotta delete these, so I may as well compile them into a video, um, and, you know, post it. But now, you know what, you know what I should just do? I should just make a, a Fish TF2 channel. That's what I should do. That's what I should fucking do. I should just make a TF2 channel. That's what I'm gonna do. This solves the problem, right? Doesn't this just solve the problem? If I just make a, a dedicated TF2 channel, and then I just upload these podcasts and vlogs and anything that, you know, the stuff I was doing before. That, this makes a lot of sense. I'm going to do that, I think. You know what? I'm just going to do that. Yeah, I'm just, I made a, I made a TF2 YouTube channel. It's called Fish TF2. I'm sure I'll link it somewhere on this channel at some point. In fact, it's probably in the description of those TF2 videos I made. And now I'm faced with, do I, do I delete those TF2 videos that are on this channel? 
and migrate them? Is that a good idea? Uh, I don't know. I don't know what to do about that. Tell me in the comments if I should do that. Someone hit me up in the comments about that shit, because I have no idea if that's a terrible... If, if, does YouTube get mad at you if you do stuff like that? Like, I feel like YouTube would get mad at, at me for doing that. You know what I mean? Like, the algorithm would get mad at me. Or something. I don't fucking know. Uh, we're all just paranoid about AI overlords at this point. <sighs> well, I'll put the clip dump there and I'll make future TF2 videos on that different channel. Um... You know, I watched this video, it's like a four hour long video about a Star Wars Disney hotel being bad, and yep, it was, it was bad, the Star Wars Disney hotel was bad, um, but also, could a Star Wars Disney hotel ever have been good? That's something that, like... What's her name? Jenny, Jenny something. She brings up in the video, like, a lot of situations, a lot of examples of, like, oh, well, instead of doing this, I expected something like this to happen, with this narrative beat, and this bit of role-playing, and I'm like, would you have actually enjoyed that, though? Would, would anyone really enjoy that? Especially, like, a family with young kids, which is primary Disney demographic, like, do, would, do people like no one actually wants that like they okay some people want that like kind of like an escape room or something right like yeah some people probably want to to rp as a star wars character but like that's a very small niche and also like i don't really i don't really see like i think that can only be so good do you know what i mean like, in an experience where it's guaranteed to be expensive and popular, you know, where there's a lot of people, to, I don't know, it seemed, I was a bit confused by the video, because I was kind of like, well, yeah, it, I mean, it, you're, you're acting as if this would have been a great idea that was just executed poorly, because the executives you know, cheaped out on, on every, everything, and that's true, it was probably worse than it could have been otherwise, but, you know, on the flip, on the flippy floppy, would you ever have ex actually expected it to be good? <laughs> but I guess, uh, you know, different people have different tastes. It's pretty annoying that we're so close to the end of this podcast because I want to go on a rant about Marxist economics but I also don't want to end this podcast on a rant about Marxist economics but uh, I've been trying to tell people that you know I thought that my problem with Marx was the labor theory of value is nonsense but as it turns out like the, the labor theory of value as the majority of you know so called Marxists understand it is not necessarily what's actually in Marx. Like, a lot of people are just not, like, misunderstanding or bullshitting. Uh, like, the key observation, if I had to really dumb it down, would be that labor is a social relation. It's a, it's a, it, oh, sorry, value is a measure of social relations. Which is why, once you realize that that's what Marx is trying to say, it kind of becomes very silly when people start talking about, like, Austrian economics, and they're like, value is subjective. It's like, yeah, kind of, that's also, like, Marx also says that value is, like, a matter of social relations, which is kind of, like, you know, the difference is that the Austrians are looking at the world as, like, a whole bunch of ind individual agents who are somehow not enmeshed in society and acting completely you know, rationally, rational individual actors or whatever, whereas Marx is like, no, I mean, I guess that's a bit silly, uh, people, we live in a society, <laughs> you know, uh, but, you know, it's, it's just kind of a, 
collectivist versus individualist take on the same basic notion. And one is a lot more fleshed out than the other. Uh, but if I had to very quickly explain, the, the, the common explanation is like, well, you go in and you make a b- b- you bake a, b- a loaf of bread or something, but then the capitalist steals all your value. There'll be no bread without you. Uh, but the capitalist steals all your your money, and takes that as profit, and then he fucking gives you back a tiny bit, just enough to pay. For, he sells the bread and then t- pays you enough for a slice of bread instead of a whole loaf. That's not enough money. The capitalists are robbing you, because you made the bread, right? Which I think is rhetorically useful, but not accurate. Because not everyone's baking bread, right? Like, what if you, for example, I don't know, let's say Marx's day, you work on a shipyard. You're making a, a, a big-ass ship, right? And you work and you get paid by week, by the week, or even by the month. It might take multiple years to finish, I don't know how long it takes to build a fucking wooden ship, but probably a long-ass time. Not enough time to sell it, right? But you're still getting paid. How? Hey, the capitalist is actually paying you wages from previous ships that he sold, or any other income stream, not necessarily based on the value of your exact wager, uh, uh, wage, I mean, and Marx wasn't stupid, he knew this, and he talks about it in Capital, Uh, because yeah, that's not how the labor theory of value works, it's really a labor power theory of capital, Uh, that like, uh, the proletarians have been stripped of their other powers and have left only with their labor power, okay, we only have like, Fucking one minute left, so I'm going to stop talking about Marxism now. Uh, How do I end this podcast? TF2 YouTube channel, communism, I'm hungover, I feel like shit. Uh, I'm going to make another podcast again, I'm very excited. I don't remember what the fuck was wrong, I don't know, I don't remember the rest of this podcast. I don't know what the fuck I talked about in the rest of this this thing. I have no memory of this place. But I'm going to finish recording this and you know what I'm gonna do I'm gonna go straight immediately and start recording the next episode that's what I'm gonna do that's what the fuck I'm gonna do so uh there you have it there you go this is the this has been the slice of life podcast season two episode one uh and it's 12 hours long for some reason and it keeps going it just you can stop watching no if you if you skip the last 30 seconds of the video no one's gonna no one's going to attack you for it. You don't have to. You don't. I mean, I'm going to still be here. I'm going to still be here for the for it. But, but you, you don't have to watch the last 30 seconds of the video. You can just click off. Honestly, most people have clicked off by now. The vast majority of people have not made it to here. Uh, so you can, you know, you don't have to watch to the last. Are you still here? You're still waiting for the last frame? You're waiting for the last frame of the video? Well, congratulations. You made it to the last frame of the video. This isn't exactly 12 hours, but here we go.